Hi guys, I want to invite you to join the Patreon where you will get some benefits as well as audiobooks that will not be uploaded on YouTube. Chapter 1. What is life? The question has been a constant pursuit during my time alive in this world. It was a curiosity I held ever since I was a kid, raised in an orphanage I found myself stranded among the hyperactive kids. Isolated by my own volition as I struggled to find a reason to connect with them. It wasn't out of some sort of trauma I had from my parents, despite not being treated well before being abandoned I didn't harbor any hatred for them, I just didn't have anything at all towards them. The trend of isolation carried on to my school life as I only focused on learning more about the world. At one point however I got bored of it, so I stopped putting in much effort in it. After barely passing high school I took up a small job in RSS, they didn't give me money since it was a voluntary service organization but they provided me with food and clothing. My goal to join them was simple, I wished to join politics and gain position of power, the reason was that I just wanted to experience if life was any different on the top from the bottom. During my time in RSS I learned a lot of things like fighting, religious practices and history, while the practice of religion itself didn't interest me much but the philosophy of it all made me quite interested in it. It sated a lot of my curiosity yet I still failed to find meaning in my fleeting life. As I approached the age of 25 I had already joined BJP. But as a normal member I had no scope to even hope for getting a nomination for election any time soon. I didn't have political connections nor did have any following among the fellow party members. So from the two options of seducing my way up or blackmailing my way up I chose the latter, I spent three years gathering information on many state ministers and union ministers. And then I took my time slowly building up my presence by the virtue of favors of very gracious ministers and key members of the party. By the time I was 30 I was running for the position of MP in the general election, and I won too. I didn't get any important ministries but I just needed to work harder to achieve more power. Politics was fun, for my second term I switched the constituency to a different place in Jumbo. Everything was going absolutely my way, my popularity was very high due to my uncompromising ideology that was displayed to the nation with the help of my friends in media groups. I was even in consideration to be a union minister if our party won the next term. Alas that future never came to be as during my return from a rally my convoy was attacked by 33 terrorists. The standoff lasted for half an hour since I didn't have high class security and my guards were nowhere near enough to dare them. But I didn't want things to end this way so I stepped out of the vehicle and surrendered, at first they wanted to shoot me but I forced them to take me hostage by pulling on their fear of death. Listen, if you kill me right now you your family and everyone that helped you will be hunted like dogs that don't even get proper funeral, if you take me hostage you can negotiate a better jail time for yourself. I was pretty bold with my statements because I was completely sure that these were not internationally funded terrorists, they were upstarts in their field. I was taken hostage and they tried to negotiate with the government, alas they were shut down completely and were put in a stalemate by the army completely surrounding their base. And within a few days of waiting the operation to rescue was already on the way since the terrorists ran out of ammunition to deter them. I was pretty happy because this altercation would have single-handedly propelled my political career to new heights. Alas I miscalculated the irrationality of a cornered madman, one of the leaders choked me to death just minutes after the army entered the base. All in all I never found an answer to my question during my life. In my final moments I had hoped that there exists an afterlife of some sort and I was right since I could have thoughts, I couldn't see feel or touch but I could think. Oh well I did have some grand expectations for this but what more can I do about it? I am not angry I am not sad, I am just unsatisfied with this. Just like this time passed. And my mind became a silent place even my own thoughts were hard to be coherent and I could feel myself losing myself. So I did the only thing I could, I prayed. I prayed to be reborn out of this hell of my own silence. Whatever deity that lives out there, my only wish is to not be reborn in this incomprehensible life of a human. And my prayer did work as after some time a sound not of my own echoed in my mind. Notice. The voice of the world grants the individual named, permission to reincarnate. And after that my thoughts seeded. Chapter 2. Notice. The voice of the world has selected your destination. Creating the most suitable body. Notice. 
the cardinal world is currently cut off from the Sidim due to infestation of true dragon aura. Acquisition of attributes failed. Reattempting process. Failed. 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 Fail. I came back to my senses with a robotic voice ringuing in my ears. I tried to feel my body but my attempts ended as futile. I could see my surroundings that were like the inside of a super-futuristic cladioscope with what appeared to be endlessly moving digital cogs but the thing that took up the most of my attention was the pulsating light at what appeared to be the ever farther end of this place. The source of this voice, while I had a lot to say to it I coiled only listen for now. Redefining path from reincarnation to transmigration. Voice of the world requests the administrator of cardinal world to clear interference of the individual Veldora's magicule. Awaiting response. Administrator is deemed irresponsive. Redefining path. Utilizing false divinity to carve a path. Coagulating interfering magicules using human hatred and fear as a medium for the process. Perfect body for the high EP individual has been created now processing the skills. A dragon lord of highest degree has been created using the magicule of Veldora. Awarding the intrinsic skills. Universal shapeshift. Gravity manipulation. Magic power jamming. Summon monster. Dragon lord hockey. Magic power perception. Ultra speed regeneration. Fear manipulation. Blood manipulation. Wind manipulation. Awarding tolerance. Pain nullification. Paralysis resistance. Fiscal attract resistance. Poison nullification. Flame resistance. Magic resistance. Mind attack nullification. Natural effect resistance. Due to utilizing a false divinity consequently to prevent damage. Holy demonic resistance. Awarding aspectual arts and magic. Ice magic. Tempest scale. Wicked light ray. Parasitic infiltration. Movement of the wind. Multidimensional barrier. Storm manipulation. Heartless one. Draconic affinity. Awarding unique skill. Politician. Merciless. Spectator. Title of humanity's evil has been awarded. Establishing a soul corridor with the individual Veldora. Specimen ready to be transferred to the cardinal world. The voice went silent after speaking for a few minutes and just when I was about to attempt to speak up my consciousness was again jolted as the cogs started turning and I began speeding towards the light. White. My voice was cut off as my consciousness went silent again. And it remained silent, I was getting anxious if all that was just my own conjuring of hallucination. My thoughts were interrupted by a voice. No it was more like a screeching. At the back of my mind. What was that? Just as I said that things started to materialize around me, my body formed the same as the one I had, shallow waters formed around me as I looked around. I couldn't even feel any sort of amazement due to the suddenness of things, my mind at this moment is so bombarded that I had shut off all responsive mechanism and am just going with the flow. I looked to the distance as large black mountains came into my view, alongside a floating island with a giant temple on it just when I was about to turn to look at the fishes in the water, the mountain moved. Wait those aren't mountains. I began running in a futile attempt to get away from the imminent danger, my instincts guiding my actions. The once blue water started to get murky as I ran, the fishes all but gone and the screeching ever percent in my ears. I don't know how much time I ran but after some time I ran out of breath and fell down in the water. I turned look at the giant blood red wave of water approaching me with fear in my eyes, never in my life had I felt so repulsed and defeated. I closed my eyes accepting my fate once again and when I did so I heard a voice in my head. Destroy. My eyes shot open as everything about the voice felt wrong and nauseating. Destroy. As the wave approached the voice got louder and louder. And as it hit me it became silent for a few seconds as my ears started ringing. Destroy blood kill destroy destroy kill kill destroy blood kill destroy destroy kill kill destroy blood kill destroy destroy kill kill destroy blood kill destroy destroy kill kill. I clutched my head in pain as I tried to scream but doing so only filled my throat with this blood mixed water. Why did end up in this situation? 
Did the voice think I a simple human who spent her entire life lying manipulating is in any way fit to deal whatever this was? My self-loathing was cut short however as the voices reacted adversely to my thoughts. Accept the truth don't run from it, you aren't human. Losing all coherence to me I simply gritted my teeth unable to bear the pain as I drowned to the bottom of the ocean. My consciousness began to fade as I heard one last thing. Not worthy yet. Chapter 3 Every time I wake up I can feel it again the icy grip of the water around me, tightening, suffocating. Every time I wake, it's always the same. This endless loop, a cruel mockery of my life. The moment of consciousness is brief, just enough to realize where I am, just enough to taste the iron in the water. Just enough to feel my lungs filled with this thick saline blood water, red and warm, a sickening mix of blood and sea. Each breath is a desperate struggle, a futile attempt to gulp down air, but all I get is more water, more blood. The pain in my chest is unbearable, a constant pressure building, like my ribs are about to crack and give way. My mind has become a foggy haze, each cycle blurring the lines between reality and nightmare. It's like a dense cloud, slowly consuming my thoughts, my memories. I can't even remember how I got here anymore. All I know is the pain, the suffocation, and the voices. Those voices they are the worst part. At first, they were distant, like whispers carried on the wind. But with each cycle, they grow louder, more piercing. They fill my ears with a maddening intensity, making them bleed. The voices are not human they are distorted, twisted. They echo through my mind, a cacophony of screams and laughter, mocking my every attempt to break free. I can feel my sanity slipping away with each shriek, each haunting laugh. My vision is failing too. The water is dark, murky, but there are moments when I can see flashes of light, distorted images of faces, maybe my own, twisted in agony. Every attempt to swim, to break the surface, is met with the same resistance, the same crushing weight pulling me back down, deeper into this abyss. My limbs are heavy, numb. My movements are slow, like I'm trapped in thick sludge. I can't escape. There's no end to this torment. Each time I wake, it's a new cycle of drowning, of choking on this bloody water. Each time, the voices grow louder, more insistent, eroding my will to fight, to live. I can feel myself fading, becoming one with the water, with the voices. I'm losing myself, bit by bit, piece by piece, until there will be nothing left but the water, the blood, and the endless, suffocating darkness. I just want this to end. Not yet. Scene break. Third person POV. Life was proceeding as usual for every being in the cardinal however. In the heart of a tempestuous night, a dark force stirred, birthed from the convergence of ambient power and malevolence. Charybdis, as was the name it was granted by the humans that were yet to meet it, the embodiment of humanity's darkest evils, emerged into the world. Her existence was a direct consequence of the voice of the world's interference, a cosmic anomaly that twisted fate itself. She was not merely born she was unleashed. Charybdis's form, colossal and monstrous, reflected the chaos within her being. Scales of deep blue and obsidian covered her serpentine draconic body, and her eyes glowed with a malevolent crimson light. She was an unexpected daughter of the mighty storm dragon, an avatar of raw destructive force, but her nature was corrupted, driven by an insatiable hunger for destruction and chaos. Brought about by the whims of a will that betrayed its creator. As the moment of convergence happened. Across the land, humans felt an inexplicable dread. In villages and cities, people awoke in the dead of night, hearts pounding with an unnamed fear, animals shrieked and the winds roared in welcome. Amidst all this, it was as if the air itself had thickened with foreboding. Elders whispered of ancient prophecies, and priests offered fervent prayers to the gods, seeking protection from the unseen terror. Yet, none could have predicted the true nature of the calamity that was about to befall them. Far from the turmoil, the world's administrators, beings of immense power and wisdom, each sensed the shift in the world's balance from their isolated sanctuaries. One resided in an icy castle, its walls glistening with frost. From this frozen fortress, the red-haired demon gazed into the swirling blizzard outside, eyes narrowing as they felt the unnatural disturbance. In a labyrinthine domain, a golden fairy moved through the endless corridors, her expression growing more serious even if for a few minutes. 
the labyrinth's walls echoed with the whispers of distress among the spirits. Meanwhile, in a lavish bed within a palace of opulence, the fallen one stirred awake from his constant slumber. Draped in silks and surrounded by luxury, he nonetheless felt the same ominous presence. Their usually serene countenance darkened as they contemplated the voice of the world's capricious interference. Ha, this is beyond my control, the red-haired demon chuckled to himself yet his voice voice heavy with the weight of uncertainty. The voice of the world has set these events into motion what does it wish to achieve now? In the labyrinth, the fairy quickly discarded the presence to the back of her mind and went back to her usual demeanor playing around with the spirits. In the opulent palace, the third administrator sighed, his fingers tracing patterns on the silk sheets. The balance has been disrupted in a way I have not seen since Veldanava's fall. What will this change bring? And so, the world braced for the onslaught. Charybdis, mindless and relentless, began her rampage. She tore through the countryside, leaving a path of devastation in her wake. Forests were uprooted, rivers diverted, and mountains reduced to mounds as she passed. Villages were obliterated, their inhabitants scattered like leaves in a storm. Her roars echoed across the land, a harbinger of doom that sent even the bravest warriors fleeing in terror. The armies that stood against her were no match for her fury. Spears and arrows shattered against her scales, and the strongest magics only seemed to anger her further. Cities fortified with walls and magical barriers crumbled before her onslaught. The land itself seemed to rebel in her presence, as if acknowledging her as its new, albeit malevolent, mistress. In the midst of this chaos, hope flickered dimly. The demon with his vast knowledge and power, began to devise a plan. He knew that to confront Charybdis directly would be folly because of the unpredictable nature of voice of the world instead. He sought a way to quell the storm within her, to restore the balance that the voice of the world had so recklessly disturbed. But for now, Charybdis's reign of terror continued unabated. She was the embodiment of humanity's darkest impulses, a pseudo-true dragon whose very existence was a testament to the fragility of order in the face of primal chaos. And as the world quaked under her wrath, it became clear that this was only the beginning of a long and harrowing struggle. One that could only end in two ways. One if someone put her to death or the other if the soul trapped in its own mind and gained control. Ah well how was this one? Chapter 4 I find my way to consciousness again, the suffocating weight of the water pressing down on me. Desperation fuels my every movement as I claw upwards, my hands scrabbling against the thick, viscous liquid, nails breaking, fingers bleeding. I push past the pain, past the searing agony in my lungs, determined to break free this time. The voices are louder, more frantic, as if they sense my struggle. Stay still. They scream in my ears, a torrent of noise that makes my head throb and my ears bleed. I grit my teeth and push on, my legs kicking furiously, my arms pulling me towards what I hope is the surface. I can see a faint glimmer above me, a promise of air, of escape. My vision blurs and darkens, but I keep reaching, keep fighting. My lungs burn, every breath a battle, every inch a victory. Just a little further, I tell myself. Just a little more. But the weight is too much. My strength is fading. My limbs are heavy, my movements going sluggish. The voices are deafening now, a relentless assault that drowns out my thoughts, my hope. My fingers brush the surface, but I can't break through. The water pulls me back, down into the darkness. I scream, but it's swallowed by the bloody water. My last breath is stolen, my last hope extinguished. The voices laugh, triumphant, as I sink into the abyss again, my body giving up, my mind numbing. I fought, but it wasn't enough. Indefinite time later. I wake again, gasping, the familiar cold grip of the water closing around me. Every time, I feel a little stronger. A little more determined. I won't let this hell defeat me. I claw upwards, my fingers slicing through the murky water, pushing against the suffocating pressure. The voices are there, louder than before, but I force them to the back of my mind. I focus on the light above, the promise of air and freedom. I remember my last attempt. I got closer that time, my fingertips brushing the surface before the water pulled me back. This time, I push harder. My lungs scream for air, my chest feels like it's going to explode, 
but I don't stop. I can't stop. The voices howl in my ears, a cacophony of taunts and screams, but I ignore them. I kick harder, my legs burning, propelling me upward. The water feels thicker, denser, like it's fighting me too. But I fight back. My nails are broken, my fingers bleeding, but I keep clawing, keep pushing. I'm closer now. I can see the light growing, can almost taste the air just out of reach. The pain is unbearable, my body screaming in protest, but I keep going. I have to. With each attempt, I get a little better. I remember the movements, the rhythm, the way to slice through the water more efficiently. I get closer and closer. This time, my whole hand breaks the surface, and for a brief moment, I taste the sweet, cold air. It fills me with hope, with determination. I can do this. I will do this. But the water pulls me back again, dragging me into the depths. The voice is mocking my efforts, but I'm not defeated. I know I'm getting closer. Each failure is a step forward, a lesson learned. The haze in my mind clears a little each time. I remember more, I fight harder. I take a deep, painful breath of the bloody water, readying myself for the next attempt. I won't give up. I can feel it. One more try. One more push. I will break free. I have to. I had no recollection of what pushed me this far but I won't sit still till I escape this hell. As my thoughts get muddled with flashes of destruction and gore, my vision backs into the familiar dark. POV, Rudra Nam Ol Nazca. The last few days have certainly been interesting. The reports of Charybdis's devastation continue to flood in, each detailing the chaos it leaves behind. Human settlements crumble beneath its relentless assault, a testament to its raw power. Yet, amidst the destruction, I see not a threat, but a pawn for me to use. Charybdis as the humans have foolishly named the beast, from what I sense is the closest thing to a true dragon without the perks of being one. It's the offspring of Veldora, brought about by saturation of his magicules and embodies the untamed chaos of its parent. Veldora himself, that troublesome storm dragon, has long been a thorn in my side, a problem child that doesn't serve in my favor. If I can bend Charybdis to my will, it will serve as a potent tool in my ongoing struggle with Guy. Its path leads inexorably towards my kingdom, as if drawn by some unseen force. It seeks to challenge the sovereignty of the Eastern Empire, yet little does it know that it will soon fall under my control. The chaos it spreads can be directed and harnessed to serve my interests. And it can also seve as an amusement for Velgrind. I'm truly a genius. Chapter 5 The forest was always alive. The wind rustling through the trees, the calls of distant creatures, and the soft murmur of the stream that wound its way past our village these sounds formed the symphony of my childhood. The great Jura forest was my home, and for the seventeen years I had lived, I felt its life force intertwine with my own. I was born to a family of proud Oni. My father was a renowned blacksmith, his hands capable of crafting swords that sang in the hands of warriors. My mother was our village's healer, her touch bringing relief and solace to the injured and the ill. I had a younger brother whose curiosity and laughter were the heartbeats of our home. My older sister was a warrior in training, her skill with the sword a source of inspiration for me. Tomorrow was to be a special day. My first lesson in swordsmanship. My sister had promised to teach me the basics, and I had spent the entire night envisioning the two of us in the clearing, her graceful movements guiding my awkward attempts. I could barely contain my excitement. But the dawn brought with it something else. The sky turned dark, clouds swirling ominously, and a chill settled over the forest. From the depths of the forest, a roar echoed, sending shivers down my spine. A gigantic flying creature with dark blue scales appeared near our village. The creature descended upon our village like a storm unleashed. Its massive, draconic serpentine form blotted out the sun, and its rage was a force of nature. Buildings crumbled, trees were uprooted, and the air was filled with the screams of my people. I remember my father's shout, telling us to run, to hide. He stood in the path of the beast, his hammer in hand, a futile attempt to protect us. Charybdis's maw opened, and with a snap, he was gone. My mother pushed my brother and me toward the forest, her eyes filled with terror and love. 
She turned back, chanting a protective spell, but the beast's massive tail crashed down upon her, silencing her forever. We ran, but we were separated in the chaos. I heard my brother's desperate cries filled with terror of death, saw his small form trying to escape the destruction, and then silence. The silence was the worst part. The void where his voice had been was more deafening than any roar of Charybdis. My sister found me, dragged me to the edge of the village. She fought bravely, her sword dancing in a desperate bid to fend off the beast. But Charybdis was inevitable, a swipe of its claw sent her flying, her body hitting the ground with a sickening squelch turning into a grotesque mess as her body turned into a mush of blood and organs. I don't remember how I escaped. The memories are a blur of fear and pain. As I fled, I felt a burning sensation on my skin. Looking back, I saw Charybdis above, its scales glistening with a viscous, dark fluid. Some of it had splashed onto me during the chaos. I brushed at it, but the liquid seemed to seep into my skin, causing an unbearable burning. Somehow, I reached the warrior nation of Dwargan. Exhaustion and grief weighed me down, and I collapsed at their gates. They took me in, nursed me back to health. But something inside me had changed. The encounter with Charybdis had marked me in ways I couldn't understand. Over time, my once vibrant red hair turned a stark, unnatural grey. My eyes, which had been filled with life and curiosity, grew dull. Emotions that once flowed freely now felt muted, distant. I was a shell of who I had been. The viscous fluid from Charybdis had started to change me, twisting my body and my mind. The trauma lingered, a shadow over my every thought. In Dwargan, I found refuge, but I could not find peace. The great Jura forest, my home, was now a graveyard, and in my soul, a storm raged as fierce as the one that had brought Charybdis to our village. The physical changes mirrored my inner turmoil. The grey hair, the dulled emotions, the occasional bouts of fever and pain as the fluid from Charybdis continued its sinister work within me. I had survived the beast's rampage, but in doing so, I had become something else. The fluid was transforming me, turning me into a reminder of the horror that had destroyed my family and my village. But it wasn't just the physical changes. At night, I was tormented by the voices of my family, their screams echoing in my head, dragging me back to that dreadful day. During sleep, I would hear my father's last shout, my mother's protective chant cut short, my brother's terrified cries, and my sister's final, desperate battle. These voices pursued me into my waking hours, especially when I looked at humans. Their faces would blur, morphing into the faces of my lost loved ones, their eyes filled with the same terror I had seen that day. An unnatural bloodlust began to grow within me. It started as a whisper, a faint, unsettling urge, but over time, it became a roar. The more I trained, the more I fought, the stronger it became. It was as if the fluid from Charybdis had not only changed my body but had also implanted a fragment of its own monstrous rage within me. I craved the fight, the clash of steel, the rush of battle. The need for violence simmered beneath my skin, threatening to boil over at any moment. As I struggled with these changes, I discovered a new, unsettling ability. I could sense the sins of others. When I looked at someone, I felt a dark, cloying aura around them, revealing their transgressions, whispering ways for me to punish them. This skill was as much a curse as it was a tool. It fueled my growing bloodlust, making it difficult to see the good in anyone. Every human I encountered seemed tainted, their sins a beacon that drew my rage. I lived in constant fear of losing control, of succumbing to the bloodlust that had taken root in my soul. I trained harder, pushed myself further, hoping to master it, to channel it. But the more I fought it, the stronger it grew. I had become something neither fully Oni nor fully monster, a haunted being torn between the memories of my family and the darkness that now lived inside me. Sometimes, in my dreams, I would find myself standing before a temple of skulls and grime, surrounded by an unending blood-red ocean. The temple rises ominously from the crimson waves, constructed from countless bones and fragments of lives lost. The walls, slick with a foul, dark substance, pulse with a sickening energy that seems to seep into my very soul. The blood-red ocean churns ceaselessly, the waves crashing against the temple's base, sending sprays of scarlet droplets into the air. The stench of death and decay permeates the atmosphere, 
filling my lungs with every breath. The water is thick and cold, lapping at my feet, staining everything it touches. Inside the temple, the ground is covered in grime and filth, the remnants of bodies, cushed organs eyes blood. As I walk through the eerie halls, the walls seem to close in around me, the skulls staring with empty eye sockets, which seem to flow with the same blood-red liquid that splashed me. I feel a crushing weight of sorrow and rage, the emotions of those who perished here seeping into my consciousness. At the heart of the temple, an altar stands, bathed in an unholy light. On it lies a twisted, grotesque idol, a mockery of life and death, its eyes burning with a malevolent fire. Its mouth continuously leaking blood as it pools around. The screams of my family and villagers fill the air, mingling with the distant roar of Charybdis. I am drawn to the altar, my bloodlust intensifying with every step, my hands shaking with the need to destroy, to kill, to consume, to punish, to rage. But as I reach out and touch the idol, I awaken, drenched in sweat, the scream still echoing in my ears, the scent of blood and death lingering in my nostrils. The skin around my hand cracking look the walls of a castle revealing pitch black muscles pulsing as if they had a mind of its own. My stomach churns violently, a sickening twist that sends me rushing to the bathroom. I barely make it to the sink before I retch, emptying the contents of my stomach. The sight that meets my eyes is horrifying dark, thick blood mixed with a foul grime, the same substance that coated the walls of the temple in my dream. I collapse against the sink, my breath coming in ragged gasps. Trembling, I force myself to look up at the mirror. The face staring back at me is barely recognizable. My once smooth skin is now cracked, with red lines running like jagged fissures along its surface. My eyes, which used to sparkle with life, are now a constant pulsing red, glowing with a sinister light. I touch my face, feeling the heat emanating from the cracks, the pain radiating from the lines. My horns, once a symbol of my own heritage, are suffering the same fate. The dark substance from Charybdis has tainted them, turning them into grotesque, pulsing masses of red and black. They throb with each beat of my heart, a reminder of the monster that changed me. I stare at my reflection, horrified and fascinated. The changes are becoming more pronounced, the monster within me rising to the surface. The blood and grime, the cracked skin, the pulsing red eyes they are all signs of the darkness that has taken root in my soul. However, as I stare into the mirror, observing the grotesque transformation overtaking my once familiar features, I feel a strange sense of acceptance wash over me. The terror that once gripped my heart at the sight of my own reflection has been replaced by a newfound calmness, a resigned acknowledgement of the darkness that now courses through my veins. In the depths of my being, something stirs a primal force, untamed and unyielding. It whispers to me, promising liberation from the shackles of fear and doubt. With each crack that mars my skin, each pulse of crimson light in my eyes, I feel its presence grow stronger, asserting its dominance over my fractured soul. However I so not dread it no I revel in it. The bloodlust that once filled me with dread now thrums through my veins like a primal drumbeat, urging me to embrace the darkness, to revel in the power it offers. The memories of my family, the horrors of Charybdis, they still haunt me, but they no longer hold sway over my actions. I am no longer bound by the constraints of morality or conscience. I am a creature of evil driven by the primal urge to destroy, to conquer, to dominate. As I gaze upon my transformed reflection, a twisted smile curls upon my lips. I no longer fear the change that consumes me instead, I welcome it with open arms. For in the darkness, I have found a freedom unlike any other, a liberation from the constraints of my former pathetic self. And as the red lines deepen, as my eyes blaze with unholy light, I know that I am destined for greatness a harbinger of chaos and destruction, a force to be reckoned with in this world and the next. The priestess of sin, the servant of evil is born welcomed by the evils of the world. Chapter 6 I wake again, the icy grip of the water surrounding me, pressing in. My body is numb, muscles heavy and lethargic. I've been here so many times that my lungs have forgotten how to breathe, my mind almost accustomed to the suffocation. But over time, I have changed. The drive to escape is no longer born out of fear. It has transformed into a fierce desire to conquer this nightmare once and for all. I focus, gathering every ounce of strength, and begin to claw my way upward. My hands cut through the thick, 
bloody water, each stroke more deliberate than the last. The voices are there, louder than ever, a cacophony of taunts and screams, but I won't let them win. I push them aside, focusing on the light above me, the promise of air and freedom. My legs kick with newfound power, propelling me upward. My chest burns, my lungs screaming for air, but I ignore the pain. I've learned the rhythm, the movements. I know how to fight its pull now. The light grows closer, brighter, each pull of my arms bringing me nearer to the surface. My fingers brush it, and I push harder, my determination unwavering. The voices shriek, a last desperate attempt to drag me back, but I won't be stopped. My head breaks the surface, and I gasp, sucking in the sweetest, most precious breath of air. The cold air fills my lungs, driving out the water making me cough like a madman, and for the first time in what feels like an eternity, I feel alive. I burst through completely, breaking free from the water's grip. The voices fade, their power over me gone as if an illusion. I cough, choking out the remnants of the bloody water, but I am free. But as my eyes adjust, I realize my escape isn't complete. All around me stretches an infinite blood-red ocean, its dark waves lapping ominously. My heart sinks, but then I see Eda single island, not far from me, a stark contrast against the endless expanse of crimson. I swim with strong, steady strokes, pulling myself through the thick, bloody water, every breath a hard-won victory. The island grows closer, and I can see it more clearly now. My relief is short-lived as I take in the sight, a temple made of skulls and bones, covered in blood and grime. The structure is grotesque, yet it draws me in, compelling me to reach it. I finally drag myself onto the shore, the sand gritty beneath my hands. The temple stands before me, imposing and macabre. Blood constantly pools out of the eye sockets of the skulls, forming dark, viscous streams that wind down the structure and soak into the ground. I force myself to stand, legs trembling from the cold, and approach the temple. The air is thick with the stench of decay, but I push forward, driven by the same determination that brought me to the surface. As I step inside, the skulls begin to whisper different from the screams meant to only cause me agony. At first, it's a faint murmur, but soon the voices grow clearer, each one distinct yet part of a unified chorus. They tell me of the temple's purpose, a place of reckoning and judgment. Slowly, their words pieced together the truth, the reason for my torment. I understand now why I was trapped in that hellish loop, why I drowned over and over again. The whispers reveal my purpose, a deep-seated loathing for all of humanity. This is a place of coagulation, where hair and sins are collected. The endless drowning was my trial, the blood-red ocean a manifestation of my hatred, fears my humanity, a test to make me worthy of what I had become. The weight of this revelation presses down on me, but alongside it comes a strange sense of clarity, of acceptance. I had to overcome the hatred I held within myself to conquer this nightmare. As I embrace this truth, the ocean around the island begins to dry up, the blood receding and forming into a massive cocoon with three eyes in its center and tentacles resembling the idol within the temple. The tentacles reach out, and inst of the disgust I would have felt from them in my previous life as I touch one, a sudden announcement is made by the same robotic voice that sent me here. Ultimate skill, Lord of Sin, Engra menu formation complete. Body soul stabilization complete. Usage of false divinity terminated. Upon this announcement, the cocoon completely merges with me. I feel a surge of power, a transformation taking place. The blood and bones, the voices and hatred, all integrate into my being. I am lifted from the island, from the abyss, and I awaken in the real world, my body changed, my form draconic. I find myself crashed on a mountain city, its panicking winged residents flying away from me. I paid them no heed as I looked upon the world feeling more complete than I ever felt, all the question in my insignificant life as a human answered without any doubt left inside. I was ready to fulfill the purpose assigned to me in this life. Be the absolute incarnation of human evils. With a thought my forms begin to fade as I use universal shape shift to regain my previous form but I am stumped as I fail to remember it. I stood there, surrounded by draconic pitch dark bones giving off steam, for almost ten minutes, my form a swirling mass of pitch black flesh and blood vaguely resembling a human body. 
Giving up I look towards the winged woman with horns on her head and an oddly beautiful jewel on her head, my skill told me that she was of a mix between a kitchen and harpy. She looked towards me with fear and hatred in her eyes. I would have tried to sympathize with her in some way and manipulate her to be my tool if I wasn't the cause of misery. Oh well not that it mattered to me. I turned towards her, my actions causing her to tense. I'll protect my people even if I die. Her declaration was cut off by my jump towards her my hand transforming into a hook. You look pretty, give me your face. And without a second delay I bisected her into two pieces, her body sinking into me as I slowly transformed into a form resembling her. Image. But I wasn't done as I sensed multiple lives around the area. With single flex of my will the sub-skill. All the world's evil activated manifesting the same waters in the material world consuming any living being in their path. My body shuddered not out of fear or pain but out of the sheer fun it was causing me to burst out lagging. Ha ha ha. Chapter 7 The kingdom of the harpies lay in ruins, transformed by the corruptive pool of curses and malice. Where once there were magnificent spires and nests, now there were only twisted remnants, soaked in the dark, liquid that had spread like a plague, corrupting everything in its path. The air was thick with the stench of rot. Charybdis, in her human form, surveyed the aftermath with a cold, crooked smile, fueled by the exhilaration of being in resonance with all this power. As she stood atop the highest peak of the shattered palace, she extended her senses through the mental connection she had with her minion, inherited from the precursor to her ultimate skill. The Oni arrived, her appearance delicate marred with cracks and an unnaturally pale skin contrasting sharply with the surrounding dark atmosphere. Her eyes, gleaming with a mixture of reverence and anticipation, met Charybdis's. Master, she said, her voice steady and unwavering, I am here. Charybdis nodded, her mind busy with possibilities. The knowledge she had assimilated from the harpy siege won a volunteer to her ultimate skill, Lord of Sin and Gramenu had expanded her understanding of this world exponentially. She knew now of the various factions, the hidden threats, and the untapped sources of resources to use. Her sights were set on a grander target, the Kingdom of the Elves, a superpower almost on par with the Eastern Empire. Attacking and corrupting the Long-Eared Tribe would provide her with new, powerful minions. Only the most exceptional among them would survive the corruption and be reborn anew, loyal to her cause. As she contemplated her next move, her thoughts were interrupted by the whispers of the skulls from the temple, still echoing in her mind. However she ignored them for now. We must make our way to the kingdom of the elves, Charybdis said, her voice carrying the weight of her newfound purpose. We will attack and corrupt sufficient members of their tribe to gain new minions. Only the strongest will survive this corruption. I hope at least two or three will endure, so I don't have to leave enough alive for repopulation. The Oni nodded, her loyalty unwavering. As you command, Master. Where shall we begin? Charybdis paused, a sudden thought striking her. She had given this minion power, purpose, and loyalty. But there was one more thing she needed to give, a name. A true name would seal their bond and ensure the Oni's evolution into a more powerful form. Kneel, Charybdis commanded. The Oni obeyed, her eyes filled with a mixture of awe and anticipation. I name you Harita, Charybdis intoned, her voice resonating with ancient power. Bear this name with pride and let it be a symbol of your strength and loyalty to me. As the name Harita was spoken, a powerful wave of magicules surged through the Oni. She staggered, her eyes widening in alarm as she felt an overwhelming force pulling her into unconsciousness. Charybdis watched, her expression inscrutable, as Harita's eyes fluttered shut and she collapsed to the ground. The name, her true name, echoed in Harita's mind, each syllable resonating deeper within her soul, engraving itself into her very essence. The blood-red water alongside remains of some harpies began to swirl around Harita, creating a cocoon-like structure. Charybdis observed closely, sensing the immense power emanating from the transformation. The bodies of the fallen harpies cogulating and their knowledge flooding into Harita's mind, triggering an evolution. As the transformation took hold, Harita's body began to change. Her skin became even, her muscles grew stronger, and her senses sharpened, wings protruded from her back. She could feel the blessing within her solidify into a new form of strength, 
her loyalty to Charybdis anchoring her through the process. When the cocoon finally dissipated, Harita emerged, her form more magnificent and terrifying than before. Her eyes opened, blazing with a newfound power and clarity. She looked at Charybdis, who now stood taller, her presence radiating formidable strength. Master, Harita said, her voice resonating with power, I am ready. Charybdis nodded, a wicked smile spreading across her face. Good. Our next target awaits. The kingdom of the elves will soon know the weight of their sins. Charybdis and her newly named minion Harita took to the sky, their path set towards the elven lands. Third Person POV Guy Crimson, one of the oldest and arguably the most formidable primordial demons, felt the disturbance deep within his core. As a holder of a Sin series skill, and a primordial he had certain attunement to changes in the world. Sitting atop his throne in his ice palace, Guy was enveloped in a sinister aura, his eyes gleaming with an ancient malevolence. A surge of restlessness coursing through him, a sensation so intense it made even him, the seasoned demon, shift uneasily. His Sin series skill had never felt so volatile, its power agitated as if responding to an unseen force. What is this? Guy muttered, his voice a low growl. He closed his eyes, reaching out with his senses, trying to grasp the source of this disturbance. The chaotic energy he felt was unlike anything he had encountered before, raw and untamed. It was as if a new, chaotic order similar to the Virtue and Sin series had emerged, no forcefully embedded itself to the world, one that resonated with his own dark nature yet felt distinctly different. On the other end of the spectrum, Feldway, the first angel and a bearer of a Virtue series skill, experienced a starkly different reaction. In the shithole his original body was hiding in, Feldway radiated purity and order, despite being the worst of the kind, his presence was a beacon of light. However, the birth of Lord of Sin disrupted this serene harmony. When he meditated in the sacred halls of his hideout, a sudden jolt of discord ran through Feldway, his Virtue series skill reacting violently to the emergence of such a potent source of sin. His eyes snapped open, and for a moment, the serene calmness in his expression was replaced by a rare look of concern. Something. Malevolent has awakened, Feldway whispered to himself, his voice filled with a mixture of dread and anticipation. He could sense the chaotic imbalance, the birth of such an entity that threatened to tip the scales set by the Creator. He knew that this new presank would be a formidable adversary. Or an ally useful in helping him in his plans. In a distant mountain range, the mighty dragon Veldora was in the midst of one of his infamous naps. The great storm dragon had long been feared for his power and destructive nature. Yet, in his slumber, he was oblivious to many of the world's subtleties. But on this day, something unprecedented happened. A sudden chill ran down Veldora's spine, a sensation so alien it jolted him awake. He shook his massive head, blinking in confusion, like an airhead. What in the? He rumbled, his deep voice echoing through the mountains. He glanced around, trying to pinpoint the source of this unease. Unbeknownst to him, his own daughter, Charybdis, had been born, her power echoing through the very essence of his being. But Veldora, unaware of this familial connection, could only sense that a new and formidable force had emerged in the world. Strange. Veldora muttered, feeling the lingering unease. Something significant has changed. He stretched his wings, contemplating whether to investigate or return to his nap. The latter was tempting, but the chill in his spine suggested that something important required his attention. Chapter 8 High above the forested expanse marking the edge of the elven kingdom, Charybdis, newly reborn as the Lord of Sin, soared through the skies along with her newly evolved minion. Her semi-draconic form, a blend of power and malevolence, cut a fearsome silhouette against the crimson-tinged twilight. Her destination was clear, the kingdom of the elves, where she intended to spread her corruption and add their strength to her growing army. Suddenly, a massive presence loomed behind her, and Charybdis was forced to halt her flight. Hovering in her path was another dragon, his golden eyes gleaming with curiosity and a hint of amusement. His scales were a mix of blue and deep black, with a powerful aura of lightning crackling around him. It was Veldora, the legendary storm dragon. Veldora's eyes narrowed as he took in the sight of Charybdis. He thundered, his voice resonating through the sky like a mighty storm. Who are you? 
Despite feeling something weird he ignored that feeling. Charybdis, undeterred by the imposing figure before her, responded with a defiant roar of her own, transforming into her draconic form almost instinctively without any thoughts in her head. The air crackled with tension as the two dragons faced off, their auras clashing violently. During this Charybdis ordered her minion to run away from here. Without a word, they lunged at each other, talons and teeth bared. The clash between Charybdis and Veldora began, a spectacle of raw power and elemental fury. Veldora, soared through the skies, his presence commanding the winds and lightning. The sky darkened, filled with tempestuous energy as bolts of lightning crackled around him. Charybdis, undeterred by the storm, responded with a fierce roar, her magic-resistant scales glistening with aura, a mix of magicules and dragon lord hockey. She unleashed a blast of icy breath, conjuring a blizzard alongside light magic that clashed with Veldora's storm. The air between them churned, a chaotic maelstrom of opposing forces of nature. Veldora's thunderous roar echoed through the sky as he lunged forward, his massive claws aiming to tear through Charybdis's defenses. Their initial collision was deafening alerting the Aleves hundreds of kilometers away, their scales scraping and sparking against each other. Veldora's storm manipulation summoned cyclones that whipped around them, but Charybdis's magic resistance and inherent storm manipulation rendered the elemental assaults ineffective. Undeterred, she retaliated with a surge of water magic, conjuring a concentrated beam of corrupted water in fee end of her mouth and shooting it at him. The water hissed and steamed where it met the lightning, creating a blinding blood-red mist. Veldora, realizing his elemental attacks were ineffective due to Charybdis's incredible resistance, shifted his approach. He used his sheer physical strength and speed to his advantage. With a mighty roar, he lunged at Charybdis, his claws slashing through the air with deadly precision. Charybdis, anticipating his move, dodged swiftly and counterattacked, her blizzard magic and multidimensional barrier creating ice barriers that shattered under Veldora's relentless assault but bought her precious moments to strike back. Summoning her strength, Charybdis unleashed a powerful torrent of pure curses, forcing Veldora to momentarily retreat as she also utilized fear manipulation to affect his mental state. She used the opening to launch herself at him, her claws and teeth aiming for his vulnerable spots. But Veldora's experience and raw power were overwhelming. He evaded her attacks with swift, precise movements, his counterstrikes landing with bone-crushing force. Ah he was playing with me before wasn't he? Charybdis, realizing she was outmatched in raw strength, shifted tactics. She summoned a dense fog spanning the entire sky obscuring herself from Veldora's sight. The storm dragon roared in enthusiasm enjoying the battle, his eyes and senses searching for her. Charybdis used the cover to dart in and out, striking swiftly before retreating into the mist. But Veldora's control over the storm was absolute. With a mighty roar, he dispersed the fog with a blast of wind and lightning, revealing Charybdis mid-strike. He met her attack head-on, their claws locking in a fierce struggle. The sky around them creaked with energy as the sheer amount of magicules used in their wrestle threatened to break space-time. Feeling her strength waning against Veldora's relentless assault, Charybdis knew she had to find another way. And at this moment her unique skill politician, coming in play as she devised the most favorable way to lie through this and gain his favor. She had long known that the dragon she was fighting was her own father but she in her thrill-fueled state overestimated her boundaries. The fight had rattled her back to her senses. As Veldora prepared to deliver a finishing blow, she cried out, Father, wait. Her voice cut through the chaos, causing Veldora to pause, confusion flickering in his eyes. Seizing the moment, Charybdis disengaged and hovered at a safe distance, panting from the exertion. Father, please listen. I am your daughter, she began, her voice earnest and desperate, hoping to reach the legendary dragon's heart before he struck again. Veldora's fierce expression immediately broke into surprise, followed by an awkward and confused chuckle. My daughter? He echoed, his tone bemused. What kind of plain-faced lie is that? Charybdis took a deep breath, her gaze meeting his. I was born from your residual magicules in the Jura forest. I am Charybdis, your daughter. If you don't believe you can try reaching with the soul corridor we share. Not that you could have done so before as Ingramenu had blocked it. 
Veldora stared at her for a moment seemingly sensing around his soul as she felt his senses brush against the surface of her soul, and then, much to Charybdis's astonishment, he burst into laughter. Kohaha! Veldanava, you old lizard, you're not the only one with a child anymore. He posed around mid-air in his dragon form laughing heartily at the one-up, wiping a tear from his eye with a clawed finger. This is priceless. Charybdis, uncertain how to respond, waited with sweat drops on her head as Veldora's laughter subsided. So, you're really my daughter, huh? Well, I suppose that makes me your... Dad? Yes, Charybdis replied, unsure of how to address the situation, she never had a dad or mom figure as she never bothered to build bonds with others in her life as a human. Veldora scratched his head awkwardly. Well, this is new. I've never had a daughter before. What do fathers usually do? He looked at Charybdis, who remained silent. Well, whatever. He flew closer to Charybdis, his demeanor turning into one of much more goofiness. So, what brings you out here? I seek to understand my purpose and my power, Charybdis said, lying through her teeth using politician. Veldora nodded thoughtlessly seemingly filtering out all the deep emotions I conjured up. Well, stick with me, kid. We'll figure it out together. Besides, it's not every day you get to meet your daughter he paused for a little bit in fact I have the perfect idea why don't you come with me to attack some kingdoms. Charybdis smiled and nodded with the perfectly lovable face, as much lovable a dragon's face can be, while internally questioning the common sense of the true dragon. With that, the two dragons flew off together, Veldora's booming laughter echoing through the sky as he reveled in his newfound role as a father. Charybdis, while still wary of revealing her true nature, felt a sense of relief and strange comfort in Veldora's presence. For now, her journey had taken an unexpected turn. Chapter 9 Apparently certain word count is needed for ranking. This expanse is merely word count however for anyone interested it has several essays on various topics. Like How Pickles and Sandwiches is Blasphemy Why Ma is Peak Fiction Why Solo Leveling is Peak Electrolytic Mechanisms Primary and Secondary Cells 1. Introduction Definition of Pickles and Sandwiches Brief History of Pickles in Sandwiches Thesis Statement The inclusion of pickles in sandwiches detracts from the overall experience due to their overpowering flavor, texture contrast, and cultural imposition. 2. Historical Context Origins of Pickles and Their Use in Various Cuisines Development of the Sandwich and Its Cultural Significance Historical instances of pickles in sandwiches and their acceptance or rejection. 3. Culinary Perspective Analysis of Flavors, How Pickles' Strong Taste Overpowers Other Ingredients Texture Considerations, The Crunch of Pickles vs. The Desired Sandwich Texture Balance of Flavors, The Impact of Pickles on the Harmony of Sandwich Ingredients 4. Cultural Significance Sandwiches in different cultures, traditional versus modern variations. How pickles alter the traditional recipes and cultural identity of sandwiches. The idea of authenticity in culinary practices. 5. Consumer preferences. Surveys and studies on sandwich preferences. Common complaints and praises regarding pickles in sandwiches. Case studies of popular sandwiches with and without pickles. 6. Nutritional Impact Nutritional value of pickles compared to other common sandwich ingredients. The health implications of consuming pickles regularly. Alternative ingredients that provide similar benefits without drawbacks. 7. Psychological and Sensory Analysis The Psychological Impact of Unexpected Flavors in Food Sensory Evaluation how the presence of pickles affects the overall sensory experience. Consumer expectations and the role of familiarity in food enjoyment. 8. Expert opinions. Chefs and food critics on the inclusion of pickles in sandwiches. Culinary expert suggestions for improving sandwich recipes without pickles. Comparative analysis of expert-reviewed sandwiches. 9. Alternative approaches. Creative Sandwich Recipes Without Pickles 
substitutes for pickles that enhance the sandwich experience. Fusion cuisines and the integration of new ingredients. 10. Conclusion. Recap of key points discussed. Restating the thesis with reinforced arguments. Final thoughts on the future of sandwiches and the role of pickles. Introduction. The sandwich, a staple of global cuisine, offers endless possibilities for culinary creativity. From the simplest combinations of bread and filling to the most elaborate constructions, sandwiches have become an integral part of daily diets worldwide. Among the many potential ingredients, pickles often find their way into sandwiches, bringing a distinct flavor and crunch. However, their presence is contentious, with many arguing that pickles are a blasphemy in sandwiches. This essay delves into why the inclusion of pickles can detract from the sandwich experience, focusing on their overpowering flavor, texture contrast, and the cultural imposition they represent. Historical Context Origins of Pickles and Sandwiches Pickles, cucumbers preserved in brine or vinegar, have ancient origins. Their use dates back to Mesopotamia around 2400 BCE, where they were prized for their longevity and unique taste. Pickling spread across civilizations, becoming a method to preserve vegetables, especially in regions where fresh produce was not available year-round. The sandwich, on the other hand, traces its roots to 18th-century Europe. Named after John Montague, the fourth Earl of Sandwich, this convenient meal became popular due to its portability and versatility. The combination of bread and filling allowed for endless variations, and the sandwich quickly became a beloved food item across cultures. Pickles in Sandwiches, Historical Acceptance and Rejection Despite their long history, the incorporation of pickles into sandwiches did not become widespread until the 20th century. In America, the rise of deli culture and fast food contributed to the popularity of pickles as a sandwich ingredient. However, traditional sandwich recipes from various cultures often excluded pickles, favoring other vegetables and condiments. Culinary Perspective Overpowering Flavor Pickles possess a sharp, tangy flavor that can easily dominate a dish. In a sandwich, where balance and harmony of ingredients are crucial, the strong taste of pickles can overshadow other flavors. Whether it's the subtle taste of a quality cheese or the delicate flavor of cured meats, pickles tend to mask these nuances, leading to a less satisfying culinary experience. Texture Considerations The crunch of a pickle, while enjoyable on its own, often clashes with the desired texture of a sandwich. A well-constructed sandwich aims to achieve a balanced interplay of textures. The unexpected crunch of a pickle can disrupt this harmony, making the eating experience less cohesive and more jarring. Balance of flavors A successful sandwich relies on a delicate balance of flavors. Ingredients should complement each other, creating a cohesive taste profile. Pickles, with their intense sourness, can throw off this balance. The acidity of pickles often necessitates adjustments in other ingredients, which can complicate the creation of a harmonious sandwich. Cultural significance Traditional versus Modern variations Different cultures have their own traditional sandwiches, each with unique ingredients that reflect local tastes and culinary practices. Introducing pickles into these recipes can alter their cultural identity. For instance, traditional Italian paninis or French baguette sandwiches often emphasize fresh, high-quality ingredients. Adding pickles to these can be seen as an imposition of foreign tastes, disrupting the authenticity of these classic sandwiches. Authenticity in Culinary Practices Authenticity is a cherished value in culinary traditions. Many argue that the inclusion of pickles in certain sandwiches is inauthentic, a deviation from traditional recipes. This perspective holds that maintaining the original integrity of a dish is crucial to preserving cultural heritage and culinary history. Consumer Preferences Surveys and Studies Various surveys and studies revealed mixed opinions on pickles in sandwiches. While some appreciate the tangy contrast pickles provide, others find them overpowering and unnecessary. Preferences often vary by region, age, and cultural background, indicating that the acceptance of pickles in sandwiches is far from universal. Common Complaints and Praises Common complaints about pickles in sandwiches include their overpowering flavor, disruptive texture, and the way they can make the bread soggy. On the other hand, 
Some praise the freshness and acidity pickles bring, arguing that they can elevate the overall flavor profile of a sandwich. Case Studies of Popular Sandwiches Examining popular sandwiches both with and without pickles provides insights into consumer preferences. Classic sandwiches like the Reuben or the Cuban often feature pickles as a key ingredient, while other beloved sandwiches, such as the BLT or the Club Sandwich, typically do not include pickles, highlighting the divisive nature of this ingredient. Nutritional Impact Nutritional Value of Pickles Pickles offer certain nutritional benefits, such as being low in calories and containing vitamins and minerals from the cucumbers. However, they are also high in sodium, which can be a concern for those monitoring their salt intake. Health Implications Regular consumption of pickles can contribute to high sodium intake, potentially leading to health issues like hypertension. For individuals looking to maintain a balanced diet, the high sodium content of pickles can be a drawback. Alternative Ingredients There are many other ingredients that can provide similar benefits to pickles without the associated drawbacks. Fresh vegetables, such as lettuce or tomatoes, offer crunch and freshness without overpowering the other flavors in a sandwich. Psychological and Sensory Analysis Psychological Impact The unexpected presence of pickles in a sandwich can lead to a negative psychological response, especially for those who dislike their flavor. Food enjoyment is closely tied to expectation, and an unwelcome ingredient can diminish the overall experience. Sensory Evaluation A sensory evaluation of sandwiches with and without pickles reveals that many people find the presence of pickles alters the overall sensory experience, often in ways they do not appreciate. The strong flavor and crunch of pickles can dominate the taste and texture profile, overshadowing other ingredients. Consumer Expectations Consumers often have specific expectations when it comes to their food. For many, a sandwich is expected to have a certain balance of flavors and textures. The inclusion of pickles can violate these expectations, leading to dissatisfaction. Expert Opinions Chefs and Food Critics Many chefs and food critics have weighed in on the use of pickles in sandwiches. Some appreciate the contrast they provide, while others believe that pickles can easily overpower other ingredients. Overall, the consensus is that the use of pickles should be carefully considered and not included by default. Culinary Expert Suggestions Culinary experts suggest that instead of defaulting to pickles, sandwich makers should experiment with other ingredients that complement the overall flavor profile. Fresh herbs, roasted vegetables, and various spreads can enhance a sandwich without overpowering it. Comparative Analysis Comparing expert-reviewed sandwiches with and without pickles highlights the divisive nature of this ingredient. While some sandwiches benefit from the inclusion of pickles, others are best enjoyed without them, emphasizing the importance of context and careful ingredient selection. Alternative Approaches Creative Sandwich Recipes Exploring creative sandwich recipes that exclude pickles can lead to new and exciting flavor combinations. By focusing on fresh, high-quality ingredients, it's possible to create delicious sandwiches that satisfy without the need for pickles. Substitutes for pickles There are many potential substitutes for pickles that can provide similar benefits. For instance, pickled onions offer a milder flavor and can add a pleasant crunch without overpowering the sandwich. Fresh vegetables and herbs can also enhance the flavor profile without the intense sourness of pickles. Fusion Cuisines Fusion cuisines offer an opportunity to experiment with new ingredients and combinations. Continuing to explore various cultural influences, sandwich creators can innovate and introduce flavors that appeal to a broader range of palates without relying on the polarizing taste of pickles. Historical Context Origins of Pickles and Their Role in Culinary Traditions Pickles have a storied history that dates back thousands of years. The process of pickling cucumbers in brine or vinegar was first developed in ancient Mesopotamia around 2400 BCE. This method of preservation was essential for ensuring a supply of vegetables during times when fresh produce was scarce. Pickles have since become a staple in many cultures, each with its unique variations and flavors. The sandwich, as we know it today, has more recent origins, attributed to John Montague, the fourth Earl of Sandwich, in the 18th century. 
the concept of placing meat and other fillings between slices of bread quickly spread across Europe and beyond, evolving into an essential part of many cuisines. The sandwich's versatility and convenience made it a popular choice for meals on the go. Evolution of Pickles in Sandwiches The incorporation of pickles into sandwiches likely began in the early 20th century, coinciding with the rise of delis and fast food establishments in America. Pickles, often used as a palate cleanser or to add a tangy kick, found a natural home in sandwiches, especially those featuring cured meats and rich cheeses. Over time, the inclusion of pickles became standard in many sandwich recipes, leading to the current debate over their suitability. Culinary Perspective Flavor Dynamics, The Dominance of Pickles One of the main arguments against pickles in sandwiches is their overpowering flavor. Pickles, particularly those made with vinegar, have a sharp, tangy taste that can easily overshadow the more subtle flavors of other ingredients. For example, the delicate taste of a brie cheese or the nuanced spices of a cured meat can be masked by the acidity of pickles, reducing the overall complexity and enjoyment of the sandwich. Texture considerations, disrupting the harmony. Texture is another critical element in sandwich making. A well-crafted sandwich aims to balance different textures crispy, creamy, chewy, and soft to create a pleasing eating experience. The crunch of a pickle can disrupt this balance, particularly if it clashes with the desired texture of other ingredients. For instance, the soft texture of a fresh tomato or the smoothness of an avocado can be compromised by the unexpected crunch of a pickle. Achieving Balance, The Role of Acidity while acidity can enhance a dish by cutting through richness and adding brightness, it must be used judiciously. In many sandwiches, the natural acidity of ingredients like tomatoes, mustard, or certain cheeses is sufficient to provide balance without overwhelming the palate. The addition of pickles, with their intense acidity, can tip the balance, making the sandwich overly sour and less enjoyable. Cultural Significance Sandwiches Across Cultures, Traditional Variations Sandwiches come in myriad forms across different cultures, each with its unique ingredients and preparation methods. Traditional Italian sandwiches, such as the panini, often emphasize high-quality ingredients like cured meats, fresh mozzarella, and sun-dried tomatoes, without the need for pickles. Similarly, French baguette sandwiches focus on the purity of flavors from fresh vegetables, teas, and cheeses. Introducing pickles into these traditional recipes can alter their intended flavor profiles and cultural significance. It raises questions about the authenticity and respect for culinary traditions. While fusion cuisine has its place, maintaining the integrity of classic recipes is also important in preserving cultural heritage. The Authenticity Debate, Modern Adaptations The debate over authenticity in cuisine is ongoing. Some argue that food should evolve and adapt to changing tastes, while others believe in preserving traditional recipes. The inclusion of pickles in sandwiches often falls into this debate. While pickles may add a modern twist, they can also be seen as an unwelcome alteration to time-honored recipes. Consumer Preferences Surveys and Studies – What Do People Really Want? Numerous surveys and studies have sought to understand consumer preferences regarding pickles in sandwiches. Results vary widely, reflecting diverse tastes and cultural backgrounds. While some people enjoy the tangy contrast pickles provide, others find them overpowering or simply unnecessary. These mixed opinions suggest that pickles should not be a default ingredient but rather an optional addition based on individual preferences. Common Complaints, Overpowering and Soggy Common complaints about pickles in sandwiches include their overpowering flavor and the tendency to make the bread soggy. The high moisture content in pickles can seep into the bread, particularly if the sandwich is not consumed immediately, resulting in an unappetizing texture. Additionally, the strong flavor of pickles can dominate the sandwich, making it difficult to appreciate the other ingredients. Popular Sandwiches, With and Without Pickles Examining popular sandwiches both with and without pickles provides insights into consumer preferences. Classic sandwiches like the Reuben and the Cuban often feature pickles as a key ingredient, adding a distinctive tang that complements the other flavors. In contrast, beloved sandwiches such as the BLT, Club Sandwich, and Italian Sub typically do not include pickles, highlighting that many popular recipes thrive without their presence. Nutritional Impact 
Nutritional Value of Pickles, Benefits and Drawbacks Pickles offer certain nutritional benefits, such as being low in calories and containing vitamins and minerals from the cucumbers. They are also a source of probiotics, which can aid in digestion. However, pickles are high in sodium, which can be a concern for those monitoring their salt intake. Consuming pickles regularly can contribute to high sodium levels, potentially leading to health issues such as hypertension. Health Implications, Balancing Benefits and Risks While pickles can be part of a healthy diet in moderation, their high sodium content is a significant drawback. For individuals looking to reduce their sodium intake, the regular inclusion of pickles in sandwiches may not be advisable. Exploring other ingredients that provide similar benefits, such as fresh vegetables or herbs, can offer a healthier alternative without compromising on flavor or texture. Psychological and Sensory Analysis Psychological Impact, Expectation versus Reality The psychological aspect of eating plays a crucial role in food enjoyment. When consumers expect a certain flavor profile and texture in their sandwich, the unexpected presence of pickles can lead to a negative experience. This mismatch between expectation and reality can diminish overall satisfaction, particularly for those who dislike the taste of pickles. Sensory Evaluation, The Overall Experience Sensory evaluations of sandwiches with and without pickles reveal that the presence of pickles significantly alters the overall experience. The strong flavor and crunch of pickles can dominate the taste and texture profile, overshadowing other ingredients. For many, this imbalance detracts from the enjoyment of the sandwich, highlighting the importance of careful ingredient selection. Consumer Expectations, Meeting Diverse Preferences Consumers often have specific expectations when it comes to their food. For many, a sandwich is expected to have a certain balance of flavors and textures. The inclusion of pickles can violate these expectations, leading to dissatisfaction. Offering pickles as an optional ingredient rather than a default component can help meet diverse preferences and enhance overall satisfaction. Expert Opinions Chefs and Food Critics, Diverse Perspectives Many chefs and food critics have weighed in on the use of pickles in sandwiches. Some appreciate the contrast they provide, arguing that pickles can add a refreshing tang that cuts through rich flavors. Others believe that pickles can easily overpower other ingredients, recommending a more restrained approach. Overall, the consensus is that the use of pickles should be carefully considered and tailored to the specific sandwich recipe. Culinary Expert Suggestions, Enhancing Without Overpowering Culinary experts suggest that instead of defaulting to pickles, sandwich makers should experiment with other ingredients that complement the overall flavor profile. Fresh herbs, roasted vegetables, and various spreads can enhance a sandwich without overpowering it. For example, pickled onions offer a milder flavor and can add a pleasant crunch without dominating the other ingredients. Comparative Analysis, Sandwiches Reviewed by Experts Comparing expert-reviewed sandwiches with and without pickles highlights the divisive nature of this ingredient. While some sandwiches benefit from the inclusion of pickles, others are best enjoyed without them, emphasizing the importance of context and careful ingredient selection. Experts agree that the key to a great sandwich lies in achieving a harmonious balance of flavors and textures. Alternative Approaches Creative Sandwich Recipes, Exploring New Combinations Exploring creative sandwich recipes that exclude pickles can lead to new and exciting flavor combinations. By focusing on fresh, high-quality ingredients, it's possible to create delicious sandwiches that satisfy without the need for pickles. For instance, a sandwich featuring roasted vegetables, fresh herbs, and a tangy spread can offer a complex and satisfying flavor profile. Substitutes for Pickles, Innovative Ingredients there are many potential substitutes for pickles that can provide similar benefits. Pickled onions, for example, offer a milder flavor and can add a pleasant crunch without overpowering the sandwich. Fresh vegetables like cucumbers, bell peppers, and radishes can also enhance the flavor profile without the intense sourness of pickles. Experimenting with different ingredients can lead to unique and enjoyable sandwich creations. Fusion cuisines, integrating new flavors. Fusion cuisines offer an opportunity to experiment with new ingredients and combinations. 
By drawing on diverse culinary traditions, sandwich makers can introduce innovative flavors that appeal to a broader range of palates. For example, incorporating elements from Asian cuisine, such as pickled ginger or kimchi, can add a distinctive twist to traditional sandwiches, offering a fresh and exciting alternative to pickles. Conclusion In conclusion, the inclusion of pickles in sandwiches is a topic that elicits strong opinions. While pickles offer a distinctive flavor and texture, their overpowering taste and potential to disrupt the balance of a sandwich make them a contentious ingredient. By exploring historical context, culinary perspectives. My Hero Academia Boku no Hero Academia has garnered immense popularity and acclaim since its debut, often being hailed as peak fiction by fans and critics alike. There are several key reasons why this series stands out as a pinnacle of storytelling in contemporary manga and anime. Here's a comprehensive analysis. 1. Compelling Character Development One of the most praised aspects of My Hero Academia is its rich character development. The protagonist, Izuku Midoriya, starts as a quirkless boy in a world where superpowers quirks are the norm. His journey from a powerless dreamer to a formidable hero in training is deeply inspiring and relatable. The series doesn't just focus on Midoriya but also develops a wide array of characters, each with unique quirks, motivations, and growth arcs. Characters like Katsuki Bakugo, Shoto Todoroki, and Achiko Yurarika undergo significant personal development, making them multidimensional and relatable. 2. Complex Themes and Moral Ambiguity My Hero Academia delves into complex themes such as heroism, morality, and the societal implications of power. The series explores what it means to be a hero, not just in terms of fighting villains, but in everyday actions and ethical decisions. It also tackles the darker sides of hero society, such as discrimination, the pressure of heroism, and the consequences of failure. Characters like Endeavor and Tamira Shigaraki exemplify the moral ambiguity within the narrative, challenging the black and white notion of good versus evil. 3. Innovative World Building the world of My Hero Academia is meticulously crafted, blending elements of a modern society with a unique system of superpowers. The concept of quirks is explored in great depth, with a variety of powers that range from the mundane to the extraordinary. The hero society is well-structured, with professional heroes, hero agencies, and the prestigious U. High school serving as key elements. The series also examines the societal impact of quirks, including the idolization of heroes and the marginalization of those with weaker or villainous quirks. 4. Action-packed and strategic battles The series is renowned for its dynamic and strategic battles, which are not only visually spectacular but also intellectually engaging. Characters must use their quirks creatively and strategically, often working together in team battles. The fights are imbued with emotional stakes, as characters struggle to overcome their limitations and grow stronger. Memorable battles, such as the U. Sports Festival, the fight against Stain, and the various confrontations with the League of Villains, showcase the blend of action and character development. 5. Emotional Resonance My Hero Academia excels in creating emotional moments that resonate deeply with the audience. Midoriya's struggles, All Might's mentorship, the camaraderie among Class 1A, and the personal backstories of characters like Todoroki and Bakugo evoke strong emotional responses. The series balances light-hearted moments with serious, heart-wrenching scenes, creating a roller coaster of emotions that keep viewers and readers invested. 6. Inspirational and Relatable Messages At its core, My Hero Academia is a story about perseverance, hope, and the pursuit of one's dreams. Midoriya's journey from quirkless to hero is a testament to the power of hard work, determination, and the support of mentors and friends. The series encourages viewers to believe in themselves, to help others, and to strive to become the best versions of themselves. These messages are universally relatable and inspiring, contributing to the series' widespread appeal. 7. Stunning Artwork and Animation Kohei Horikashi's artwork in the manga is detailed and expressive, bringing the characters and their world to life with dynamic compositions and intricate designs. The anime adaptation by Studio Bones takes this a step further with fluid animation, vibrant colors, and expertly choreographed action sequences. The quality of the visuals enhances the storytelling, 
making the series a feast for the eyes. 8. Strong Supporting Cast Beyond the main characters, My Hero Academia boasts a diverse and well-developed supporting cast. Heroes like All Might, Eraser Head, and Endeavor, as well as villains like All for One and the League of Villains, add depth and complexity to the narrative. The students of Class 1A and 1B each have distinct personalities and quirks, contributing to the richness of the story. This extensive cast allows for a variety of subplots and interactions, keeping the story engaging and multifaceted. 9. Impact on Pop Culture My Hero Academia has significantly impacted pop culture, both in Japan and internationally. It has inspired a plethora of merchandise, video games, spin-off series, and even stage plays. The series has also influenced other creators and has been referenced in various media. Its themes of heroism and self-improvement resonate with a broad audience, cementing its place as a cultural phenomenon. 10. Continued Evolution and Growth The story of My Hero Academia continues to evolve, with new arcs introducing fresh challenges and deeper exploration of its themes and characters. The narrative growth keeps the series dynamic and unpredictable, maintaining the audience's interest over time. As the story progresses, it explores the consequences of previous events and the characters' evolving relationships, ensuring that the series remains engaging and relevant. Conclusion My Hero Academia stands as peak fiction due to its compelling character development, complex themes, innovative world-building, and emotional resonance. Its ability to blend action, strategy, and heartfelt moments, along with stunning visuals and a strong supporting cast, creates a richly layered narrative that captivates fans. The series' inspirational messages and significant cultural impact further solidify its status as a modern classic. Whether you are a fan of superhero stories, coming-of-age tales, or intricate world-building, My Hero Academia offers something for everyone, making it a standout in the world of manga and anime. Introduction Solo Leveling, a South Korean web novel by Chu Gong that was later adapted into a highly successful webtoon, has taken the world by storm. It follows the story of Sung Jin Woo, an initially weak hunter who, through a unique turn of events, gains the ability to level up infinitely, transforming from the weakest hunter into the world's strongest. This series has captured the imagination of many fans globally, earning it the title of peak fiction. This essay delves into why solo leveling is considered a masterpiece, focusing on its compelling protagonist, innovative leveling system. Dynamic action scenes, rich world building, emotional depth, and overall impact on the genre and its audience. 1. Compelling Protagonist At the heart of solo leveling is its protagonist, Sung Jin Woo, whose journey from being the weakest hunter to the most powerful is both inspiring and gripping. Initially, Jin Wu is portrayed as a character with no exceptional skills or abilities, often mocked and disregarded by his peers. However, his transformation begins when he gains access to a unique system that allows him to level up infinitely. Jin Wu's character development is meticulously crafted. He evolves from a vulnerable and insecure individual into a confident and formidable warrior. This progression is not just physical but also mental and emotional. Jin Wu's determination, resilience, and unwavering commitment to protecting his loved ones make him a relatable and admirable hero. His growth is gradual and believable, making his eventual rise to power all the more satisfying for the audience. 2. Innovative Leveling System One of the most distinctive aspects of solo leveling is its unique leveling system. Unlike traditional RPG systems, where characters have set limits and abilities, Jin Wu's system allows for endless growth. This mechanic is not only innovative but also adds an exciting layer of complexity to the narrative. The system's user interface, with its quests, stats, and rewards, is visually engaging and easy to understand. It also serves as a narrative device, driving the plot forward and providing Jin Wu with continuous challenges and goals. The idea of leveling up in real life resonates with many readers, especially those familiar with RPG games, creating a strong connection with the audience. The constant evolution of Jin Wu's abilities keeps the story dynamic and unpredictable. Each new power-up or skill acquisition brings fresh excitement and anticipation, making the readers eager to see what he will achieve next. 
This mechanic also allows for varied and creative combat scenes, as Jean Wu employs an ever-expanding arsenal of abilities. 3. Dynamic Action Scenes Solo leveling excels in its depiction of action and combat. The series features intense, high-stakes battles that are both visually spectacular and strategically engaging. The fight scenes are meticulously detailed, with fluid motion and impactful visuals that convey the sheer power and skill of the characters. Jean Wu's combat style is dynamic and versatile, thanks to his ability to summon shadow soldiers and use a wide range of skills. This variety ensures that battles never feel repetitive, as Jean Wu constantly adapts his tactics to overcome different foes. The stakes in these battles are always high, with life and death consequences that keep readers on the edge of their seats. The webtoon's artwork plays a crucial role in bringing these action scenes to life. The illustrations are vibrant and detailed, capturing the intensity and emotion of each battle. The use of color and shading enhances the impact of the scenes, making the fights feel even more thrilling and immersive. 4. Rich World Building The world of solo leveling is intricately crafted, blending elements of modern society with a fantastical realm of magic, monsters, and dungeons. This fusion creates a unique and immersive setting that captivates the audience from the start. The existence of dungeons and gates, which connect the real world to dangerous, monster-filled realms, adds a layer of mystery and excitement to the story. The series delves into the complexities of this world, exploring the societal and economic impact of the dungeon system. Hunters, individuals with special abilities who raid these dungeons, are integral to this world's functioning, similar to modern-day professions but with much higher stakes. The hierarchy among hunters and the politics within hunter associations add depth to the narrative, making the world feel lived in and believable. Additionally, the lore and history of the dungeons and the origins of the system that grants Jean Wu his powers are gradually revealed, keeping readers engaged and curious. This careful pacing of world-building information ensures that the audience is never overwhelmed but always eager to learn more about the universe of solo leveling. 5. Emotional Depth Beyond the action and adventure, solo leveling also offers profound emotional depth. Jean Wu's motivations are deeply personal and relatable. His initial drive to become stronger stems from a desire to protect his family, particularly his ill mother and younger sister. This personal stake adds a layer of emotional resonance to his journey, making his victories and struggles all the more impactful. The series also explores themes of sacrifice, loyalty, and the burden of power. Jean Wu's relationship with his shadow soldiers, especially the more sentient ones like Igris and Barou, highlights his growth as a leader and his sense of responsibility towards those under his command. These relationships add a touching, human element to the story, balancing the high-octane action with moments of genuine emotion. The character interactions in solo leveling are well-crafted, with meaningful dialogues and development. Whether it's Jean Wu's bond with his family, his camaraderie with fellow hunters, or his confrontations with antagonists, each interaction is layered with significance and contributes to the overall narrative arc. 6. Impact on the Genre Solo leveling has made a significant impact on the webtoon and manga genres, influencing numerous creators and spawning a wave of similar stories. Its success has helped popularize the dungeon crawling and leveling up subgenres, blending elements of RPG mechanics with traditional storytelling. The series has set a high standard for webtoons in terms of storytelling, character development, and artwork. Its popularity has also contributed to the global recognition of Korean webtoons, helping to expand the audience for these digital comics beyond South Korea. Solo leveling has inspired a multitude of adaptations and merchandise, including light novels, anime adaptations, and mobile games. Its widespread influence is a testament to its quality and the deep connection it has formed with its audience. 7. Engaging Plot Progression The plot progression in solo leveling is expertly paced, keeping readers hooked from start to finish. The story begins with Jean Wu's humble beginnings and gradually escalates as he gains power and uncovers deeper mysteries about the dungeon system and his own abilities. Each arc is well structured, with clear goals and escalating stakes. The narrative is filled with twists and surprises, ensuring that readers are constantly engaged and eager to see what happens next. The blend of personal growth, epic battles, 
and intriguing lore creates a multifaceted plot that appeals to a wide range of readers. The series also effectively balances long-term plot development with episodic adventures. While the overarching story of Jean Wu's rise to power and the mystery of the system unfolds over time, each dungeon raid and battle provides immediate excitement and satisfaction. 8. Strong Antagonists A hero's story is only as compelling as the challenges they face, and solo leveling excels in creating formidable antagonists. The series features a diverse array of villains, from powerful dungeon bosses to rival hunters and shadowy organizations. Each antagonist presents a unique challenge for Jin Wu, pushing him to his limits and driving his growth. The motivations and backgrounds of these antagonists are well developed, adding depth to their characters and making them more than mere obstacles. The series explores their perspectives and histories, creating a more nuanced and layered narrative. This complexity enhances the overall story, making the conflicts more engaging and meaningful. 9. Visual Excellence the visual presentation of solo leveling is a significant factor in its appeal. The webtoon's artwork is top-notch, with highly detailed character designs, dynamic action scenes, and vivid backgrounds. The use of color and shading enhances the mood and atmosphere of each scene, drawing readers into the world of the story. The visual storytelling is also impressive, with clear and impactful panel layouts that convey motion and emotion effectively. The action scenes are particularly well executed, with fluid choreography and powerful visual effects that bring the battles to life. The character designs are distinctive and memorable, with each character having a unique and recognizable appearance. The attention to detail in the artwork adds a level of polish and professionalism that sets solo leveling apart from many other webtoons. 10. Reader Engagement and Community Solo leveling has fostered a passionate and engaged fan community. The series' compelling story and characters have inspired a wealth of fan art, discussions, and theories. The weekly release schedule of the webtoon creates a sense of anticipation and excitement, with fans eagerly awaiting each new chapter. The series has also spawned numerous online communities and forums where fans can discuss the story, share fan creations, and speculate about future plot developments. This level of engagement adds to the overall experience of reading solo leveling, creating a shared journey that enhances the enjoyment of the series. Conclusion Solo leveling stands as peak fiction for a multitude of reasons. Its compelling protagonist, innovative leveling system, dynamic action scenes, rich world-building, emotional depth, and significant impact on the genre and its audience combined to create a truly exceptional story. The series masterfully balances action, emotion, and plot progression, keeping readers hooked from start to finish. Its success and influence have not only set a high standard for webtoons but have also helped to popularize and legitimize the medium on a global scale. Solo leveling is a testament to the power of storytelling and the enduring appeal. Introduction Electrolysis is a fundamental process in chemistry and industry that involves the decomposition of a substance using electrical energy. It plays a crucial role in various applications, such as the production of metals, electroplating, water splitting, and the manufacturing of chemicals. This essay will delve into the mechanisms underlying electrolysis, detailing the principles, reactions, and factors influencing this process. Principles of Electrolysis Basic Concept Electrolysis is the process of using an electric current to drive a non-spontaneous chemical reaction. In an electrolytic cell, electrical energy is converted into chemical energy, allowing substances to decompose into their constituent elements or ions. Components of an electrolytic cell An electrolytic cell consists of several key components. Electrolyte, a substance that conducts electricity by allowing the movement of ions. Electrolytes can be molten salts or aqueous solutions. Electrodes, conductive materials that allow the transfer of electrons. The anode is the electrode where oxidation occurs, and the cathode is the electrode where reduction takes place. Power source, a battery or DC power supply that provides the necessary electrical energy to drive the electrolysis process. Redox reactions. Electrolysis involves redox reduction oxidation reactions. At the anode, oxidation occurs, meaning electrons are lost by the species being oxidized. 
At the cathode, reduction occurs, meaning electrons are gained by the species being reduced. The overall reaction is the sum of the two half reactions occurring at the electrodes. Mechanism of electrolysis Electrolyte dissociation When an electrolyte is dissolved in water or melted, it dissociates into ions. For example, when sodium chloride NaCl is dissolved in water, it dissociates into sodium ions Na and chloride ion Cl. Text Na Cl right arrow text Na text Cl. These ions are free to move within the solution or molten state, enabling the conduction of electricity. Movement of ions. Upon applying an electric current, the positively charged ions cations migrate towards the cathode, while the negatively charged ions anions migrate towards the anode. This movement is driven by the electric field created by the external power source. Electron transfer and redox reactions. At the electrodes, ions undergo redox reactions. Consider the electrolysis of molten sodium chloride. At the cathode reduction, sodium ions gain electrons to form sodium metal. Text na e right arrow text na. At the anode oxidation, chloride ions lose electrons to form chlorine gas. 2 text Cl, right arrow text Cl2 2E. The overall reaction for the electrolysis of molten sodium chloride is 2 text Na Cl right arrow 2 text Na text Cl2. Factors influencing electrolysis. Nature of the electrolyte. The type of electrolyte used significantly affects the products of electrolysis. Different electrolytes dissociate into different ions, which in turn participate in different redox reactions at the electrodes. For example, electrolysis of aqueous sodium chloride brine produces different products compared to molten sodium chloride. Electrode material. The material of the electrodes can influence the efficiency and outcome of the electrolysis process. Inert electrodes, such as platinum or graphite, do not participate in the chemical reactions and only facilitate electron transfer. However, reactive electrodes can participate in the reactions, influencing the overall process. Concentration of the electrolyte The concentration of the electrolyte affects the rate of ion migration and the overall efficiency of the electrolysis process. Higher concentrations typically lead to increased conductivity and faster electrolysis rates. Voltage and current The voltage and current applied to the electrolytic cell determine the energy provided to drive the reactions. Higher voltages can overcome activation energy barriers more effectively, but excessive voltage can lead to unwanted side reactions and energy wastage. Temperature Temperature affects the conductivity of the electrolyte and the kinetics of the reactions. Higher temperatures generally increase the mobility of ions and the reaction rates, but can also increase the rate of side reactions and degradation of the electrodes. Applications of electrolysis Metal production one of the most important industrial applications of electrolysis is the extraction of metals from their ores. For example, aluminum is produced from bauxite or through the Holherol process, which involves the electrolysis of molten aluminum oxide aloe dissolved in cryolite NaLF. The reactions are At the cathode Textal 3-3E right arrow textal At the anode 2 text O2 right arrow text O2-4E the overall reaction is 2 textile 2 text O3 right arrow 4 textile 3 text O2. Electroplating. Electrolysis is used in electroplating to deposit a thin layer of metal onto the surface of an object. This process enhances the appearance, corrosion resistance, and durability of the object. For example, in silver plating, a silver anode and a conductive object cathode are immersed in a solution containing silver ions AG. The reaction at the cathode is text AG E right arrow text AG water splitting electrolysis of water produces hydrogen and oxygen gases which can be used as clean fuels the overall reaction is 2 text H2 text O right arrow 2 text H2 text O2 the half reactions are dot at the cathode 2 text H2 text O2 E right arrow text H2 2 text OH. At the anode. 2 text OH right arrow text O2 2 text H4 E. This process is critical for producing hydrogen for fuel cells and other applications in the hydrogen economy.
Chemical Manufacturing Electrolysis is also employed in the production of various chemicals. For instance, the chloralkali process involves the electrolysis of brine sodium chloride solution to produce chlorine gas, hydrogen gas, and sodium hydroxide. The overall reactions are At the cathode 2 text H2 text O2 E right arrow text H2 2 text OH At the anode 2 text Cl right arrow text Cl2 2 E The products are chlorine gas Cl hydrogen gas H, and sodium hydroxide NaOH. Advanced Concepts in Electrolysis Faraday's Laws of Electrolysis Faraday's laws provide quantitative relationships for electrolysis. First law, the amount of substance produced at each electrode is directly proportional to the quantity of electricity passed through the electrolyte. Second law, the amount of different substances produced by the same quantity of electricity passing through the electrolyte is proportional to their equivalent weights. These laws are expressed mathematically as m frac q.mn.f, where m is the mass of the substance produced, q is the total electric charge passed through the electrolyte, m is the molar mass of the substance. n is the number of electrons involved in the reaction and F is Faraday's constant approximately 96,485 kmol. Overpotential Overpotential is the extra voltage required beyond the theoretical cell potential to drive an electrolytic reaction at a practical rate. It arises due to kinetic barriers such as activation energy, concentration polarization, and ohmic losses. Overpotential can significantly affect the efficiency of electrolytic processes and is a key factor in designing and optimizing electrolytic cells. Electrochemical Cells and Industrial Electrolysis Industrial electrolysis is performed using specially designed electrochemical cells, tailored for high efficiency and large-scale production. These cells often incorporate features such as Membranes, to separate different reactants products and prevent mixing. Electrocatalysts, to reduce overpotential and increase reaction rates. Optimized electrode configurations, to maximize surface area and minimize resistance. Challenges and future directions. Energy efficiency. One of the primary challenges in electrolysis is energy efficiency. Electrolysis processes often require significant electrical energy, which can be costly and environmentally unfriendly if derived from non renewable sources. Improving the energy efficiency of electrolysis involves optimizing cell design, using better electrocatalysts, and integrating renewable energy sources. Material Durability Electrode and membrane materials in electrolytic cells can degrade over time due to harsh operating conditions such as high currents, corrosive electrolytes, and extreme temperatures. Developing more durable materials that can withstand these conditions without significant performance loss is crucial for the long-term viability of electrolysis technologies. Scalability Scaling up electrolysis processes for industrial applications poses engineering and economic challenges. Large-scale systems must maintain high efficiency, reliability, and safety while being cost-effective. Advances in material science, process engineering, and Batteries are essential components of modern technology, powering everything from small electronic devices to large industrial machines. They can be broadly categorized into two types, primary cells and secondary cells. Primary cells are designed for single use and cannot be recharged, while secondary cells are rechargeable and can be used multiple times. This essay explores the mechanisms, advantages, disadvantages, and applications of both primary and secondary cells. Primary cells. Primary cells, also known as primary batteries, are designed to be used until the chemical reactions that generate electrical energy are exhausted. Once discharged, these batteries cannot be recharged and must be disposed of or recycled. Mechanism of primary cells. Primary cells generate electrical energy through redox reduction oxidation reactions, where one substance is oxidized loses electrons and another is reduced gains electrons. The components of a primary cell include the anode negative electrode, cathode positive electrode, electrolyte which allows ion movement, and a separator to prevent direct contact between the anode and cathode. A typical example is the zinc carbon cell, where the chemical reactions are as follows. Dot. At the anode oxidation, 
text ZN right arrow text ZN 22 E. At the cathode reduction. 2 text MNO22 text NH42 E right arrow text MN2 text O32 text NH3 text H2 text O. The overall reaction is. Text ZN2 text MNO22 text NH4 right arrow text ZN2 text MN2 text O32 text NH3 text H2 text O. Types of primary cells. 1. Zinc carbon cells. Dot. Anode, zinc. Cathode, manganese dioxide. Electrolyte, ammonium chloride or zinc chloride. Applications, flashlights, remote controls, toys. 2. Alkaline cells. Anode, zinc. Cathode, manganese dioxide. Electrolyte, potassium hydroxide. Applications, high drain devices like digital cameras, portable audio players. 3. Lithium cells. Anode, lithium. Cathode, various materials like manganese dioxide or iron disulfide. Electrolyte, organic solvents with lithium salts. Applications, long life applications such as watches, calculators, pacemakers. Advantages of primary cells. High energy density. Primary cells typically have a higher energy density than secondary cells, making them suitable for devices requiring long-lasting power. Convenience, they are ready to use and require no maintenance or recharging. Cost-effective, for low-drain devices and infrequent use, primary cells are often more economical. Disadvantages of primary cells Non-rechargeable, once discharged, primary cells cannot be reused, leading to more frequent replacements and environmental waste. Limited lifespan, they are not suitable for high-drain devices over extended periods. Environmental impact, disposal of primary cells can contribute to environmental pollution if not properly recycled. Secondary cells. Secondary cells, or rechargeable batteries, can be recharged and used multiple times. They are designed to undergo many charge and discharge cycles, making them ideal for applications where long-term use and high power are needed. Mechanism of secondary cells Secondary cells operate on the same basic principle of redox reactions as primary cells but are designed to allow the chemical reactions to be reversed during charging. During discharge, the battery converts chemical energy into electrical energy, and during charging, electrical energy is converted back into chemical energy. A common example is the lithium-ion battery, where the chemical reactions are as follows. Dot. During discharge. Textly C6 right arrow Textly Text C6E. Textly CoO2 Textly E right arrow Textly 2 Text CoO2. During charge. Textly Text C6E right arrow Textly C6. Textly 2 Text CoO2 right arrow Textly CoO2 Textly E. Types of secondary cells. 1. Lead acid batteries. Dot. Anode, lead. Cathode, lead dioxide. Electrolyte, sulfuric acid. Applications, automotive batteries, uninterruptible power supplies UPS. 2. Nickel cadmium NICD batteries. Dot. Anode, cadmium. Cathode, nickel oxyhydroxide. Electrolyte, potassium hydroxide. Applications, power tools, medical equipment, aviation. 3. Nickel metal hydride NMH batteries. Dot. Anode, metal hydride. Cathode, nickel oxyhydroxide. Electrolyte, potassium hydroxide. Applications, hybrid vehicles, consumer electronics. 4. Lithium ion batteries. Dot. Anode, graphite. Cathode, lithium cobalt oxide or other lithium compounds. Electrolyte, organic solvents with lithium salts. Applications, smartphones, laptops, electric vehicles. 5. Lithium polymer batteries. Dot. Anode, graphite. Cathode, lithium cobalt oxide or other lithium compounds. Electrolyte, solid polymer electrolyte. Applications, portable electronics, drones. Advantages of secondary cells Rechargeability, they can be recharged many times, making them cost-effective over their lifespan. High power density, 
secondary cells can deliver high current, suitable for power-hungry applications. Sustainability, reduced waste compared to primary cells due to their reusability. Long-term use, ideal for devices that require frequent or continuous use. Disadvantages of secondary cells. Higher initial cost, more expensive upfront compared to primary cells. Limited charge cycles, they have a finite number of charge discharge cycles before capacity diminishes. Complex management, require proper charging and discharging management to maximize lifespan and safety. Safety concerns, some secondary cells, like lithium-ion batteries, can pose safety risks such as overheating, swelling, or even explosion if not managed properly. Applications of primary and secondary cells Primary cells Primary cells are widely used in applications where low power consumption and long shelf life are critical. Examples include Remote controls, alkaline batteries are common due to their long shelf life and sufficient power for infrequent use. Smoke detectors, lithium primary cells are preferred for their long life and reliability. Flashlights Primary cells provide the necessary energy density for extended use without frequent replacements. Secondary cells Secondary cells are essential in applications that require high power, frequent use, and reusability. Examples include Smartphones and laptops, lithium-ion batteries provide high energy density and long-lasting power for portable electronics. Electric vehicles EVs Lithium-ion and NMH batteries are used for their ability to deliver high power and energy efficiency. Power tools, NICD and NIMH batteries are common in power tools due to their high discharge rates and durability. Renewable energy storage, lead acid and lithium-ion batteries are used to store energy from solar panels and wind turbines, providing a stable power supply. Future Trends and Innovations the development of battery technology is a dynamic field with ongoing research aimed at improving performance, safety, and sustainability. Future trends include Solid-state batteries, these batteries use solid electrolytes instead of liquid ones, promising higher energy densities, longer lifespans, and improved safety. Silicon anodes, silicon has a higher capacity than graphite, potentially increasing the energy density of lithium-ion batteries. Recycling and sustainability, advances in recycling technologies are crucial for reducing the environmental impact of both primary and secondary cells. Alternative chemistries, research into new battery chemistries, such as lithium sulfur and sodium ion batteries, aims to overcome the limitations of current technologies. Both primary and secondary cells play vital roles in modern society, each with its own set of advantages and applications. Primary cells are convenient and cost-effective for low-drain and infrequent-use devices, while secondary cells are indispensable for high-power and frequently-used applications due to their reusability and high performance. Understanding the mechanisms and differences between these types of batteries is essential for choosing the right power source for various needs and for driving future innovations in energy storage technology. Chapter 10 The sky over the kingdom of Luminaria darkened as Veldora and Charybdis approached their massive dragon forms casting long shadows over the land. Lightning crackled around Veldora, his storm manipulation stirring the atmosphere into a chaotic frenzy. Charybdis followed close behind, her icy aura creating a chilling contrast to Veldora's tempestuous energy. Ready for some father-daughter bonding? Veldora roared, his voice booming through the clouds. Charybdis nodded a small smile on her face. With a synchronized roar, they descended upon the kingdom. Veldora unleashed a torrent of lightning and wind, tearing through buildings and scattering the inhabitants in terror. Charybdis summoned a blizzard, freezing everything in her path and creating a landscape of ice and snow. Some who were far away thought themselves safe and tried to run but the light ray and scale attack were enough to exterminate the majority of them. The Luminarians tried to mount a defense, but their efforts were futile against the overwhelming power of the two dragons. Soldiers and magicians fell before their might, their attacks deflected by his scales and dissipated by his storms. Charybdis's icy breath froze entire battalions, her claws shattering them like glass. Amid the chaos, Charybdis's keen eyes spotted a strange boy covered in blood standing in the midst of the destruction. Unlike the others, he did not run or cower in fear. Instead, he stood calmly, 
watching the devastation with an inscrutable expression. While she could have just ignored it as him stuck in some sort of mental state too shocked to attack. However his aura indicated otherwise. Intrigued, Charybdis swooped down, her massive form transforming into the one of the Harpy Queen, landing with a thud on the ground. The boy looked up at her, his eyes unflinching even as he faced imminent death. You don't seem afraid, Charybdis observed, her voice a low rumble. The boy shrugged, a faint smile on his lips. Fear is pointless. What will happen, will happen. Charybdis's interest was piqued. There was something unusual about this boy, his demeanor it was too familiar with her own. Deciding he would be a perfect specimen worth further study, she reached out with her clawed hand and gently picked him up, careful not to harm him. You're coming with me, she declared, her tone leaving no room for argument. Covering ribbons of curses around him forming a protective cocoon. As she lifted off into the sky, Veldora noticed her new companion. What's this? A souvenir. He teased, his laughter booming. Charybdis rolled her eyes, though there was a hint of amusement in her gaze. Let's call it. Research. Together, they soared over the ruined kingdom, leaving behind a trail of destruction. Charybdis held the boy securely, curious about his fearless demeanor and what secrets he might hold. Back in their lair, Charybdis placed the boy in a secure chamber, her mind racing with questions. What is your name? She asked. The boy met her gaze calmly. My name is Kai. Well, Kai, Charybdis said, her eyes narrowing thoughtfully, you are now my personal research specimen. Let's see what makes you so special. As she studied Kai, it became clear that his uniqueness went beyond his fearless demeanor. His indifference to death was quite similar to what she had in her childhood, although she later did gain attachments no matter how small. More intriguingly, he had an almost sinless disposition, untainted by the fear and corruption that plagued others. Almost as if he was blessed with such a peculiarity. After meeting Veldora Charybdis had abandoned her previous plans and chose a more rational, albeit longer, path. While her method of infecting thousands and hoping for one or two to survive worked it wasn't really an effective method to build armies. While she didn't really need countless soldiers, she did need enough to laze around and delegate all her work to them. So she had chosen to instead research on ways to more effectively spread her corruption. The bee had just piqued her interest and so luckily he got the fortune of being the first human to volunteer for this esteemed task. Smiling a twisted smile she went back to Veldora who was already getting restless. As Charybdis and Veldora flew side by side through the skies, heading towards Veldora's next target of ire, a question lingered in Charybdis's mind. She turned to her father, her curiosity piqued. Father, she began, her voice clear despite the rush of wind around them, do you have a human form as well? Veldora let out a booming laugh, his voice filled with mirth. No, daughter, I don't. I've never seen the need for one. My draconic form is more than enough to instill fear and command respect. Charybdis smiled, finding her father's straightforwardness both amusing and endearing. I see. I have taken a human form myself. It helps me blend in and interact with others more easily. Haha, <laughs> you're right my sisters skid the same thing, though I must say, I prefer our true forms. There's something liberating about being in our natural state, wouldn't you agree? Charybdis nodded. I do agree, father. But there are times when subtlety and adaptability are necessary. Veldora chuckled. True enough. Speaking of adaptability, tell me about this boy you took as your minion. What makes him so special? Charybdis's eyes sparkled with intrigue. He's an enigma. His fearless demeanor and indifference to death are fascinating, but what truly sets him apart is his almost sinless disposition. It's as if he lacks the darkness that taints most beings. Veldora raised an eyebrow, intrigued. A sinless human, you say? That is indeed unusual hell I Devon question if he really is a human. Charybdis nodded. That's what I intend to find out. He's my personal the boy toy, as I've come to call him, and I'll be studying him closely. Veldora laughed heartily. You have quite the curiosity, daughter. It seems we both have our own unique ways of entertaining ourselves. Chapter 11 Experimentation Log 1 
Subject, Kai Boy Toy. Location, Research Facility within CH Domain. Minion Involved, Harita. Entry 1, Initial Encounter. Description. During an assault on a human nation alongside my father, Veldora, I encountered a peculiar boy. Despite the chaos and imminent death surrounding him, he remained unafraid and indifferent. Intrigued by his unique demeanor, I decided to spare him and brought him back to my domain for further study. Entry 2, Preliminary Observations Description The boy exhibits an unexplainable indifference to death and a seemingly sinless disposition. This makes him an ideal subject for further experiments, as his unique psychological profile could reveal insights into resilience and adaptability under duress. Entry 3, Initial Experiment, Corrupted Water Exposure Objective To observe the boy's reaction to a highly diluted drop of corrupted water. Procedure Administered a very diluted drop of corrupted water to the boy. Monitored his vital signs and physiological responses closely. Observations The boy exhibited severe adverse reactions to the corrupted water, indicating a high sensitivity to its properties. Symptoms included intense pain, fever, magical poisoning, hallucination and initial stage of tumor development. Monologue To prevent his death from magical poisoning, I injected him with a very, very diluted drop of spirit blood. This spirit injection is essentially a collection of very weak spirits, stripped of their elemental properties through a process I call ego distillation. This process rips away the spirit's elemental affinities, leaving behind pure, undiluted essence that can fortify the subject without overwhelming them. Entry 4, Physical Training Regimen Objective To strengthen the boy physically before further exposure to corrupted substances. Procedure Ordered Harita to engage the boy in rigorous physical training. The training included strength, endurance, and combat exercises designed to enhance his physical resilience. Observations The boy's physical condition improved significantly under Harita's training. Despite the harsh regimen, he showed remarkable adaptability and perseverance albeit still needing healing from it and an increased dose of spirit blood. Note Constructed a small house for them to ensure the boy has a stable environment for recovery and continue training. Entry 5, Second Exposure, Controlled Injection of Corrupted Water Mixed with Weak Spirit of Water. Objective. To test the boy's improved resilience against a slightly higher concentration of corrupted water. Procedure. Administered a marginally stronger dose of diluted corrupted water and spirit blood. Continued close monitoring of his physiological responses. The addition of spirit blood mitigated a lot of permanent damage as the boy transitions into being a magen. Observations The boy's reaction was less severe compared to the initial exposure. His body appears to be slowly healing and getting resilient, likely due to the combined effects of physical training and the spirit blood injection. Entry 6, Behavioral Analysis To understand the psychological resilience and unique demeanor of the boy. Conducted a series of psychological evaluations and stress tests to gauge his emotional and mental response to various stimuli. The boy continues to exhibit an unusual indifference to danger and pain. Despite rigorous physical training bordering on torture and exposure to controlled stressors, he shows no signs of fear or emotional distress. This trait, coupled with his sinless disposition, suggests a unique psychological profile that is resistant to typical human responses. Entry 7, Elemental Property Separation Research To separate the elemental properties from weak spirits and store them in a usable form. Experimented with various methods to distill elemental properties from weak spirits and transfer them to different materials. Currently, the most successful method involves transferring these properties to metals. The current method of transferring elemental properties to metals is highly inefficient. While it shows promise, the process requires refinement to increase its efficacy and practicality. Continued research and experimentation are necessary to develop a more efficient method for harnessing and utilizing elemental properties. Conclusion The boy's unique attributes and resilience make him a fascinating subject for ongoing study. The combination of physical training, controlled exposure to corrupted substances, and the fortifying effects of the spirit blood will continue to be explored in subsequent experiments.
It has been one month since Veldora and I attacked the kingdoms together, and this subject has already provided valuable insights. I look forward to the potential discoveries that this unique subject might yield, not without considering any chance at making a weapon too powerful to control. In lieu of this any further experiment with my water will be terminated. Additionally, the research on separating and storing elemental properties is in its early stages but holds significant potential for future advancements. The integration of weak spirits through ego distillation might pave the way for new advancements in my research, furthering my understanding of corruption, resilience, and the untapped potential within seemingly ordinary beings. The inefficiency in transferring elemental properties to metals presents a challenge, but it also opens new avenues for exploration and innovation in my quest for power and knowledge. Experimentation Log 2 Subject, Harita Minion Location, Research Facility within Veldora's Domain Objective, to enhance Harita's abilities and create a unique path of evolution through the ingestion of high-concentration spirit blood, Charybdis's blood, and grafting of special monster cells. Entry 1, Initial Setup Description Harita, my loyal minion, is the subject of a new series of experiments aimed at enhancing her capabilities and exploring new avenues of evolution. The process will involve three main components, ingestion of high-concentration polarized spirit blood fire affinity, ingestion of my own blood, and grafting special cells made from coagulating hundreds of monsters. Entry 2, Ingestion of High-Concentration Polarized Spirit Blood Fire Affinity To imbue Harita with the elemental power of fire and enhance her combat abilities. Administered a controlled dose of high-concentration spirit blood with a fire affinity. Monitored her vital signs and physical responses closely. Harita exhibited immediate signs of internal combustion, but her robust constitution managed to stabilize the reaction. Her body temperature increased significantly to approximately 170 C and she began to exhibit pyrokinetic abilities. Her combat prowess improved, and she displayed an enhanced resistance to heat and fire-based attacks. Exhibited heightened irrationality in fights. Entry 3 Ingestion of Charybdis's Blood To strengthen Harita's connection to me and imbue her with unique abilities related to my domain. Administered a controlled dose of my own blood. Monitored her vital signs and physiological responses closely. Harita's physical and magical attributes showed marked improvement. Her regenerative capabilities skyrocketed, and she developed a partial affinity to curses. The bond between us strengthened, allowing for more efficient communication and coordination in combat scenarios. Entry 4, Grafting of Special Monster Cells to introduce a new cellular structure that packs condensed energy and provides a unique path of evolution, akin to RC cells from the Tokyo Ghoul series. Grafted special cells made from coagulating hundreds of monsters into Harita's body. These cells were made from processing live bodies with high amount of spiritons till the boundary between the soul and body blur making a sort of semi-spiritual cells made from soul and flesh. Designed to store and condense energy, offering enhanced strength and agility and a gateway to Demon Lord Seed. The grafting process was initially met with resistance from Harita's body, but she gradually adapted. The special cells integrated successfully, resulting in noticeable increases in her physical strength and agility. Harita's combat capabilities improved further, and she exhibited new abilities such as energy manipulation on a smaller scale and biological manipulation. Entry 5 Combined Effects and Initial Results To assess the combined effects of the three experimental procedures on Harita's overall capabilities. Harita now possesses enhanced pyrokinetic abilities, increased physical and magical attributes, and a new cellular structure that provides a steady supply of energy and rapid regeneration. Her combat prowess has significantly improved, and she has developed unique abilities uncommon to her tree of evolution. Conclusion the experiments on Harita have yielded satisfying results. The ingestion of high-concentration spirit blood fire affinity in my own blood, combined with the grafting of special monster cells, have created a unique path of evolution for her. Harita's new abilities and enhanced attributes make her a formidable asset in combat and further solidify her loyalty and connection to me. Continued monitoring and refinement of the procedures will be necessary to ensure stability and maximize her potential.
The creation of the special RC cells provides new evolutionary paths usable for even furthering my corruptive power and growth tree. Although for such cells to have any effect on me you'll need to gather a lot of high-level monsters. But there is no need to be hasty after all if anything the past few days have taught me that time is on my side. Chapter 12 After months of shared destruction and chaotic exploits, Charybdis knew it was time to part ways with Veldora. Their attacks on various kingdoms had become a twisted form of bonding, but she had other ambitions to pursue. The decision came one evening as she stood on a cliff overlooking the forest, the wind whipping through her draconic form. Veldora, in his usual awkward but friendly manner, joined her. So, what's next for you? Veldora asked, his voice booming despite the casual tone. Charybdis turned to him, her eyes reflecting a MX of mischief and contemplation. I've decided to visit the kingdom of Nazca. It's time I met my cousin, Melim. Veldora's laughter echoed through the forest. Melim, huh? That should be interesting. I don't know much about her. Charybdis nodded, a small smile playing on her lips. I'm sure she will be interesting to meet. She paused, plus I don't think she has anyone familiar looking after her right now and I count as family so I kind of qualify for the close relation status. Veldora's expression softened slightly. Well, it's been fun. You're not bad for a daughter. He said in a rare moment of sincerity in his voice. Charybdis chuckled. And you're not bad for a father. But don't think this is goodbye. We'll meet again, and next time, maybe we can cause even more chaos together. With that, Charybdis spread her wings and took to the sky, leaving Veldora's domain behind. She flew without her minion to the kingdom of Nazca and her cousin Malim her next destination. The time spent with Veldora had been valuable, her myopic view has been altered ever since spending some time with him. So to test that she decided to meet another member of her family. As Charybdis flew towards the kingdom of Nazca, her thoughts wandered to the story Veldora had shared about Malim Nava. She had learned much about her powerful niece from Veldora, who spoke of Malim with a mixture of pride and uncertainty. Malim Nava, Veldora had begun one evening as they rested on a mountaintop, is the daughter of my brother, Veldanava, and Lucia, a human. Veldanava, the creator of our world, he fell in love with a mortal, and from that union, Malim was born. Charybdis had listened intently, intrigued by the power dynamics of such a relationship. Veldora continued, his tone unusually somber. Malim inherited great power from Veldanava, but her early life has been filled with hardship. Recently, a tragedy struck all of us. Veldanava and Lucia died, leaving Malim alone in the world. She could almost see the scenes Veldora described the young Malim, heartbroken by the loss of her parents. Malim has been raised as a princess by the kingdom of Nazca, Veldora explained. Lucia's brother, Rudra, was the one who decided to keep looking after her. I don't know her current condition or how she's been coping, but that's where she is now. Charybdis felt a very small pang of empathy for Malim, not because of some sort of understanding but rather the fact that they both had been victims of circumstances. Just as the small pang came it was shredded by her own skill, she didn't need such useless emotions. As she neared the borders of Nazca, she wondered what kind of reception she would receive from Malim. Would her cousin, still reeling from recent events, accept her presence and guidance? As Charybdis headed toward the kingdom, she prepared herself to meet Malim. As she neared the kingdom, she was suddenly attacked by the army poised for battle, led by one of Rudra ul Nazca's generals. Arrows whizzed through the air, clashing against her magic resistant scales, and soldiers standing on guard, their faces hardened with determination. Despite the surprise assault, Charybdis remained calm, as it did nothing to her. Halt! State your purpose here! The general's voice thundered over the chaos of battle, as he saw the obvious signs of intelligence. Charybdis, sensing the hostility in the readiness to attack, landed gracefully amidst the swirling dust of the battlefield. She began to shift from her draconic form to her human form, her transformation causing gasps and murmurs among the soldiers. I am Charybdis, she announced loudly, her voice cutting through the tension. Daughter of Veldora, the Storm Dragon. I have come to meet my cousin, Malim Nava, who resides in this kingdom. My purpose is peaceful. I wish to do no harm. 
The soldiers hesitated, their weapons still trained on her, uncertainty flickering in their eyes. The general, his grip tight on his sword, spoke again, his voice strained with distrust. And why should we believe you? How do we know you speak the truth? Before Charybdis could respond, a powerful presence made itself known. Velgrind, the scorched dragon and another of the true dragons, descended from the sky with a thunderous roar, her aura radiating heat and authority. She landed between Charybdis and the soldiers, her eyes narrowing as she surveyed the scene. Hold your weapons, Velgrind commanded, her voice brooking no argument. She turned to Charybdis, her gaze piercing. Explain yourself. Charybdis bowed her head slightly in respect. I am indeed Veldora's daughter. I have come to meet Malim, I have no intention of causing harm. I only wish to offer her my support in these troubling times. Velgrind considered her words carefully, then nodded slowly, feeling her presence similar to her idiot brother. Very well. I will vouch for you, Charybdis. But know this, any sign of destruction like my brother and I'll burn your soul. The soldiers, uncertain but seeing Velgrind's stance on the matter, reluctantly lowered their weapons. As they conversed, the soldiers began to realize that the previous statement about their princess being the daughter of a dragon. The surprise spread among the soldiers like wildfire, murmurs and whispers filling the air. The general, who had accompanied them, exchanged a quick glance with Velgrind, both realizing the implications of Malim being the daughter of Veldanava. Velgrind stepped forward, her presence commanding attention. Malim Nava, she began, addressing the gathered soldiers, is indeed the daughter of Veldanava. Charybdis, as she claims, is related to Veldora. Their presence here is not a threat. The soldiers, though still wary, look to their general for guidance. After a moment's consideration, he nodded solemnly confused about the state of affairs internally, acknowledging Velgrind. Very well, the general declared, addressing his troops. Stand down. Let them pass. The general stepped back, allowing Charybdis to pass. Thank you, Velgrind. Charybdis said, her voice sincere. Velgrind only nodded with a smug smile. With Velgrind at her side, Charybdis was led into the heart of the kingdom, where she hoped to find Malim and learn more about her. As they walked through the bustling streets of Nazca, Velgrind kept a watchful eye, ensuring Charybdis' face showed no signs of sudden bouts of destruction like her idiot brother. Chapter 13 As Charybdis and Velgrind approached the palace grounds, they spotted Malim, with an energetic demeanor, playing with a small dragon-like creature by her side. Malim looked up curiously as they approached, her eyes wide with curiosity. Velgrind gently nudged Charybdis forward. Go on, introduce yourself. Charybdis took a deep breath and stepped forward, kneeling down to Malim's level. Hello, Malim. My name is Charybdis. I'm your cousin. Malim's eyes sparkled with excitement, instead of a bout of anger like Charybdis expected or some other probable reactions for being too late or something along the line. Cousin. Really? I didn't know I had a cousin. This is awesome. Charybdis smiled warmly. Yes, really. I'm Veldora's daughter, and I heard about you from him and wanted to come meet you. Malim's face lit up with joy. Veldora's daughter. That's so cool. This is Gaia. She said not giving it much thought likely due to the low attention span as a kid, pointing to the small dragon-like creature beside her. He's my best friend. Charybdis extended a hand to Gaia. Hello, Gaia. It's nice to meet you. Gaia sniffed her hand and gave a small, approving growl instead of the normal reaction of aversion all creatures give me when I expose a bit of my presence, a byproduct of my draconic ability. Malim beamed. He likes you. Charybdis chuckled softly. I'm glad. I wanted to come see you, Malim, to get to know you better. I heard a lot about you from father. Malim puffed her small chest with a smug smile as she felt proud for being famous. Charybdis smiled, but the conversation soon began to lag, the contrast between her excitement and my monotonic demeanor giving way to an awkward silence. After a few moments, Charybdis decided to break the tension. Malim, she began, have you ever explored outside the kingdom? Malim shook her head, her eyes widening again. No, 
I haven't. I've always wanted to, though. There's so much out there to see. Charybdis grinned, her eyes twinkling with a hint of mischief, thinking up ways to use this time to study her own self without the prying eyes. How about we go on a little trip? Just the two of you and Gaia, of course. We can explore the lands beyond the kingdom and have some fun. Meline's face lit up with excitement. Really? That sounds amazing. Can we go right now? Before Charybdis could respond, Belgrind stepped in, her expression stern. Absolutely not, she said firmly. Meline, you know it's not safe outside the kingdom right now. There are too many dangers, and I can't allow you to leave the safety of the palace grounds. Velgrind was right in her own way since nowhere was safe for Malim, who knows what the world will might do to her. It already conspired against Veldanava. Who's to say it won't want to harm Malim? Malim's excitement deflated, and she pouted. But, Velgrind, Charybdis can protect me. And I have Gaia, too. Velgrind shook her head. I'm sorry, Malim. It's too risky. Charybdis, if you want to spend time with Malim, it has to be here, within the kingdom. Her safety is the top priority. Charybdis nodded, understanding the gravity of Velgrind's concern. I understand, Velgrind. We'll stay within the kingdom. Malim, how about we play some games instead? We can make our own adventures right here. Malim's pout quickled turned into a smile. Games. That sounds fun. What kind of games? Charybdis thought for a moment. We could play hide and seek, or maybe we can have a treasure hunt. I bet there are lots of hidden nooks and crannies around the palace grounds. Melim's eyes lit up with excitement. Hide and seek sounds awesome. And a treasure hunt too. Let's do both. Charybdis laughed. All right, let's start with hide and seek. You hide first, and I'll. Charybdis and Malim started their games, their laughter echoing through the palace grounds as they bonded over their shared fun. They were eventually joined by a reluctant Velgrind who was too embarrassed to admit that the childish games were fun for her too. As Charybdis strolled through the tranquil gardens of Rudra ul Nazca's palace alongside Velgrind, memories of the joyful moments with Malim Nava filled her mind. The laughter of her niece echoed warmly, it made her feel strangely content, mingling with strategic considerations assessing Rudra's power and pondering alliances or other ambitions. Beneath it all, a genuine longing stirred within Charybdis a desire to experience the joys of motherhood herself. The sun-drenched courtyard of Rudra ul Nazca's palace set a serene atmosphere as Charybdis and Velgrind approached casually, their demeanor relaxed on the outward. Rudra, known as the strongest hero, greeted them with a welcoming smile. Charybdis greeted Rudra with a nod of respect, her expression warm and curious. Rudra ul Nazca, she greeted casually, it's nice to finally meet you. Rudra returned her nod graciously, his eyes assessing her with interest. Charybdis, he acknowledged warmly, and Velgrind, good to see you both. Velgrind nodded in acknowledgement, her presence lacked she greeted casually as she strode into the room and took a glass of wine in her hand. Charybdis continued, her tone relaxed as she navigated the conversation. I'm here without any big plans, she explained, her thoughts briefly turning to Malim. Just thought it'd be good to chat and see where things go. Rudra listened with a smile, sensing the words to not be complete truth yet not far from it. Sounds good to me, he replied casually, his tone friendly. Always open to meeting new people and seeing how we can help each other out. Charybdis nodded, her skilled politician running in overdrive. Maybe our realms can find ways to support each other. She suggested casually, her voice tinged with genuine interest. For the benefit of our common interests. Rudra regarded her with a thoughtful gaze, sensing Charybdis's relaxed approach to things quite like how Veldanava did, the difference here is that Veldanava really held no ulterior interests. Definitely worth exploring, he agreed casually, his tone open. He was about to continue with more seriousness about the rampage of previous months. When he was interrupted by a groaning Velgrind. Ugh, talk about politics and whatnot when I'm not there, let's grab a drink and chat, I want to know more about my new niece. Sure they both chuckled and agreed. Chapter 14 During the past month, 
Charybdis found herself growing bored of just playing and relaxing. While she cherished the time spent with Melim, her restless nature craved something more challenging. The peaceful surroundings of the Kingdom of Nazca were perfect for honing her magical skills and exploring new areas of magic. Charybdis decided to refine her neglected magic, Wicked Light Ray. She had always been proficient from the get-go, but she wanted to perfect it and explore its potential further. Each day, she practiced in a secluded part of the gardens, pushing her limits and experimenting with new techniques. She also delved into her summon monster ability, researching and practicing summoning different creatures. She aimed to improve her control and the power of the entities she could call forth. Through her efforts, she discovered ways to enhance the summoned monsters, making them stronger and more resilient by mixing her ultimate skills properties with them. On a contrast Charybdis's curiosity about holy magic led her to seek guidance from one of the kingdom's mages, an elderly woman named Leora. Leora was known for her mastery of holy magic and her unwavering faith in a god whose name Charybdis didn't bother to remember. Despite her indifference to the deity, Charybdis was eager to understand the magic itself. One day, after their usual training session, Leora explained, holy magic is not just about purity or righteousness. It stems from devotion, a deep connection to a higher power. Charybdis raised an eyebrow, intrigued. So, it's the devotion that matters, not the holiness of your connection? Leora nodded. Exactly. The strength of your faith and the sincerity of your devotion channel the magic. It's about focusing your will and believing in something greater than yourself. Charybdis practiced the incantations and techniques Leora taught her, slowly becoming more proficient. However, without true devotion, she found it difficult to cast more than the simplest of holy spells. Frustrated but determined, she decided to find something she could genuinely devote herself to. After much thought, Charybdis chose to worship the voice of the world. This mysterious entity was responsible for many aspects of her existence, guiding and influencing her life in subtle but significant ways. It was the only being she could willingly devote herself to. Channeling her devotion to the voice of the world, Charybdis found that her holy magic grew stronger and more controlled. She practiced diligently, and her sheer talent, combined with this newfound focus, allowed her to cast more powerful holy spells. This choice gave her the connection she needed to truly harness holy magic, adding a versatile layer to her already formidable magical abilities. One late afternoon, after a particularly intense practice session, Charybdis noticed Malim watching her with wide, curious eyes. The young girl's enthusiasm was infectious, and Charybdis decided it was time to share her knowledge. Hey, Malim, Charybdis called out, a smile forming on her lips. Want to learn something cool? Malim's eyes lit up, and she bounced over eagerly. Yes, please. What are we going to do? We're going to learn how to perform the light ray, Charybdis explained, kneeling to Malim's level. It's a powerful magic, but I think you can handle it. Ready to give it a try? Malim nodded enthusiastically. I'm ready. Let's do it. Charybdis guided Malim through the steps, her tone gentle but firm. First, you need to gather your magicules. Close your eyes and feel the energy within you. Let it flow through your body. Meline closed her eyes tightly, her small hands clenched at her sides cutely. Charybdis watched as the young girl began to glow faintly, her magicules responding to her call. Good, Meline, Charybdis encouraged. Now, imagine that energy converging in your hands. Picture a beam of light from a star forming, ready to be released. Melim's brow furrowed in concentration as she visualized the beam. Slowly, a faint light began to gather in her palms, growing brighter and hotter with each passing second. But as Melim tried to focus the energy, the light flickered and wavered, then fizzled out completely. Frustration crossed her face as tears gathered in her eyes. It's not working, Charybdis. I can't do it. Charybdis knelt down beside her, placing a reassuring hand on her shoulder. It's okay, Malim life is about failure. She placed a hand on her hand patting her fluffy hair this isn't easy to learn, it takes time, only failure and learning eventually leads to success. Malim took a deep breath, her determination renewed, wiping her gathered tears. She closed her eyes and began gathering her magicules once more. 
The light started to form in her hands again flickering a deep blue different from Charybdis's general colorless or yellow, it flickered more intensely, struggling to maintain its shape. Keep focusing, Charybdis coached noting the anomaly silently. Don't let your frustration get the better of you. Control the energy, don't let it control you. Meline gritted her teeth, her small body trembling with the effort. The light flickered again, then steadied as she fought to maintain her concentration. Finally, with a burst of determination, she thrust her hands forward. A beam of bright light shot out from her palms, cutting through the air AR an angle and illuminating the sky as the beam exploded into tiny glowing jewels of magicules. It wasn't as powerful as Charybdis's wicked light ray, but it was a promising start. Melim's face lit up with delight. I did it, Charybdis. I did it. Charybdis smiled, pride swelling in her chest. You did great, Melim. With practice, you'll get even better. Melim beamed up at her cousin, her eyes shining with admiration. Thank you for teaching me, Charybdis. You're the best. Charybdis stood and ruffled Melim's hair affectionately. You're welcome, Melim. Remember, magic is about control and practice. Keep working on it, and you'll become even stronger. Pausing a bit she continued, it's the same for everything in life, you are a special kid Melim, don't let your mind get the better of you. As she said that Melim could only nod with a blank look on her face while tilting her head cutely like an airhead. Seeing this Charybdis chuckled and ruffled her hair once more causing an annoyed grunt from Melim. As they walked back towards the palace, Charybdis couldn't help but feel a deep sense of satisfaction. Teaching Melim had been rewarding, and the bond they shared was growing stronger with each passing day. The idea of nurturing and guiding a child of her own someday seemed more appealing than ever. The month had been incredibly productive, and Charybdis felt more powerful and confident in her abilities than ever before. Yet, amidst all her progress, the genuine longing for a child of her own remained, a dream she hoped to fulfill in the future. Chapter 15 After two months in the kingdom of Nazca, Charybdis decided it was time to move on. The time spent honing her skills, exploring new magic, and bonding with Melim had been deeply fulfilling. But now, she felt the call to return to her own domain and continue her work there. On her last day, Charybdis prepared a special parting gift for Melim. She called the young girl to the palace gardens, where they had spent many hours practicing and playing together. Melim, Charybdis began, her voice soft, I've made something for you. It's a token of our time together and a gift to help you in the future. Melim's eyes sparkled with curiosity despite glistening with tears. What is it, Charybdis? Charybdis smiled and handed her a small box. Open it. Melim eagerly opened the box and gasped. Inside were a set of rings and a delicate crown, all crafted from metals that were byproducts of Charybdis's ego distillation process. These metals were imbued with pure elemental properties. The rings, Charybdis explained, will help you channel elemental properties into your magicules more easily. I know you've struggled with that, so I thought these might help. Melim slipped the rings onto her fingers, feeling the immediate boost in her magical control. These are amazing. Thank you, Charybdis. Charybdis nodded, then pulled out a long, slender object wrapped in cloth. But there's one more gift. She unwrapped the cloth to reveal a simple yet elegant sword. The blade shimmered faintly, reflecting the pure light of its pseudo-dragotite composition. The sword was a product of Charybdis's own blood and generous donations from Velgrind and Veldora, making it a weapon easily in the legend grade. This sword, Charybdis said, handing it to Melim, is made from pseudo-dragotite. Over thousands of years, it will evolve into Star Heart. It has two main properties, resurrection of the sword and soul bond. It doesn't have any inherent properties because I want it to grow with you. Melim took the sword, her eyes wide with awe. It's beautiful. And so powerful. Thank you. Charybdis smiled, a hint of pride in her eyes. It was a group effort, but mostly mine. I wanted it to be perfect for you. It will grow with you, and it will always be by your side. Melim hugged Charybdis tightly. I'll treasure it always. Charybdis hugged her back, feeling a pang of sadness at leaving her behind. And Melim, remember, 
I'm just a summon away if you ever need me and, uh, one more thing, Malim. That crown is special. It's like a little guardian. It'll nibble on your magicules and the surrounding magic to protect you keep it on you at all times. As Malim admired the gifts, Charybdis's thoughts wandered to the crown, the most intricate piece of the set. The crown wasn't just a beautiful adornment it had a unique function. Crafted using her parasitic infiltration skill, the crown would constantly absorb magicules from Malim and the surrounding environment to create a dimension that stored this accumulated magic for one specific use, protection. The crown had ten jewels, each representing a life. Every time Malim faced a fatal situation, the crown would revive her, making her stronger with each rebirth. The rings also had a hidden ability to collect souls within an 18-kilometer radius, adding to Malim's power and offering protection if she sustained life-threatening injuries. Charybdis kept these grim details to herself, only telling Malim that the crown would protect her life. She wanted the young girl to enjoy her gift without worrying about the darker aspects. As they parted, Charybdis felt a deep sense of fulfillment. She had given Malim a part of herself and ensured she had the tools to grow stronger. And like any good politician, she had kept some of the materials for her own research, knowing they would be valuable in her future endeavors. Walking away from the kingdom, Charybdis chuckled to herself. Well, that went better than expected. Maybe I should consider a career in gift-giving. Or at least start charging for it. At least I managed to keep some of those materials from Veldora and Velgrind. They're practically like a dragon's rainy day fund. You never know when you might need some extra powerful elements lying around. It seemed like she was forgetting something so she paused and THWN realized. I forgot about Gaia. In the she could only slum up her shoulders in disappointment as she made such a brainless mistake. With a final wave, Charybdis sighed and flew away from the kingdom of Nazca, her heart a house of lovely memories and embarrassment. As Charybdis exited the kingdom of Nazca, she felt a sudden and overwhelmingly hostile presence. Her senses went on high alert, but before she could fully grasp what was happening, a figure materialized in front of her a man cloaked in darkness, radiating an immense and demonic aura. Without a word, the figure launched an attack. Charybdis having time to react, summoned a multidimensional barrier around her hand catching the claw of her assailant. The clash of their STRGTH sent shockwaves through the air, after the failed attack the man retreated with wings on his back. Who are you? Charybdis demanded, her voice echoing through the battlefield. The figure paused for a moment, his eyes tinged with amusement. Noir, he replied with a small smile, then attacked again with relentless force. Charybdis summoned a legion of monsters, wanting to overwhelm Noir with sheer numbers. The creatures roared and charged, their combined might crashing against Noir's defenses. Noir, however, moved with blinding speed, his efficient magic combat consuming and countering her attacks effortlessly. As they exchanged blows, Charybdis tried to gauge her opponent's reasoning why are you attacking me? She asked, her curiosity piqued. Noir's eyes glinted with amusement as if remembering a fun memory, as he effortlessly cut through the summoned monsters. Humans and monsters alike that survived your onslaught summoned me, he replied, his voice smooth. They asked me to kill you and Veldora. I refused the task of killing Veldora, but you. You're within my capabilities. Charybdis's eyes narrowed. I see. No hard feelings, Moore chuckled. Just a job. And besides, I find you intriguing. Perhaps when you revive, we can have a proper conversation. Determined to test the limits of her basic skills, Charybdis activated her recently acquired holy magic. The sky darkened as a surge of power enveloped her. She unleashed a devastating attack, a concentrated beam of pure holy energy that struck Noir with incredible force. The attack managed to scar Noir's spiritual body, causing him to stagger back. Impressive, Noir admitted, but not enough. The battle raged on, with Charybdis pushing her base abilities to the limit unwilling to use her full strength. Despite her overwhelming strength she wanted to use this encounter as an experiment. However it frustrates her that it just wasn't the type she would like it to be Noir's experience and cunning allowed him to stay one step ahead. He anticipated her moves, countering with precision and exploiting every weakness. Charybdis found herself increasingly intrigued and frustrated by Noir's skill and composure. 
You can't win, Charybdis, Moore said calmly, his voice cutting through the chaos of the battle. You're strong, but strength alone won't decide who will die here. Charybdis smirked, unfazed. We'll see about that, she replied, preparing to unleash her full might. She began to summon the full extent of her ultimate skill ready to end the battle decisively as her form began to distort and ribbons of darkness harboring curses of humanity emerged from her hand. But just as she was about to release her attack, Noir moved with blinding speed. Before Charybdis could react, he landed a fatal blow utilizing the pinnacle of his current abilities. His attack coated with dimensional energy distorting fate on a small level piercing through her defenses and striking her down beyond recovery in a single blow leaving behind only her head. As she lay on the ground, her vision fading, Moore leaned down and put a finger on her lips, preventing her head from uttering anything that might activate some sort of magic from her words. When you revive, let's have a proper conversation. Until then, farewell. Charybdis's thoughts were surprisingly calm as darkness consumed her. She had fought while assuming herself to be invincible although she did have the ability to not die that battle could have been over the moment she encountered Noir. But in her hubris she had chosen to use the opportunity as a lab test. In the end she could only sigh and wait for her to reform. Chapter 16 Charybdis awoke in a temple that was both familiar and disturbingly altered. The realm where she had once been trapped after her initial reincarnation now felt more sinister, the atmosphere heavy with a palpable sense of dread. She pushed herself up, her body aching from the phantom pain of the recent battle with Noir and. The temple that once held an idol had been replaced by a gaping, bottomless pit that seemed to devour light itself. The once blood-red waters now housed the very monstrous entity she made to be the core of her skill a grotesque fusion of squid and crab, resembling an aborted embryo with three unsettling eyes and countless writhing tentacles. It was an abomination, a testament to the unfinished development of her ultimate skill. The realm she stood on was something she was always quite divided on, its current state was a by-product of her sub-skill, Marble Phantasm, Shashvatam Naraka Eternal Hell. Yet it had existed before the skill was even formed, leading her to believe that it was most probably installed within her or had different origin pertaining to her nature of being. Anger and disappointment simmered within her. The battle with Moore replayed in her mind, each misstep, each failed strategy a sting to her pride. She had been so close to unleashing her full might, only to be outmaneuvered and struck down. Her complacency had been her downfall. As she stood, the creature's three eyes locked onto her, a mixture of curiosity and recognition in its gaze. This monstrosity was a part of her power, an extension of her will and potential. Its unborn state mirrored her own incomplete mastery of the skill, a potential not yet fully realized. Charybdis approached the creature, her steps slow and deliberate. The tentacles writhed, responding to her presence. She reached out and gently petted its grotesque head, drawing a series of approving noises across between gurgling and clicking. Despite its horrifying appearance, she felt her soul resonate with it. You're still growing, aren't you? She murmured her voice tinged with frustration. We both are. The creature's response was a low rumbling sound, almost like a purr. Charybdis felt a flicker of satisfaction. This realm, this creature, they were manifestations of her strength and potential. The unfinished state of the skill represented the challenges she had yet to overcome, the power she had yet to fully grasp. She took a deep breath, her mind racing with thoughts of her recent failure and the path ahead. The bottomless pit, the blood water, the monstrous creature each element of this realm was under her control, a testament to her dominion. Yet, she couldn't shake the bitterness of her defeat, the knowledge that she had been outplayed before she could utilize even a fraction of this vast untamable power. As she petted the creature's head one last time, she stepped back, her resolve hardening. Let's get to work, she said, her voice firm despite the anger bubbling beneath the surface. We have a lot to accomplish and we also have the time to accomplish it. The creature's eyes gleamed with understanding, letting out another approving noise. Charybdis smiled grimly. This was her realm, her domain. She would master it, refine her skills, and harness her power to its fullest potential rather than just being haphazard about it and leaving growth to time. The battle with Moir had been a harsh lesson, but it also fueled her determination. She would not be caught off guard ever again. 
As Charybdis's presence faded from Veldora's senses, an overwhelming wave of grief and panic crashed over him. Their bond as daughter-father, was suddenly severed, leaving behind an echoing emptiness that reverberated through his very being. In the heart of Jura Forest, where Veldora resided in his majestic solitude, he felt the abrupt absence like a sharp, stabbing pain. Without a moment's hesitation, fueled by a mix of desperation and determination, he unleashed his full strength. In a mere fifteen seconds, he streaked across the skies, crossing vast distances with unparalleled speed. Simultaneously, Velgrind, sensed the disruption caused by Charybdis's imminent activation of her ultimate skill. Her response was swift as she hastened toward the epicenter of the disturbance, her mind racing with concern and possibilities. Their arrival at the scene was nearly simultaneous, Veldora's usually vibrant and jovial demeanor was overshadowed by a profound anger, his eyes scanning the surroundings with an overflowing rage. It didn't take Velgrind a lot to pace together what might have happened here, the realization instantly caused her mood to sour. For Veldora, it was as if a part of his essence had been torn away. His wings, usually vibrant and full of life, now hung heavy with the weight of grief. Each beat echoed the ache in his heart, rage shimmering in him like a Valdano bubbling. Velgrind, ever the vigilant, cast her gaze over the scene realizing that Veldora might do something the world may never recover from. Don't be rash Veldora. Thus caused him to slowly turn his draconic head towards him his golden eyes turned red from sheer anger. And as they made eye contact his aura exploded, the usual golden aura a contrasting black its potency multiplied by the intense emotion he was feeling. The entirety of the cardinal world shook as Veldora's aura swept every living thing in the world. Not act rash. You say. Veldora said a few words, that came out in a demonic tone. Sweat went down Velgrind's face, for the first time in her life Velgrind felt scared of Veldora and his power, she couldn't understand how this child could cause her fear. While Velgrind was intimidated Veldora roared to the world. Answer me who did this. Almost immediately the spirits whispered to him the culprit of it to avoid getting his wrath. Veldora prepared to fly towards the filthy mongrels that harmed his precious child and destroy all traces of their race itself. But his flight was stopped by a wall of magma that surrounded him. I can't allow you to go Veldora because I know your rampage this time won't end once it starts. Open my way sister he growled out. I refuse came a simple reply tinged with determination. The hard way it is. Muttered Veldora disappointed in his sitter and in the next moment he attacked her with a point-blank thunder breath. Chapter 17 Chapter 18 The atmosphere was tense as Veldora stood at the edge of the fiery barrier. His aura was wild, shaking the very foundations of the world. Velgrind appeared before him, her expression a mix of determination and sorrow. Veldora, calm down. This isn't the way, Velgrind called out, trying to reach her brother through his rage. Calm down. My daughter is gone. How can I calm down? Veldora's voice thundered, his eyes burning with fury. Without another word, Veldora charged at Velgrind in his massive dragon form. His magic aura flared, and his immense power surged forward. Velgrind barely had time to raise her multilayer barrier before his attack collided with it, sending shockwaves through the air. Velgrind countered swiftly with Cardinal Aura, her own power clashing against Veldora's. The ground beneath them cracked and shattered under the sheer force of their confrontation. Burning Embrace Velgrind shouted, releasing a wave of scorching flames. The intense heat radiated outward, but Veldora's magic resistance and dragon body allowed him to endure the attack. Veldora roared and unleashed his breath of storm, a tempest of destructive energy that tore through Velgrind's flames and struck her head on. She gritted her teeth, using space-time continuous attack to retaliate with rapid, precise strikes that seemed to come from every direction. The siblings clashed again and again, their powers lighting up the sky. Veldora's magic manipulation allowed him to deflect and counter Velgrind's scorch magic, while she used spatial domination to keep him at bay. Dimension Fault Velgrind invoked, creating a protective field around herself. Veldora's attacks slammed into it, causing ripples in the very fabric of space. You think that can stop me? Veldora growled, his rage intensifying. He summoned his universal sense to track Velgrind's movements even within her protective barrier. 
Velgrind's eyes narrowed. I didn't want to do this, but you leave me no choice. Cardinal Cage. She trapped Veldora within a sphere of fiery energy, attempting to contain his fury. For a moment, it seemed to work. But Veldora's anger only grew. A new power began to stir within him, born from his intense desire for revenge. He roared, and the cage started to crack. What's happening? Velgrind whispered, eyes wide with shock. Announcement, unique skill punisher has been awakened due to the intense desire for revenge. The cracks in the cage expanded, and with a final, earth-shattering roar, Veldora broke free. His eyes burned with a new intensity as a dark aura surrounded him. No barrier can hold me now, Velgrind. I will avenge Charybdis. Veldora's voice was laced with a chilling resolve. Velgrind steeled herself. I won't let you rampage in this state. She unleashed gravity collapse, aiming to crush him under an immense gravitational force. But Veldora's new power surged, and he shrugged off the attack. His massive dragon form began to shift, forced by the power of Punisher into a grotesque humanoid dragon form. He now stood tall with elongated limbs, a twisted mixture of draconic and humanoid features, an abomination of raw power and vengeance. You think you can stop me? Try it. Veldora's voice was a deep growl, filled with unyielding rage. Dragon Fist Veldora's punch landed with a force that could shatter mountains. Velgrind staggered but quickly retaliated with burning breath, a torrent of searing flames. The fight continued, each sibling pushing the other to their limits. Veldora's punisher skill allowed him to fight on, driven by his need for revenge. His attacks became more brutal and relentless, but Velgrind's resilience and strategic use of her abilities kept her in the fight. Time Warp Velgrind attempted to distort time around Veldora, trying to slow him down. But his new power seemed to adapt, breaking through the temporal distortion. Announcement, Skill Punisher has evolved into a pseudo-ultimate skill, sacrificing parts of Veldora's soul to break time-based restraints. As the announcement echoed in his mind, Veldora's power surged even further. The very air around him crackled with energy, and his form grew more monstrous, a twisted reflection of his desire for vengeance. You're strong, Velgrind. But I won't stop. I can't stop. Veldora's voice was a mix of fury and sorrow. Velgrind's eyes softened for a moment. I understand your pain, brother. But this path leads to nothing but destruction. With that, she summoned her ultimate attack, Thugga, a fusion of her skills Regel, Lord of Charity in Uriel, Lord of Vows, and aimed it at Veldora. The immense energy of the attack threatened to consume everything in its path. Veldora roared once more, his Punisher skill flaring to its fullest, and he charged at the oncoming blast with a determination that seemed unbreakable. The immense energy of Thugga barreled towards Veldora, a manifestation of Velgrind's ultimate power. Veldora roared, his Punisher skill flaring to its fullest, and charged at the oncoming blast with unbreakable determination. As he moved, a sudden shift occurred within him. Punisher sensed an external force attempting to connect, the Lord of Sin, Ngramenu, was trying to send something through. Veldora felt the malevolent presence as the connection began to form. Announcement, Skill Punisher has detected the presence of Lord of Sin, and Gramenu. Attempting to send an influx of curses. Punisher accepted the connection, and an overwhelming surge of curses flooded towards Veldora. The sheer volume and intensity were staggering, a nigh-infinite pool of dark power threatening to consume him. However, Punisher reacted swiftly, erecting floodgates on the soul corridor to control the influx. Realizing the danger, Punisher did not attempt to integrate the curses directly. Instead, it began using the curses as fuel, harnessing their energy to accelerate its evolution. Velgrind's Thugga attack collided with Veldora, but his newfound power, fueled by the curses, allowed him to withstand the brunt of the impact. He roared again, the dark aura around him intensifying, transforming as the curses fed into his evolving skill. Announcement, Skill Punisher is evolving. The energy coursing through Veldora became more controlled, more focused. His form stabilized, becoming even more imposing. The curses no longer threatened to overwhelm him instead, they fueled his transformation. 
Announcement, Skill Punisher has evolved into Ultimate Skill Lord of Vengeance, Alastor. Veldora's eyes glowed with a new, dark intensity. The air around him crackled with the power of vengeance, now amplified to an unimaginable degree. You cannot stop me now, Velgrind. I am the embodiment of vengeance. Veldora's voice echoed with unyielding resolve. Velgrind watched in awe and fear. Veldora, what have you become? I have become what I need to be to avenge Charybdis, Veldora replied, his voice a deep growl filled with sorrow and determination. With newfound power, Veldora unleashed an attack infused with the energy of his Lord of Vengeance skill. Dark tendrils of energy, laced with curses, erupted from his form and surged toward Velgrind. Velgrind responded with parallel existence, creating multiple copies of herself to evade the attack. She activated Thought Acceleration to process the rapid series of events, searching for a way to counter Veldora's new power. She summoned her Universal Barrier, reinforcing it with Infinity Prison and Law Manipulation to create an impenetrable defense. The Cursed Tendrils clashed against the barrier, causing ripples in space-time, but Velgrind's defense held strong. Veldora snarled, the power of Alastor pushing him forward. He charged, his dragon fist crackling with cursed energy, and struck Velgrind's barrier with the force of a thousand storms. Velgrind staggered, but she quickly activated cardinal acceleration to boost her speed and power. She retaliated with dimension fault, creating a series of spatial distortions aimed at destabilizing Veldora's form. However, Veldora's Alastor skill allowed him to adapt, his form shifting and morphing to counter the spatial distortions. He roared, summoning an even greater surge of cursed energy, and launched a barrage of attacks. Velgrind knew she had to end this quickly. Summoning all her remaining power, she unleashed Dream Fortress and eight impervious gates, creating a formidable defense and preparing her final strike. Veldora, I will not let you pass. She cried, her voice filled with determination. With a final, desperate effort, Velgrind summoned Thugga once more, pouring every ounce of her power into the attack. The air around them crackled with energy as the ultimate blast of fiery energy surged toward Veldora. Veldora roared, his Alastor skill flaring to its peak. He met the attack head-on, the cursed energy clashing with the fiery blast in a cataclysmic explosion that shook the very foundations of the world. The cataclysmic explosion from their final attacks sent shockwaves rippling through the kingdom of Nazca. The sheer force of the impact left the ground scorched and shattered, with the sky itself seeming to tear apart from the intensity. As the dust settled, Veldora stood amidst the wreckage, his body nearly destroyed. His massive form was now a mere shadow of its former self, with limbs missing and scales charred and broken. Despite this, his eyes literally burned with flames of pure magicules and unrelenting determination. Velgrind, too, was heavily weakened. Her once radiant form flickered with the strain of the battle. She fell to one knee, gasping for breath, her ultimate skills having drained much of her energy. You. You can't keep this up, Veldora, Velgrind panted, her voice filled with exhaustion and sorrow. Please, stop and for once gain your rationale. But Alastor, Veldora's relentless skill, had no intention of stopping. It sacrificed Veldora's remaining mass, prioritizing movement over healing. His body twisted and contorted, shrinking in size and becoming more agile and streamlined. Instead of restoring his lost limbs and scales, Alastor focused on maintaining what still functioned. Veldora's new form was smaller, a grotesque mixture of charred dragon and humanoid features, his elongated limbs and sinewy muscles designed for speed and efficiency. His dark aura pulsed with the cursed energy of Alastor, driving him forward despite his grievous injuries. I won't stop, Velgrind, Veldora growled, his voice a distorted echo of its former self. I can't stop until Charybdis is avenged. Velgrind watched in horror as her brother's form twisted and adapted, the sheer willpower and vengeance driving him to continue. She knew she had to act quickly, or this battle would lead to both their destructions. Summoning the last of her strength, Velgrind activated parallel existence once more, creating multiple copies of herself to confuse Veldora. She then utilized instant motion to teleport behind him, hoping to catch him off guard. Burning embrace, divine burn Velgrind shouted, releasing another wave of scorching flames. The intense heat engulfed Veldora's new form, 
but his Alaster skill used the curses as a shield, mitigating the damage. Veldora roared and retaliated with a swift, powerful strike from his dragon fist, now enhanced by the cursed energy. The blow shattered one of Velgrind's copies, but she quickly maneuvered away, using space-time connection to create distance. Due to his smaller size, Veldora moved with astonishing speed, his form a blur as he pursued Velgrind. Each strike he delivered was fueled by the endless pool of curses he was provided with, making him a relentless force of destruction. Velgrind, weakened but resolute, activated Universal Barrier and Infinity Prison once more, combining them to create a nearly impenetrable defense. She needed time to think, to find a way to end this without losing her brother forever. Veldora, please. Velgrind's voice was filled with desperation. This isn't you. This isn't what Charybdis would have wanted. But Veldora, driven by the power of Alastor, could not be reasoned with. He charged at the barrier with renewed fury Loka Juggernaut, his attacks becoming more savage and unrelenting. Each strike sent ripples through the barrier, threatening to shatter it. Velgrind knew she had to try one last tactic. She activated thought acceleration and law manipulation, using them to create a precise, calculated strike. Summoning the last vestiges of her power, she prepared to use Thugga one final time, hoping to incapacitate Veldora or kill him. As Veldora's relentless assault continued, Velgrind launched her final attack. The fiery blast of Thugga surged forward, meeting Veldora's cursed energy head-on. The explosion that followed was immense, a blinding light that consumed everything in its path. When the light faded, both siblings lay on the ground, their forms battered and broken. Velgrind, barely conscious, looked at her brother with tears in her eyes. Veldora. I'm sorry I denied you this she whispered, her voice weak. Veldora, his body twisted and nearly destroyed, managed a faint, sorrowful smile. Velgrind. I really hate you with all of my heart. But instead of collapsing, Alastor surged within Veldora, forcing him to move. His body twisted again, becoming smaller sacrificing draconic fighting traits, ignoring the need for healing. He rose, his form slimmer, and adapted to multiple of its previous shortcomings, designed for speed and survival. Goodbye, Velgrind, Veldora said, his voice filled with hate and disappointment. A final burst of cursed energy, Veldora used spatial motion to escape his spectators, his form disappearing. Velgrind watched absolutely destroyed both mentally and physically, tears streaming down her face. Chapter 19 Kingdom of Nazca One hour after the cataclysmic clash of the true dragons. The Grand Hall of the Imperial Palace was unusually quiet. Velgrind, her body wrapped in magical bandages, sat in a high-backed chair. Her normally fierce eyes were clouded with exhaustion and pain. Across from her stood Rudra, his face etched with worry. Velgrind, Rudra began, his voice low and impatient, tell me exactly what happened. After the fight Velgrind had fainted and it took almost an hour of healing to get her to wake up. Velgrind took a deep breath, her thoughts heavy with the recent battle. Veldora. He's lost himself to his rage and vengeance. His ultimate skill, Alastor, has consumed him. I tried to stop him, but he escaped. Rudra's expression darkened further. This is worse than I feared. From what I sensed of Veldora, if he continues on this path, he could cause untold and irreparable destruction. Velgrind nodded, her eyes downcast. I know. I tried to reach him, but his anger. It was overwhelming. He's changed from the old rampaging idiot. Rudra paced the room for some time his mind racing and eventually sighed as he came to a decision. We can't let this information get out. If Meline finds out about what happened Charybdis, she might do something reckless. He turned to a nearby aide, his voice commanding. Effective immediately, all information about Veldora and the recent events is to be classified. No word of this reaches Meline. The aide nodded and hurried off to carry out the orders. Velgrind watched him go, her heart heavy with worry. Do you really think we can keep this from her? Rudra sighed, his eyes meeting hers. We have to try. Malim is powerful, but she's also impulsive. If she acts without thinking, the consequences could be catastrophic. Velgrind leaned back in her chair, her body aching from the battle and the strain of healing. 
Her thoughts were scattered, and she found it hard to focus. What's our next move, Rudra? How do we stop Veldora? Her voice wavered, betraying her fragile state of mind. Rudra's expression hardened. We prepare to put him down, even if it's only temporary. We gather our forces and come up with a plan to neutralize him before he can cause more harm. Velgrind's eyes widened as her body shuddered. But before she could say anything she was interrupted by Rudra. Velgrind, Rudra said. But he's a threat to everyone now. We need to stop him before he destroys everything. This might be the only way to save him from himself. Velgrind looked away, her brother's parting words echoing in her mind. Velgrind, I really hate you from all of my heart. She started to tremble, her voice growing erratic. No. No, I can't accept this. There has to be another way. There has to be. I've already wronged him enough. Rudra grabbed her shoulders, forcing her to meet his gaze. Velgrind. Snap out of it. His voice was stern but filled with concern. I know you're hurting, but you need to focus. We can't afford to lose you to despair. Velgrind blinked, her breath coming in shallow gasps. Slowly, Rudra's words began to pierce through her chaotic thoughts. She steadied herself, though tears streamed down her face. I can't do this, Rudra. I know, Rudra said, his voice softening. But if we don't act, we'll lose everything. We need to stop him, and then we can find a way to placate his anger and make up to him for this. Velgrind took a deep, shuddering breath, trying to gather her strength. All right. But we have to believe there's a way to save him without destroying him. Rudra nodded, seeing the resolve return to her eyes. We will. But first, we need a plan. We need to prevent any further destruction. As they stood in the quiet of the Grand Hall, both knew that the path ahead was synonymous to walking towards potential death. But Rudra couldn't back down from it as a hero of humanity. The Edge of Kingdom of Elves A few days before the death of Charybdis. Melinda stood at the edge of the summoning circle, her heart pounding with anticipation. The air crackled with energy as she chanted the final incantations, her voice joining the chorus of nearly two hundred others. She could feel the power of the fire spirit within her, its warmth a comforting presence as they invoked the forbidden ritual. The summoning of Noir, the primordial black, was supposed to be their apex weapon against those dragons who had wronged us. As the ritual climaxed, shadows twisted and writhed, and the temperature plummeted. Melinda's ecstatic grin faltered as the summoning circle exploded into chaos. Many of her comrades were consumed by the ritual itself, their bodies disintegrating into ash. Melinda's fire spirit flared brightly, protecting her from the worst of the backlash. When the dust settled, less than a third of their original number remained. She panted heavily, her heart pounding with a mix of exhilaration and dread. With Noir finally summoned, Melinda felt a rush of power. She gave the order that would change everything, Noir, we implore you to kill Charybdis and Veldora. Noir turned to her, its gaze cold and indifferent. I won't act against Veldora, Charybdis's doable it intoned, its voice reverberating with an eerie finality. She wished to say something else but its eyes gave her dread down to her soul. In the aftermath of the summoning, Melinda felt a cold dread settle over her, her instincts feeling like she had made a grave mistake. She fled the site, leaving behind the remnants of her group, and sought refuge in a small hut near the eastern coast of the continent. The isolation was her only solace as she tried to make sense of the catastrophic failure. Days turned into weeks, but the haunting fear of retribution kept her on edge. And then the day came she realized that her wish had become a reality. But her ecstasy was hurt lived as the familiar but twisted presence of Veldora made itself known. On that night, as she sat by the flickering fire trying to keep calm from the constant explosion sounds invading her senses making her restless, she felt it a sudden, overwhelming presence that paralyzed her entire being. Cold sweat broke out on her skin, and her heart thudded painfully in her chest. Slowly, she turned around, her eyes wide with terror. Standing there, silhouetted against the moonlight, was a grotesque dragon humanoid abomination. Its body was twisted, a horrifying fusion of dragon and man, but it had no aura. It was as if the air itself recoiled from the abomination. 
Melinda's breath hitched in her throat as she recognized it from the feeling it gave her, Veldora. Before she could react, her legs were erased from existence. The pain was immediate and excruciating, and she tried to scream, but her voice caught in her throat. She clawed at the ground, desperation fueling her need to escape, but Veldora's fury was unrelenting. He moved with a terrible swiftness, his monstrous form looming over her. Each strike was filled with his uncontrollable rage, and Melinda's vision blurred as the agony consumed her. Her thoughts were a jumbled mess of regret and terror. As the life drained from her body, Melinda's last conscious thought was of the fire spirit abandoning her. She realized that the true cost of their ambition was far greater than any of them had anticipated. The darkness they had unleashed was not something they could control or comprehend. Chapter 20 Chapter 21 Chapter 22 The middle parts of the continent lay in ruin, a testament to Veldora's unrelenting wrath. Cities were reduced to rubble, forests burned to ashes, and rivers ran red with the blood of those who had tried to stand in his way. His form ever twisting and adapting, moved with a terribly unquenchable anger. The remnants of his fury had carved a path of destruction that none could escape. Driven by an unquenchable thirst for vengeance, Veldora set his sights on the demon realm. He remembered Noir, the demon who assisted in killing Charybdis, and his anger reignited with a fierce intensity. The journey to the demon realm was a blur of violence and devastation. He punched his way through mountains, tore apart landscapes, and created shockwaves that reverberated across the continent. He could faintly sense Velgrind and her human toy approaching but he paid them no attention. When Veldora's skill that was focusing on adapting to fulfill his goal of reaching the demon realm attained a saturation point he could feel the barrier separating it from the demon realm. It was an invisible wall, a rift in reality, but it could not stop him anymore. He had temporarily shut down his magic to completely focus his existence power in gaining atches to the realm physically. With a roar that shook the cardinal world, Veldora drew back his fist and punched with all his might. The impact cataclysmic in both worlds physical and spiritual. The fabric of reality and space-time tore apart, creating a massive rift. The energy released was so intense that the skies above the continent cracked as if made of glass, and the earth trembled creating earthquakes. A portal to the demon realm yawned open, an unstable, swirling vortex of dimensional energies. Veldora stepped through the rift, the air growing thicker with dark energy and malevolence. He entered this foreign territory, his eyes burning with a singular focus. The realm itself seemed to recoil at his presence its furniture conflicting with his physical presence, its inhabitants shuddering in fear. He could sense that insect and almost instantly with a single jump Veldora tore through the realm and reached him. So, the mighty Veldora has come to seek vengeance. How quaint! Veldora's response was a primal roar that shook the very foundations of the demon realm. He lunged at Noir with a speed that belied his massive form, his claws tearing through the air. Noir raised his hand, dark energy swirling around him as he prepared to counterattack. But Veldora's prowess was unmatched. He struck with physical force so great that it shredded the very fabric of the demon realm. Noir's defenses crumbled under the onslaught. The demon barely had time to register the impact before he was obliterated, his form disintegrating into nothingness. The fight, if it could be called that, ended almost as soon as it began. The fight was observed by many of the other primordials but none dared to interfere. The dark energy that once thrived in the realm dissipated, as Alastor utilized the ever-present magicules to try to adapt to the dimensional energies. That flowed freely from the rift he created. Veldora stood amidst the ruins of the demon realm, his monstrous form heaving with exertion. He had avenged Charybdis, but the rage that had fueled his rampage left him feeling hollow. His eyes scanned the desolate landscape, taking in the devastation he had wrought. With a final, guttural growl, Veldora turned away from the demon realm. The rift he had created still pulsed with chaotic energy, a gaping wound in the fabric of reality. As he stepped back through the rift, the path of destruction in his wake served as a grim reminder of the power of his vengeance. The destruction Veldora wrought was unparalleled, but even the mightiest force of nature could not quell the storm within his heart. After leaving the shattered remnants of the demon realm behind, Veldora flew aimlessly until he found himself over the familiar expanse of the Jura Forest. 
This place, once a sanctuary and home, now felt like a distant memory. Veldora's shirt and wings beat heavily as he descended, seeking solace in a specific location the cave that Charybdis had used as her base when they lived together. He landed with a thunderous impact, his monstrous form casting long shadows in the dim light of the cave. The memories of their time together flooded back, overwhelming him with a mixture of nostalgia and grief. Veldora shifted into a larger, more familiar form albeit still being a humanoid dragon, though his heart remained heavy. He moved to the center of the cave, where traces of Charybdis's presence still lingered. Veldora sat down, his head hanging low. The silence of the cave enveloped him, a stark contrast to the chaos and destruction he had unleashed. Tears began to flow from his eyes, glistening in the dim light. Despite all his power, he realized that his rampage had been a way to run away from his true feelings. The loss of Charybdis had left a void of sorrow and panic that no amount of destruction could fill. His tears fell freely now, each drop a testament to his sorrow and regret. He had sought vengeance, but in the end, it had only deepened his pain. Panic began to set in as the full weight of his loss crashed down on him. He had lost the only person he could consider family once again. The thought of being alone, truly alone, filled him with a dread he hadn't felt in centuries. His breathing grew ragged, and his body trembled uncontrollably. Charybdis. He whispered, his voice cracking. Why did this happen? Why did you have to go? Veldora in his emotionally driven state had yet to notice that the soul corridor was slowly opening up. The cave that had once been a place of warmth and companionship now felt like a tomb, a reminder of what he had lost. Veldora's thoughts raced, struggling to grasp the reality of his situation. The emptiness inside him seemed to grow, threatening to swallow him whole. As the echoes of his mournful roar faded, Veldora curled up on the cold stone floor, his wings wrapping around him like a cocoon. He closed his eyes, trying to find some semblance of peace in the memories of better times. The Jura forest outside continued its serene existence, unaware of the turmoil within the cave. Announcement, Alaster, Lord of Vengeance has shut down vengeance mode to allow for natural healing. A soothing warmth spread through Veldora's body as his natural healing abilities began to activate. The monstrous form that had been twisted and battered by his rage started to mend. Scales regrew, muscles knitted back together to their previous form, and the pain that had been a constant companion slowly began to fade. POV, Charybdis. Pant. Pant. Charybdis panted from exhaustion, her breath coming in ragged gasps as she paused in her training. The marble phantasm, with its grotesque beauty and timeless horror, was her sanctuary. She had been practicing with utmost dedication, pushing herself to her limits. Her body glistened with sweat, the exertion of her efforts evident. I need to keep going, she murmured to herself, her determination unwavering. I can't afford to slack off. She steadied her breathing, taking in the calming ambience of the marble phantasm. The gentle sound of flowing water and the soft rustling of leaves in the ethereal breeze provided a soothing backdrop to her intense training sessions. Focus, Charybdis, she whispered, closing her eyes for a moment to center herself. You're getting stronger. Just a little more. With renewed resolve, she resumed her practice, her movements precise and controlled. She was unaware of the happenings in the outside world, completely immersed in her own journey of improvement. Pant. Pant. Her breath came in rhythmic gasps as she continued, each exertion bringing her closer to her goal. In the marble phantasm, time seemed to lose its meaning. Hours felt like minutes, and Charybdis lost herself in the flow of her training. She paused again, her muscles aching but her spirit undeterred. I wonder how Veldora is doing, she thought aloud, a brief moment of genuine concern crossing her mind. I hope he's okay. Charybdis shook her head, refocusing on her training. He can take care of himself. I need to keep pushing forward. The odd calmness of the marble phantasm was a stark contrast to the turmoil outside. Here, Charybdis found peace in her solitude, her mind clear and her heart determined. As she continued her practice, she remained blissfully unaware of the chaos and grief that had unfolded behest of her death. Chapter 23 Rudra stood in his war room, his expression grim as he pored over the reports detailing Veldora's rampage. 
His frustration was palpable, hands clenched into fists at his sides. Despite his immense power and influence, he had been unable to intervene in time to prevent the catastrophe. We can't let this continue, Rudra muttered, pacing back and forth. Veldora's destruction is spreading like wildfire. Beside him stood Guy Crimson, the Primordial Rouge, and his two subordinates, Blue and Vert. Guy's usual arrogance was tempered by the gravity of the situation. Even the powerful demon lord recognized the necessity of their uneasy alliance. The situation is getting glaringly concerning overtime, and from what I understand it will only continue to get worse as long as his skill is in effect Guy said, his voice low and serious. Veldora's moving almost at the speed of thought. We need to find a way to intercept him. Rudra nodded, the weight of their task heavy on his shoulders. I had counted on Velgrind to help contain him, but her hesitation has cost us dearly. Velgrind's hesitation Velgrind's hesitation had indeed been a significant setback. When Rudra had approached her, hoping to mobilize her to confront Veldora, she had fallen to her knees, trembling and unable to muster the courage to face him. Velgrind, we need to act now. Rudra had urged, his voice filled with urgency. I can't, Velgrind had stammered, her body shaking. His words. His anger. I can't face him. Rudra had watched, helpless, as Velgrind succumbed to her fears. She had been too deeply affected by Veldora's parting words, Velgrind, I really hate you from all of my heart. The weight of those words had crushed her spirit, leaving her paralyzed with guilt and sorrow. Meanwhile, Veldora had been constantly on the move, making it nearly impossible for anyone to intercept him. He had avoided contact with Rudra, Guy and Velzard, keeping ahead of any attempts to confront him. His relentless pursuit of destruction left a trail of devastation in his wake, further complicating any efforts to stop him. Hours turned into days as Rudra and Guy worked tirelessly to track Veldora. Their forces clashed with the remnants of destruction left in his wake, constantly playing catch-up as Veldora moved with a speed and unpredictability that made him a phantom of devastation. Velgrind, despite her initial hesitation, eventually mustered the strength to join the hunt. Her resolve was shaky, but the support of Rudra and the unexpected alliance with Guy helped her find the courage to face her brother. Accompanying Guy were his loyal subordinates, Blue and Vert, both utilizing their influence as primordial demons in their own right to keep track at least of the destruction. Their combined efforts bolstered the hunt, adding layers of strategy and power to their mission. After days of tireless pursuit, they tracked Veldora to the Jura forest. The lush and vibrant forest had been scarred by Veldora's rage, all monsters had gone into deep hiding avoiding the wrath of their god. They found him in a cave that looked inhabited by someone as a home previously. Veldora sat at the entrance of the cave, his head hung low on the ground. His body was battered and bruised, a testament to the toll his rampage had taken on him. Despite his power, he appeared defeated, broken by his own emotions. Rudra, Guy, Blue, and Vert approached cautiously, their combined forces surrounding the area. Velgrind, her heart aching at the sight of her brother's despair, stepped forward. Veldora, she called out softly, her voice trembling. Please, stop this. We don't want to fight you. Veldora looked up, his eyes filled with sorrow. It doesn't matter anymore, he replied, his voice hollow. If you want to kill me, do it. I have nothing left. After that, Veldora fell silent, his expression hollow and unmoving. No matter what was said, he remained unresponsive, his spirit seemingly shattered. Guy, his usual arrogance tempered by the gravity of the situation, remained silent. He understood that no words could reach Veldora in his current state. Rudra tried once more, his tone softer. We can find a way to help you, but you need to stop running and face this together with us. Veldora's eyes flickered with annoyance. I said, it doesn't matter anymore. He looked at them, a mix of anger and despair in his gaze. If you can't understand that, then leave me be. Velgrind stepped closer, tears in her eyes. We'll find a way to make this right. Veldora's frustration boiled over. Enough. He roared. I don't need your pity or your help. With a sudden surge of power, Veldora activated his new unique skill, Dimension Craft. The space around him began to warp and twist. 
In an instant, he created a new dimension, similar to the demon realm, and separated himself from the others. The atmosphere around the cave changed, and a rift in the fabric of space itself appeared. Veldora stepped through the rift, disappearing into the new dimension he had crafted. Meanwhile in Kingdom of Nazca. A very unfortunate event was occurring while the kingdom's forces were occupied with Veldora's confrontation in Jura Forest. In the absence of Malin Gaia her dragon companion was brutally murdered by the spies of Elven Kingdom. Unleashing yet another calamity on the world. Chapter 24 Ultimate Skill, Lord of Vengeance Alaster Lord of Vengeance Alaster embodies the relentless pursuit of retribution and justice, fueled by humanity's countless sins. It manifests as an unstoppable force driven by pure desire for vengeance, transcending mortal limits. Subskills 1. Optimal Path, instantly calculates the most efficient route to achieve vengeance upon gaining new information. This ability ensures every action taken is maximally effective in pursuing justice. 2. Unimpeded Path, grants immunity to obstruction or defeat in the pursuit of revenge. Any opposition faced increases the user's probability of victory by a factor of 30, ensuring success against all odds. 3. Persistence of Rage, sustains an unyielding fury that prevents death or incapacitation from any injury. Even if the user is annihilated, this skill ensures their resurgence, driven solely by the need for vengeance. 4. Curse of Alaster, induces a berserk state of irrational fury when the significance of revenge reaches a critical threshold. Physical prowess multiplies exponentially over time function of ET, with corrupted aura and magical properties that curse adversaries. Main Subskill Path of Vengeance permanently adapts the user to any circumstance or obstacle hindering the pursuit of revenge. Enhances capabilities to overcome challenges and ensures relentless progress towards justice. Chapter 25 Meline Nava, the beloved daughter of the true dragon Veldanava, was shattered by the death of her cherished companion, Gaia. Gaia was more than a simple companion he was her sibling and a precious gift from her father. His death shattered Meline's heart, driving her into a state of uncontrollable rage and insanity. The kingdom responsible for Gaia's death had no idea of the catastrophe they had unleashed. They failed to understand the deep bond between Malim and Gaia and underestimated the fury and power of the heartbroken Malim that they wished to control using fear tactics. Malim's eyes, once full of joy, now burned with a demonic crimson light. As she approached the elven kingdom after eradicating the spies, her power radiated so intensely that the very air seemed to shudder. The elves, unaware of the approaching doom, continued their daily lives, oblivious to the storm about to befall them. Malim stood in the air at the gates of the elven capital, her heart pounding with a mix of grief and rage. Gaia. I will avenge you, she whispered, her voice carrying a promise of utter destruction. She raised her hand, summoning the magic taught to her by Charybdis. The sky darkened as an immense surge of magicules gathered around her. Wicked light ray. She screamed, releasing a blinding beam of destructive light. The beam sliced through the elven capital, obliterating everything in its path. Buildings crumbled to dust, and the earth itself was scorched by the intense attack as if a kinfi slicing through butter. The elven mages and soldiers, caught off guard, had no chance to mount a defense. The once vibrant and beautiful kingdom was reduced to ruins in moments. As Meline continued her rampage, her attacks became increasingly wild and erratic, a reflection of her shattered sanity. Her grief and rage fueled her power, turning her into an unrelenting force of nature. The elves, still unaware of the reason behind her fury, could only watch in horror as their home was decimated. Gaia. I'm sorry I should have been there for you. Melim's voice echoed through the ruins, a haunting cry of a lost and broken heart. In her frenzied state, Melim unleashed another devastating attack. Light ray burned the beam of energy tore through the remaining structures, leaving nothing but smoldering ashes in its wake. The ground shook, and the sky was filled with the acrid scent of destruction. During her rampage, Melim's transformation reached its peak. The immense energy and depth of her emotions triggered her harvest festival, the ritual of becoming a true demon lord. Thousands of souls from the fallen accumulated around her, and she awakened as the Lord of Wrath, Satinal. 
Despite the immense power and the transformation, Malim remained unfazed, continuing her rampage without pause. Her new sub-skill, Magicule Breeder Reactor, went into overdrive, producing vast amounts of magicules. Malim started emitting pure stardust, her presence becoming even more overwhelming and destructive. For nearly an hour, Malim's relentless assault continued, nearly obliterating the entire kingdom. The once majestic elven capital was polluted with intense magicules, the very air thick with destructive energy. The spirit queen Ram Iris, recognizing the threat Malim posed, appeared and attempted to contain her with a powerful barrier. Malim, stop you already have your revenge Ram Iris shouted, her voice echoing through the barrier. However, Ram Iris's containment failed. The sheer force of Malim's power shattered the barrier, and Malim's magical breeder reactor intensified, flooding the area with pure stardust. Seeing that containment was not an option, Ram Iris had no choice but to mitigate the adverse effects of Malim's magicules, trying to protect what little remained of the kingdom. Just when it seemed all hope was lost, Guy Crimson intervened. Recognizing the potential disaster, he arrived to confront Malim head-on. Guy, with his immense strength and experience, engaged Malim in a fierce battle. Malim, this has to stop. Guy shouted, his voice resonating with authority and power. You're going to destroy everything if you don't control yourself. Malim, lost in her rage, responded by instinctively summoning the sword given to her by Charybdis. The weapon materialized in her hand, glowing with a fearsome energy. The clash between Malim and Guy was titanic, each strike sending shockwaves across the ruined landscape. Ram Iris, meanwhile, focused on mitigating the adverse effects of Malim's magicules, using her powers to protect the surviving elves and stabilize the environment. In a desperate attempt to calm Malim, Ram Iris began to absorb the magicules directly from Malim, even though it poisoned her being. Despite the immense pain, Ram Iris continued, knowing it was the only way to reach Malim. As Ram Iris absorbed more and more magicules, she managed to create a small window of clarity for Malim. The haze of rage and grief began to lift, and Malim's attacks slowed. Ram Iris's selfless act began to penetrate Malim's broken heart, reminding her of her true self and the love Gaia had for her. Just as Malim began to regain her senses, a sight appeared before her that stopped her cold. The revived corpse of Gaia emerged, a byproduct of her intense desire during the Harvest Festival. However, the dragon was now nothing but a mindless drone of destruction. Tears streamed down Malim's face as she faced the grotesque parody of her beloved companion. Gaia. No. She whispered, her voice filled with sorrow. With a heavy heart, Malim knew what she had to do. Summoning all her remaining will, she put Gaia down, ending his suffering. Malim sealed Gaia's body in a cave, ensuring that his remains would rest undisturbed. The act of sealing Gaia's body provided Malim with a semblance of closure, though her heart remained heavy with grief. Exhausted and heartbroken, Malim flew away from Ram Iris and the sealed cave, leaving the devastated kingdom behind. Ram Iris weakened and poisoned by the magicules quickly left for the dwelling of spirits as soon as she reached her labyrinth she fell down on the ground writhing in pain as she felt her essence being corrupted. Chapter 26 Ram Iris lay on the cold floor of her labyrinth, writhing in agony. The intense corruption from the magicules she had absorbed from Malim coursed through her being, eroding her essence. Her normally vibrant and mischievous spirit was now a mass of pain and desperation. She clutched her chest, feeling the dark energy gnawing away at her very core. This. This can't be happening, she gasped, tears streaming down her face. I can't let this corruption consume me. Every breath was a struggle, every heartbeat a reminder of the tainted power within her. The labyrinth, usually a place of safety and control, now felt like a prison. Her thoughts raced as she searched for a solution, something, anything, that could save her from this fate. I need a way to stop this, she murmured, her voice barely a whisper. The corruption threatened to twist her into something sinister, something far removed from the spirit queen she was meant to be. In her darkest moment, an idea sparked. She remembered the elemental lords. Perhaps they could help her counteract the corruption. Gathering what little disposable strength she had left, Ram Iris summoned all the elemental lords though only a few responded. Earth, water, fire, wind, light, and darkness. 
One by one, the elemental lords materialized before her, their presences formidable and awe-inspiring. The room filled with an ethereal glow, each elemental lord embodying their respective elements in their purest forms. Ram Iris, Spirit Queen, intoned the elemental lord of earth, its voice deep and resonant. Why have you summoned us all? Ram Iris, still writhing in pain, managed to speak. I need your help. The corruption within me. It's destroying my essence. I need a way to prevent myself from becoming something sinister. The elemental lord of water, with a voice like a flowing stream, spoke next. You have taken on a great burden, Ram Iris. To counteract this corruption, you will need to enter an eternal cycle of distillation and renewal since it appears to be deeply rooted within you. This process will probably span eons, gradually purifying your essence. The elemental lord of fire added, its voice crackling like a roaring flame. This will not be an easy path. The process will be slow, and the pain will be immense. Are you prepared for such a pact? Ram Iris nodded, her resolve unwavering despite her pain. I'll do whatever it takes to protect my essence and remain true to who I am. The elemental lord of wind, with a voice like a gentle breeze, spoke softly, then we shall form a pact. Through this slow, ever-feeding loop of distillation, your spirit shall be preserved, reborn anew over eons to cleanse the corruption that seeks to consume you. The elemental lord of light, its voice shining with purity, said, your essence will be safeguarded. You must trust in the cycle and endure. Finally, the elemental lord of darkness extended a shadowy hand. We will bind our powers to create this loop. Through our combined might, you shall be reborn and renewed. The elemental lords unanimously decided to form a construct linked to their essences and ramrases. This construct was tethered to the souls of every spirit lord and lesser elementals, ensuring absolute control over the process even if only one person survived. This guaranteed that the spirits would not weaken and that the balance of the world would remain intact. The elemental lords regarded Ram Iris with profound respect, recognizing her former status as an elemental lord herself. She had once governed an element now lost to time, an element she had removed from the fabric of reality when she evolved into the spirit queen. Even the knowledge of this element had been erased from the world's inhabitants' mind. The elemental lord of earth spoke with reverence, Ram Iris, you have done what none of us could. You erased your own element to evolve and protect the balance not caring that it destroyed your ultimate skill. We honor your sacrifice and will ensure your essence is preserved. The elemental lord of fire added, your decision was one of the highest forms of duty and selflessness. We will see to it that your spirit remains pure. The elemental lord of light, with a voice full of compassion, said, in creating this construct, we bind our essences with yours. Together, we will sustain the balance and keep the cycle unbroken. As the figures faded, Ram Iris felt the binding force of the pact take hold. The pain began to subside, replaced by a sense of profound peace and hope. She had found a way to protect herself and remain the spirit queen she was meant to be. The process of distillation would be slow, lasting eons, gradually purifying her essence. Her spirit, though still scarred, was now safeguarded against the force that had threatened to corrupt her. The eternal loop of renewal would ensure that the corruption was kept at bay, her essence slowly restored over countless cycles of life and rebirth. As the pact finalized, Ram Iris felt her consciousness fade. The overwhelming magicules that had corrupted her were being drawn out, replaced by the pure essence of the elemental lords. Her body began to dissolve, her spirit undergoing the first stage of the slow distillation process. In her final moments of this life, Ram Iris whispered, Thank you. I will not forget. Her essence was drawn into the construct, her spirit reborn anew. In a flash of light, Ram Iris reappeared in her labyrinth, no longer the spirit queen in her previous form but as a small, childlike pixie. She fluttered her tiny wings, feeling the renewed purity of her essence and the connection to the elemental lords. Over the coming eons, her essence would slowly distill, preserving the true spirit of the queen within her, forever resisting the corruption that once threatened her existence. The elemental lords had ensured that the balance of the world would remain intact, their essences intertwined with hers, protecting her and the world they had sworn to safeguard. I want to eat something sweet, muttered distractedly as if she didn't face an existential threat recently. 
Alas the elemental lords had forgotten to take into consideration the behavior changes that come with the body of a child. Even if it's the spirit queen she wasn't resistant to the carefreeness that comes with being a child. Chapter 27 POV, Charybdis Since my defeat, I have been confined to this place, determined to overcome my previous shortcomings. I have not rested I have been practicing and growing non-stop, pushing the limits of my power. The red blood water in my marble phantasm, which once seemed stagnant, now teemed with life again or what passed for life here. Emerging from the depths was the creature that symbolized the core of my ultimate skill the currently unnamed creature. It has changed. The once amorphous, embryo-like form evolved to a better more defined state. It still resembled a monstrous fusion of a squid and a crab, with three gleaming eyes and countless writhing tentacles. I approached it, placing a hand on its grotesque head. It responded with a series of guttural noises that seemed almost approving. You're growing, I murmured, a mix of pride and determination in my voice. Just like me. The creature's development was slow but steady, a testament to the time I'd spent here. I had been pushing myself relentlessly, practicing my magic, and refining my skills. My ultimate skill, has seen significant improvements in its utilization grounds. I have even delved into the deeper mysteries of holy magic. It had resulted in me gaining a small unique skill, crescent interference. It functioned on the principle of interference and superposition in magic, allowing me to bring out more synergy in my magic spells. It basically buffed my mix attacks with more than one skill or magic used at a time. With each practice session, the creature and I grew stronger. It was still incomplete, but its evolving form was a promise of what was to come. My desire for power was fueled by my memories of Malim and the joy I felt in teaching her alongside the humiliation of death at the hands of someone weaker than me. I wanted to be stronger, not just for myself, but for the future I envisioned. Hang in there, I whispered to the creature. We'll get through this together. As I continued my training, I could feel the threshold of revival approaching. The creature's evolving form was a constant reminder of my potential and my determination. I wasn't done yet. There was still so much to achieve, so much power to harness. Every spell cast, every movement made, was a step closer to revival. The vitality of the dragon blood in my veins pulsed with power, pushing me towards that threshold. I could feel it soon, I would return, stronger than ever before. And when I did, the world would tremble at the might of the new Charybdis. As I cast another spell, a sudden, overwhelming force interrupted my focus. The entire realm seemed to shudder, and I felt a connect Iona powerful, familiar presence. Milim. My vision blurred, and I collapsed, unconscious, alongside the creature. The voice of the world. Milim Nava has ascended to a true demon lord. The harvest festival is complete. Distribution of gift is now beginning. When I awoke, the air around me was charged with a new energy. Malim's presence was everywhere, her ascension as a true demon lord resonating through the very fabric of existence. It was as if the world itself celebrated her transformation and threw a party. I staggered to my feet, feeling an unfamiliar power coursing through me. My body felt different, stronger, and yet more alien. The creature in front of me had also undergone a transformation, its form more defined, and distinct draconic features present. Milim. I whispered, realizing the magnitude of her evolution. My connection to, the entity born from my skill, was now more profound than ever as my desire was to eventually merge with it and completely become the concept it represented. The creature's evolution and my own were aided by Malim's ascension. I felt the voice of the world speak again, not in words but in a deep, resonating truth that filled my being. This was a gift, a reward for my relentless pursuit of power and my close attunement to Ingramenu. The Voice of the World Charybdis has evolved from Dragon Lord to True Evil Dragon Pseudo-Cryptid. True Evil Dragon The term reverberated through me, distinct from the title of True Dragon, which I could never attain. I wasn't born a true dragon, but this new form was a push to my unique path, my strength, and my desires. I looked at my hands, and felt the conceptual difference in my existence. Just to check I shifted to my draconic form. 
my form had shifted from the fusion of a dragon and shark to a more defined draconic form having lines of different colored scales running along my back. A mix of my dark blue, Veldora's black and a mix of dark red from the creature. I was a being reborn, a pseudo-cryptid, embodying the dark and chaotic nature more effectively. The creature in my domain, the embodiment of my marble phantasm, seemed to bow its head in recognition and nudged me playfully with its head seemingly as a sign of it liking the new form. Thank you, Malim, I said softly, acknowledging her unintentional gift. I will honor this power. I turned back to my practice with renewed determination. My new form, my new strength, was not just a boon it was a promise. A promise that I would rise, stronger than ever, and that the world would know the true might of Charybdis. The creature watched as I resumed my training, its presence a constant reminder of the power I now wielded. Together, we would continue to grow, to evolve, and when the time came, we would emerge from Shashvatam Naraka as a force to be reckoned with. Somewhere in heaven. In the deep, oppressive darkness of his ancient prison, Ivarij lay dormant. His senses, dulled by millennia of confinement, suddenly sparked to life. A surge of power pulsed through the air, resonating with an intensity that penetrated even his formidable seals. It was a feeling he had not experienced in eons, the birth of a new kin, similar to him in many ways. His consciousness stirred, honing in on the source of this newfound energy. Though he lacked the means to understand it fully, the raw, chaotic, and undeniably potent power was unmistakable. This presence was not just any creature it was powerful, something of great potential and significance, akin to his own essence. A deep, guttural rumble resonated from within him, a sound that was equal parts acknowledgement and approval. This new being was a testament to the enduring power of their kind. Its emergence marked a significant shift, a disruption in the stagnant order of the world. Ivarich's essence swirled with a mixture of pride and anticipation. He couldn't perceive the specifics of this entity's journey or the trials it had faced, but he felt the magnitude of its transformation. Its rise was a beacon, a sign that the influence of their lineage was far from extinguished. Though he could not express it in words, an unspoken understanding settled within him. This new presence, whatever it was, was a harbinger of change, a signal that the balance of power was shifting. The world, which had long been complacent in its stability, would soon feel the resurgence of their kind. His confinement seemed a little less suffocating in that moment. The presence of a new powerful kin, even one born of different circumstances, brought a sense of validation. The legacy of their lineage persisted, and through this new being, it would continue to grow and evolve. As the sensations faded, leaving only the lingering awareness of his new kin, Ivarich's dormant state felt less like an eternal slumber and more like a temporary repose. Change was on the horizon, and the emergence of this powerful entity was only the beginning. With a final, instinctual pulse of acknowledgement, Ivarich settled back into the depths of his prison. The world outside was shifting, and though he remained bound for now, he knew that the time would come when he, too, would rise again. Until then, he would bide his time, drawing strength from the knowledge that his lineage lived on, stronger and more resilient than ever. Chapter 28 Chapter 29 In the heart of the Jura forest, Malim flew with desperate urgency. She had just emerged from a frenzied rampage in the Elven Kingdom, her mind clouded with sorrow and rage. Now, she was searching for Charybdis, her mentor and friend, hoping against hope to find her alive and well. Her search was relentless, scouring the entire world, her sharp senses probing every corner for even a wisp of Charybdis's presence. But there was nothing. Frustration and fear gnawed at her heart as she continued to search, her movements growing more frantic. She didn't want confirmation of Charybdis's fate she needed to see her, to hold on to. Her and feel the warmth that she craved desperately. As the realization began to sink in, a hollow feeling grew in her chest. Her search had yielded no results. No trace of Charybdis, no sign of her immense power or familiar presence. It was as if she had vanished from existence in this world. Malim's movement slowed, her wings fluttering erratically as she descended to the ground. She landed softly, her legs giving out beneath her. She fell to her knees, her hands gripping the earth as her head bowed low. The enormity of the truth hit her with full force. Is she dead too? Malim whispered, her voice cracking. Not Charybdis. 
not her too. Tears welled up in her eyes, blurring her vision. The fierce determination that had driven her moments ago was replaced by a wave of overwhelming grief. She let out a choked sob, the sound of it raw and unrestrained. She collapsed fully, her body curling into a ball as she cried like a child, tears streaming down her cheeks. Her small frame shook with the intensity of her sorrow, her cries echoing through the forest. Unbeknownst to Malim, Veldora, the mighty dragon who had been watching her from his crafted dimension, sensed her distress. Though they had never met, he recognized the anguish of a kindred spirit. Veldora decided to step out of his dimensional space and approach her. Malim, Veldora called gently, his voice a deep rumble that conveyed both sorrow and understanding. Malim looked up, her tear-streaked face filled with pain. She didn't recognize him but felt the comfort of his presence. Who? Who are you? She asked, her voice barely a whisper. Veldora knelt beside her, his massive form shifting to a smaller size to match the girl, radiating a sense of calm and strength. I am Veldora. I know how much in pain you missed being right now. Malim's sobs grew quieter, but the tears continued to flow. Charybdis. Is she really gone? I can't find her. Her words were filled with heartache. Veldora placed a comforting hand on her shoulder. It's all right to cry. Let it out. She meant a lot to you, and it's okay to grieve. Knowing too well what she must be feeling right now. Meline nodded, unable to speak, and leaned into Veldora's comforting presence. She let the sorrow wash over her, her cries gradually subsiding into soft whimpers. The great dragon remained by her side, offering silent support as she mourned. In that moment, the Jura forest seemed to hold its breath, respecting the depth of Malim's grief. Two weeks since the death of Charybdis. Two weeks had passed since Charybdis's unexpected demise, and Harita's world had turned into a nightmare. The hunger gnawed at her constantly, a relentless, insatiable beast. She could feel the withdrawal symptoms from the RC cell injections clawing at her sanity, threatening to tear her apart from the inside. After Charybdis's death, Harita had left the Jura forest with Kai, the human boy her master had experimented on. They had found temporary refuge in a nearby goblin settlement. For a week, it had seemed like a safe haven, a place where they could regroup and plan their next move. But then the withdrawals hit, and everything changed. The hunger wasn't something she could fight with sheer willpower or physical strength. It was a primal, visceral need that consumed her every thought and action. She had always been strong, but this was different. This hunger was a monstrous force, one that demanded constant feeding and would not be denied. In the beginning, she had tried to manage it, rationing the last of her RC cell injections carefully. But they had run out after the first week, leaving her desperate and driven to extremes. The goblins became the targets of her ravenous hunger. She had no choice but to hunt relentlessly, feeding on the raw flesh of anything that seemed edible in her starved state, anything to keep the hunger at bay. But there was another reason for her desperate actions, Kai. The human boy her master had injected with a very diluted drop of spirit blood to prevent him from dying from magical poisoning. Charybdis had seen something special in him, an unexplainable quality that went beyond his fearless demeanor and almost sinless disposition. Harita knew she had to protect him, to keep her ravenous hunger from turning on him in a moment of weakness. Harita's once proud form had become a feral shadow of its former self. Her eyes, once clear and focused, now burned with a feverish intensity. The process of finding and consuming living beings had become an all-consuming obsession. She moved through the settlement and the surrounding wilderness with an almost predatory grace, each step calculated, each movement precise. As she hunted, a peculiar transformation overtook her. When she fed, a vaporous blood mist formed around her, adding an eerie, almost spectral quality to her presence. Her eyes would turn pitch black, veins glowing with an orange-red hue, her irises burning like embers. This monstrous visage only deepened the terror in her prey, making each hunt a gruesome spectacle of primal ferocity. She tore through the underbrush, her senses heightened to an almost painful degree. The scent of blood and fear was intoxicating, pulling her towards her next meal. She pounced on an unsuspecting goblin child the last one of the village she had recently discovered, her claws sinking into its flesh with brutal efficiency. 
the taste of its blood, warm and metallic like a condiment to its raw flesh different from the older ones, momentarily sated the gnawing hunger, but she knew it wouldn't last. It never did. Each kill provided only a brief respite, a temporary lull in the storm of hunger that raged within her. She had tried to remember the techniques and teachings of Charybdis, to find a way to control the hunger, but it was a losing battle. The more she fed, the more she craved, and the cycle continued, a vicious spiral that seemed to have no end. The forest had become her hunting ground, a place where she could let loose the full extent of her predatory instincts. The once familiar surroundings now felt alien, warped by her relentless need. She could feel the eyes of other creatures upon her, wary and fearful, but they were of no consequence. Only the next meal mattered. In quieter moments, when the hunger was momentarily sated, Harita allowed herself to think of Charybdis. Her master had been a source of purpose and direction, someone who had given her a name, a place, and a path to follow. Now, with Charybdis gone, she felt adrift, her purpose reduced to a singular, all-consuming need for sustenance. She pushed those thoughts away, focusing instead on the immediate present. There was no room for regret or longing in this new reality. Survival was all that mattered, and to survive, she had to feed. She had to keep the hunger in check, to protect Kai from becoming her next victim. Harita moved through the forest with relentless determination, the hunger always lurking just beneath the surface of her icy facade. As she hunted, she couldn't help but wonder if there was a way out of this endless cycle, a way to regain control and find a new purpose. But for now, there was only the hunt, the insatiable hunger that drove her forward, and the knowledge that she must protect Kai at all costs. One day, after a particularly frenzied bout of feeding, Harita found herself overwhelmed by the sheer fulfillment of her hunger. She had fed non-stop, tearing through the forest and almost reaching the Eastern Empire while feeding on human that traveled in caravans. Her body, finally sated, could not handle the strain any longer. She collapsed, driven into unconsciousness by the intensity of her feeding frenzy. It was Kai who found her. He had been hiding, watching her descent into madness with a mixture of curiosity, disgust and concern. When he saw her crumpled form, eyes closed, the vaporous blood mist still lingering around her, he approached cautiously. The sight of her unconscious, so vulnerable despite her monstrous strength, stirred something within him, surprising himself as he never felt much. Kai knew that she had been fighting her own demons, trying to keep the hunger at bay to protect him. He gently shook her, trying to wake her up, his voice soft but insistent. Harita, he called, wake up. You can't let this defeat you before me. Slowly, Harita's eyes fluttered open, the blackness receding as she regained consciousness. She looked at Kai, seeing the worry shrouded in fake anger in his eyes, and for a moment, the hunger seemed a distant memory, Bo because she felt something for the boy. She only felt immense disappointment in herself for allowing such weakness and being unable to fulfill her master's only demand. She vowed to control this power at all costs to fulfill her duty properly. Chapter 30 In the dark, churning waters off the east coast, a convergence of magicule began to manifest. The magicules of the world, drawn by a primal force, started to coalesce with purpose and intensity. The air burned with power as the magicules swirled together, forming a vortex of pure energy that pulsed with an ominous light. This was not a birth, but a reformation Charybdis was returning. The seas around the vortex began to roil violently, waves crashing with unprecedented fury as the magicules took shape. Within moments, a terrifying draconic form emerged from the maelstrom, an embodiment of sins and corruption. The sky darkened, and a palpable sense of dread spread, alerting all nearby to the resurgence of an immense, dangerous presence. However, unlike her first birth, this time Charybdis's consciousness was more attuned, more in control. As soon as her draconic form solidified, she began to reign in the chaotic energy that emanated from her. Her monstrous body started to shift and compress, scales melting into smooth skin, wings retracting, and fierce claws turning into delicate fingers. Within minutes, the terrifying dragon was gone, replaced by a human form Charybdis, reborn and reformed stronger than she had ever been before. Standing on the turbulent surface of the ocean, her human senses quickly attuned to the world around her. The oppressive energy that had leaked uncontrollably moments before was now a potent but stable force. 
suddenly, two figures descended from the sky with blinding speed. Veldora and Malim, their immense power cutting through the atmosphere, landed with an urgency that betrayed their deep concern. As soon as they saw Charybdis standing there, their expressions shifted from anxiety to pure, unrestrained joy. Charybdis. Veldora roared, his voice cracking with a rare mix of relief and overwhelming happiness. Tears welled up in his eyes, a rare sight for the mighty dragon. I thought I had truly lost you all. Malim, unable to contain her emotions, let out a wail that echoed with both joy and sorrow. Charybdis. She screamed, her voice breaking as tears poured down her cheeks. She launched herself at Charybdis, wrapping her in a fierce, almost desperate embrace. I thought I'd never see you again. I missed you so much. I can't believe you're really here. Veldora, joining the embrace verbally after finishing his crying. You have no idea how empty everything felt without you, he choked out. Your return means everything to us. Charybdis, still adjusting to her new form, felt the overwhelming warmth of their emotions wash over her. She began to laugh, a light and joyous sound that rang out over the calming ocean waves. I missed you both so much too, she said, her voice filled with affection and a hint of apology. I'm so sorry for all the sadness I caused. Despite the trials and transformations her life had undergone, the sense of belonging and acceptance from her new family made her feel whole something Ahe never felt before. I really lucked out this life didn't I huh? Nature, having acknowledged her revival, began to calm. The skies cleared, and the seas settled. Though the initial sense of danger had subsided, a new understanding permeated the world, Charybdis had returned, not as an unrestrained force of destruction, but as a powerful controlled foe. With Veldora and Malim by her side, she was ready to face whatever challenges lay ahead. Charybdis stood near the edge of the ocean along with her family seemingly staring into nothing as she shoosed the others, the salty breeze rustling her hair. The waves crashed against the rocky shore, a symphony of nature's relentless power. She glanced at Harita, who stood behind the forestry, trying to maintain a facade of strength and secrecy. But Charybdis could see the strain in her eyes, the subtle tremor in her hands. Harita, Charybdis called, her voice cutting through the roar of the sea. Harita straightened, stepping forward. Yes, master. Charybdis turned to face her, her gaze intense. Drop the act. I know what you're going through. Harita's eyes flickered with defiance and fear. I'm fine, master. I can handle it. Charybdis moved closer, her presence dominating. No, you can't. The withdrawal is tearing you apart. I see it. Harita's shoulders slumped, the truth undeniable. I don't want to appear weak in front of your family. Strength isn't about hiding your struggles, Charybdis said, her tone softer but firm. It's about overcoming them. And I can help you. She extended her arm, veins pulsing with potent blood. Drink. This will satisfy your hunger and calm the turmoil within you. Harita hesitated, but the primal urge gnawing at her was too strong. She latched onto Charybdis's arm, her eyes darkening as she drank deeply. The moment the blood touched her lips, a wave of relief and energy surged through her. Her hunger was sated almost instantly, but she couldn't stop. She continued to drink, consumed by the overwhelming need for more. Charybdis watched her with amusement in her eyes. That's enough, Harita, she said firmly, but Harita didn't seem to hear. The Oni's eyes rolled back as she continued to draw more energy than her body could handle. Finally, her grip loosened, and she collapsed, unconscious, at Charybdis's feet. Charybdis knelt beside her, gently brushing a strand of hair from Harita's face. Rest now, she whispered. We'll find a better way for you to handle this. As she looked up, she saw Veldora and Malim watching from a distance. Veldora's expression was curious and concerned, while Malim's eyes sparkled with interest. She'll be fine, Charybdis assured them. She just needs time to adjust. Malim nodded, stepping closer. You're really something, you know that. Charybdis allowed a small smile. Well you could say that. With that, she lifted Harita effortlessly and carried her on her shoulder. She turned towards Veldora and Malim with a bewitching smile on her face. 
So wanna go home now. Chapter 31 Before Charybdis even materialized in Chaldea, an overwhelming sense of dread spread throughout the facility. Alarms blared, and the staff scrambled to understand the sudden surge of malevolent energy. Servants felt it immediately, a dark, suffocating presence that set them on edge. In the control room, Romani Archamon and Leonardo da Vinci were frantically analyzing the data. What is this? Romani shouted, eyes wide with fear. It's unlike anything we've ever detected before. Da Vinci's usually calm demeanor was replaced with concern. This energy. It feels chaotic, destructive. Everyone, be prepared for anything. The summoning circle in the main chamber glowed fiercely, the ground trembling under the immense power. Servants from all classes assembled, weapons ready, their faces set in grim determination. This presence. It's not like any other servant. Muttered the King of Knights. Stay alert. Whatever's coming, it's going to be a tough fight. Amiya Altar. I can feel the corruption. It's overwhelming. As the energy peaked, a figure began to materialize. The air grew thick with tension as prana converged and the lights flickered. Then, with a blinding flash, Charybdis appeared. Her semi-draconic form loomed large, her eyes glowing with a fierce, otherworldly light. Welcome to Chaldea, Romani's voice echoed through the chamber, trying to maintain a semblance of control. Charybdis surveyed her surroundings, her gaze cold and calculating. Where am I? What is this place? You're in Chaldea, summoned to aid in our mission to protect humanity, Romani explained, his voice steady despite the fear. Charybdis's eyes narrowed. Summoned? By whom? Before Romani could respond, the tension broke as several servants stepped forward, weapons still at the ready. Who are you? What is your purpose here? Demanded Arthur. Charybdis's lips curled into a slight smirk. I am Charybdis, the Lord of Sin. My power surpasses the understanding of your world. The room fell silent, the weight of her words sinking in. But before any further confrontation could arise, Romani intervened. Please, everyone, lower your weapons. Charybdis, we need your help. There are threats that only someone of your strength can face. Charybdis considered this, her gaze flicking to the assembled servants. Very well. But know this, I am not here to save humanity I'll help until I get bored. Charybdis had been in Chaldea for a few weeks now, slowly getting used to the new environment and the myriad of servants she had to interact with. Despite her initial hostility, she found herself intrigued by the complex dynamics and the sheer variety of powers present. One day, she decided to join a simulation battle, hoping to test her abilities against these new opponents. As the simulation began, Charybdis found herself in a desolate wasteland, a perfect battleground. She scanned the horizon, her senses heightened. Suddenly, she felt a familiar, dark energy. Turning, she saw a figure approaching. It was Ingra Mainu, his presence like a shadow creeping over the land. You're the new foreigner, right? He said, his tone casual. Charybdis nodded. And your Ingra Mainu divine spirit let's see what you've got. Without another word, they clashed. Charybdis unleashed her chaotic magic, while Ingra Mainu countered with his own dark powers. Charybdis while having the ability to end it in one blow decided to probe the being that shared the name of her skill. The battle was fierce, but as it progressed, Charybdis felt a strange resonance with Ingra's presence. Their powers seemed to complement each other in an eerie, almost perfect harmony. After an intense exchange of blows, they both paused, breathing heavily. Your power. It resonates with mine, Charybdis said, her eyes locking onto Ingra's. He smirked. I noticed that too. It's almost like we're two sides of the same coin. They both lowered their weapons, the battle transitioning into a conversation. Over the next few weeks, Charybdis and Ingra Mainu began to spend more time together, often meeting in the simulation room for more battles. Each fight deepened their understanding of each other's abilities and strengthened their bond. One evening, after a particularly grueling match, they sat down on the simulated grass, looking up at the starry sky. You know, Charybdis started, I never thought I'd find someone whose power resonated with mine like this. It's comforting in a way. 
Engra Mainyu glanced at her, a rare, genuine smile on his lips. It's not every day you meet someone who understands the burden of darkness. But with you, it feels different. Less lonely. Charybdis nodded, a faint smile crossing her face. I've felt that too. And. I've started to feel something more. Something I never expected. He turned to face her fully, curiosity and a hint of hope in his eyes. What do you mean? I think. I've fallen in love with you, Engra, she confessed, her voice soft and tinged with embarrassment. Engra Mania's eyes widened in surprise at the words coming from the cold hearted dragon. He reached out, gently taking her hand. Charybdis, I feel the same. In this chaotic world, we've found each other. And that's something worth holding on to. They leaned in, their foreheads touching, sharing a moment of profound connection. In each other's presence, they found a rare peace, a sanctuary from the burdens they both carried. As they continued to fight side by side and share their lives, Charybdis and Ingra Mainyu grew even closer. Their bond was a beacon of light amidst the darkness of their selves and the chaotic world they inhabited. Chapter 32 In the heart of the Jura Forest, Charybdis gathered with Melim, Veldora, and Harita. The dense canopy overhead cast dappled shadows on the forest floor, creating an atmosphere ripe for serious discussion. I've been thinking, Charybdis began, her voice echoing softly among the trees, about creating a kingdom. A place for us and our family, a home where we can be free from the turmoil of the continent. Melim's eyes sparkled with curiosity. A kingdom? Where would we build it? Charybdis gestured towards the horizon. Out there, in the southern ocean we create ourselves. A new island, far from any current territories. Veldora raised an eyebrow, intrigued. An island? What will you call it? Charybdis paused, a name from her previous life surfacing. She thought about the name's significance, recalling Ramiana she once read in her previous life. Where Lanka was inhabited by the king of Azura's Ravana in the Treaty Yuk. Though they didn't know about her past life, the name seemed fitting for her and the future she had planned for the world. Lanka, she said thoughtfully. We'll call it Lanka. Melin nodded, a grin spreading across her face. Lanka. I like it. It sounds strong. Veldora chuckled. It does have a ring to it. And this kingdom, what will its purpose be? I personally never found a reason to rule weaklings. Charybdis's eyes glinted with determination. It will be our home, a sanctuary for our family and for the beings I plan to create. A place where we can live in peace and build a future. Veldora crossed his arms, a thoughtful expression on his face. And how do you plan to create this island? With our combined powers, Charybdis replied confidently. We can shape the land and make it a reality. It won't just be a place to live it will be symbol of our unity and combined strength. Melim's excitement was palpable. Let's do it. We'll build Lanka and make it the best kingdom ever. Harita, who had been quietly listening, finally spoke up. And what about me, master? How do I fit into this new kingdom? Imnita being created by you. Charybdis looked at Harita, her expression softening. Don't consider yourself excluded from this you may not have been born from me but you are my first creation one that will stand above all who come later. Your family. At my word she shuddered in her place and nodded, a determined look on her face. I understand. I'll do whatever it takes to ensure our kingdom thrives. Charybdis smiled, as she looked through the sky envisioning the future that lay ahead. Together, we can create something extraordinary. A place where no power in the world can interfere, a place where we can thrive. I think we should start building shouldn't we? Yeah no time better than now replied Malim with her ever cheerful voice. So how do we start this? Boomed Veldora. I have a plan, I'll pull apart a celestial body to make this island I'll condense its mass to the smay size as the eastern nations. Charybdis replied calmly. But why is pulling apart a celestial body necessary? Questioned Melim. We need resources and a planet full would be enough to last more than enough for our nation, I don't want to wage war for such an unnecessary reason since I need to concentrate on getting stronger Charybdis said. I also need time for my experiments. 
Kohahaha my daughter is such a genius boomed Veldora genuinely baffled by the logic used by Charybdis. In the southern reaches of the vast ocean that bordered the continent, the waters churned restlessly as Charybdis prepared to embark on her monumental task. Standing on the shore with Milim, Veldora, Harita, and Kai by her side, she gazed out across the horizon where the faint outline of distant lands could be seen. I will start the Cretan of Lanka, Charybdis declared, her voice hiding the nervousness in her voice. Milim clasped her hands together eagerly. I can't wait to see how you do this, Charybdis. Veldora, always intrigued by displays of power, laughed. Kohaha pulling apart a planet to create an island. Now that's something I can confidently say I've never seen before. Harita stood silently, her eyes fixed on Charybdis with unwavering loyalty and trust. Kai stood emotionless as always, but still his childish curiosity matched Malim. Charybdis closed her eyes, focusing after some concentration she opened them again but this time a slit appeared on her forehead which opened to reveal an eye with three different pupils. Her skin around the eye reddened and developed scales, a manifestation of Ingrid the core manifestation of her ultimate skill. After practicing during her time developed she devised a way to being more intertwined with her ultimate skill and utilized the endless curses as a fuel for her actions. Her aim was to convert it into her intrinsic nature over time, creating a case similar to the Spirit Queen. Around her, the air boomed with energy as she began to manipulate gravity on a grand scale. With precise control, she reached out to a nearby planet in the solar system, drawing on its mass with her gravity manipulation. Slowly, the planet began to respond, its surface quivering as Charybdis exerted her will. With careful precision, she pulled apart chunks of rock and soil, condensing and reshaping them into a cohesive mass. A whirlwind of elemental forces surrounded her, bending to her command as she shaped the future island of Lanka. As the process continued, the distant lands on the horizon seemed to grow clearer, drawn closer by the gravitational pull of Charybdis's magic. Piece by piece, the island took form under her guidance, growing larger and more defined until it matched the size of the eastern nations combined. With a final surge of power, Charybdis anchored the newly formed island in the southern ocean, seamlessly blending it into the natural geography of the world. The waters around it calmed, as if acknowledging the birth of something extraordinary. Meline cheered with delight, her eyes sparkling with stars in them. Charybdis, you did it. Lanka is incredible. Veldora clapped enthusiastically with his draconic claws' impressive work, Charybdis. This island will be a testament to your power. Harita approached Charybdis quietly, a deep reverence in her gaze. Master, you've created a miracle. Kai, bowed deeply. I'm honored to witness your greatness, Master. Charybdis smiled, her heart swelling with pride and gratitude for her companions. Thank you, all of you. Lanka is just the beginning. Together, we will build our kingdom and forge our destiny. With the island of Lanka now firmly established in the southern ocean, Charybdis and her family started the process of terraforming the barren land. The creation of Lanka marked not just the birth of a new land, but the dawn of a new era of power for this world. Chapter 33 In the heart of the newly born island Lanka, where the barren land met the tideful ocean. Charybdis gathered her allies for a strategic meeting after spending the day terraforming the Islenad by grafting ley lines and integrating the landmass partially to the planet. Milim, Veldora, Harita, stood with her amidst the gentle rustling of leaves and the distant murmur of waves. I propose we fortify Lanka using Veldora's dimension craft, Charybdis began, her voice carrying a hint of anticipation. Combined with my sub's kill of Ingramanu, we can create a protective barrier that will deter scrying magic of all levels and prevent infiltration. Veldora nodded thoughtfully, his eyes glinting with interest. A dimensional barrier reinforced with your semi-manifested marble phantasm. It sounds like the best plan. We could make Lanka virtually impenetrable. Meline grinned, excitement dancing in her eyes. I love the sound of that. No one will dare to mess with us once we have that in place. Harita, ever practical, voiced her agreement. Managing internal affairs and defenses will be crucial. I'll ensure everything runs smoothly at your command within Lanka. Charybdis looked around at her family, her expression serious yet filled with ambition. 
With Lanka fortified, we will not only protect our home but also lay the groundwork for greater ambitions. My ultimate goal is the complete subjugation of the entire demon realm and all the primordials. Milim's eyes widened in surprise, then gleamed with excitement. That sounds so fun, Charybdis. Veldora chuckled confidently. I've always admired your ambition, Charybdis. Let's make it happen I have a bone to pick with those anyways. Charybdis smiled, a glint of determination in her eyes matching the resolve of her companions. Then let us begin. Lanka will be our stronghold, and from here, we will conquer. In the newly created golden castle of Lanka, Charybdis sat on her throne joined by her family. In front of her stood Harita dressed with her armor and weapon. Harita, Charybdis began, her voice firm yet calm picking out a small card from her pocket, I have an important task for you. You are to travel to the dwelling of spirits and present an invitation to the spirit queen. Invite her to join us in Lanka during its early stages. Her presence and power would greatly benefit our new kingdom. Harita nodded, her expression serious and resolute as she received the invitation from her master. I understand, master. I will deliver the invitation to the spirit queen. Charybdis's eyes hardened slightly as she continued. However, if she refuses our invitation or delays in the decision, you are to extend the same offer to the elemental lord of darkness and the elemental lord of space. Their powers and influence would be invaluable to us as well. Harita bowed deeply, acknowledging the gravity of her mission. I will ensure that the invitation reaches its intended recipients, Master. I will do whatever it takes to secure their alliance. Malim, ever enthusiastic, punched the air in support. Good luck, Harita. Show them the strength and potential of Lanka. Veldora nodded approvingly. It's a crucial mission, but I have no doubt you will succeed, Harita. Harita straightened, her resolve clear. Thank you, everyone. I will not fail. With that, Harita turned and began her journey, her form quickly disappearing into the waves of the ocean that bordered the shores of Lanka. As Harita embarked on her mission, Charybdis looked out over the newly formed island. The creation of Lanka was just the beginning. With alliances forged and their kingdom fortified, they would rise to meet any challenge and achieve their grand ambitions. Harita moved swiftly through the dense foliage of the Jura forest, her mind focused on the task at hand. The invitation from Charybdis weighed heavily in her heart, not as a burden, but as a constant reminder to her master's trust in her abilities. She had to succeed no matter what. After a long journey, she finally arrived at the dwelling of spirits. The air here was different more vibrant, filled with a gentle hum of magic. Harita took a deep breath and stepped into the entrance of the labyrinth, a structure formed by the intrinsic skill of the spirit queen, Ram Iris. The labyrinth was immense, its walls cryptic and dusty. Navigating through the never-ending corridors, Harita felt the presence of countless spirits watching her. She finally reached the heart of the labyrinth, where the spirit queen resided. In the center of a luminous chamber stood a small, glowing figurea pixie with delicate wings and an aura of ancient wisdom. Ram Iris, in her recently reborn child form, turned to Harita with wide, curious eyes. Who are you? Ram Iris asked, her voice high and innocent, yet carrying an ancient power. Harita knelt before the young queen, showing her respect. Great spirit queen Ram Iris, I am Harita, envoy of Charybdis, the queen of Lanka. I come with an invitation. Ram Iris tilted her head, her curiosity piqued. Lanka? What is that? And why should I be interested? Harita took a deep breath, choosing her words carefully. Lanka is a new kingdom, created by Charybdis herself, in the southern ocean of the continent. We seek allies of great power and wisdom to join us in our early stages, to help us build a sanctuary of peace and strength. Charybdis believes that your presence would be invaluable to us. Ramarissa's eyes sparkled with interest, but she didn't immediately respond. Instead, she floated closer to Harita, scrutinizing her. Hmm. There's something unusual about you. Qualities that shouldn't be present in living beings. And there's a glaring essence of a spirit within you. How did this come to be? Harita hesitated, taken aback by Ramarissa's perceptiveness. My powers come from the mercy of Master. 
Ramaris's expression softened slightly. I see. You have the essence of a fire spirit within you, about 15%, I'd say. It makes you unique, but also marks you as a creation impeding in nature by many. If you ever feel the need, you are welcome to join the dwelling of spirits. You might find a sense of belonging here. Harita was momentarily stunned by the offer but quickly composed herself. Thank you, Spirit Queen. I am honored by your offer. But my loyalty lies with Charybdis and the Kingdom of Lanka. I am here to extend an invitation to you, to join us and help shape our new home. After finishing she offered the invitation to Ramiris. Ramiris considered this, her tiny fingers tapping her chin thoughtfully as she read the card. Relocating the dwelling of spirits is not something to be done lightly. It's my domain, my home. How can you ensure its safety and sanctity? Harita nodded, understanding the weight of Ramiris's concerns. We propose to use Queen Charybdis's and Master Veldora's combined powers to create a secure and enhanced environment for the labyrinth. Your home will be protected by powerful barriers and our unwavering commitment to its preservation. Additionally, we offer to relocate the dwelling of spirits to a strategic position on the bridge between the island of Lanka and the mainland. This way, your responsibilities to the spirits remain intact while enhancing their protection and influence. Ram Iris floated back slightly, her expression serious despite her childlike appearance. I will need time to think about this. It's not a decision I can make lightly. Harita bowed her head in acknowledgement. Of course, Spirit Queen. Take all the time you need. We await your decision with respect and hope. Ram Iris nodded, a small smile touching her lips. Thank you, Harita. You may go now. I will send my response soon. With that, Harita rose and backed away respectfully before turning to leave as she navigated her way out of the labyrinth, she felt a mixture of hope and determination. The future of Lanka while didn't inherently depended on these alliances, and she was determined to see her master's vision realized with the best possible odds. Chapter 34 After departing from the dwelling of spirits, Harita set her sights on the next phase of her mission. The elemental lords of darkness and space held significant power and influence. If they could be persuaded to join Lanka, it would be a monumental step toward solidifying the new kingdom's strength. Harita traveled swiftly, her path leading her to the secluded regions where the elemental lords resided. The journey was arduous, filled with treacherous landscapes within subliminal dimensions and potent magical barriers, but she pressed on with unwavering determination. Her first destination was the domain of the elemental lord of darkness. The air grew heavy with an eerie stillness as she approached a towering, ancient fortress shrouded in perpetual twilight guard by heavy dimensional isolation. The only reason for her being able to traverse these narrow mystical pathways was her spicale constitution and the key provided to her by her master. It held the power to unlock any lock even dimensional ones. She could feel the oppressive energy of darkness permeating the area, a testament to the immense power of its ruler. As she stepped into the fortress, she was met by a shadowy figure materializing from the darkness. The elemental lord of darkness, an imposing presence with eyes that seemed to pierce through the very fabric of reality, regarded her with curiosity. Who dares enter my domain? The elemental lord's voice echoed, carrying a mixture of authority and intrigue. Harita knelt respectfully. Great elemental lord of darkness, I am Harita, envoy of Charybdis, guardian of the newly formed kingdom of Lanka. I come with an invitation. The elemental lord's eyes narrowed slightly. An invitation, you say? Speak, and be quick about it. Harita took a deep breath, steadying herself. Lanka is a new kingdom, created by Master Charybdis in the southern ocean of the continent. We seek to gather allies of great power and wisdom to help us build a sanctuary of peace and strength. Charybdis believes that your presence would be invaluable to us. The elemental lord's expression remained inscrutable. And what makes you think I would be interested in such an alliance? We offer you a place of prominence and respect within Lanka, Harita explained. Your power will be recognized and revered. Additionally, we propose to use Charybdis's and Veldora's combined powers to create a secure and enhanced environment for your domain. Your influence will extend far and wide, and your safety will be guaranteed obviously require absolute loyalty to our cause in exchange. 
The elemental lord considered this for a moment, his eyes never leaving Harita. I will need time to contemplate your offer. You may go. Harita bowed deeply. Thank you, great elemental lord. We await your decision. With that, she departed the fortress, feeling a mixture of hope and apprehension. Her next destination was the realm of the Elemental Lord of Space. The journey to the Elemental Lord of Space's domain was even more challenging, as it lay hidden within the folds of space bordering on bending reality. After navigating through intricate spatial distortions, Harita finally arrived at a vast, ethereal expanse where the Elemental Lord of Space awaited. The Elemental Lord of Space, a figure of otherworldly beauty with a presence that seemed to warp the very air around them, observed Harita with a curious gaze. You have traversed the boundaries of space many will find impossible to traverse to reach me, the Elemental Lord said, their voice echoing with a resonance that seemed to transcend dimensions. What brings you here young one? Harita knelt respectfully. Great Elemental Lord of Space, I am Harita, envoy of Queen Charybdis, of the newly formed Kingdom of Lanka. I come with an invitation. The Elemental Lord's eyes sparkled with interest. An invitation? To what end? Harita repeated her pitch, explaining the vision of Lanka and the unique opportunities it presented. She emphasized the potential for cooperation and the promise of a secure and influential position within the new kingdom. The Elemental Lord listened intently, their expression thoughtful. Your offer is intriguing. I will need time to consider it. Harita bowed deeply. Thank you, great Elemental Lord. We await your decision. As Harita made her way back, she felt a sense of accomplishment. She had delivered Charybdis's invitations and laid the groundwork for potential alliances. Now, it was up to the Elemental Lords to decide whether they would join the emerging Kingdom of Lanka. Underground Facility Lab 02 the dim glow of the laboratory cast long shadows on the walls, the room filled with the hum of machinery and sterile scent. Charybdis stood over Kai, her clinical glasses reflecting the sparse light, her face a mask of calm determination. Are you ready, Kai? She asked, her voice steady but with an underlying hint of severity. This will probably be the toughest one you will face, from all the ones you have faced yet. Kai, strapped to the operating table, nodded slowly. He had been through countless experiments, each more grueling than the last. But something in Charybdis's tone gave him pause. And if it goes well, she continued, locking his arm in place with another set of constraints gently, it'll probably be the last. With a swift motion, she pulled out a mechanical plug, a cold, metallic device designed to stifle any sound. She placed it over his mouth, sealing it shut. For the first time, a flicker of fear crossed Kai's eyes. I'm a changed woman, Kai, she said, her voice softening, almost tender. If you survive this, you will get any reward you want. So be a good and strong boy. She moved to a console, her fingers dancing over the controls. Kai's heart pounded as he felt the first prick of pain, a brutal surge that made him scream into the muffling plug. His soul felt as if it was being torn apart, a methodical application of spirit elemental distillation via a scepter focused at his heart. It ripped apart his human nature, replacing it with neutral spirit and constructs. Charybdis walked away, her expression cold and distant, and activated a few more machines she had created from scratch. She pressed a final red button, and multiple needles injected Kai with a purple liquid. He felt the advanced RC cells, infused with traits from thousands of monsters, coursing through his veins. It was an advanced form of cellular transformation, forcing his body to evolve beyond its limits. This was Harita's legacy, a rudimentary experiment that showed Charybdis the potential of breaking set evolutionary paths, creating entirely new species. Kai's screams grew louder, his body convulsing in agony. Charybdis, emotionless, pressed another button. A metal cradle closed around Kai, cutting off his screams. She sat down and pulled out a cable with organic terminals, a stinger at its end. Without hesitation, she plunged it into her neck as red lines spread through her body causing an expression of pain and happiness to cross her face as she inched closer to her goal. This was the birth of the first Asur, the manifestation of her rage and her first child, though unconventional it was the best she could manage. 
Soon after two hours, the cradle whirred down, and she withdrew the terminal from her neck stumbling a bit as she had used her qualitative essence as a monster to artificially mother Kai in this process. As she touched the surface of the cradle, it exploded outward, revealing a transformed Kai. He emerged with six eyes, four arms, and six wings, a terrifying blend of human and monstrous traits. He lunged at her, his rage palpable. But Charybdis merely smiled, a blissful expression of motherly pride, and embraced him. It's okay, my child, she whispered. It's okay. Kai's struggle ceased at her touch, and he collapsed into unconsciousness. As he fell asleep, his monstrous features faded, leaving only his six eyes. Charybdis watched over him, a sense of exhilaration washing over her. She had succeeded. But more importantly she was a mother now. That day not many knew the calamity that Charybdis unleashed on the world. The first Asur, the eldest of the ten siblings, Crota the Imperial, was born. Chapter 35 Charybdis sat on the plush chaise in her opulent bedroom, cradling Kai's head in her lap. The transformation he had undergone was extraordinary, and now, as he slept peacefully, his six eyes closed, she felt a mix of pride and trepidation. The candles cast a warm glow around them, the rich tapestries and ornate furniture adding to the serene atmosphere. As she gently stroked his hair, she thought about the path ahead. Kai, now the first Osir Crota, was not just a subject of her experiments. He was her creation, her responsibility, her son. How do I guide him? She mused. His power is immense, and his potential even greater. She would have to teach him control, discipline, and the wisdom to wield his abilities in the most effective way. But there was also a part of her that wanted to spoil him, to give him the childhood he never had. A balance, she thought. He deserves to experience joy and freedom, but he must also learn the gravity of his power. The door creaked open, and Charybdis's thoughts were interrupted as Malim entered the room. She froze in surprise at the sight before her, Kai, sleeping so peacefully on Charybdis's lap. His face, usually marked by a motionless stare, now looked serene. What happened here? Malim began, her voice curious and a bit odd. Charybdis raised a finger to her lips, signaling for silence. She made a small, precise gesture with her free hand, conjuring up a pack of sweets. With a flick of her wrist, she tossed it to Malim, who caught it with wide eyes. Later, Charybdis whispered, her voice barely audible. For now, let him rest. Meline nodded, understanding, and tiptoed out of the room, clutching the sweets. As the door closed quietly behind her, Charybdis returned her attention to Kai. You are my greatest creation. She thought, her heart swelling with a rare, soft warmth. I will guide you, protect you, and teach you everything you need to know. But I will also let you be a child, at least sometimes. She smiled gently, the cold, clinical exterior she usually wore melting away. For this moment, she was not the usual ruthless master, but a mother, filled with affection and hope for her newly acquired son. Harita returned to Lanka, her expression solemn as she approached Charybdis. The responses from the elemental lords had been varied, and it was now time to relay their decisions. In a quiet, private chamber within the burgeoning kingdom, Harita bowed before her master. Master, I have delivered your invitations. The spirit queen Ram Iris and the elemental lord of space have both declined your offer. Ram Iris values the sanctity and security of her dwelling of spirits too much to consider relocating, and the elemental lord of space feels no compelling reason to align with us at this time. Charybdis's expression remained unreadable, but a flicker of disappointment passed through her eyes. And the elemental lord of darkness? She asked, her tone steady. Harita straightened, a hint of hope in her voice. He has been intrigued by the special offer you mentioned. The promise of a deviated evolution path struck a chord with him. He feels his influence and knowledge are waning due to the blocked evolution path he faces. Your offer has given him a glimmer of hope. Charybdis nodded, her mind already working through the possibilities. Good. He was always the most likely to understand the importance of what we are building here. His presence will be a significant boon to us. Shall I meet with him again to propagate the dealings further? Asked Harita. No need Harita things have changed since you left, 
new information and new offers are now on a higher priority, in order to do so I'll meet him myself. During her talk Charybdis slowly got up from the throne and walked past Harita as wings slowly emerged from her back. Also keep Crota company while he is unconscious Charybdis paused for a moment and then smiled meaningfully I think he'll like that. As you wish master exclaimed Harita. In the dark, imposing fortress of the elemental lord of darkness, Charybdis met him in person to finalize their agreement. The atmosphere was thick with the essence of darkness, the air vibrating with conceptual density. The elemental lord of darkness, an imposing figure with eyes that seemed to absorb all light, regarded her with a mixture of suspicion and curiosity. You have my attention, Charybdis. Explain this deviated evolution path you spoke of. Charybdis stepped forward, her demeanor confident. Before Ram Iris, you were the closest thing to an all-powerful spirit. Your influence and knowledge have been steadily diminishing because of the blocked evolution path you face. I offer you a chance to reclaim your former glory. The elemental lord's eyes narrowed. How? And Dantai dare lie in front of me. Charybdis smiled, her voice laced with amusement as if watching a show. Not only will I grant you a new evolution path, but I also offer you something far more profound a chance at rebirth, a new name, and a new race. I offer you a place in the world as my son. The elemental lord's eyes widened in shock, the ancient being momentarily speechless. Charybdis's offer was beyond anything he had ever imagined. Rebirth? A new name and race? You would make me your son? Charybdis nodded, her gaze unwavering. Yes. You will be reborn with a new identity, free from the constraints that currently bind you. As my son, you will have a place of honor and power within Lanka. Your influence will grow, and your legacy will be restored. As the elemental lord mulled over Charybdis's offer, memories of his past flashed through his mind. He remembered a time when he had nearly achieved true power among Hus race, only to be thwarted by the limitations of his evolution. The frustration and yearning for a chance to surpass those limits had haunted him ever since. Charybdis's offer reignited that old ambition, the promise of a new beginning where he could attain the power and recognition he had once dreamed of. The thought of a new identity, a new race, and a chance to rebuild his legacy was irresistible. Yet, he was cautious. His many years had taught him to be wary of promises that seemed too good to be true. Your offer. It is unprecedented, he finally said, his voice filled with a mixture of awe and hope. To be reborn, to have a new place in the world. I am intrigued. But before I commit fully, I must understand you and your kingdom better. I will live in Lanka for a few months to see if your vision aligns with my aspirations. Charybdis extended her hand, and the elemental lord clasped it in agreement. Welcome to Lanka, then. Take the time you need. Together, we will reshape the future. As Charybdis left the fortress, she felt a sense of triumph. The elemental lord of darkness was now her ally, and his acceptance was only natural as evident of her increasing manipulation skills. Though she did have a genuine reason to offer this request to him since the plan of creating a race unmatched by anything was still not close to being even 1% done the success in Project Azura was a surprise that was welcomed by her wholeheartedly. Chapter 36 Upon returning Charybdis was greeted by a sleeping Veldora who had reshaped the throne room due to his large size once again. Father, Charybdis began, her tone calm yet firm, I think it would benefit you and our kingdom if you considered taking on a more humanoid form. It would make interactions with our allies and subjects easier and more approachable. Plus I won't have to fix the chamber all the time. Veldora snorted, his massive form casting a shadow across the room. Humanoid form. Why should I bother with that? I am the storm dragon, feared and respected in this form. Changing into something lesser would be a disgrace. Charybdis sighed, knowing Veldora's adamancy was unshakable. Very well, father. I understand your pride. We will manage without it. Veldora gave a nod, satisfied with his decision, and left the chamber reshaping it on his way out again. Charybdis watched him go, her mind already shifting to other matters while she unconsciously fixed the hall. She turned back to her research but paused as a sudden surge of power rippled through the air. Her eyes widened. Crota has awakened. 
With renewed purpose, Charybdis altered her plans. She left her chamber, seeking out Crota to meet him in controlling and understanding his newfound intrinsic abilities. She found him in her bedroom where he has been resting, his presence already radiating a raw, untamed aura. Crota, Charybdis called out, drawing his attention. You finally awakened Crota. First of all I'm glad you survived this and you now have new powers. We must train you to control them and understand their potential. Crota looked at her, determination in his eyes. What are these abilities, master? Charybdis smiled, proud of his eagerness. Call me mother, Crota. He hesitated, the word mother caught in his throat. Yes, and mother. Charybdis's expression softened. But before we get into that, I've prepared a meal. Let's eat first. They moved to a large table where Charybdis had set out a feast. The aroma of various dishes filled the air, a testament to her effort and care in preparing the meal. She had decided to cook for him every day this was her way of expressing her care, at least in her mind. Crota's eyes widened at the sight, his hesitation momentarily replaced by curiosity. Did you make all this? He asked, taking a seat. Yes, Charybdis replied, serving him a plate. I've been working on it for quite some time. I thought it would be good for us to share a meal before diving into your training. They ate in relative silence, the only sounds being the clinking of cutlery and the rustle of leaves in the distance. The meal was simple yet delicious, each dish crafted with precision and care. Crota finally broke the silence. Thank you, mother. This is really good. Charybdis smiled. I'm glad you like it, Crota. It's important to nourish the body as well as the mind. After they finished eating, Charybdis led Crota back to the training grounds. Now, let's discuss your abilities. She began with Wrath of Earth This ability allows you to channel nature's wrath into your elemental magic, making it devastatingly effective against humans and demons from foreign dimensions. Feel the anger of the earth itself, and let it guide your magic. Crota nodded, closing his eyes as he tried to tap into the elemental rage. The ground beneath him trembled, but the energy didn't fully materialize. He opened his eyes, frustration evident. It's okay, Charybdis reassured him. These abilities are new to you. Let's move on. Next, she explained Wrath of the Imperial This ability allows you to summon an unstoppable arrow that can pierce anything, provided your anger towards the target is strong enough. Focus on your anger and let it shape the arrow. Crota's expression hardened as he imagined a target, his anger boiling within him. A shimmering arrow formed in his hand, but it was weak and unstable, a mere spirit and construct without a proper target. Don't worry, Charybdis said, placing a reassuring hand on his shoulder. It takes time to master these abilities. Your talent will soon catch up. Finally, Charybdis described judgment. When activated, your six eyes will bear words in Sanskrit, Nyayi, Justice, Nishpaksh, Impartial, Amishra, Absolute, Amal, Pure, Satya, Truth, Vijay, Victory. These words set rules for both you and your opponent, but their meanings are defined by your perception. You can twist these concepts to suit your desires and beliefs. Each concept in these can be brought to your complete control if they are applicable to your target. Crota's eyes glowed simultaneously as the words appeared along with the power of judgment, the words manifesting their conceptual weight. He felt the weight of each concept, understanding the potential to shape reality according to his will. But activating the skill felt daunting, and the pressure to define each concept was immense. Use these abilities wisely, Charybdis advised. They are powerful tools, but they require control and understanding. You have the potential to become a formidable force, Crota. I will be here to guide you. Days passed as Crota practiced diligently. Though initially, his attempts were weak and unstable, his increased talent soon caught up. He learned to channel the earth's wrath, and the arrows he summoned grew stronger, driven by genuine anger towards his inability. His understanding of judgment deepened, allowing him to manipulate its rules more effectively. As Charybdis watched him train, she felt a sense of satisfaction and pride in her son and her own work. Obviously she never stopped her research on various topics. After another rigorous training session, Charybdis and Crota sat under the shade of a large tree. 
The air was filled with the sounds of the forest, a peaceful contrast to the intense training they had just finished. Charybdis looked at Crota thoughtfully. Crota, I promised you something before your rebirth. Do you remember? Crota nodded, wiping sweat from his brow. Yes, mother. You said if I survived, I could have any reward I wanted. Charybdis smiled. That's right. So, tell me, Crota, what is it that you desire? Crota hesitated, his eyes lowering to the ground. He had gained immense power and abilities, yet he found himself at a loss. I don't know, mother. I can't think of anything. Charybdis tilted her head, studying him. You must have some wish, some dream or aspiration. Think about it. Crota's brows furrowed as he tried to delve into his thoughts. He had been so focused on survival and mastering his abilities that personal desires seemed distant and vague. I want to be strong, to protect our kingdom and repay you for giving me this new life. But beyond that, I'm not sure. Charybdis placed a gentle hand on his shoulder. Strength and loyalty are noble desires, Crota. But remember, you are more than just a warrior. You have a soul, dreams, and a future. Take your time to discover what truly matters to you. When you find it, I'll be here to help you achieve it. Crota looked up at her, gratitude and determination in his eyes. Thank you, mother. I'll think about it. I want to make you proud. Charybdis smiled warmly. You already do, Crota. Every day. Now, let's continue your training. There's still much to learn and master. Chapter 37 Charybdis donned a human disguise and ventured into a well-established human kingdom, whose name she couldn't be bothered to remember, intent on uncovering the secrets of summoning heroes or otherworlders. Her curiosity had been piqued by the kingdom's rumors and records of the research on summoning rituals, and she needed this knowledge to advance her plans for Lanka. For weeks, she immersed herself in the kingdom's libraries, scouring the experimental texts and conversing with the kingdom's scholars. Her research revealed the intricate magic circles and incantations required, as well as the sacred materials used in the process. She meticulously took notes, ensuring she understood every detail. Armed with this newfound knowledge, Charybdis returned to Lanka. In a secluded part of the island, she began the delicate task of setting up a summoning portal connected to a magical furnace, something inspired from the Fate series. The furnace used was very simple to make with the ever-abundant and versatile RC cells she has at her disposal. Using her enhanced magical talents, she converted the spell into one of holy nature, channeling her devotion to the voice of the world to increase its efficiency. After days of preparation, she stood before the completed portal as the moon hung on the sky. Her heart pounded with anticipation as she began the modified chant, her voice resonating with power and reverence. Voice of the world, impartial and true. Keeper of balance, I call unto you. From the realms beyond, heed my plea. Summon forth an ally, bring them to me. In the name of harmony, in the light of justice. Let your guidance be my compass. By your will, let the gates be unfurled. Bring forth a champion, to protect this world. As the final words left her lips, the portal glowed with an intense, blinding light. The air around her crackled with energy, and the very ground beneath her seemed to hum in response. When the light finally began to fade, Charybdis looked upon the figure standing before her. A man clad in Indian armor, stained with blood, emerged from the portal. His eyes bore the stare of someone who had seen the horrors of countless battles. His presence was formidable, yet there was a haunting emptiness in his gaze. Charybdis immediately noticed the intricate details of his armor and the regal bearing that suggested he was no ordinary warrior. For a moment, the room was silent. Charybdis observed the man, understanding that he had been summoned straight from a battlefield, likely in the midst of a fierce fight. His confusion was palpable, and he did not speak, merely trying to orient himself to his new surroundings. Welcome, Charybdis said softly in the magic tongue she had developed, taking a cautious step forward. I am Charybdis. You have been summoned here for a purpose. Can you tell me your name? The man blinked, his gaze slowly focusing on her. He seemed to be processing her words, the transition from the chaos of battle to this serene room taking its toll. He then spoke in Prakrit, 
a language Charybdis understood easily from her extensive studies. Ashoka, he said, his name carrying the weight of his experiences. My name is Ashoka. Charybdis's eyes sparkled with recognition. Her mind raced over the possibility that she had summoned the Maurian Emperor Ashoka. The legendary ruler, known for his transformation from a ruthless conqueror to a benevolent and just leader, could be an invaluable ally in her quest. Emperor Ashoka, she whispered, her voice filled with awe and respect. The King of the Maurian Empire Ashoka remained silent, still grappling with the sudden shift from the battlefield to this unfamiliar place. His blood-stained armor and the haunted look in his eyes spoke volumes of the battles he was involved in. Charybdis took another step closer, her voice gentle, as she realized that the vulnerable psyche of the formidable emperor at the moment, she must have summoned him either amidst or at the end of the Kalinga War. You have endured much, Ashoka. But here, you can find a new purpose. Together, we can create a world of our shared desire. Will you join us? Politician has always worked like a charm. Ashoka's eyes met hers, and for the first time, there was a flicker of something else, a glimmer of hope, perhaps, or a sense of curiosity about this new world and the role he might play in it. He didn't speak, but his gaze narrowed on her taking in her veiled appearance hidden in the night, and he gave a slight nod. Charybdis smiled, a sense of relief washing over her. Thank you, Ashoka. Welcome to Lanka. We have much to do, and your presence here will be invaluable. She said walking in the Rigon illuminated by the humming magicule furnace. As Charybdis called her kingdom Lanka, Ashoka's eyes widened in shock. The name struck a deep chord within him, echoing the tales of the Ramayana he knew so well. Lanka? He repeated, his voice tinged with disbelief and anger. He took in the now visible inhuman features on her face, the slight glint in her eyes, and his hand instinctively moved to the hilt of his sword. You are a Danav, he declared, his voice firm and filled with conviction. Even if I die here, I will not succumb to your wishes. Seeing his reaction, Charybdis sighed with disappointment. She had hoped that this encounter would be easily mangeable, that she could convince him of their noble cause. But the situation was rapidly deteriorating, and she was already considering the possibility of having to kill him. Ashoka, she said calmly, trying to defuse the tension. I understand your fears and your anger. But I am not your enemy. I have no desire to harm you. He did not lower his sword, his eyes filled with determination. You speak of Lanka, the land of Ravana, the demon king. And you, with your inhuman features, expect me to believe you are not a threat. I will not fall for your deception Danov. Charybdis raised her hands in a placating gesture. Lanka is not meant to be a land of demons, but a sanctuary. A place where we can build something new, something better. The Lanka I envision is different from the one ruled by Ravana. It will be a place of unity, where beings of all kinds can live in harmony. Politician tried to salvage the situation by pumping out half lies. His grip on the sword tightened as his newly modified body started humming with magicules. I have fought many battles, faced many enemies. But I will not join forces with Adanov. Even if you kill me, I will not betray my principles. Charybdis sighed again, the weight of his words pressing heavily on her. I see, she said softly. It seems I misjudged your willingness to understand. I do not wish to fight you, Ashoka. But if you leave me no choice, I will defend myself and my kingdom. For a moment, they stood in tense silence, the air between them thick with the possibility of violence. Charybdis hoped that he might reconsider, that he might see the sincerity in her actions. But Ashoka's resolve remained unshaken, his stance unyielding. With a final, resigned sigh, Charybdis prepared herself for the inevitable conflict. Very well, she said, her voice tinged with sadness. If this is how it must be, then so be it. But know this, Ashoka, I do not seek to destroy. I seek to create. And perhaps, one day, you will understand that. What she proclaimed was truth she didn't harbor the thought of destruction any longer, she saw it something beneath her level. After finishing her last word her head split revealing the eye of Ingramenu, her phantasm already manifested bending her features further. I'll try to make it painless Emperor. Chapter 38 
As Charybdis stood before him, Ashoka's eyes burned with determination. He lunged forward, swinging his sword with all his might, but she effortlessly dodged his strikes. Her movements were fluid, almost mocking in their ease. She's toying with me. How is she so fast? He thought, gritting his teeth. He struck again, harder this time, but Charybdis danced around his attacks, not even bothering to counter. His frustration grew, fueling a surge of energy within him. Instinctively, he began to channel his battle aura, his body glowing with a faint light. What is this power? He wondered, feeling a strange new strength coursing through his veins. I have to push harder. With renewed vigor, he attacked again, his blows carrying more force. Charybdis, however, remained unbothered, effortlessly parrying his every move. You have some potential, she remarked, sidestepping another attack. But it won't be enough. Ashoka's frustration grew into a burning determination. He felt a deeper power awakening within him, his unique skill, Emperor, activating. His mind cleared, his strength increased, and he felt a surge of authority over his own mana. I can do this. I must do this, he told himself, launching a more powerful assault. His sword strikes were now faster and stronger, each blow carrying the weight of his newfound power. Yet, Charybdis remained untouchable, evading his attacks with an almost casual grace. You fight well, Ashoka, she said, her voice calm amidst the clash of steel and magic. But you are still just a man, facing a power far beyond your comprehension. His frustration grew. He could feel the fear creeping in as he looked at Charybdis's third eye, its three pupils staring back at him with an unsettling intensity. But his unique skill helped him fend off the fear, bolstering his resolve. I will not succumb to fear. I am an emperor. I am Ashoka, he reminded himself, his resolve hardening. With a roar, he channeled all his strength into a final, desperate charge. But Charybdis sighed, raising her hand. With a flick of her wrist, she sent a wave of energy that knocked him back, his sword flying from his grasp. He hit the ground hard, the wind knocked out of him. You are brave, Charybdis acknowledged, walking towards him. But bravery alone will not save you. Ashoka struggled to his feet, his body aching. His battle aura flickered, and the power of his unique skill felt like a hollow echo. He was an emperor without a kingdom, a warrior without an army. The realization stung, but he refused to give up. You think you can defeat me? He spat, his voice defiant. I will not bow to a Danov. Charybdis's expression softened slightly. This fight is pointless, Ashoka. You have spirit, but you lack the power to back it up. Yield, and we can find another way. Ashoka's eyes blazed with determination, but he knew deep down that she was right. His strength was waning, and despite his best efforts, he could not land a decisive blow. The futility of his struggle weighed heavily on him. With a final, desperate effort, he charged at her. Charybdis didn't even bother to touch him. Instead, she manipulated his blood, causing him to levitate off the ground. The pain was excruciating, and he gasped as he hung helplessly in the air. How is she doing this? He wondered, his mind racing. This is not a fight I can win. You are strong, Ashoka, Charybdis said, her voice firm but not unkind. But this is not your battle to win. His vision blurred, the edges darkening. He could feel the last of his strength slipping away. With a ragged breath, he whispered, I will not bow. Charybdis sighed, a look of disappointment crossing her face. Very well. With a gentle touch, she increased the pressure on his blood, and Ashoka's eyes rolled back as he lost consciousness. She lowered him to the ground, careful not to harm him further. You have potential, Ashoka. But you need to learn, she murmured, looking down at his unconscious form. With a sigh, she turned and walked away, leaving him to recover from their one-sided battle. She hoped that in time, he would understand the purpose of his summoning and join her in the realization of her ambitions. It will take some re-education but she was sure she could achieve it. As the dim light of the underground chamber flickered, Charybdis placed the unconscious Ashoka into a secure cell. She cast a lingering glance at his still form before turning and making her way to the main hall. Charybdis summoned her son, Crota, 
and the Lord of Darkness. They arrived promptly, the air around them charged with their formidable presences. Crota, stood tall and resolute, while the Lord of Darkness exuded an ancient, inscrutable aura. We must prepare for war, Charybdis declared, her voice echoing through the hall. Our plans for Lanka will not go unchallenged. We need an army, one that can withstand any opposition. Crota's eyes glinted with determination. What do you need of me, mother? Charybdis's gaze hardened with resolve. I need you to gather intelligent monsters and name them, bestowing upon them power and purpose. Prioritize the enlistment of magents for our cavalry. They will be the backbone of our forces. Magical beasts must be domesticated completely and trained for combat. Once that is done give each one a magical beast to bond with over time making them fight and learn the powers of each other. Obviously it's only common sense for them to have similar power set, I will set up a mass production facility of RC implants and quinqua weapons production derived from their bonded beast. The Lord of Darkness nodded, understanding the gravity of the task. What if the creatures within Jura are insufficient? Then go beyond Jura, Charybdis commanded, her tone unwavering. Capture and recruit from other territories. We cannot afford to be complacent. We must build an army that is not only powerful but also loyal. Crota's jaw set with determination. I will see to it, mother. We will have the army we need. Charybdis gave a curt nod, her eyes meeting those of her son and the Lord of Darkness. This is our time. We will not be stopped. Begin immediately. The future of Lanka depends on our actions now. With that, Crota and the Lord of Darkness set out to fulfill their tasks. The halls of the kingdom buzzed with activity as preparations for war commenced. Charybdis became busy with the Quinqua production factory and writing books to teach, those deemed unfit for battle, the ways of handling other tasks. She also set a deadline for the army formation, within one month the forces of Lanka will subjugate the demon realm completely. Chapter 39 Charybdis stood before the massive portal made from pure magisteel, its unbelievably mystical surface and complex structure the direct result of her extensive research. This portal would serve as a crucial component in her strategy, acting as both a camp for the exhausted cavalry and a transportation hub for the army to reach any battlefield efficiently. Around her, the bustling activity of Lunka's growing army continued. One month had passed, and though they had made significant progress, the numbers were still not where they needed to be. Currently, the army boasted 1,000 magents equipped with their quinqua, with another 3,000 in training. Among these, 47 were dragon quinqua soldiers, bonded to magical beasts of dragon lineage, elevating their strength to be on par with barren rank and abive demons once their RC grafting was complete. Crota approached, his expression filled with remorse. Mother, I apologize for the inefficiency. We have not yet reached the numbers we need. Charybdis waved off his apology with a gentle but firm hand. Crota, there is no need for apologies. The deadline was set to create constraints and drive urgency. I never expected to build an army from scratch capable of fighting billions of demons in such a short time. She looked over the soldiers, noting their potential. More importantly, 150 of the 1,000 have shown high potential. Given enough time, they will inevitably become strong and strengthen our kingdom. Crota's eyes shone with determination. I will continue to push them, mother. We will reach the numbers we need and beyond. Charybdis nodded, her mind already working through the next steps. Good. Focus on quality as much as quantity. Each soldier must be strong, capable, and loyal. We will need every advantage we can muster. The portal hummed with latent energy, a testament to the immense time and resources Charybdis had poured into its creation. Crota, she said, turning to her son, ensure that the training continues without interruption. And keep an eye on those with high potential. They will be our key assets in the battles to come. Crota bowed his head in acknowledgement. Yes, mother. I will see to it. As Crota turned to leave, Charybdis continued while observing the portal, I have made a breakthrough in the production mechanism of RC cells. This new method should enhance the grafting process significantly and increase the success rate of the process. Crota's eyes widened in surprise and hope. That is excellent news, mother. 
it will surely accelerate our progress. Charybdis looked out over her burgeoning army, feeling a surge of pride and determination. Lanka would rise, and with it, her vision of a new world order. Turning back to Crota, she continued, we need to reach a total of 40,000 soldiers to completely take over the demon realm. Veldora, you, and I can eliminate about four to five lineages of demons within one day, but we need enough forces to establish control immediately after. Crota nodded. Understood, mother. We will continue to recruit and train as many as we can. With the improved RC cell production, we can expedite the process. Good, Charybdis affirmed. We need to ensure that when we strike, it is decisive and overwhelming. One day of military operation should be all it takes to secure our hold over the realm. As Crota turned leave again Charybdis called out to Crota once again, call Harita her mission is complete, tell her it's time to hunt. Crota nodded his expression serious. As you wish mother. Harita moved silently through the realm of the elemental lord of fire which she had been staying at for the past month. Her nature as a demi-spirit which has been further enhanced allowed her to blend seamlessly with the other inhabitants. Her mission was critical to Charybdis's plans, to subjugate the power of all th elemental lords as her underlings, assimilating their power into the kingdom by hook or by crook. Her master had entrusted her with this mission of utmost importance. The realm of the elemental lord of fire was a volatile place, filled with flames and heat that would have been unbearable for any ordinary being. However, her demi-spirit essence made it easier for her to navigate the searing environment. As Harita gathered information, she awaited the signal from her master. The message came through the pager link, as master had called it, the voice of Crota resonating in her mind. It's time to hunt. With a surge of determination, Harita activated the second phase of her mission. Charybdis, from afar, used her immense power to block any path of escape by making a membrane of her marble phantasm around the dimension, ensuring that the elemental lord and her minions were trapped. Harita moved with deadly precision, her form shifting and adapting to the environment as she approached her targets. Her eyes gleamed with a predatory light and a grin spread on her face in anticipation of the food she is about to have, as she zeroed in on the elemental lord of fire, who stood surrounded by her most loyal underlings. A fierce battle erupted. The fire spirits fought back with all their might, but Harita was relentless. She unleashed her demi-spirit abilities, her power enhanced by the data she had gathered. As she fought, a blood mist began to form around her, solidifying into an external white appendage with red veins exposed in it. As time passed Harita was completely covered in a coating of similar material and her form grew to be of enormous size with spikes from her back blazing with heat. Her form adorned with a single, blazing eye, sharp claws, and a body covered in red-blue, flame-like fur that radiated intense heat. It was her owl form as her master called it. The fire spirits were overwhelmed by her sheer physical might and her ability to consume fire. No matter what the elemental lore tried, Harita's ability of consuming fire allowed her to gain the upper hand. Her claws slashed through the elemental minions with ease, absorbing their fiery essence and growing stronger with each attack. The elemental lord of fire, realizing the gravity of the situation, unleashed a torrent of flames, but Harita was undeterred. She countered with a wave of energy, their powers clashing violently. Through sheer force of will and strategy, Harita gained the upper hand. The elemental lord, now weakened and cornered, let out a final, desperate attack. Harita absorbed the attack, using it to fuel her own power, and with a final, decisive blow, she consumed the elemental lord of fire eating her spiritual body like a snack. Her monstrous visage underwent change during her feast itself. Her height that once stood at 14 meters now stood at about 35 meters the spikes on her back had changed into corrupted wings that undoubtedly once belonged to the fire elemental lord. But Harita didn't notice these changes as she was bearing pain of having herself conceptually transformed once again. Charybdis who was watching this allowed her power to aid this transformation via Theer Soul Corridor. With a final roar Harita transformed into the new strongest mortal representative of the fire element. The assimilation was complete. Harita stood amidst the ruins of her enemies, her body glowing with radiance. She felt a surge of strength and a deep understanding of the element she had conquered. Returning to Lanka, Harita entered Charybdis's chamber, her presence announced by a subtle shift in the ambient energy. 
Charybdis looked up from her work, her eyes gleaming with curiosity and expectation. Master, Harita began, bowing respectfully, the mission is complete. I have consumed the elemental Lord of Fire and her underlings, assimilating their power into myself. Good job, as expected of you Harita, you've worked hard why don't you rest for some days and then we'll go over what's next for you since you no longer need RC implants or spirit injections, Charybdis got up and patted Harita's head. Be proud you've been perfected. Chapter 40 Harita spent most of her free time that she WQS grenaded, in the training grounds, honing her skills with her sword and learning to manipulate her kagun as Master called it. Her movements were fluid and precise, each swing a way to probe the extent of her grown strength as a full-fledged elemental lord. The bloodlust that had once driven her had subsided, replaced by a clarity of purpose and control over her powers ever ains she had her evolution. Her days were a mix of rigorous training and rest, her body often seeking the solace of sleep to recover from the intense physical exertion. As dusk settled over Lanka, Harita decided to take a break from her routine. The settlement outside the palace walls had grown considerably housing thousands of magents, it was bustling with activity, a stark contrast to the serene palace grounds. She made her way to a bar run by a group of Tengu women, their laughter and chatter filling the air. Inside, she spotted Crota sitting alone at a corner table, an exhausted look on his face as he nursed a drink. Mind if I join you? Harita asked, sliding into the seat opposite him without waiting for an answer. Crota looked up, his serious demeanor briefly softening at the sight of her. Sure, he said, his voice weary. Harita waved over one of the Tengu women, ordering a drink for herself. Long day. She asked, taking a sip. Crota sighed. You could say that. Training the new recruits, managing logistics. It never ends. Harita nodded, her tone more reserved. Yeah, it's been tough all around. How are the new recruits holding up? Crota gave a small smile. They're getting there. Slowly but surely. The conversation felt awkward, stilted, with long pauses punctuating their exchanges. Harita's natural reserved nature clashed with Crota's seriousness, neither quite sure how to bridge the gap between them. It was also fueled by the previous stance in their relationship which had been completely overturned. As the night wore on and the alcohol began to take effect, Harita found herself relaxing a bit more. She glanced at Crota, a small smile playing on her lips. You know, she said, quoting Charybdis, sometimes you need to relax. Even Master says so. Crota raised an eyebrow. Mother said that? Harita chuckled softly. Yeah, she did. Surprised me too, but she has her moments of wisdom. Crota's demeanor remained serious, but there was a hint of amusement in his eyes at the shift in personality Harita had since the last time they met. I'll keep that in mind. Their conversation continued, gradually easing into a more comfortable rhythm. The magical alcohol loosened their tongues, allowing for a more genuine exchange. Harita's guarded nature softened slightly, her words flowing more freely. I guess it's just hard, Harita admitted after a while. I just don't know what to do in life other than what I've been told to do. Crota nodded. I understand. We're all under a lot of pressure. But we can't let it consume us. We have to find moments to breathe, to enjoy. Something. The once emotionless boy now turned an osur seemed to have gained some wisdom after spending countless hours with different people. Crota's emotionless demeanor had softened considerably over time OM his post as the commander-in-chief. You're right. Maybe we do need to find those moments. Harita agreed. Their conversation, though still marked by Harita's initial restraint, had shifted into a more personal, meaningful exchange. The bond between them, though still fragile, was beginning to form. Eventually, they decided to part ways for the night. Harita stretched, feeling the effects of the alcohol and the long day. Well, Crota, it's been... interesting. We should do this again sometime. Crota nodded, his expression unreadable. Maybe we will. As they went their separate ways, Harita couldn't help but feel a sense of satisfaction. It wasn't love, but it wasn't coldness either. It was something in between, that Harita found unable to comprehend. Charybdis sat on her throne, 
her third eye permanently activated for the past weeks, observing the entire kingdom with unwavering vigilance. She had seen the interaction between Harita and Crota and smirked at the future prospects between her loyal minion and her son. For more than a month, Charybdis had been working relentlessly, not resting for even a single second. Her tireless efforts in research had opened up various prospects. Shifting her focus from biological advancements, she had recently delved into the development of weapons. However, a conversation with Melim about Stardust had sparked her interest in a different direction. Inspired, Charybdis pushed her resources into creating a magicule furnace. She remembered the Holy Grail from an anime she had once watched, Fate Stay Night. While she was unaware of its intricate details, she knew it was a sort of magic furnace that refined mana to its purest form. Hoping to achieve something similar, she set to work. The result was a very large reactor. Though it couldn't be used in battle without a giant ship, it produced magicules that were 30% purer than her own. However, it couldn't achieve even 1% of the properties of stardust. The inefficiency stemmed from her inability to figure out the natural regeneration and production of magicules, which she knew had something to do with souls. To solve this, she had sent out soul collectors to the mainland continent. The reactor used crystallized forms of these souls as generators for the complex mechanism of purifying magicules. It was a Herculean task, and it always failed to achieve calculated results due to the randomized reset frequency of the souls. The soul's natural cycle disrupted the consistency of the energy output, causing unpredictable fluctuations in the reactor's performance. Resonance in the souls was something she could only hope to achieve. Despite these setbacks, Charybdis wasn't discouraged. She saw potential in this reactor, envisioning it as a catalyst for a new wave of technology for the common man in the future. For now, the reactor served a different purpose. It lessened the need for a larger army, as Charybdis had decided to build a ship that utilized seven such reactors. Its firepower would be more than enough to obliterate dimensional boundaries. This vessel would be a marvel of magic and technology, reducing the reliance on sheer numbers in battle and enhancing their strategic capabilities. As she continued her work, Charybdis's mind raced with possibilities. The path ahead was challenging, but her relentless drive and vision for the future kept her focused. Charybdis rose from her throne, her eyes never leaving the storm gathering on the horizon. Thunder rumbled ominously, echoing through the halls of her palace. The moon, tinged with an eerie red hue, cast a blood-like glow over the land, intensifying the sense of foreboding. Behind her, four translucent spheres seemed to come to life as they floated behind her. At first glance, they seemed like a mix of slime and molten lava, pulsing with a fluctuating light. Their exact nature was a mystery to all but her, leaving those who saw them to speculate about their purpose and power. As she stepped into the moonlight, the new addition to her visage became visibly a necklace around her collarbone that, upon closer inspection, seemed to merge with her skin. This strange adornment hinted at the extent of her experiments, merging organic and inorganic materials in ways that defied understanding. It's time, she muttered to herself, her voice barely audible over the rising wind. The bionic slimes behind her responded instantly, wrapping around her body and forming an armor of gold and purple. The transformation was both elegant and formidable. A blend of beauty and power that made her appear almost divine in nature as her draconic features became prominent with her hands gaining claws covered in armor and scales in her exposed areas. The eye in her eye glowing with a purple tint for just a moment as she pulled back her scrying on the kingdom. Thunder cracked violently, illuminating the night sky with a blinding flash. The kingdom of Lanka seemed to hold its breath, aware that something monumental was about to unfold. Crota, summon the army. We will strike at midnight, Charybdis commanded, her voice steady and resolute. Crota, who had just entered her chamber, bowed deeply. As you wish, mother, he replied, his tone filled with determination. He quickly left to carry out her orders, understanding the gravity of the moment. Charybdis gazed out at the approaching storm, her mind sharp and focused. Tonight would mark the beginning of a new era, one that she had meticulously planned for. The power she had harnessed, the army she had built, and the technological marvels she had created were all coming together for this moment. Lightning split the sky, illuminating the landscape in stark relief. 
The storm on the horizon mirrored the storm with inherent unstoppable childish giddiness ready to reshape the world to her whims. As Charybdis continued to gaze forward, the distant shore of the uninhabited part of the island buzzed with light. The massive ship, a marvel of her ingenuity, came to life, its engines humming with raw power as a roaring sound this world never heard in its existence came to life guided by her thoughts. The ship, resembling a dragon in structure, soared into the air, a symbolic design paying homage to the might of her lineage. Charybdis spread her wings, their form changed to resemble the bionic structure of her armor and flew to the ship. She stood at the ready, waiting for her army to gather, the anticipation in the air palpable. Father, it is time, she called, her voice carrying with the wind. A moment later, Veldora's presence manifested, the air around him crackling with his immense power. The storm dragon appeared beside her, his eyes filled with a mixture of pride and excitement at the ship that dwarfed him in size by a large margin. Charybdis, Veldora rumbled, his voice echoing like thunder. You have done well. The preparations are impressive. She nodded, her gaze unwavering. We strike tonight, father. The culmination of our efforts begins now. Charybdis stood silent, her wings outstretched, the eight pulsing translucent spheres behind her casting an eerie glow different from her armor. Thunder rumbled in the distance, and the moon, tinged red as if in anticipation of the coming conflict, hung low in the sky. Below her, the army began to gather, magents, moving into formation, the light from the hovering dragon-like ship illuminating the scene. She watched as they assembled, each member a result of the relentless preparation and determination that had brought them to this moment. As the final ranks fell into place, Charybdis pulled the ship nearer to the ground and stepped forward, her eyes sweeping over the sea of faces below her. With a deep breath, she began to speak, her voice naturally loud to reach everyone. Warriors of Lanka, she started, her tone solemn and commanding. Tonight, we embark on a journey that will reshape the very fabric of our world. We strike not just for conquest, but for a future forged in our own path. The crowd was silent, hanging on her every word. This path will not be easy, Charybdis continued, her eyes intense, her years of experience as a politician coming in use as her oratory was natural obviously enhanced by her skill. We will lose allies, we will face challenges that will test the very limits of our endurance. But remember this, every sacrifice, every drop of blood spilled, will never be in vain. Each of you is an integral part of the change that is to come. Together, we will bring forth a new era, one where our power and vision reign supreme. A murmur of agreement rippled through the ranks, growing steadily into a roar of approval. She raised a hand, calling for silence once more. Tonight, we march. We fly. We fight. And we will not stop until our goals are realized. Prepare yourselves, for this is just the beginning. The demon realm will know our name, and they will tremble. For tomorrow, she rumbled. For tomorrow came their Unision chant ready to fight. The storm on the horizon crackled with uncontrollable intensity, lightning illuminating the night sky as countless powerful presence bared their presence in support of their queen. As the army roared once more, Charybdis took to the air, Veldora following close behind. The massive ship began its ascent, its engines humming with energy, ready to lead the charge. The time for change had come, and under Charybdis's command, the world would never be the same again. Chapter 41 POV, Crota Commander-in-Chief I stood at the forefront of our legion, my six wings spread wide, as the dimensional energies enveloped us in a dome. Around me, my soldiers, each bonded with their majestic magical beasts, held their quinquas at the ready. The weapons, infused with the essence of their bonded creatures, hummed with power, eager for the impending battle. Weapons ready, I commanded, my voice carrying over the quiet anticipation. The magents adjusted their grips on their quinquas, eyes locked on the dun which was beginning to clear. Soon our vi cleared and on the horizon where the weakened territory of the black lineage awaited our advance. The decaying stench of demonic presence hung heavy in the air as we materialized in the forsaken dimension, our teleportation spell executed flawlessly. My six wings spread wide, catching the dim light filtering through the dense, ominous clouds above. Around me, the Majin Legion stood ready, each with their quinquas pulsing with anticipation. Charge! 
I roared, my voice echoing across the desolate landscape. Instantly, the legion surged forward, the ground shaking beneath our combined weight. The quinquas of the magents flared to life, infused with the essence of their bonded beasts. A wave of magicules surged through the air as each quinqua unleashed its unique abilities, ready to rend and tear through any demonic resistance. I spotted the leaderless subordinates of the primordial black nearby, their forms uncertain about the conflict. Without hesitation, I activated my skill, Wrath of Earth. The ground beneath them trembled violently as I summoned massive air slashes coated with its effect, each one tearing through the ranks of demons with devastating force dealing extra damage due to their foreign nature. The air filled with the cries of the demons as they struggled to defend themselves against our onslaught. They were caught off guard, unable to mount a coordinated defense against our swift and deadly assault. Our advance was relentless, driven by the resolve to fulfill the desire of our queen. As I flew amidst the chaos, leading by example, I could feel the exhilaration of battle coursing through my veins. With every swing of my arms and every command I issued, I knew that we were one step closer to victory in this pivotal battle of the war. POV Third Person Amidst the swirling chaos of battle, Crota found himself facing a formidable opponent a towering demon, with multiple faces throughout its body. The creature lunged at him with savage ferocity, claws slashing through the air with deadly precision. Crota's six arms moved with fluid grace, deflecting the blows with his raw strength, each strike causing the demon to fall back. But it seemed futile as the when one face disappeared two replaced it. Crota had come face to face with a cockroach that couldn't be killed easily. As the demon pressed its assault, Crota knew he needed to turn the tide of battle decisively since each second wasted was their loss. With a deep breath, he focused his inner energy, channeling the essence of his skill, judgment. In that fleeting moment, time seemed to slow around him as he materialized the concept of victory itself a blinding aura of light and determination that surrounded him like an impenetrable shield. With a single call his special quinqua materialized in air, crafted personally by his mother. Its form a mix between a mace and a double-edged axe with a skull at its base that seemed to be alive with power. Empowered by this manifestation, Crota's movements became more precise, his strikes aiming to pummel the demon as fast as possible. The demon, caught off guard by the sudden shift in Crota's prowess, faltered under the onslaught. With a final, decisive strike, Crota unleashed the full force of his skill. Driving his quinqua deep into the demon's core and activating its ability of instantaneous death along with the continuous loop to kill the cockroach within seconds. The creature let out a screeching roar of agony as it dissolved into shadows, permanently vanquished by the overwhelming manifestation of victory that Crota had brought forth. As the battlefield quieted around him, Crota stood triumphant, the concept of victory dissipating into the air around him. This manifestation had not only empowered just him but all of Lunka's forces that were engaged at this moment around the demon realm. After observing for a bit more with his heightened senses and finding all that Kemens either killed or subjugated, Crota marched forward towards the territory of John in order to assist his deputy the Elemental Lord. The Elemental Lord of Darkness stood at the edge of the region of the primordial John, the air thick with the acrid scent of decay and demonic presence. His legion, equipped with special armor designed to enhance their effectiveness in the harsh conditions, waited in disciplined silence behind him. Each soldier's quinqua, pulsed with latent power, ready to unleash devastation upon their enemies. As soon as we had teleported into the dimension, the oppressive energy of this forsaken place pressed down upon us. However, our specially crafted armor mitigated its effects. My spirit and wings spread wide, shimmering with an ethereal darkness yet glowing with brightness. As a spirit, I was a natural bane to the demon race, my very presence a threat to their existence. Charge! I commanded, my voice a low rumble that carried through the thick, foul air. The legion surged forward, their armor glinting ominously as they activated their quinquas. Magic flared, and the air filled with the sounds of battle roaring of magic being utilized, clashing weapons, and the guttural cries of demons meeting their end. In the midst of this chaos, my gaze fell upon a figure standing defiantly in the distance. Primordial Johnny a demon who took the form of a little girl, yet wielded the devastating power of nuclear magic. Her innocent appearance belied the destructive force she could unleash, and I knew confronting her would be no small feat. As I approached, John's eyes locked onto mine, 
a mischievous smile playing on her lips. She raised a small hand, and a sphere of blinding energy began to form, crackling with nuclear power. Elemental Lord, I haven't fought one of you guys since forever she taunted, her voice sweet yet filled with malice. Do you think you can withstand my magic? I drew my sword, a weapon gifted to me by an old friend, its blade made entirely of blue light. The contrast of its brilliance against my darkness was striking, but it was a sword that had served me through countless battles. Without responding, I surged forward, my spirit and wings propelling me with incredible speed. John's sphere of energy grew larger, its radiance intensifying. I knew I had to act quickly to prevent her from unleashing its full potential and damaging our forces. Primordial call, I intoned, invoking my most potent intrinsic skill. Instantly, all that was dark around us heeded my command, bending to my will. The dark itself became my ally, wrapping around John and constricting her movements. Her eyes widened in surprise as she struggled against the tendrils of black energy. What is this? She hissed, her playful demeanor slipping. With a swift motion, I unleashed a barrage of dark tendrils, aiming to bind her before she could cast her spell. John's laughter echoed through the battlefield as she deftly evaded my attack, the sphere of nuclear energy now blazing like a miniature sun. Realizing I needed to escalate my efforts, I drew upon the darkest depths of my power, summoning a vortex of shadow that enveloped both of us. The swirling darkness clashed with the radiant nuclear energy, creating a maelstrom of conflicting forces. John's eyes widened slightly, sensing the intensity of my attack. Impressive, she admitted, her voice now tinged with genuine respect. But can you handle this? With a flick of her wrist, the sphere of nuclear energy shot toward me. I barely had time to react, raising a barrier of concentrated shadows to absorb the impact. The explosion was deafening, the force of it sending shockwaves through the battlefield. Through the smoke and debris, I saw John preparing another attack. Summoning all my strength, I channeled the essence of darkness into my sword, its blade now wreathed in shadow flames. I lunged forward, my sword slicing through the air with deadly precision. John's eyes widened as I closed the distance, her nuclear magic struggling to keep up with my relentless assault as her power became weakened with each slash with my sword consuming it. With a final, decisive strike, I drove my sword into her core, the shadow flames consuming her form, just as that happened a wave of empowerment washed over me. Recognizing it as Crota's concept of victory I smirked, satisfied with beating the brat to eliminating the main boss of my Rigon. John let out a piercing scream as the nuclear energy within her dissipated, her body crumbling into ashes. The battlefield fell silent for a moment, the demons pausing in shock at the fall of their powerful leader. Seizing the opportunity, I raised my sword high, the aura of victory still shimmering around me. Forward. I commanded, my voice filled with authority. Eliminate every demon in our path. My legion, emboldened by the sight of John's defeat alongside Crota's skill, surged with renewed vigor. The air crackled with the energy of our combined assault as we pushed deeper into enemy territory, each step bringing us closer to total victory. As I led the charge, I waited for Crota to reach my position according to the strategy advised by the Queen. Chapter 42 Charybdis sat upon her throne on the massive, dragon-shaped ship, cables connecting her armor to the ship. From the outside, her eyes glowed an ethereal blue, but within, she was immersed in the ship's interface, her vision filled with streams of data and system analytics. Her army had already teleported to the demon realm, and now it was time for her to make her move. She could see the battle unfolding through her interface, each soldier's position marked and updated in real time by their weapons and the small spiritual chips. Her mind was a storm of calculations, strategies, and predictions, all working towards one goal, complete subjugation of the demon realm. The ship hummed with power, the reactors working tirelessly to maintain the vessel's readiness. Charybdis took a deep breath, feeling the ship's pull synchronize with her own it was an extension of herself at this point. She focused her thoughts, commanding the ship's systems with precision. Open a new rift, she ordered in her mind. The ship responded instantly, its mechanisms whirring to life. Outside, the air shimmered and distorted as a massive rift began to tear open. The sheer size of the portal was awe-inspiring, as it became visible from the shores of the main continent. 
Charybdis watched through her interface as the rift stabilized, creating a passage large enough for the colossal vessel. Engage thrusters, she commanded. The ship responded with a low rumble, and slowly, it began to move forward. The ship's dragon-like form cut through the air with a not-so-silent grace, heading towards the rift. Charybdis's eyes never left the interface, her mind calculating every variable, every possible outcome. She was in absolute control, almost a dream come true, and nothing would stand in her way. She watched as the ship entered the rift, the portal closing behind them with a thunderous clap. The battle had already been won. As Charybdis appeared in the demon realm, she found herself in the territory of Rouge, the primordial red. With Rouge having long departed to live as a demon lord, Charybdis scanned the entire realm with a bored look, counting every demon within it. The central machine in her ship whirred to life, the sphere within it beginning to rotate. This was the large-scale version of the spell she had used on Nalim's crown, designed to absorb the souls of dying demons throughout the realm. The cables attached to her began to glow yellow and black, signifying the different lineages of demons, as the first attack led by Crota and her pet elemental lord began. A small grunt escaped her as the necklace embedded in her collarbone heated up, the once dull crystals glowing as they absorbed the souls of the demons. Her eyes widened, and she grinned with ecstasy as she felt the souls of the primordial demons entering her being. The colors, save for red, lit up in the cables. In the distance, a group of red lineage demons decided to attack her ship. She's vulnerable. Attack now. One of them shouted, their voices rising in a frantic chorus. For the honor of Rouge. I will stop her. Charybdis sighed, her voice echoing with irritation. Annoying bugs, she muttered, her eyes narrowing. Activating another weapon, the dragon head of the ship transformed into a long blade reminiscent of Storm Border. Light began to rotate in concentric circles, the sheer holy presence threatening to tear the demon realm apart. A powerful whirring sound that grew louder and more intense with each passing moment. The noise was a rhythmic, pulsating drone, a constant reminder of the immense power being unleashed. The bands of light rotated with an electric crackle, adding a sharp, high-pitched undertone to the deep, resonant with thrum of the turbines of the engines. The cacophony built to a deafening crescendo, shaking the ground beneath with almost its sound. The demons tried to flee and teleport, but none could escape as Charybdis's monotonic voice rang out, divine departure. The sound of an immense power buildup boomed through the air, followed by a deafening crack as holy light erupted in all directions. The entire Rouge territory was evaporated in an instant. Clouds gathered crackling with the very same holy lightning, causing rain to fall in the demon realm. Meanwhile, in the territory of Blanc, the primordial white, Veldora was mercilessly beating Blanc. Each of Veldora's punches echoed like thunderclaps. Blanc, reeling from the onslaught, looked up just in time to see the blinding flash from Charybdis's attack. Despair washed over her. How can we fight against such power? She thought, her heart sinking further as she felt the realm's balance tip irrevocably. Back on the ship, Charybdis got up, the cables still attached to her back. She walked to the edge and looked at the horizon. Her smirk widened as she saw the scattered demons. The falling rain, heavy and unyielding, mirrored the chaos she had wrought. Some crows are here she called out to the fallen angels that she sensed trying to escape from the careless Veldora in the territory of Blanc. One of the spheres floating beside her transformed into a bow without a string, and as she held it, an arrow made from the pure magicules of the reactors condensed, laced with holy magic. As she drew the bow, a concentrated beam of light hummed with power. Divine arrow, she repeated, releasing the arrow. The arrow whirred across two territories silently but the rotating arrow began destabilizing as it neared its target. And as soon as it reached the group of terrified fallen angels it lost its form completely and transformed into two spheres of light and an explosion of pure spiritons and magicules. But its mechanism wasn't that simple the magicules and spiritons turned into metaphysical waves as they interfered in hyperbolic lines creating fringes of destruction a sight of absolute beauty. But the intense burning of the atmosphere caused the area to explode. The sound of the explosion was belated, the light a blinding burst in a torrent of calm. The arrow erasing a quarter of Blank's territory. Blank's eyes widened in horror as the arrow obliterated her realm. Impossible. 
this power. She trembled, the overwhelming force of Charybdis's attack breaking her will. Veldora's laughter echoed across the realm, chilling and triumphant. Ha 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 ha. That girl sure is over the top just like her father. Charybdis stood, her eyes gleaming with satisfaction, as the rain continued to pour, the demon realm trembling under her overwhelming power. The demon realm had no choice but to acknowledge the unstoppable force that Charybdis had become. Stones and reviews are welcome. Chapter 43 Minutes after the appearance of Charybdis in the demon realm. Primordial Blanc stood in her realm, her territory serene under the pale, ghostly light that permeated the demon world. Suddenly, the air vibrated with an ominous energy. Her heart skipped a beat as she saw the massive form of a dragon materialize in her skies. The ground trembled as the beast roared, sending a shockwave through her domain. Veldora. She gasped, her eyes widening in shock. Without a single word, the dragon unleashed a torrent of destructive energy, ripping through her territory with unstoppable force. Storms brewed in an instant, lightning cracking the sky, and winds howling with terrifying ferocity. Her demons, caught off guard, were annihilated almost instantly. Blanc watched in horror as her realm crumbled under the dragon's assault. Why is Veldora attacking me? I have done nothing to provoke him. I'm not like Noir, she thought frantically, trying to understand the reason behind the unprovoked attack. But there was no time to ponder. She had to defend her home. Summoning her power, Blanc flew towards Veldora, her body glowing with a white, ethereal light. She launched a barrage of spells at him, each one crackling with elemental force. But Veldora only laughed, a deep, rumbling sound that shook the air. He transformed into his humanoid form, the same terrifying visage he had when he killed Noir. Blank's heart sank as she recalled the tales of Veldora's brutal strength. Now, facing him directly, she realized those stories were not exaggerations. Veldora's eyes gleamed with a sadistic light as he swatted away her attacks like they were nothing more than bothersome insects. He moved with a terrifying grace, each of his blows powerful enough to shake the ground. Is this all you've got, Blanc? Veldora taunted, his voice mocking. You're even weaker than I expected. Blanc gritted her teeth, fury and fear mingling within her. She poured more of her energy into her attacks, her body radiating intense heat as she summoned the full extent of her powers. But no matter what she did, Veldora shrugged off her efforts effortlessly, his laughter ringing in her ears. He caught her mid-air, gripping her by the throat. Pathetic, he said, squeezing just enough to make her gasp for breath. You're nothing to be bossed as one of the primordials. Blanc struggled, her hands clawing at his iron grip, but it was futile. Veldora tossed her aside like a ragdoll, sending her crashing into the ground. She tried to rise, but her body was battered, her energy nearly depleted. It was then that she felt eat a massive surge of power in the distance. She turned her gaze towards the horizon, her eyes widening in disbelief. Charybdis had appeared, her ship a looming shadow in the skies. The central machine of the ship whirred to life, and she could feel the pull of its power as it began absorbing the souls of the dying demons. Blank's heart filled with dread. No. This can't be happening is someone attempting to evolve into a demon lord using demon souls? She thought desperately. She tried to stand, but Veldora's foot pressed down on her back, pinning her to the ground. Veldora distracted from the cool mechanism of the ship momentarily allowed Blanc to escape. But it was the foolishness of the primordial white, to think that she could escape. Veldora began mercilessly beating Blanc just using enough strength to only damage enough that could be healed naturally by the demon. Each of Veldora's punches echoed like thunderclaps. Blanc, reeling from the onslaught, looked up just in time to see the blinding flash from the build-up of Charybdis's attack. Despair washed over her. How can we fight against such power? She thought, her heart sinking further as she felt the realm's balance tip irrevocably. She could only watch in horror as Charybdis activated her ship's weapon. The dragon head of the ship transformed into a long blade, light rotating in concentric circles. The sheer holy presence threatening to tear the demon realm apart. Divine Departure Charybdis's voice echoed, followed by a blinding flash of light. The entire Rouge territory was evaporated in an instant. 
Veldora caught her by the throat again to stop the insect from squirming and watch the show. Rain began to fall, heavy and unyielding, soaking Blank's battered form. She struggled to breathe, each breath a painful effort. She felt Veldora's grip loosen as he turned his attention to the devastation Charybdis had wrought. Her sight then focused on an arrow of light reaching her territory. The arrow erased a quarter of her territory. Blank's eyes widened in horror as the arrow obliterated her realm. Impossible. This power. Blanc whispered, despair washing over her. She looked up at Veldora, her vision blurring. Veldora's laughter echoed across the realm, chilling and triumphant. Ha 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 ha. That girl sure is over the top just like her father. Why? Why are you doing this? She managed to ask, her voice weak. Veldora smirked down at her, his eyes cold. Hmm, how would I know? He said simply, before turning his back on her. Blank's heart sank further as she realized the futility of her struggle. Veldora didn't even bother to attack her anymore because he had felt what was happening to Blanc. Her ego, which as a spiritual being was basically her existence, had begun crumbling. He didn't need to interfere as she won't be able to maintain her form and will be dispersed back to the cycle of reincarnation loke all demons do when they die. At the same time of Veldora's descent. Harita's massive form loomed over the violet region, a colossus of elemental power and fury. Her Kagun manifestation, towering at 35 meters, exuded an aura of dominance as she faced off against the reckless primordial purple and her demon horde. The primordial purple, known for her arrogant demeanor and mastery of nuclear flame and poison magic, stood defiantly before Harita, her confidence unshaken despite the overwhelming presence of the elemental lord of fire. You dare challenge me, insignificant creature. The primordial purple taunted, her voice laced with childish arrogance. I doubt you'd live long enough against empty magic. With a dismissive wave of her hand, the primordial purple unleashed a torrent of nuclear flame towards Harita. The searing heat and destructive force washed over Harita's fiery wings, but she remained steadfast, barely flinching as the flames dissipated harmlessly around her. With another mocking laugh albeit a bit subsided, the primordial purple sent tendrils of toxic mist swirling towards Harita, seeking to corrode her elemental form. Harita's lone eye narrowed, her patience wearing thin as she observed the futile attacks. In one swift motion, she swung her massive arm, the force of her blow creating a shockwave that shattered the toxic mist and sent the primordial purple hurtling through the air. The impact was devastating, knocking the arrogant demon to the ground with a resounding crash. You underestimate the power of nature, Harita's voice boomed, resonating across the battlefield. Your arrogance blinds you. Before the primordial purple could recover, Harita closed the distance between them in a thunderous charge. Her massive hand descended like a hammer, striking the primordial with enough force to send shockwaves rippling through the earth and reduce the mountain which the primordial hut to dust. Purple let out a pained cry as she struggled to rise, her illusions of superiority shattered by the raw might of Harita. She tried to run as a desperate way to save herself but suddenly the ground around her broke apart as white searing hot spikes impaled her little body from all directions. Her core shattering sending her soul to the cycle of reincarnation. As Harita stood victorious over her fallen opponent, a sudden ripple of energy surged through the battlefield. With a wave of her hand, Charybdis activated a devastating divine departure. An attack her master had told her about. A devastating attack of holy energy erupted from the weapon, converging upon the primordial Rouge's territory with unstoppable force. The ground trembled, and clouds gathered as the holy power descended upon the demon realm, cleansing it in a blinding display of divine wrath. Harita, her task complete, turned away from the aftermath of destruction, her fiery wings casting long shadows over the scorched battlefield. She felt a surge of pride at her accomplishment, knowing she had proven her strength as the elemental lord of fire. Charybdis done from her attacks observed, from afar on her giant ship. Her eyes, glowing with eerie blue light, filled with approval. Well done, Harita, Charybdis's voice rumbled in her mind. Your strength is truly unmatched, not even my son can match you in pure might. These words were not exaggerations as Charybdis had intentionally directed Harita's evolution in the path of pure might even forcefully sacrificing the budding concept of sins and retribution in favor of developing a pure unmatched powerhouse. 
In fact Harita could even match Charybdis if Charybdis wasn't armed with the conceptual mud of her ultimate skill. Chapter 44 Chapter 45 When the subjugation finally ended, Charybdis rose from her throne, her eyes glowing with a mix of satisfaction and power. She had absorbed the souls of billions of lesser demons and three of the primordials, their essence now a part of her formidable strength. The cables connected to her armor detached with a series of mechanical clicks, and the pulsating lights dimmed as she stepped away. Standing at the helm of the massive ship, she gazed out over the conquered demon realm. With an euphoric smile on her face as the demon lord seed formed inside her soul. Three down four more to go, she muttered to herself. The once formidable territory now lay in ruins, a testament to the might of Lunka's forces and her unrelenting ambition. With a wave of her hand, she issued the command to release the information to the world. The message was clear and concise, spreading like wildfire across continents. News of the complete eradication of the demon race within their realm and the death of four primordials, including Noir, sent shockwaves through every kingdom and territory. In human lands, reactions varied. Celebrations erupted in some quarters, with naive well-wishers hailing the kingdom of Lanka as heroes. They failed to grasp the true implications of such a decisive victory. In contrast, the more astute rulers and strategists began preparations, aware that this shift in power could spell their own downfall if they were not vigilant. In the kingdom of Nazca, the Grand Hall was filled with a tense silence. Rudra, sat deep in thought, contemplating the formidable alliance that had been revealed. The power of Charybdis, Veldora, and Malim, along with potential unknown allies, loomed large in his mind. As the news spread, preparations were made in every corner of the human world. Armies were mobilized, alliances forged, and strategies devised. The balance of power had shifted dramatically, and everyone knew that the future was uncertain. Back on her ship, Charybdis stood tall, her wings unfurled and glowing in the dim light as she filled the demon realm with her magicules in an attempt to overrun its desolate nature. The bionic slimes, a junction of technology and biology, floated around her, pulsing with energy. The sphere at the center of the ship with its concentric rings spun steadily, with holy power. It's done, she murmured to herself, a satisfied smile playing on her lips. Let the world know our strength. This is only the beginning. Her grin widened as she thought about the next interesting plot she had devised. It wasn't destructive and it wasn't manipulative no it was even benefiting to humans. A dungeon full of resources for anyone with a dream to come and take advantage of. He he ha 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 ha. Three weeks after the news of demon realm subjugation. In the heart of the desolate plains, where the once vibrant kingdom of harpies had thrived, a tower suddenly emerged from the earth, defying logic and reason. For three days, people from distant kingdoms gathered cautiously, observing the abnormality in the world. Scholars debated theories of ancient prophecies while soldiers stood watch, their gazes fixed upon the mysterious structure that loomed over the horizon. Amidst the murmurs and speculation, seven individuals emerged from the crowd of blacksmith from Dwargan, his calloused hands stained with the sweat of labor a scholar from Nazca, the one who had taught holy magic to Charybdis a slave from Gistav. A fledgling nation emerging from the grounds of an illegal market a survivor from the Harpy settlement, marked by resilience a warrior from Rubrios, his sword arms steady and true and two villagers from the western nations, humble souls drawn into a fate they couldn't foresee. As the sun dipped low on the fourth day, the ground trembled beneath their feet. A brilliant, azure light erupted from the earth, swirling into a celestial dome that encompassed the chosen seven. Within its radiant embrace, they felt a surge of power or resonance that seemed to flow from the very core of their beings. The blacksmith's hands tingled with the primal essence of metalwork, the scholar's mind expanded with arcane knowledge, and the warrior felt an indomitable strength coursing through his veins. With dawn breaking over the horizon, messengers arrived from each kingdom, their urgency matching the gravity of the tower's appearance. Before the champions could fully comprehend their newfound abilities, they were enveloped in a blinding flash of light, transported from the familiar plains to the shadowed depths of an ancient dungeon. In the dimly lit chamber, their senses reeled from the sudden shift. They huddled together, their confusion mingling with apprehension until their attention was drawn to a figure of ethereal beauty a woman with four fiery wings and a mask adorned with the symbol of an all-seeing eye. Her presence commanded both awe and reverence, 
as her presence radiated authority. Welcome, chosen champions, her voice echoed softly, carrying a weight that resonated deep within their souls. You have been called to the Tower of Babel, where your destinies will be tested. With a graceful gesture, she conjured seven star-shaped lockets, each glowing with a gentle inner light. The champions reached out, feeling the weight and significance of these artifacts in their palms. Without a word, the lockets transformed into weapons of exquisite craftsmanship each one a reflection of its wielder's inner strengths and aspirations. You have one month to ascend to the tenth floor of the tower, the ethereal lady continued, her gaze unwavering. Should you fail, the consequences will be dire. With those solemn words, she dissolved into a cascade of fiery energy, leaving the champions to contemplate the daunting path that lay ahead. As they stood amidst the shadows of the dungeon, their hands grasping their newly forged weapons. They knew that their journey through the Tower of Babel would not only test their skills but also define the fate of their kingdoms in ways they could only imagine. With hearts pounding minds racing, they steeled themselves for the challenges that awaited, bound together by destiny and the quest that now united them as champions. I hope they work hard to replace Netflix from my old world commented the bored queen who clipped her nails giddy with the recent streak of success. Chapter 46 Ashoka sat cross-legged on the cold stone floor of his cell in the heart of Lunka's palace, his eyes closed in deep meditation. The oppressive darkness of sensory deprivation had been his companion for more than half a month, a punishment for his attempt to strangle the caretakers of his prison. He had been biding his time, gathering the power within him, waiting for the right moment. The woman who had summoned him here, Charybdis, possessed an aura so powerful that any escape attempt would be futile as long as she was nearby. On this night, Ashoka's patience was rewarded. He felt the depressive aura of Charybdis disappearing, fading to some distant part of the palace or perhaps beyond. His eyes snapped open, a fierce determination burning within them. This was the moment he had been waiting for. Ashoka reached into his mouth and pulled out a nail he had carefully bitten off and hidden. In his hand, the nail glinted ominously as his unique skill, Emperor, transformed it into a weapon capable of killing. Without hesitation, he moved to the door of his cell and slashed at it. The initial strikes did little more than scratch the surface, but Ashoka was relentless. He continued to slash, each strike fueled by his desperation and rage. Almost an hour passed, the constant scraping of metal against metal echoing in the silent corridors. His fingers bled, the pain searing up his arms, but he did not stop. Finally, with a final, exhausted swing, the door gave way, crashing open. Ashoka staggered forward, his breath ragged but his spirit unbroken. The corridors of the palace were dimly lit, shadows dancing on the walls as he moved with calculated haste. He fought his way through, knocking out guards with quick, precise blows. Whenever he encountered someone stronger, he avoided confrontation, slipping into the shadows until the threat had passed. His movements were a blend of grace and desperation, a dance of survival. As he neared the exit, the salty scent of the ocean reached his nostrils, a beacon of freedom. With one last burst of energy, Ashoka sprinted toward the open air, the cool breeze washing over him as he emerged from the palace's oppressive walls. The moonlight reflected off the ocean's surface, a shimmering path to freedom. Without a second thought, Ashoka leaped into the ocean, the cold water enveloping him as he swam away from the palace. Each stroke through the water was a vow, a promise to himself. One day, he would return. One day, he would take his revenge on the Danav who had summoned him to this place and humiliated him. Ashoka swam through the cold ocean waters, each stroke fueled by his burning desire for freedom and vengeance. Behind him, the palace of Lanka stood silent and dark against the night sky. Inside the palace, Charybdis returned after some time, her presence as ominous as ever to the onlookers. The wardens of the prison kept their heads bowed in fear, their bodies trembling. They had expected wrath, fury, or punishment. Instead, Charybdis only smelled a chilling, inscrutable smile that sent shivers down their spines. Her piercing gaze swept over them, lingering for a moment longer than comfortable, before she turned away. Interesting, she murmured to herself, the smile never leaving her lips. The wardens dared not look up, their fear palpable in the heavy silence of the corridor. That smile was something else, something far more terrifying in its quiet certainty. Charybdis walked down the hall, 
her thoughts hidden behind that eerie smile. She reached the shattered cell door, the remnants of Ashoka's desperate escape still evident. She ran a finger along the jagged edges, her smile widening ever so slightly. Good, she whispered, almost as if speaking to herself. Let him run. The hunt is always more satisfying when the prey believes it has escaped. Her laughter echoed softly through the corridor, sending chills through the wardens who dared not move. They had no idea what plans she had in store, but they knew one thing for certain, their queen was never one to let go of what she considered hers. Outside, Ashoka continued to swim, the palace receding into the distance. He was free for now, but a part of him sensed that this escape was only the beginning of a much larger game. Charybdis's smile lingered in the shadows, a silent promise that their paths would cross again. Chapter 47 POV of a common man from Greymar a city-state near the Tower of Babel In the past thousand years, the world has transformed in ways our ancestors could scarcely have imagined. I'm just a common man, living in the small bustling town of Greymar, but even here, the influence of the Tower of Babel and the Kingdom of Lanka is undeniable. When the Tower of Babel first appeared, it was an enigma, a looming presence that defied understanding. But as the years passed, it became a symbol of possibility. The dungeon within the tower revolutionized our world. Before it, dreams of power and grandeur were just that dreams for 90% of the dreamers. Only the privileged or the exceptionally gifted could hope to achieve greatness. But the dungeon changed all that. It became a place where ordinary people like me could aspire to achieve extraordinary things. I remember my grandfather's tales of a time when becoming stronger was a near impossible task. People trained for years with little to show for it. But now, the dungeon offers a simpler path to strength. Many have entered its depths, seeking to unlock their potential. Some return with newfound abilities, others with treasures that can change their fortunes. It's as if the dungeon itself is a forge, tempering the dreams of those who dare to enter into reality. The kingdom of Lanka, once a distant and mysterious land, has risen to unparalleled prominence. Their army of magents, mastery of magic and technology has turned them into an absolute powerhouse. The magic appliances they export have transformed our daily lives. In Greymar, we have magic lanterns that illuminate our homes without the need for oil. We have enchanted stoves that cook our meals perfectly every time, and water purifiers that ensure we always have clean water to drink. Lanka's influence extends beyond mere convenience. Their advancements in magic have made it possible for common folk to access healing treatments and protective charms that were once the domain of the elite. Diseases that plagued our ancestors are now curable with a simple visit to a local healer, armed with Lankian magic. The world feels smaller now, more connected. Trade routes flourish, and knowledge spreads faster than ever. The dreams of our forefathers are our everyday reality. My neighbors talk about sending their children to Lanka to study magic, in its prestigious academy. Even the smallest villages are touched by this new era of prosperity and possibility. But it's not just about the magic or the appliances. The tower and the kingdom of Lanka have given us common folk something far more valuable, hope. Hope that no matter where you start in life, there's a chance to rise above it. Hope that with enough determination and courage, the dungeon's trials can be overcome. Hope that the future holds endless possibilities. As I walk through the streets of Greymar, I see children playing with enchanted toys, shopkeepers using magical scales, and farmers employing enchanted tools to tend their fields. I see a world that has embraced change, a world where dreams are no longer confined to the realm of fantasy but are tangible, attainable goals. The Tower of Babel and the Kingdom of Lanka reshaped our world, and as a common man, I am grateful to be living in such extraordinary times. The future is bright, and it's filled with promise for those willing to reach out and grasp it. In the annals of history, the Kingdom of Lanka's rise to prominence began with a dark and decisive act the annihilation of the entire demon race a thousand years ago. The aftermath of that event left a power vacuum, one that Lanka swiftly filled under the leadership of their immortal queen, the mother of all Azura. A figure of religious reverence to many outside and within the kingdom. There is even a guild of adventurers that utilize holy magic fueled by her. Despite this violent past, the queen has since maintained a reputation of peace and benevolence in the eyes of the common man. The Azura Kingdom, 
formidable and feared, has only launched one significant attack in the last millennium. Almost 400 years ago, they devastated a small kingdom on their borders. The reasons were unclear and the fight broke out overnight with no prior warnings. Yet, apart from these instances of aggression, the Queen's rule has been largely peaceful, guiding her kingdom towards prosperity and innovation. With the advent of the Tower of Babel, Lanka led the charge to standardize dungeon entry permits, making the tower's resources accessible to all. Initially, the Seven Kingdoms, each boasting a hero chosen from their lands, monopolized the dungeon's treasures and opportunities. However, a single, unambiguous threat from the immortal queen forced them to relent. They bowed to her will, agreeing to make the dungeon's resources available for the common man. In Greymar, the benefits of these changes are evident. Our lives are easier, filled with conveniences my ancestors could only dream of. The once arduous path to power and prosperity is now accessible to anyone willing to enter the dungeon and face its trials. Ordinary people like me can venture into its depths, seeking strength and fortune. Many return transformed, bearing not just riches but new abilities and a sense of purpose. It has democratized power, offering a chance for greatness to all, regardless of their birth or station. The Immortal Queen's vision reshaped our world, fostering an era of unprecedented opportunity and advancements. Lunka's influence is everywhere, from the magic appliances in our homes to the new heroes emerging from the dungeon's depths. Our world is brighter, more connected, and filled with the promise of a better future. As I watch the sun set over Greymar, I can't help but feel a sense of hope. I just hope that the something doesn't hop in to the queen that might reverse this process as despite the benefits of the era the ruling class of many kingdoms still felt animosity towards the queen for trampling into their domains SND imposing her beliefs on them. Chapter 48 In the thousand years since his escape from Charybdis, Ashoka's life had been a relentless journey of growth, driven by a singular vow, to build his power and take revenge on the one who imprisoned him. For the first five years after his escape, Ashoka wandered the lands, his thoughts consumed by the need to become stronger. During this period, he encountered various spirits and magical beings. His perseverance paid off when he was blessed by both water and earth spirits. This dual blessing enhanced his innate abilities, granting him control over both elements and significantly boosting his magical potential. Twenty years after his escape, Ashoka's efforts bore fruit. He managed to gather a group of loyal followers and allies who shared his vision. With their support, he established the new Maurayan Empire, a realm built on principles of strength, wisdom, and strategic might. Under his rule, the empire flourished, becoming a beacon of power and hope in a world fraught with chaos. Despite his successes, Ashoka soon realized that his power had reached a plateau. The challenges of the world required strength far beyond what he currently possessed. Determined to overcome this, he embarked on a journey of self-discovery and continuous improvement. He studied ancient texts, sought out legendary mentors, and delved into the deepest secrets of magic and combat. Ashoka understood that to outlast Charybdis, he would need to extend his lifespan significantly. His quest for immortality led him to ancient rituals and forbidden magic. Through these, he discovered ways to slow his aging process, granting him the time he needed to amass even greater power. Twenty-five years after his escape, Ashoka's relentless pursuit of strength culminated in the development of formidable abilities. The human spirit, this skill allowed Ashoka to ignore mental barriers and push his body beyond its limits by sheer willpower, unlocking 100% of human potential and granting minor adaptation to phenomena. Spirit fusion, this skill enabled Ashoka to indefinitely merge with spirits, as long as they consented. There was no limit to the number of spirits, except for the capacity of his own body. Conqueror's Ambition, a unique application of his aura and hockey, this skill allowed Ashoka to project his will and killing intent into all his attacks, making each strike lethal to spiritual beings. It also enabled thought domination on weaker specimens. Kinslayer, evolved from a title he received in his previous life when he killed 99 of his brothers to ascend to the throne of the Maurian Empire, this skill channeled the darkest aspects of human nature. Killing any blood relative allowed Ashoka to multiply his existence value based on the closeness of kin. It also enabled him to take the lifespan of humans he killed, subjugated, or those who consented to giving their life force. Lord of Conquest, Skanda. 
mastery of war, anything in Ashoka's hand became a weapon. Mind's will, provided mental protection. Loyalty, allowed Ashoka to use the combined might of all who served him. Inheritance of a king, upon death, the soul of the king's subordinate merged with Ashoka, fueling his life and granting their skills to the ultimate skill, Lord of Conquest. Strategy of war, manipulated probability to favor the chosen plan, ensuring the best possible outcome. Thousands more inherited and intrinsic subskills. Despite his immense power, Ashoka felt a chill eye his spine whenever he looked towards Lanka. After steadily expanding and usurping all the western nations, he received many marriage proposals, but all the proposed brides mysteriously died off. Six hundred years after his escape, ruling under a different name, Ashoka was finally betrothed to the princes of a significant, trade kingdom near the shores, which Lanka shared with the main continent. But something truly chilling happened. In all its existence, the kingdom of Lanka declared war on the very same kingdom Ashoka was betrothed to. Without waiting for his army, Ashoka rushed to the besieged kingdom. Upon arrival, he found the city in ruins, as if someone had finally chopped it apart with giant knives. Floating above the devastated city was a man with blonde hair, six eyes, and brilliant wings. Ashoka instantly recognized him, Crota the Imperial, the commander-in-chief of all of Lanka's forces and the eldest son of Charybdis. Fury ignited within Ashoka, and he launched an attack on Crota, masking his identity. However, his efforts proved futile. His physical might was like the flailing of a child against Crota's overwhelming magical power. Each strike Ashoka delivered was effortlessly countered, and his best efforts were met with dismissive ease. Crota, with a calm yet deadly demeanor, dominated the fight. His magical prowess was unmatched, rendering Ashoka's attacks meaningless. The clash culminated in a single, devastating blow. Crota punched Ashoka in the gut with such force that he was sent flying through the sky, hurtling away from the battlefield. As Ashoka hurtled through the air, the pain was excruciating, but the humiliation and the stark reminder of his inferiority to Crota burned even deeper. The chilling realization settled in, despite all his accumulated power, he was still not strong enough to challenge the might of Lanka and its champions. In contrast Crota clutched his fist satisfied with the way he handled the fight despite having to use his judgment skill. Crota's concept of victory had been activated throughout the exchange, ensuring Ashoka's defeat was inevitable. Ashoka's struggle was a futile one as the battle's outcome was decided the moment he allowed Crota to choose his battlefield. Chapter 49 Charybdis sat at a grand table, surrounded by the lively chatter of her family. The boisterous blonde man with dark skin tone, her father Veldora, laughed heartily at some jest. While her son, Crota, with his six eyes, merely smirked. The elemental lord of darkness, now turned Azura, sat beside Crota, exuding a calm yet powerful presence. Harita, with a ring on her finger, leaned affectionately towards her husband, Crota. Across the table, Malim, more mature, engaged in a spirited conversation with two other girls who bore inhumane features loosely resembling Charybdis. They all sat within the Grand Palace of Lanka, a place that resonated with power and history. This was Charybdis's family. Her sons and daughters, her cousin Malim, and her father Veldora were all present. It had been three hundred years since Crota and Harita had married, their love had been budding for quite some time at that point. Charybdis reflected on her life over the past millennium. It had been a time of immense growth and enjoyment, interspersed with moments of profound research and discovery. She had to deal with the nuisance of the Tenma War that ravaged her pet kingdoms, but the pesky angels couldn't even come close to the island before being incinerated by the passive marble phantasm manifestation. It was a huge pain in the ass to rebuild all the stuff. About four hundred years ago, Charybdis had summoned another otherworlder or second one after Ashoka. During that time, she found herself with ample free time, which she spent bonding with him. Their relationship, while not reaching the level of marriage, had been meaningful. From their union, a daughter was born. This daughter, unlike her other siblings, inherited her curiosity and the free-spirited nature of her father. A dangerous mix. As Charybdis looked at the empty seat at the table, she sighed for the umpteenth time. She had a soft spot for her daughter and regretted allowing her so much freedom. She had run off to the Babel Tower with her friends. 
Her absence at the family gathering was a constant reminder of the wild and untamed spirit that she had fostered. Despite her daughter's absence, the room was filled with warmth and laughter. Charybdis took a moment to appreciate the family she had built, the legacy she had created, and the countless years of research and discovery that had brought her to this point. Life had been good, and as she looked around the table, she felt a deep sense of contentment mixed with the slight pang of anger for her daughter. But the ever-constant thinker shifted it to the back of her mind. Charybdis's thoughts drifted back to one of her most amusing preoccupations, Ashoka. His relentless struggle for power had been a constant source of entertainment. She had watched his every move in the past millennium with a mix of amusement and annoyance. His attempts to marry had particularly irked her, prompting her to ensure all his brides met a swift and mysterious end. Ashoka was her property. None could lay hands on him other than her. The idea of him seeking companionship or forming alliances outside her control was intolerable. His ambition, though admirable in its persistence, was futile. No matter how hard he tried, he would never escape her grasp. The memory of his last encounter with Crota brought a slight smile to her lips. Watching him flail uselessly against her son had been a reminder of the vast power gap that separated them. Despite all his acquired strength and skills, Ashoka remained a pawn in her grand design. As the lively banter continued around her, Charybdis leaned back, her eyes twinkling with a mixture of pride and anticipation. Which soon was broken by the familiar mental jolt that she had been experiencing for some time now. Charybdis had recently begun to feel an intense, mentally irritating sensation, coupled with an unbearable surge of horniness. It was a feeling she hadn't experienced since her time with the Otherworlder, and upon closer study, she realized it was a sign of her ovulation. As a spiritual life form and a pseudo cryptid, her inherited dragon anatomy had an unusual, uncoordinated, and infrequent ovulation cycle. Despite her powerful and dominant nature, Charybdis had never shied away from sexual pleasures in her previous life, she just saw no significant value in them. But now, faced with the unrelenting mental itch, she found herself divided on how to address it. She could destroy it but that would be a huge waste considering the ability of my body to produce an egg is very low. The irritation wouldn't subside until the egg was fertilized or destroyed. She could self-reproduce using her cryptid anatomy, a process that would leave her heavily weakened. Alternatively, she could seek a mate, which she preferred as it wouldn't compromise her strength. As she got up from the table, her movement drew glances from the others. She waved them off with a simple smile and walked to her chambers, her mind swirling with thoughts. Entering her bedroom, her eyes fell on the now dull necklace displayed as a showcase. This very necklace had been used to distill the entire strength of the demon race into her body, fueling the birth of two ultimate skills, her demon lord seed, and even partial awakening. One name surfaced in her mind as she contemplated her options, Noir. She had left him along with the others alive to grow and become perfect food for her complete awakening. But he was a primordial of the strongest order, and his lineage could indeed be worthy. The idea of seeking out Noir was tantalizing, the prospect of a union with such an eccentric being both unpractical and thrilling. She liked that. A smirk of challenge descended on her face as she made up her mind. Chapter 50 Charybdis walked out of her chamber, having temporarily sated her horniness in the only way she could for now, by masturbating. Her steps were purposeful as she made her way through the grand halls of her palace. As she turned a corner, she saw one of her daughters, Mo, the twin sister of Loba. She had named her children after the desires and emotions she had channeled into them when they were placed in the iron cradle. Mo looked distraught, her eyes brimming with tears as she rushed towards her mother. Mother! Mo cried out, throwing herself into Charybdis' arms. My sister stole my subordinates again. Charybdis wrapped her arms around Mo, her expression softening with a motherly charm that would fool even the wisest to think she was just a normal mother, not the Queen of Lanka. She stroked Mo's hair gently, her touch soothing the sad girl. There, there, Charybdis murmured, her voice a comforting lullaby. You are stronger than this. Do not let such petty actions disturb your peace. Your sister will learn her place soon enough. But she keeps doing it. Mo protested, her tears soaking into Charybdis' gown. I don't know what to do. Charybdis pulled back slightly, looking into her daughter's eyes. 
You must stand your ground, Mo. Show her that you are not to be trifled with. You have the strength of Lanka within you, and you must let it shine. Mo sniffled, nodding slowly. I will, mother. I promise. Good girl, Charybdis said, kissing Mo's forehead. Now, wipe your tears. We will handle this together. However Charybdis couldn't placate Mo fully with just words, so she decided to take her daughter to the kitchen. The Grand Palace kitchen was a giant one with all kinds of utensils but it has the same warmth and comfort that one a house of a normal family would hold. Filled with the sense of various delicacies being prepared by the finest chefs in Lanka and the most exotic ingredients in the world. Come with me, Mo, Charybdis said gently, leading her daughter by the hand. Once in the kitchen, Charybdis set to work, preparing a special treat. She knew ice cream was Mo's favorite, and the simple act of making it together always seemed to soothe her. As Charybdis mixed the ingredients, she spoke softly. You know, Mo, you're more attached to things and people than others. It's a beautiful quality, but it also makes you more vulnerable. That's not something you can easily change, but it's not a weakness. Mo watched intently, her tears slowing as she focused on her mother's hands moving with practiced grace. Charybdis continued, her voice steady and reassuring. This attachment means you care deeply, and caring is a strength. But you must learn to balance it, to protect yourself from being hurt so often. It doesn't mean you have to become someone else, just that you need to be stronger in facing these challenges. Charybdis had told her this many times, but Mo always fumbled. As a mother, Charybdis felt a deep sadness for all her daughter's heartbreaks, no matter how small. It was a delicate balance, nurturing Mo's gentle heart while encouraging her to develop a resilience that matched her spirit. With the ice cream ready, Charybdis scooped it into a bowl and handed it to Mo, who smiled faintly as she took a spoonful. Charybdis sat down, pulling Mo onto her lap. As the girl ate, Charybdis patted her head, her touch filled with love and comfort. You'll get through this, Mo, Charybdis said softly. And I'll always be here to help you no matter what. Mo nodded, a small smile playing on her lips as she leaned into her mother's embrace. The simple pleasure of ice cream and the warmth of Charybdis' presence began to mend her heart, even if just a little. As Charybdis held her daughter, she felt a mix of pride and sorrow. Pride in Mo's capacity for love and attachment, and sorrow for the pain it often brought her. But in this moment, surrounded by the simple comforts of the kitchen and the bond between mother and daughter. Sun Mo composed herself, Charybdis felt a swell of pride. Her children were her legacy, each one crafted as a reflection of one of her aspects. They were her treasures, and she would ensure they grew into their full potential, no matter the obstacles. With a final reassuring smile, Charybdis led Mo back into the heart of the palace as Mo regained her determination and went back to her department. After soothing Mo with ice cream and motherly comfort, Charybdis made her way to a conspicuous gate near the throne room. The gate was a marvel of intricate design, blending mystical and technological elements seamlessly. It stood as the sole spatial passage to her palace in Osirlok, formerly known as the Demon Realm. She held the doors and opened them just enough to allow her to pass. As she walked through the empty halls of the Golden Palace, the soles of her feet made no noise, her presence silent. The outside view contrasted sharply with the grandeur inside. It was a dystopian sci-fi scene where enormous factories operated on such a scale that no light could pierce the thick smog made by them. These factories were distant from the palace grounds, which housed several ministry offices. The zone outside was crucial, the beating heart of the Kingdom of Lanka. Here, high-class queek of the seventh generation and other technologically advanced products were produced en masse, driving trade and sustaining the lives of the people. The factories were integral, producing versatile, advanced products that bolstered Lanka's economy and infrastructure. Charybdis had been researching alone for many years, but recently, she had granted immortality to a select few individuals. These chosen ones assisted her with various research projects, working alongside her in pushing the boundaries of knowledge and innovation. The research she conducted here was not just for power, but for the continuous growth and prosperity of her kingdom and the fulfillment of her ambitions. She silently approached the giant laboratory, that contained enough firepower to destroy a solar system. Chapter 51 As Charybdis entered the lab, 
she was greeted by the sight of a giant sphere with bands of light encircling it, and several cables extending from it into a large structure that looked like a hybrid of an engine and a pod. This was the core of Project B, her most ambitious goal, something she had been working on for six centuries. Despite its incomplete state, Charybdis remained undeterred. She understood the daunting nature of her ambition and the almost impossible goal she sought to fulfill. She called for her lead researchers, a man named Marcel, and two others named Alicia and Deadless. They were attired in mechanical armor that whirred and shined as they moved, their faces covered by masks resembling plague doctors. The mechanical hum of their suits filled the air as they approached her. So, how is the structural design of B coming along? Charybdis inquired, her tone authoritative yet patient. Marcel stepped forward, his voice tinged with weariness. We've yet to find a close to perfect structure without it having problems with other components. The integration issues are proving more complex than anticipated. Alicia and Deadless nodded in agreement, their body language conveying their shared frustration. Charybdis regarded them for a moment, then spoke with a calm, steady voice. Failure and frustration are part of research. Each setback brings us closer to the solution. Continue refining the designs. Remember, our ambition requires patience and perseverance. Her words, though simple, carried the weight of her centuries-long pursuit and the unyielding determination that had brought them this far. She knew the path to greatness was fraught with obstacles, but she also knew that with each challenge overcome, they inched closer to achieving the impossible. Charybdis watched them for a moment before turning her attention back to the giant sphere, the core of her dream, and the promise of what it could bring. After her words of encouragement, Charybdis continued, Now, can someone bring me the cube? Deadless's eyes lit up with enthusiasm as he quickly moved to retrieve the item. He returned with a small 10 cm by 10 cm cube of blood-red color, presenting it to Charybdis with a sense of pride. She smirked as she took the cube, feeling its smooth, cold surface. Excellent work, Deadless. This will be crucial for our next phase. Deadless beamed under her praise, his masked face unable to hide his excitement. Thank you, my lady. We've been working hard on perfecting its properties. Charybdis nodded, I can see that. You've all done well. I'll join you in the research after I finish some personal work. With that, she turned and walked away, leaving her dedicated team to continue their efforts. The cube in her hand broke apart merging with her being as her skin seemed to be separate in paces of red similar to the coot her entire body refreshed rearranging itself in the same way as a Rubik cube. Feels weird but it'll definitely be useful. After integrating the cube's essence, Charybdis reappeared in the human realm. Her form had undergone a dramatic transformation. Her once purely spiritual body now resembled a spiritual bionic chimera, a harmonious blend of mystical and mechanical attributes and living and non-living. She soared into the outer atmosphere, leaving the kingdom of Lanka far below. The stars and the vast expanse of space framed her descent as she adapted her form to the high altitudes, her senses attuned to the myriad ways of perception. Her body radiated with a faint, eerie glow, a side effect of the cube's influence. Charybdis began her search with methodical efficiency. She activated an array of sensors' magical detection to sense any residual energies, thermal imaging to detect heat signatures, spirit and analysis, soul fluctuations, and X-ray polarimetry to penetrate any obstructions. The data streamed into her consciousness, an overwhelming flood of information. Within moments, she zeroed in on a specific location, a set of ruins hidden within the remnants of a once majestic palace, now a mere shadow of its former self. This palace, ravaged by Ashoka's previous attacks, lay in a remote, secluded area, its once grand halls now crumbling and forgotten. Charybdis descended rapidly through the atmosphere, her form sleek and agile against the sky. The landscape below came into sharper focus as she approached. Her flight path was direct, without any hint of hesitation. The sight of the desolate palace grew clearer, its shattered walls and overgrown vines marking the place where Noir had last been seen. Charybdis landed gracefully amidst the ruins, her bionic form shifting seamlessly back to her normal form. She surveyed the wreckage with a discerning eye, her sense allowing her to perceive even the smallest details in the devastation. 
Finding Noir was more than just a step towards her goal it was an opportunity to explore for something new. Noir emerged from the ruins, his ever-present smile seeming to contrast with the devastation surrounding him. His eyes gleamed with a mixture of curiosity and wariness as he regarded Charybdis. Ah, have you finally come to end me too? He asked, his tone light but with an underlying tension. Charybdis shook her head, her form shimmering slightly as she adjusted to the atmosphere. No, she replied, her voice carrying a hint of uncertainty. The air between them grew thick with awkwardness. Moore's usual eccentric demeanor seemed out of place in the tense silence that followed. He shifted uneasily, glancing around at the remnants of the palace. After a moment, Charybdis took a deep breath and decided to break the silence. Her words came out hesitantly, an odd mix of discomfort and determination. I as a dragon of this hybrid nature already have a very low fertility rate and combined with my hybrid nature I have an unpredictable ovulation cycle lasting of time period lasting several between them she began. Her gaze dropping to the ground. And I don't want to waste this opportunity. Moore's confusion deepened as he listened. And why am I involved in this? He asked, genuinely puzzled by her strange explanation. With a deep blush coloring her cheek something that seemed almost out of place given her well-general demeanor Charybdis took another step forward. I'm asking you to be my mate, she said, her voice barely above a whisper. Moir's eyes widened in surprise, his usual playful demeanor giving way to genuine astonishment. The awkward tension between them lingered, but Charybdis stood firm, her gaze meeting his with an earnest expression. Despite the strange circumstances and her own discomfort, she was resolute in her request. Even though it was weird to ask that from someone who she had erased the entire lineage of or someone who had once killed her. Chapter 52 After Charybdis's proclamation, Moore let out an awkward chuckle, his signature laugh echoing faintly through the ruined palace. Do I have any way to deny this? He asked, his smile still in place but his tone edged with a mix of amusement and resignation. Charybdis replied with a resounding, no. Noir sighed, the sound carrying a note of acceptance. Well, this certainly is. Interesting, he said, his tone shifting to one of reluctant amusement. I suppose there's no helping it, then. He looked at Charybdis, his smile softening slightly. Very well, Charybdis. If this is what you wish, then I will be your mate. With that, the awkward tension between them began to ease until Charybdis moved. Charybdis, who had already exceeded her daily limit of awkward situations, decided to take a more direct approach after being done with the formalities. With a swift and decisive movement, she knocked Moir out cold. His smile remained fixed on his face as he crumpled to the ground, unconscious. Without hesitation, Charybdis hoisted him over her shoulder, her expression unwavering. She took to the skies, flying swiftly back to Lanka. The journey was a blur, the wind rushing past as she navigated the familiar paths back to her palace. Upon reaching Lanka, she landed gracefully in the courtyard of her palace. The golden towers gleamed in the sunlight, and the intricate designs of the palace reflected light and appearing to be glowing. As she approached the grand entrance to her chambers, the guards stood aside, bowing respectfully. Charybdis entered her private quarters, gently laying Noir down on a luxurious couch. She took a deep breath, the events of the day finally catching up with her. Charybdis looked down at the unconscious form of Noir, a mixture of relief and anticipation coursing through her. Noir woke up slowly, his head pounding from the abruptness of his unconscious state. As he opened his eyes, he found himself laid out on an opulent bed in a room that exuded power and grandeur. He groaned softly, sitting up and glancing around. There was no sign of Charybdis. As his senses sharpened, he began to notice the intricate magical design woven into every inch of the room. It was like staring at a piece of paper covered in millions of meticulously drawn runes, each one layered with precision and care. The complexity was beyond normal magical understanding, leaving even Noir, a primordial demon, in awe. His curiosity peaked, Noir swung his legs over the side of the bed and stood up. He moved towards the door, intent on exploring or perhaps finding an exit. But as he approached, a soft, almost childlike voice echoed throughout the room. Please, do not leave, the voice said, coming from everywhere at once. Noir paused, looking around for the source of the voice. 
Who are you? He asked, his tone wary. I am blue, the voice responded. An artificial manas created by the queen, Charybdis, to inhabit this palace. I have been ordered not to allow you to leave without her permission. Moor frowned, feeling a mix of irritation and fascination. The queen, huh? And I suppose you address me as? You are queen's mate, Blue replied simply. Moore's mind raced as he processed this information. Her mate, he repeated, the reality of his situation sinking in further. He sighed, running a hand through his hair. I suppose there's no way out of this room, then. Correct, Blue answered. The queen has given strict instructions. Moore couldn't help but chuckle at the absurdity of his predicament. He walked back to the bed and sat down, resigned to wait for Charybdis' return. As he waited, he continued to marvel at the magical intricacy of the room, thinking he was wrong about her when he initially saw her. When they met thousands of years ago Noir had thought that Charybdis was complacent like all the other true dragons considering she was Veldora's offspring. His curiosity soon got the better of him again. What will happen if I try to leave forcefully? Noir asked, testing the boundaries of his confinement. Blue's voice remained calm and matter-of-fact. According to the strike system, you will be allowed three transgressions against the Queen's orders. If you commit another one, I will be forced to bind you in a reality distortion bubble. A reality distortion bubble? Moore repeated, intrigued despite himself. Yes, Blue confirmed. A makeshift marble phantasm without any specific qualities. It will effectively immobilize you and prevent any further attempts to leave. Noir sighed, weighing his options. So, I get three chances before I'm completely restrained. Correct, Blue said. Noir couldn't help but chuckle at the absurdity of his predicament. Noir, always one to test boundaries, decided to push his luck. He walked to the door and grasped the handle, attempting to open it. However, the door glowed with a red light, signaling that it didn't recognize him as an inhabitant, and became glued in its place as spatial magic activated negating all his strength in opening it. He found himself unable to move, held in place by an unseen force. One strike, Blue's voice announced, calm and unwavering. Undeterred, Moore tried a different approach. He prepared a teleportation spell, intending to bypass the physical constraints of the room. But as he began to cast the spell, he found his senses blocked, unable to reach beyond the confines of the room. Two strikes, Blue stated. Before Noir could try anything else, the door swung open, and Charybdis entered the room. She was dressed in a rather revealing outfit, her presence commanding and intense. She looked at Noir with a small deadpan stare, clearly aware of his attempts to escape. Caught in the act, Noir couldn't help but chuckle nervously. He waved his hands in a small, sheepish greeting, like a child caught in mischief. Hello, he said, his voice tinged with the same mix of amusement. Charybdis sighed, a hint of exasperation in her expression. Really, Moir? She said, her tone a mix of amusement and mild annoyance. You couldn't wait a little longer. Moir shrugged, his usual confident demeanor slightly diminished. I was just testing the boundaries, he replied with a grin. I didn't think you'd mind. Charybdis shook her head, a small smile playing on her lips. She walked towards him and feeling her mood more backed off until he was standing by the wall with Charybdis in front of him. You're lucky I find you worthy, she said, putting her hand beside his head and bringing her face closer to him. But remember, Moir, you're my guest here. Try not to break the rules too often. As she backed off she commented off-handedly. Moir nodded, still grinning. Understood, Queen Charybdis, he said, giving a mock bow. I'll behave. You better, Charybdis said as she ruffled around some stuff on a table not giving attention to his antics. Chapter 53 Charybdis, who had finally found what she was looking for, turned towards Noir with a smile that sent immediate alarms ringing in his head. The smile wasn't just a curve of her lips it was a predatory grin, a promise of control and dominance that made Noir's stomach twist. Her eyes, sharp and gleaming with a manic light, locked onto his, and he could feel the intensity of her gaze burning into him. She approached him with deliberate steps, each one echoing with purpose and a simmering excitement. Moore instinctively stepped back, 
his confidence waning in the face of her overwhelming presence. What is it, Q Queen? He asked nervously, his voice trembling as he tried to maintain his composure. Charybdis closed the distance between them, and Noir found himself backed against the wall. She reached out and gently took one of his hands, her touch deceptively soft. Then, with the same hand, she took the other, holding them both in a firm, unyielding grip. Her eyes never left his, the glint in them growing wilder, more fevered. With her free hand, she produced a collar, which she swiftly placed around his neck. The cold metal locked mechanically, and then, with a soft hum, it magically bonded with his body, becoming an integral part of him. The sensation sent a shiver down his spine. Her face drew closer to his, so close he could feel the warmth of her breath. Her cheeks were flushed, her pupils dilated with excitement, and her lips curled into a smile that was both maddening and alluring. She whispered, her voice low and filled with promise, we'll have lots of fun together. Her eyes sparkled with a dangerous thrill, leaving no doubt in Noir's mind about the depths of her intentions. Censored by Tkthigud Chapter 54 Charybda sat on her throne, glowing in pleasure as she devoured fruits from a basket. Her expression was one of happiness, the release of her pent-up desires leaving her in a state of contentment. Loba, her daughter, noticed her mother's unusually joyful demeanor and approached her. Mother, you seem exceptionally joyful today. May I ask what has brought you such happiness? Charybdis paused, stopping her chewing as she looked at Loba. With a blissful smile, she said, My dear Loba, you will have a new sibling in the near future. Upon hearing the news, Loba exclaimed, This is news worthy of celebration, mother. Charybdis hesitated for a moment, then nodded after some thought. Very well, Loba. Let's celebrate. After Loba left to make preparations, Charybdis got comfortable on her throne. She called out, Blue, initiate the connection to the reactor core. In response, a small cable emerged near the throne, resembling a tentacle with energy running along its length. Charybdis took hold of the cable and inserted it into the back of her neck, the connection partially molding to her skin. A small moan escaped her lips as magicules flooded her body, nourishing the growing fetus with a near-endless supply of energy. She closed her eyes, savoring the sensation, and whispered to herself, Grow strong, my child. The world awaits you. Chapter 55 The entire golden palace of Lanka was decked out in extravagant decorations, with golden drapes and vibrant banners lining the grand halls. Outside, the capital city around the palace shimmered with festive lights and colorful streamers, creating a breathtaking spectacle visible from miles away. The festivities extended to every settlement on the island, each city under the rule of Charybdises for children basking in celebratory splendor. In Malim city-state, the Star Dragon City, a similar scene unfolded. The streets buzzed with activity, filled with joyous citizens and vibrant displays. The Jura forest itself seemed to sing with festivities as Veldora, ever the proud grandfather, boasted his happiness to the monsters he had taken under his protection. Everything in Lanka was free today, a generous gift from the queen who had paid out all the stock present in the country. Shops handed out goods with no charge, and stalls overflowed with food and drink. Music filled the air as performers entertained the revelers, and the sound of laughter echoed through the streets. Foreign dignitaries began to arrive to offer their congratulations to the immortal queen. Among them was the god Valentine. The ideological ruler of Rubrios. The empress of Sarayan, ruler of the reformed elven lands, arrived in a grand procession, her entourage reflecting the elegance and grace of her realm. Even the king of the harpies made an appearance, a remarkable sight given the harpy races near extinction twice over, once directly by Charybdis and once by a dungeon break. The harpies had since evolved to include males among their ranks, a change brought about by intermixing with a fallen angel. Within the palace, a grand feast was laid out in the great hall. Tables groaned under the weight of sumptuous dishes, from roasted game to intricate desserts. Musicians played enchanting melodies, their tunes weaving through the chatter of several guests and the clinking of glasses. Charybdis, seated at the head of the table, radiated an aura of contentment and power. Her presence commanded the attention of all, her smile warm yet tinged with a sense of supreme confidence. As guests approached to offer their well wishes, she accepted their congratulations with gracious nods and thoughtful words. 
Loba, standing proudly by her mother's side, coordinated the festivities with a keen eye. She ensured that every guest was attended to, every detail perfect. The air buzzed with excitement and anticipation, the celebration a testament to the Queen's enduring legacy and the promise of a bright future. Luminous Valentine, the vampire masquerading as God, approached Charybdis with an air of quiet elegance. Her regal demeanor was complemented by her ethereal beauty, an aura of royalty surrounding her every move. As she neared, Charybdis rose from her throne, her expression warm and welcoming. Ah, Luminous, Charybdis greeted, extending a hand. It's been too long. Indeed, it has, Luminous replied, taking Charybdis's hand gently. You look radiant, as always. Thank you. Please, sit, Charybdis gestured to a plush seat beside her throne, and Luminous gracefully complied. They exchanged pleasantries, discussing the state of their respective lives and the ongoing festivities. The conversation flowed effortlessly, each woman a paragon of power and elegance in her own right. You know, Luminous said, her tone turning reflective, you remind me of the true ancestor. The same indomitable spirit, the same commanding presence. It's almost uncanny. Charybdis smiled, a glint of pride in her eyes. High praise, coming from you. I have always admired the resilience of your kind. Translation, love how close they are to cockroaches. As their conversation began to wind down, Charybdis leaned forward slightly, her expression growing serious. Luminous, there is something I must ask of you. Luminous tilted her head slightly, curiosity peaked. Oh. What is it? Charybdis's aura intensified, her hockey projecting an almost tangible wave of intense desire and determination. Join me, Luminous. Join Lanka. Together, you can achieve unparalleled greatness. The sheer force of Charybdis's will stun Luminous to her core. She felt the weight of the queen's request, the power behind it pressing into her very being. For a moment, she was speechless, caught off guard by the intensity of Charybdis's proposition. I will have to think about it, Luminous finally managed to say, her voice uncharacteristically nervous. The normally unflappable vampire found herself unnerved by the raw power and conviction radiating from Charybdis. Charybdis's intense gaze softened slightly, and she nodded. Of course. Take all the time you need. But know that my offer stands, and my desire for our union is unwavering. Luminous nodded, still processing the overwhelming experience. I will give it careful consideration, she promised, rising from her seat. Good, Charybdis said, her smile returning. I look forward to your decision. As Luminous Valentine departed, the air seemed to crackle with the lingering energy of their exchange. Charybdis watched her go, confident that the cockroach will eventually take the bait. After Luminous Valentine departed, the Harpy King approached Charybdis with a graceful bow, presenting a delicately crafted set of earrings, a necklace, and a stunning dress. For you, Queen Charybdis, he said, his voice smooth and respectful. He handed the gifts to Loba, who accepted them with a strained smile, clearly not pleased with his demeanor. Charybdis nodded in acknowledgement. Thank you. Your generosity is appreciated. The Harpy King then took Charybdis's hand and kissed the back of it. Even though he knew this wasn't the customary way to greet her in Lanka as nobody greeted her this way, she allowed it, remembering that he was just a kid and perhaps not fully acquainted with their customs. Loba, however, was less forgiving, her glare sharp enough to cut through steel. Charybdis only narrowed her eyes slightly, observing the Harpy King's black wings. While she knew that black wings were the typical color for male harpies, something about his wings felt off. There was an unnatural quality to them, and his smooth talk of prosperity for their kingdoms did little to alleviate her suspicions. Thank you for the gifts and your well wishes, Charybdis said, her voice cool and measured. I trust your kingdom is flourishing. Indeed it is, thanks to your influence and guidance, the harpy king replied smoothly, his expression sincere but somehow still unsettling. Charybdis gave a polite smile, though her eyes remained keenly observant. I'm glad to hear that. Please, enjoy the festivities. After the Harpy King took his leave, Charybdis turned to Loba. Make sure these gifts are stored properly with the others. Of course, mother, Loba replied, 
her voice still laced with irritation as she shot one last glare in the direction the Harpy King had gone. Once they were alone, Charybdis's expression turned thoughtful. There was something peculiar about him, she mused aloud. Loba nodded in agreement. I felt it too. His presence didn't seem genuine. Charybdis nodded, her decision firming in her mind. I'll need more information about him. Contact the intelligence department and have them look into his background and current activities. It's been too long since I've paid attention to the local power shifts among the harpies. Right away, Mother, Loba said, already moving to carry out the order. Charybdis reclined on her throne, her thoughts turning over the strange encounter. She had no personal interest in the harpies, but the feeling of deception she got from the harpy king was enough to warrant further investigation. In her long reign, she had learned never to ignore her instincts. They had kept her and her kingdom safe for centuries, and she wasn't about to start disregarding them now. Chapter 56 As the grand celebrations came to an end, the golden palace of Lanka returned to a serene silence, the halls now empty of guests. Yet, two figures remained, Charybdis, reclining on her throne, and Elamesia Elru Sarayan, the queen of the Sarayan dynasty, who stood in the hall, lingering with a sense of unresolved purpose. Elamesia, throughout the festivities, had kept to herself, engaging in idle conversation here and there but never approaching Charybdis. Now, as the last dignitaries departed, she signaled her aide to stay behind, indicating with a stern look that she intended to speak with Charybdis alone. The aide, understanding the gravity of the situation, complied silently. The hall grew quiet as Elamesia approached Charybdis, neither of them uttering a word. The weight of the moment hung heavily in the air. When Elamesia reached the throne, she suddenly prostrated herself at Charybdis's feet, her movement swift and filled with desperate reverence. Forgive me, your majesty, for not being useful enough, Elamesia pleaded, her voice trembling with genuine emotion. Charybdis sighed, recognizing the familiar scene. She was well aware of Elamesia's inferiority complex and the unparalleled love she harbored for her creator. It was unfortunate that Elamesia's heart had shattered upon learning that Charybdis had no interest in women, a matter Charybdis decided to set aside for another time. Charybdis lifted her bare leg, placing it gently under Elamesia's chin, raising her face to meet her gaze. I won't repeat my words, Elamesia. You are useful enough. The history between them was complex. Elamesia was not a natural-born queen she was crafted by Charybdis through Project Re, Life. After the elves had been devastated by Malim's rampage, Charybdis had silently captured 98% of the surviving population, subjecting them to intense experiments. Most were either physically or mentally destroyed, but from the ashes of this cruelty, Charybdis gained the insight to craft life itself. Elamesia emerged as the perfect elven queen, a being who was partially nature and partially the embodiment of magic. Her talent was unparalleled, possessing the concept of magic as her inherent trait. At just two years old, she was sent by Charybdis to win over the fragmented elven survivors. Remarkably, within two years, Elamesia returned having established a full-fledged kingdom. Through Elamesia, Charybdis had effectively bound the entire elven population to her will. Their food, water, and air were all mixed with her essence, transforming their very blood into a blend of cryptid and elven. Every child born under this new order inherited the blood-bound servitude before even having a soul. As Elamesia knelt before her, Charybdis regarded her with a mix of satisfaction and calculated control. You have done well, Charybdis said, her voice soothing yet authoritative. Your efforts have not gone unnoticed. Elamesia's eyes filled with a mix of relief and admiration. Thank you, your majesty. Your words mean everything to me. Charybdis leaned back, her expression softening just a touch. Continue to serve me well, Elamesia. There is much more to be done, and I will need your unwavering loyalty. Always, my queen, Elamesia vowed, her voice firm with devotion. Charybdis watched her with a calculating gaze, satisfied with her creation's loyalty. The future of her kingdom, and the control she held over it, seemed ever more secure with such dedicated servants at her command. Hearing the praise from Charybdis, Elamesia's face broadened with a smile that bordered on the edge of madness. She lowered her head, unable to contain the excitement that bubbled within her. May I? 
May I ask for a reward, your majesty? She stammered, her courage faltering midway as she hastily added, if you wish, of course. Charybdis sighed, a small smile playing on her lips. What is it that you want, Elamisia? Expecting her request to be denied as it always had been in the past, Elamisia trembled, a hint of liquid seeping through her undergarments. Still, she dared not overstep her bounds. I would like a kiss from you, your majesty. Charybdis, who was in a particularly good mood, considered the request. She could see the desperation and longing in Elamisia's eyes. With a faint chuckle, she decided to indulge her devoted creation. Using her blood control, she lifted Elamisia effortlessly into the air. Elamisia's breath hitched as Charybdis drew closer. She felt the gentle yet firm touch of her queen's lips on her forehead. The sensation was electric, sending shivers down her spine. Disappointed that the kiss wasn't on her lips, Elamisia's blush deepened. However, to her astonishment, Charybdis leaned in again, this time planting a kiss on her cheek, tantalizingly close to her lips. If you behave, Elamisia, Charybdis whispered, her voice dripping with a promise, I might have some remedy for your predicament. With that, Charybdis released her hold and walked away. Elamisia's legs went limp as she collapsed to the ground, a satisfied smile on her lips. Her legs gave out, unable to support the overwhelming surge of emotions, and a pool of liquid formed around her a fishy aroma spreading around her as she succumbed to her intense feelings. The hall, now empty save for Elamisia, echoed with the sound of her shallow, ecstatic breaths. She lay there, the scent of her queen still lingering, her heart racing with the possibility of future rewards. And a stupid smile on her face. As for the remedy she knew what it was, the queen would allow her to open the configuration lock placed on her being when she had crafted her. Allowing her to Bexome someone worthy of her love. Chapter 57 The scene shifts to the king of the harpy striding quickly through his palace, descending to a hidden door in the basement. Unlocking it with a swift, practiced motion, he entered the dimly lit chamber, his demeanor changing instantly. As soon as he closed the door behind him, he began to tear at his lips and peel away the skin that had come into contact with Charybdis. In the darkness, a voice spoke, its owner obscured from view. It was Feldway. No need to rush. The blood and flesh the Harpy King shed ignited the magic circle on the ground, confirming their theory, Charybdis was indeed a cryptid. The king's wounds healed almost instantly, and his wings retracted back into his body, revealing a more sinister form beneath the Harpy facade. Feldway addressed him again, so, you have the preparations ready? The man nodded. Even if I die, the plan won't fail. You may have to ask Ashoka if he is ready from his side or not. From the shadows, the silent conqueror Ashoka spoke up, his voice laced with confidence and disdain. I have already gathered 3,300 unique skills and have the resources to summon the required individuals at any given moment. He paused, glancing towards a darkened corner of the room with visible disgust. Just make sure you keep your pet working. Feldway chuckled, walking towards the same shadowed area while continuing to speak. Michael has been very generous in helping us. His efforts are always top-notch. As the flickering magic light illuminated the corner, monstrous visage was revealed, a red dragon with 108 angel wings and thousands of eyes. At its forehead, a human-like body protruded, naked and exposed. It was Velgrind, her eyes hollow and glassy, her will almost completely overpowered. He has already perfected Thugga, after all, Feldway remarked, pride in his voice. Velgrind, once a proud true dragon, had been twisted and corrupted by Michael and Feldway's machinations. Her monstrous form, a horrifying hybrid of true dragon and angel, was a testament to their dark collaboration. This was their creation, a being born from the overpowering of Velgrind's will by Thugga, an abomination of immense power and horror. Feldway looked upon Velgrind with satisfaction. Our plans are moving forward. Soon, Charybdis and her abominations shall be crushed. As these events conspired, Charybdis, who was snuggling Noir in bed and using him as a body pillow, felt a shiver run down her spine. Her danger sense blared genuinely, a sensation she hadn't felt in centuries. Ignoring the disappointed sounds from Noir as she got up from bed, she walked towards the source of her unease. 
She reached the edge of the palace, her eyes narrowing as she gazed out into the distance. Her marble phantasm, reacting to her distress, caused lightning to crackle in the sky, illuminating the surroundings with a stark, eerie light. The storm reflected her turmoil, a manifestation of her heightened senses and the imminent threat she felt. Standing there, Charybdis's mind raced through possibilities. She could feel the presence of something ominous, something that threatened not just her but the entire realm she ruled. Her instincts, honed over centuries, told her this was no ordinary danger. The sky grew darker, the lightning more intense, as if the very heavens were preparing for a confrontation. Charybdis, ever the ruler, stood tall and resolute, her mind already formulating plans and countermeasures. She knew she couldn't afford to be complacent, not when the safety of her kingdom and her loved ones was at stake. After observing the horizon, Charybdis made a decisive move. She needed to fasten the progress on Project B. For the first time in centuries, she felt that her complacence and confidence might have put her kingdom in danger. She left the palace and headed to her laboratory in Osir Lok, the former demon realm. There, she would put all her focus and energy into ensuring the success of her most ambitious project. Though armed with her two ultimate skills Lord of Sin, Hengra Mainyu and the Mother of Azura, Charybdis, her personal manifestation in the skill system she knew she still had to prepare for any mighty enemy that might come. Her resolve was unshakable. After the warning issued by her instincts, Charybdis decided to pull the curtains on many farces that had been going on for centuries. With a thought, she appeared on the Tower of Babel. Thousands of adventurers were within the tower at that moment. To her, it didn't matter. She connected to the tower, absorbing the millions of souls that it had been storing for the past millennium, causing its magic to flicker. With full control, she massacred all those currently present in the dungeon. The souls in the dungeon were special. The special power awarded to adventurers through the Exilia system was an advanced application of her soul research. This was her way of creating souls that synchronized with each other in fluctuations, maximizing their absorption efficiency. She pulled on the seven powers she had granted to seven individuals to become true heroes. None disappointed her, as all had become one despite it being a path available to few. She had altered their structure to optimize that path of evolution. She pulled on their special connection and absorbed their souls, causing each of them to fall like dolls without strings. As she did this, Charybdis began to bleed from her soul. The process was excruciating, her very essence being torn apart and reformed. Her once radiant skin began to pale, dark veins appearing and spreading across her body as their conflicting nature poisoned her. Her eyes, usually gleaming with predatory intent, now looked strained, with blood vessels bursting in a horrifying display of the toll this ritual was taking on her. The reason for this adverse reaction was that Charybdis had drastically bypassed the boundary of a being's ability to store souls within them without absorption. This caused her spiritual vessel to suffer, stretched beyond its limits, and now threatening to shatter under the immense pressure. She pushed these seven souls into two unique skills she had gained some time ago, Hero of the People and People's Queen, sub-evolutions of the fragmented politician. These two skills, powered by the souls of seven saints, were pushed to their limit as the skills were forced to evolve. Her physical appearance continued to deteriorate. Her luxurious hair, which had always flowed like a river of shadows, started to fall out in clumps, revealing patches of raw, bleeding scalp. Her regal attire became stained with her own blood, dripping from the wounds that opened spontaneously across her body. She could feel the fabric of her existence fraying, each soul she absorbed and manipulated tearing at her very being. Charybdis had personally petitioned the voice of the world to award her this ultimate skill, much like her own manifestation in the skill system she had gained after gaining a significant bond with the voice of the world. She had gained the intrinsic property of the voice of all things, allowing her to directly petition the voice of the world in times of need. The unique skills synchronized with each other as their rudimentary nucleic cores cracked by the collision of countless other smaller skills to give birth to a new ultimate skill, King of Heroes, Gilgamesh. But Charybdis wasn't done, despite the toll it was taking on her body. She petitioned again with 70% of the souls she had absorbed from the dungeon. Her body convulsed violently, more blood seeping from her pores. Her vision blurred, but she pressed on, knowing that this was necessary for the path she had planned next. Chapter 58 
The world rumbled from the petition as time seemed to stop. But this was different from the normal time stops that powerful people of the world pulled every now and then. The cardinal world itself had stopped from progressing further in the time stream. Not even the grand spirit of time was active at this moment. Charybdis was transported to the same place she had been when she was reincarnated. The surroundings were like the inside of a superfuturistic kaleidoscope with what appeared to be endlessly moving digital cogs, a pulsating light at what appeared to be the ever farther end of this place. This time, the cogs were moving erratically as the voice of the world seemed to be considering the outrageous petition Charybdis was making. Charybdis's petition was twofold. First was to allow Ingramenu to evolve into a Manus with a perfect nucleic core, making Charybdis a being with two nucleic cores to function. But this wasn't the outrageous one. The second one was truly outrageous. It was her merging of the voice of all things with the tidal vessel of evil, humanity's evil, and all her research-related skills. It was basically a polite and indirect way of asking a part of the voice of the world to descend into her soul and function as her tool. The same voice of the world that governed the eternal rules in all the vast universes created by Veldanava. Charybdis was even willing to lose all her resistance and magic if they could help tip the scale. The amount of authority such a skill would grant over reality was immense enough to warrant such a reaction. The pulsating light at the far end of the kaleidoscopic realm grew brighter, its rhythm matching the erratic movements of the cogs. Charybdis felt her spiritual vessel stretching further, threatening to shatter under the immense strain of her petition. The drastic bypassing of the boundary of a being's ability to store souls within them without absorption had caused her spiritual vessel to suffer immensely. Coupled with the divine nature of Vota pressing on her existence without abandon as the entity was rightfully angry. The cog stuttered, hesitated, and then began to align. The light intensified, filling the space with a blinding brilliance. The voice of the world was responding. Petition processed. Individual named Charybdis. Request for dual nucleic core monus evolution. Request for merging of skills and titles. Assessing consequences. Charybdis, her determination unwavering despite the toll, projected her thoughts in response. I am prepared to sacrifice everything. My kingdom, my people, my creations they are worth any price. I beseech you, grant me the power to protect them. Petition acknowledged. Risks assessed. Sacrifice required. Petition likely to be rejected due to individual favoritism. Despite the assessment, the voice of the world seemed inclined to reject the proposal. Granting such a favor to an individual was unprecedented and against the impartial nature of its governance. However, the millions of harmonized souls Charybdis had absorbed were not being used in vain. These souls, filled with the desire to grant Charybdis's request, began to resonate, their collective will exerting pressure on the decision OM the governing body. External influence detected. Souls harmonized. Collective will strong. Reassessing petition. Charybdis felt a surge of power as Ingra Mainu within her soul began to transform, the shell of the ultimate skill which was on the verge exploding apart as the boundaries of what was possible with UT became non-existent. Simultaneously, the knowledge and authority of the voice of all things merged with the vessel of evil and her research skills. The sheer power coursed through her, threatening to tear her apart even as it granted her unparalleled control. Her body convulsed violently, the pain nearly unbearable as the transformation took hold. Her skin cracked, her hair fell in clumps, and her blood soaked the ethereal realm. But through it all, she endured, driven by her unyielding resolve. Manus evolution complete. Ultimate skill merging in progress. Charybdis's consciousness wavered as the voice continued. Sacrifices accepted. Processing new ultimate skill. Charybdis felt the unbearable strain as she offered up her racial resistances, her body weakening further. Final stage of petition processing. Sacrifice of all racial resistances required. Approval of new skill. As the kaleidoscopic realm began to fade, Charybdis, now imbued with her new ultimate skill, felt her essence transform one final time. Origin skill, divine mind granted successfully. The realm's light faded, and Charybdis found herself back in her kingdom. The air crackled with energy, the power within her pulsating with a life of its own. She stood taller, despite her physical deterioration, 
her eyes burning with the intensity of her newfound authority. The world resumed its course, the pause in time ending as abruptly as it had begun. As Charybdis reappeared on the tower, she stood up shakily. Her natural healing was gone, and her draconic and cryptid racial traits were affected by the loss of certain resistances. But her mind wasn't focused on that. Her mouth broke into a bloody grin, and she even forgot about the fetus in her belly. A gurgle of blood began slowly and then loudened as she laughed, coughing. Ha! 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 Her laughter grew louder, more maniacal. Ha ha ha! Look at this! Ha ha ha! The once reddish black blood of hers turned pure golden as the origin skill granted her access to divine energy. This energy served on equal footing with stardust and turned null, but unlike them, it only served to create laws for reality. The black blood that had previously fallen to the tower, causing it to wither, was replaced by fallen golden droplets that rejuvenated life around the withering roof. But her attention was called back to the growing fetus by Ingramenu, who spoke within her mind. Charybdis, focus. The child within you needs your attention. You cannot afford to be careless now. Charybdis's manic laughter subsided, and she placed a hand on her belly, feeling the strong pulse of life within. The divine energy she now possessed coursed through her, stabilizing the fetus and ensuring its growth. She took a deep breath, the divine energy pumping through her body as her energy, healing her wounds and stabilizing her condition. Her draconic features shimmered with a golden hue, and she stood tall, her mind clear and focused. Engra, we need to accelerate Project B. We must prepare for the coming threats. Understood. Let us proceed. Your new power will be essential in pushing the project ahead. Charybdis nodded, her eyes burning with resolve. She teleported to her laboratory in Osir Lock, ready to fasten the progress of Project B. Her complacence and confidence had potentially put her kingdom in danger. But now, armed with her ultimate skills King of Heroes, Gilgamesh and the Mother of Azura, Charybdis along with the newly acquired origin skill, Divine Mind, she was ready to face any mighty enemy that threatened her realm. The loss of Lord of Sin had not weakened her it had evolved into an intrinsic skill facilitated by the Manas and Gramenu, granting her a deeper connection and control over her powers. Her steps were resolute as she entered the lab, knowing that the future of her kingdom and her unborn child depended on her actions from this moment onward. Chapter 59 Charybdis spent an intense month in the lab, working tirelessly on Project B alongside her dedicated team. Her patience was wearing thin, however, as her danger sense had been blaring with increasing frequency since the day she had gained her new powers. She knew she couldn't ignore the warnings much longer. One evening, frustration finally boiled over. Deadless, one of her most trusted advisors and chief scientists, approached her cautiously as she paced the lab, her eyes burning with impatience. Queen Charybdis, he began, his voice steady but filled with concern, we need more time. Project B is still incomplete. Using it now could be catastrophic. It could harm you, and worse, it could harm the baby. Charybdis whirled around, her eyes blazing. We don't have time, Deadless. My danger sense hasn't stopped warning me. Every second we delay, we risk everything we've worked for. Deadless stood his ground, his expression earnest. I understand the urgency, but we cannot be reckless. The incomplete Project B poses too many risks. We need to ensure its stability. Your power is already immense you don't need to rush into this. Silence. Charybdis roared, her divine hockey flaring with such intensity that it caused Deadless to stumble backward. The sheer force of her anger and the projection of her emotions were mind-numbing, leaving the room in a tense silence. With a glare that could pierce through steel, she ordered, begin the procedure immediately. The team moved quickly, their movements precise and efficient despite the palpable tension in the air. They prepared the giant core of Project B, transporting it from Osir Lock to the depths of the ocean in the overworld. This location was where the storage facility of a titanic ship, which Charybdis had built almost a millennium ago, was once housed. Now, it was repurposed into the process chamber for Project B. Charybdis had long collected all the necessary pieces for this project. The addition of the origin skill, a new but welcome element, and the ultimate skill, King of Heroes, 
Gilgamesh, were crucial to the modifications she had planned. As the core was secured in its chamber, Charybdis stood at the center, feeling the immense power and potential radiating from it. With a final nod, she initiated the procedure, the behemoth machine whirring. The next phase of her plan was in motion, and there was no turning back now. The place of the procedure once harbored the ship Charybdis had used during the Demon Realm invasion. Now, this reinforced space served a new purpose, the chamber for her ambitious and risky Project B. Project B was conceived after she gained the ability of Voice of All Things, which allowed her to petition the Voice of the World VOTW. The plan was to create an ultimate skill targeting heroes, drawing on the essence of powerful figures from history and fiction. Her summoning of Ashoka had confirmed her theory that these heroes existed somewhere in the vast multiverse. The ultimate skill, King of Heroes, Gilgamesh, allowed her to take power from any hero, awakened or not. This skill gave her absolute dominion over humanity's greatest champions. But it only allowed her raw power consumption and she didn't want to get demanding for a custom ultimate skill so Project B was made. Project B aimed to absorb these heroes' entire beings, including their feelings and resolve, transforming their lives into concepts of new skills if their abilities are not usable for Charybdis. As she sat inside the chamber, cables seamlessly merged with her body. The room's light changed from red to golden as the first summoning began. The core sphere spun rapidly, and rainbow-colored light bands formed around it. After some build-up, the first individual was summoned in the same position as her, but much more rudely invaded by cables and instantly absorbed by the hungry king of heroes. The first summon was Arash, a legendary hero from ancient Persia. As a warrior of King Manicher, Arash was known as the strongest archer who ended a sixty-year war between Persia and Tehran. His greatest feat was shooting an arrow from Mount Damavand, marking the boundary between the two countries. This heroic act ended the war and established peace, but it cost him his life as his body burst from the strain. Charybdis felt the rush of Arash's essence merging with her own. His heroic spirit, resolve, and legendary power became part of her. The process was smooth, her body and mind effortlessly integrating the new power. Her physical appearance showed no strain, only the confident glow of someone growing more powerful by the moment. She grinned widely as she reveled in her newfound power. The room's atmosphere reflected her confidence and growing might. She laughed, a sound that began as a low chuckle and slowly grew louder, echoing through the chamber. Yes. This power. It'll suffice. Despite Deadless' earlier warnings and his continued concern, Charybdis was resolute. The procedure had begun, and there was no turning back. With each hero she will absorb, her power will only grow, and with it, her ability to protect her kingdom and her unborn child. After absorbing Arash, Charybdis grew more confident. She decided to test the next feature of Project B, a mechanism still unfinished but functional, the pointer. The pointer allowed her to choose who to summon. As the antenna on the machine started rotating, the space around it destabilized, setting up a metaphysical interference pattern designed to allow only individuals matching a specific description to pass through. Any mismatch would result in incineration by the shifting magicules. With her goal clear, Charybdis aimed to summon Arjuna, the legendary archer known as one of the greatest warriors in history. Since she had begun with archers, it made sense to continue with that theme. The machine hummed and vibrated as it locked onto the desired target. The interference pattern shifted, filtering through countless potential heroes until it honed in on Arjuna. The core sphere spun faster, and the light bands around it intensified. After a moment of intense buildup, the machine succeeded. Arjuna appeared, occupying the same position as Charybdis, but the process was far from smooth. As the cables connected with Arjuna, the machine struggled. His divine essence caused interference, and the summoning room was filled with crackling energy. The pointer's antenna, unable to handle the strain, burst apart with a loud explosion. Charybdis gritted her teeth as the divine essence within Arjuna resisted absorption, causing her significant pain. She felt the divine energy clash with her own, like a tempest inside her body. Her draconic features flickered in and out of visibility as she struggled to integrate Arjuna's essence. The resistance was fierce, and the divine energy threatened to tear her apart. After an agonizing struggle, Charybdis finally managed to absorb Arjuna. 
she fell to her knees, gasping for breath. Her body bore signs of the struggle, with small wounds and burned holes where the divine energy had lashed out within the cables. Damn! I didn't expect this much resistance, she muttered, her voice strained. Despite the pain, she couldn't help but smile. The power she had gained was immense, and the addition of Arjuna's skills and essence made her significantly stronger. However, the damaged antenna and the intense backlash from Arjuna's summoning made it clear that she needed to improve Project B. The potential was undeniable, but it was also dangerous and unstable in its current form. As she recovered, Charybdis realized that she had to proceed with caution. The power she sought came at a high price, and reckless use could have dire consequences. With renewed determination, she resolved to refine Project B, ensuring that it would serve her purposes without further risks. For now, she had gained what she needed, the strength and skills of two of history's greatest archers. This was only the beginning, and Charybdis was prepared to continue her quest for power, no matter the challenges ahead. Chapter 60 Charybdis, satisfied with the initial results, stepped away from the machine that had begun to overheat and required shutdown. She surveyed her team, the ones who had poured their efforts into this ambitious project. I am proud of all of you, she declared, her voice resonating with sincerity. You will be rewarded with anything you desire. But for now, I have something rather important to attend to. In an instant, she vanished, reappearing at the top of her golden castle. The moon hung high, casting a silver glow over her kingdom. The wind whispered through the fabric of her dress, and she stood, savoring the cool breeze and the grand view of the realm she had crafted. Her kingdom was like a perfect dress woven with diverse threads monsters, humans, elves, and other subspecies all coexisted in this utopia. Crime was non-existent, and fear of hunger or poverty was a distant memory. Everyone had a role, no matter how small, contributing to the harmony of this society. With a final, contemplative look, she turned her gaze skyward. A red light began to form around her hand as she crystallized the legends of Arash and Arjuna into a single weapon. A grotesque imitation of Gandiva, Arjuna's divine bow, materialized in her grip. Though it wasn't as magnificent as the original, it was formidable in its own right. Testing the bowstring with a flick, the compressed weight produced a sound akin to thunder. Drawing the bow, she aimed toward the heavens. The divine construct of Indrayit Astra formed within the bow, glowing with an otherworldly brilliance, drawing the attention of the city below. Silent and focused, Charybdis drew the bowstring back fully, her godly senses and Arjuna's archery knowledge guiding her. She began the chant for Arasha's ultimate move, Stella. Midway through, the chant morphed into a chaotic blend as Charybdis decided to unleash her full power. Her third eye manifested, distorting the space behind her as wings of eldritch beauty extended infinitely into the void. The arrow in her grasp shone so brightly that night turned to day across the cardinal world. Anyone who glanced beyond the blinding light would see a visage of such beauty it would drive them Mata Testament to her form, crafted to overwhelm any mind with sin. The world seemed to pause as her fingers released the bowstring. The backlash alone cracked the unbreakable palace of mythical metals. The word's divine greeting echoed softly as the arrow soared skyward. The single arrow split into three, each heading toward a different destination. The kingdom Ashoka had built trembled as the arrow approached, obliterating all in its path. The ever-frozen northern continent lit up as the arrow neared the administrator of the world, the primordial rouge, Guy Crimson. The third arrow targeted the kingdom of the imposter Rudra. Charybdis didn't know who had triggered her danger sense, but she wasn't about to wait and find out. She would strike first blow, and with all her might. The sudden eruption of light from Charybdis's arrow had thrown the kingdom into chaos. Civil offices buzzed with frantic activity, messengers running to and fro, and officials shouting orders as they tried to comprehend the magnitude of what had just occurred. Citizens looked to the sky in awe and terror, their faces illuminated by the glow of Charybdis's divine arrow. What's happening? Is this the end of days? A voice shouted amidst the crowd. It's an attack. Something powerful has been unleashed, another responded. Why are you shouting you idiot it's obviously the queen. Near his home, Crota stood tall, his presence commanding even amidst the chaos. Beside him, Harita looked equally concerned. 
We need to get to the royal palace, Crota said, his voice urgent. Harita nodded, and the two quickly made their way towards the castle. Just as they reached the front gates, the earth beneath them trembled violently. The once immovable golden castle shuddered and cracked, the aftermath of Charybdis's immense power released still echoing through its foundations. Mother, Crota called out as he entered, his eyes scanning for her. He found her atop the highest tower, gazing at the far horizon. She was decked out in armor, ready for battle. Mother, he repeated, his voice steady despite the turmoil around them. Charybdis turned, her eyes still glowing with the remnants of divine energy, her presence overwhelming. She looked him deep in the eyes her clear scara conveying all that she had to say. She looked like a war goddess, ready to unleash her wrath upon those who threatened her kingdom. Crota bowed deeply, understanding the unspoken command in her gaze. I shall prepare the army and ready them for war, he declared with conviction. As Crota left to prepare the army, Charybdis stood alone atop her castle, the moon hanging high, the wind rustling around her. This was her answer to the provocation, her declaration of war. The kingdom she had built, a utopia of unity and peace, was now on the precipice of a season of war. Ashoka awoke to a world of unbearable pain. His body, a mere pile of burnt flesh, was a testament to the cataclysmic power he had faced. He had exhausted all of his stored extra lives, each resurrection more agonizing than the last, leaving his soul in tatters. A scream tore from his lips, raw and filled with a pain that echoed through the desolate remains of his kingdom. The sound was primal, a guttural roar that spoke of unimaginable suffering and loss. His lone bloodied eye, still visible amid the charred remains, burned with an intensity that could pierce the heavens. Rage. Pure, unadulterated rage coursed through him, fueling the fire that had kept him alive. It was a rage that promised retribution, a fury that vowed to tear apart anything and anyone responsible for his torment. With a shuddering breath, Ashoka tried to move, his broken body protesting with every agonizing inch. The charred remnants of his flesh crackled and peeled, each movement a new wave of searing pain. But he did not care. He welcomed the pain, embraced it as a reminder of his purpose, of the vengeance he would exact. Through the haze of agony, he could still see the devastation that had befallen his kingdom. The once proud buildings lay in ruins, the air thick with the acrid scent of burning. His people, those who had trusted and followed him, were gone. The kingdom he had built with his blood and sweat was reduced to ashes. But Ashoka's spirit remained unbroken. His lone eye, a beacon of fury and determination, glared at the horizon. He would rise from these ashes, stronger and more relentless than ever. His rage would fuel him, guide him on his path of retribution. And her who had brought this destruction upon his world, would face the full force of his wrath. With a final, seething scream, Ashoka vowed to reclaim his kingdom and obliterate his enemies. The pain would not stop him. The suffering would only make him stronger. And his rage, a promise of destruction, would tear apart anything in his way. Chapter 61 a similar scene unfolded in the icy expanse of the northern continent. Guy Crimson, the mighty primordial red, had conjured his most formidable shield, but it could only protect a small area. When the arrow struck, it shattered his defenses, reducing his body to near destruction. His once loyal subordinates lay scattered, their powerful magic insufficient against the overwhelming force. Misery and rain, although primordials like Guy, suffered severe injuries. They lay in crumpled heaps, their essence barely clinging to the remnants of their forms. Velzard, the ice dragon, stood amidst the devastation, her injuries grievous but not insurmountable. Her dragon factor granted her a resilience that even Guy envied. She grimaced, feeling the sting of her wounds but already beginning to heal. Despite her regenerative abilities, the attack had left her weakened, the force of the impact a testament to the sheer power of Charybdis's assault. Guy, his body barely holding together, managed to lift his head, surveying the desolate landscape. His crimson eyes, usually filled with a fiery confidence, now reflected a smoldering rage. He had underestimated his opponent, and the cost had been high. His once indomitable form was now a patchwork of broken flesh and seared bone, held together by sheer willpower. Misery and rain, despite their grievous injuries, crawled towards Guy, their faces etched with pain and determination. 
Lord Guy, misery rasped, her voice barely audible. We. We need to regroup. Rain, clutching her side where there was barely anything left of her flesh, nodded in agreement. This. This is beyond anything we've faced. Guy nodded weakly, his strength slowly returning. I know. As the chilling winds swept across the frozen wasteland, carrying the scent of devastation, both Guy and his subordinates knew that this was only the beginning. Their adversary had made a bold move, but they would not be easily defeated they were primordials for crying out loud. The town of Babel, named after the dungeon it housed, was in chaos. The adventurers who had ventured into the dungeon had all died unexpectedly, reminiscent of the dungeon break centuries ago that devastated human kingdoms. The news of the seven heroes' deaths spread rapidly, instilling fear on this era that human have grown accustomed. One month after the initial panic, in a bustling tavern within Babel, people were discussing the incidents. The air was thick with anxiety and speculation. Did you hear? All the adventurers in the dungeon are dead. A man exclaimed, his voice trembling. It's just like the dungeon break from centuries ago, another muttered, eyes wide with fear. Are we headed for another disaster? And the seven heroes? They're gone too, a woman added, her tone somber. What does this mean for us? Does this mean the era of peace is ending? A young man asked, his fear evident. The tavern fell silent as a woman dressed as a witch stood up, swaying slightly. She appeared drunk, but her voice was clear and commanding. War is just the preparation for peace, she proclaimed loudly. The patrons turned to her, intrigued and apprehensive. You humans, she continued, her tone dripping with contempt and disgust at the people around her, you aren't even worth being called humans. In fact, you're not even worth being called subhumans. Most races at least accept their general nature, but you. You are a disgrace. A burly man near the bar, his face red with anger clearly drunk, stood up. Watch your mouth, witch. You don't know what you're talking about. The witch smirked, her eyes gleaming with a dangerous light. Oh, but I do. Humans have always craved war. It's in your nature. You seek power, control, and dominance. You cloak it in noble causes, but at the end of the day, you are nothing more than beasts pretending to be civilized. Shut up. The man roared, lunging at her. She sidestepped gracefully, using her mug to stun him, by hitting the wooden mug on his head. He staggered back, rage twisting his features as he grabbed a chair and swung it at her. Though it was useless as with a wave of her hand, the man's skin began to slough off, transforming him into a grotesque mix of dog and aquatic animal. The room erupted into chaos, patrons shouting and scrambling to get away from the monstrosity. The witch looked down at the transformed man with disdain. Look at this. A perfect example of what you really are. Pieces of shit who have devolved into something even worse than beasts. The man's cries of agony filled the room, but her speech was cut short. Suddenly, the tavern shook, and a blinding light filled the room as Charybdis's attack and the subsequent thundering arrow lit up the sky. The witch fell to her but in awe, her mocking words forgotten as she stared at the spectacle a smile of childlike amazement on her face. The townsfolk, now more terrified than ever, looked outside to see the night turn into day as the arrow split into three parts, each heading towards its devastating destinations. The chaos in the tavern was now mirrored by the chaos in the town, the fear of war now a looming reality. The fiery explosion's light bathed the town of Babel, casting long shadows and a crimson hue over its cobblestone streets. The roar was deafening, a sound so fierce it seemed to split the sky. In the aftermath, the townspeople were left in various states of fear and awe. One mother clutched her child tightly to her chest, her own heart pounding as she whispered reassurances to the trembling little one. It's all right, darling. It's all right, she murmured, though her own eyes betrayed the fear she couldn't completely hide. Others were not so composed. A man fell to his knees, shaking his head as he muttered, What kind of force? What kind of power could do this? His voice trembled with a fear that many around him shared. People stumbled, some collapsing in sheer terror, their minds unable to fathom any force capable of saving them from such a display of destruction. Amidst this chaos, a witch stood apart from the rest, 
her grin widening as the explosion's light flickered across her face. Her robe slipped from her shoulders, revealing a symbol on her chest a dragon with three eyes and fins. This was no ordinary tattoo but the sacred mark of the dragon followers, a religion devoted to Charybdis, the immortal queen. The ink was a potent mix of concentrated magic and bits of the seven scales bestowed by their deity. As a high-ranking member, the witch's tattoo was of the purest form, unlike the diluted versions worn by ordinary followers. Recently, every member had felt a surge in their holy magic, the bond with their goddess growing stronger and feeding back an energizing loop of power. Their goal, hidden from the general populace, was to replace humanity with the descendants of their god and to create a world purged of creatures they deemed agents of chaos and suffering humans. This was not a small sect. The dragon followers were the only religion with adherents in every country, even in Rubrios, and their congregation included members from all races. Their influence was vast and growing, their faith unshakable. The witch, reveling in the chaos, muttered to herself, this is just the beginning. Our goddess has shown her true power. Soon, the world will be cleansed, and we shall be its rightful inheritors. As the townsfolk stared at the burning sky, the witch felt a surge of pride and purpose. To her, the explosion was a divine sign, a testament to Charybdis's power and their righteous mission. The era of peace was ending, but for the dragon followers, it heralded the dawn of a new, purer world. Chapter 62 the day after the attack, the world was further shaken by a chilling proclamation. The Kingdom of Lanka declared absolute war against numerous nations, including the Nazca Kingdom, ruled by Rudra. He had anticipated this day would eventually come, understanding the fragile balance that held the era of peace together. In the Nazca Kingdom, Rudra stood on his balcony, looking out over his realm as the sun rose. His face was stoic, but his eyes were hardened with resolve. So, it begins, he said quietly to himself, his voice carrying the weight of the inevitable conflict. His advisors hurriedly gathered around him. Your Majesty, one of them spoke, his voice trembling. The emissaries have delivered the ultimatum to all allied nations. We're preparing for their response. Rudra nodded, his gaze distant. Prepare our forces. We must show our strength and readiness. If Lanka wishes to test us, we will be ready. Meanwhile, in El Dorado, the relatively new demon Lord Cromwell addressed a crowd gathered in the city square. The atmosphere was tense, the fear palpable. People of El Dorado, he began, his voice steady, we stand on the brink of war, but we will not falter. Our strength lies in our unity, and together we will face whatever comes. We have faced challenges before, and we will overcome this one too. A murmur of agreement rippled through the crowd, though uncertainty was evident on many faces. Akira, whose name means beautiful strength in Sanskrit, was a unique and enigmatic figure within the chaotic world. As a cryptoid, she was a rare fusion of true dragon, human, and cryptid, a blend that set her apart from the Azura lineage of her siblings. Born with a carefree spirit and an insatiable curiosity, Akira explored the world with a sense of wonder and a desire to uncover its secrets. Her origins were shrouded in mystery from Ven herself, but her presence was unmistakable radiating a blend of beauty and formidable power. Despite her playful and inquisitive nature, she was a force to be reckoned with, possessing a strength that rivaled even her sibling Crota. Their powers had never been tested against each other, leaving their true capabilities a mystery. On the day the world was shaken by Lanka's declaration of war, Akira was in the small city-state of Attila. The tavern where she sat buzzed with talk of the impending conflict, but Akira was focused on the challenge before her. She was arm wrestling a brute of a man, his muscles straining against her seemingly effortless grip. With a playful smile, she pushed his hand down with ease, the table shaking under the impact. The man stared in disbelief, but Akira merely laughed, her eyes twinkling with amusement. Better luck next time, she said, patting his shoulder. The tavern erupted in cheers and groans, the patrons both awed and entertained by the display of strength. As she collected her winnings, a messenger rushed in, breathless and pale. Lanka has declared war on the Nazca Kingdom and others. He shouted, causing the tavern to fall silent. The news spread like wildfire, igniting whispers of fear and anticipation. Akira's curiosity was piqued. 
she knew her mother's sudden declaration would change everything. With an amused smirk, she stood up, her presence commanding attention. Looks like it's time for me to head back, she murmured to herself, her mind already racing with the possibilities. She left the tavern, the streets alive with the whispers of war. Her carefree demeanor belied the power she carried within her, a blend of grace and might that made her both unpredictable and captivating. As she made her way out of Attila, she glanced back at the bustling city one last time. The world held its breath, and Akira's return to Lanka promised to add another layer of formidable layer to the unfolding conflict. Let's see what mother has in store for us, she said, her voice filled with excitement. With that, she disappeared into the horizon, ready to reunite with her mother. In the grand, gilded chamber of her palace, Charybdis sat at her expansive desk, sketching the intricate designs for a new warplane. She had decreed that the nations of the world had a week to choose their allegiance, and the deadline loomed ever closer. Her hand moved deftly over the paper, outlining a design that fused the sleek, advanced technology of an F-35 with the fantastical elements of myth and science fiction. The result was a majestic hybrid, a flying fortress that symbolized both her power and ingenuity. As she worked, a messenger brought her a letter from the dragon followers. Their zealous words expressed their fervent desire to reshape the world in her image. Charybdis allowed herself a moment of amusement at their fanatical devotion, but she quickly returned to her work, unconcerned with their grandiose proclamations. These zealots, she mused aloud, so eager to reshape the world. Amusing, but ultimately insignificant. She cast the letter aside, refocusing on her sketch. Beneath her desk, Moir, one of her most loyal servants, was busily attending to her in a much more personal manner. Charybdis's breath hitched as waves of pleasure coursed through her, but she did not allow herself to be distracted from her task. She rubbed Noir's head gently, her voice a sultry purr. Emicham, good boy. Keep doing that. Returning to her sketch, she detailed the building process, envisioning a war machine that would dominate the skies. The design was not only formidable in function but also breathtaking in form, a true testament to her divine brilliance. However, the mounting intensity of her pleasure made it increasingly difficult to focus. As she neared her release, her hand faltered. The overwhelming sensation forced her to push Noir's head deeper, her moans echoing through the chamber. Her face contorted in ecstasy, she momentarily abandoned her work, surrendering to the bliss that washed over her. Ah, Noir, just like that. Don't stop. When the waves of pleasure finally subsided, she took a moment to compose herself, a satisfied smile playing on her lips. She looked down at Noir with approval. You've done well, she praised before turning her attention back to the nearly complete sketch. The plane would be a crucial asset in the imminent war, a testament to her strategic genius and unyielding power. Charybdis resumed her work with renewed focus, the design of the warplane taking shape before her eyes. This will be the key to the slaughter will do she whispered to herself, her eyes gleaming with ambition. The world would soon witness the full might of her empire, and with it, the dawn of a new era forged in fire and ambition. Let them choose their sides, she murmured. In the end, they will all bow before me. Chapter 63 Chapter 64 Chapter 65 The scene shifts to Charybdis walking through an ancient forest, her steps sure and deliberate. In her hand, she carried a bow vastly different from the one she had previously conjured. This bow was more refined and elusive in nature, its handle larger than necessary, adorned with the pattern of an upside-down fish and intricate carvings that glowed a mystical blue. Following closely behind her was Harita, her loyal subordinate. Harita's wings were fully displayed, and a sort of armor-like appendage extended from her back, wrapping protectively around her body. The two of them walked through the dwelling of spirits, a place once filled with the chattering of pixies and the light-hearted presence of lesser spirits. Now, the area was eerily silent. Some spirits had fled, others hid, and the majority simply could not bear the pressure that Charybdis was exerting. Her divine hockey disintegrated the spiritual beings merely by existing near them. Their progress was halted by Ram Iris, who appeared as if she had seen a ghost. Her form was incomplete, still far from her full potential as she had yet to complete her cycle of reincarnation. Charybdis looked at the pitiful state of the Queen of Spirits and shook her head in disdain. 
If I had known that the Great Spirit couldn't even use her power when her kind needed it the most, I would have never bothered to come here, Charybdis said, her voice dripping with scorn. Before Ram Iris could respond, Charybdis lunged at her with incredible speed. In response, the space around them shifted as Ram Iris added an infinite amount of distance between herself and Charybdis. To this, Charybdis smiled, her eyes lighting up with excitement. Now that's what I'm talking about, she exclaimed, drawing her bow. The string lit up with thunder, crackling with divine energy. This sudden flexibility stemmed from the fact that she had already assimilated the legends into herself completely. While Arash had been easy to absorb, Arjuna's will prove more challenging. Arjuna was not just a skilled archer he was a paragon of duty and righteousness. His unwavering commitment to his principles and the weight of his divine essence made him a formidable force. Charybdis had to be careful recklessly assimilating him could have poisoned her mind, overwhelming her own will with his steadfast warrior spirit. She realized that she had only summoned a fragmented version of Arjuna, as she had received only knowledge of archery and fragmented memories of fighting in Grail Wars. It did not surprise her that the world of Tight Moon truly existed, and she could even summon entities from there. The complexity of her revived existence in a world with godlike powers seemed like a convoluted story hatched in the mind of a truly talentless author. It was almost laughable. All these thoughts churned in her head within the fraction of a spirit second the amount of time it takes for information particles to cover the distance of one nanometer in the information plane. As a divine existence, Charybdis was very close in terms of thinking to a digital life form. Returning to the battle, the thundering bowstring converged into an uneven, curved arrow as Charybdis's divine authority pumped through the air. Vajra, she whispered, the embodiment of lightning covering the infinite distance instantly and embedding itself in the abdomen of the Queen of Fairies, who was thrown back by the giant thunderous blast. As Ram Iris struggled to stabilize herself, a concentrated beam of fire, which melted space and time, reached her from far, far away. The combined attack was enough to destroy the entire labyrinth that existed in the physical world and most of what existed in the spiritual world. Charybdis observed the expanding explosion cloud for a moment before smirking again. She assumed a running position mid-air, her legs bending slightly as the air acted as a podium. Bionic wings sprouted from her back, allowing her to cross the infinite distance effortlessly. Just as she reached Ram Iris, the spirit queen emerged from the smoke, her expression furious as more and more power radiated from her. The gaping hole from Vitra was already healing. Charybdis had intentionally fired Vitra in a way that wouldn't kill Ram Iris, aiming instead to eliminate all spirits residing within the dwelling that hadn't fled. She wanted to draw the complete anger of Ram Iris onto herself, and it worked like a charm. Ram Iris waved her hand like a sword, and the space around them seemed to warp and distort. The attack, no, it wasn't an attack it was more reminiscent of her newly gained authority as she tried to separate Charybdis. Though Charybdis mitigated the effects with a burst of divine energy, a small cut still appeared on her cheek, drawing her golden blood which didn't spill out of her body but stuck inside, unmoving. Charybdis exclaimed with a grin, You do have the power, Spirit Quino, I shouldn't call you that. You are a disgrace as a queen, but you do have power, Spirit of Creation. Her words, loud and filled with boisterous confidence and scorn, pierced through Ramrus's mind. The spirit queen froze, shell-shocked that someone could remember that creation once existed as an element. When she ascended to become the most powerful spirit excluding the great spirits, she had absorbed the concept of creation as an element. The only exception she had ever found was Malim, which was understandable since she inherited stardust. But even then, Malim could never truly realize the potential of creation unless she gained an ultimate skill before her ascension, it was like an element similar to fire, wind, or light. This was also the reason why Malim's corruptive aura damaged her so much. Surprised that I know. I know a lot, Ram Iris, but that's not why I am here, Charybdis said, theatrically pointing at Ram Iris. I want you to join me. I fought you to know if you're worthy of my time. Ramaris's eyes widened in shock but quickly narrowed in determination. You underestimate the power of the spirits and the strength of my resolve, she replied, her voice steady despite the turmoil within her. Charybdis laughed, a cold, mirthless sound. We'll see about that, spirit she said, her eyes gleaming with anticipation. 
The sky darkened as Ram Iris summoned a torrent of energy resembling stardust, swirling around her like a hurricane. She thrust her hands forward, releasing a barrage of bolts that crackled with her authority within this domain. Charybdis deflected them effortlessly with her bow, each impact creating ripples of energy that distorted the air. With a powerful leap, Charybdis closed the distance between them, her bowstring lighting up with red thunder which morphed to cackling flames. She drew the bow, the string humming with flames. Agniastra she said, releasing the arrow. Chapter 66 Soon, the scene shifts to Charybdis with a few cuts on her dress and a new wound on her chest, yet she appeared untired, seemingly playing with Ram Iris. In stark contrast, Ram Iris looked ragged, struggling to keep her form. Her body was scorched and wounded in many places. She no longer had the power to perform complex magics involving spiritual mechanisms. The only reason she could resist Charybdis at the moment was her domain over the labyrinth. As the fairy of creation, she had absolute authority over her creations, and this authority had allowed her to keep Charybdis at bay. Other elemental lords had tried to intervene, but the demi-spirit, no, the new fire lord, had been enough to stop them all in their path. Her form shifted to one of titanic scale as she alone fought the combined forces of elemental spirits. Ram Iris could only watch in fear as Charybdis absorbed all their essences. The spirit race was basically finished. Even if the lesser ones survived, the spirits would be reduced to mere slaves of magic. None could lead them, and none would be able to fight for them. Her attention was drawn back to Charybdis, who began speaking again after their fierce battle. I have given you enough time. To think your defiance is a pity, but it doesn't matter. Time is my ally, after all. Charybdis's voice was calm, almost amused, as she spoke, her eyes gleaming with a cold, calculating light. You were once a powerful spirit, Ram Iris. Now look at you. Struggling, fighting a losing battle. It's almost tragic. Charybdis, her eyes gleaming with a predatory light, stepped closer to Ram Iris, a serene smile on her face despite the carnage around them. You pride yourself in your domain of creation, don't you? She asked, her voice almost tender. I have a little bit of a domain myself, though it's not a flimsy realization of magic like yours. It's the ultimate crystallization of my existence. The epitome of my being is humanity's evil, the true herald of what drives this world. Ramaris's eyes widened in horror as Charybdis continued, you should rejoice because no one but a single person in this world has ever set foot in that place. As she spoke, the reality around her seemed to glitch. Her form started shifting, revealing her three eyes, while her bionic wings transformed into those of a dragon. The space around her eroded like a corrosive poison. Charybdis began to chant, her voice resonating with an ancient, malevolent power. By the shadows of humanity's darkest desires. By the essence of all sins and liars. I summon forth the eternal blight. To bring the world's truth into light. By the blood of the fallen and the cries of the damned. By the sins of man, both slight and grand. I call upon the abyssal flame. To consume all within its name. From the depths of eternal despair. I weave the threads of nightmarish air. Shishvata Narakam, rise and stand. Embodiment of sin by my command. Unveil the truths hidden in lies. Expose the rot beneath the guise. From the darkest corners of the soul. Consume the world, make it whole. In this phantasm, all shall see. The perfect world, as it should be. By my will, let the sins ignite. And bring forth eternal night. As the chant echoed through the air, the space around Charybdis twisted and warped, a vortex of malevolent energy forming. Ram Iris, despite her exhaustion, tried to muster her remaining strength to resist, but the overwhelming power of Charybdis's marble phantasm was too much. Reality itself seemed to buckle under the weight of the dark energy. Charybdis, now fully transformed, looked upon Ram Iris with a mixture of pity and amusement. This is my domain, Ram Iris. Shishvata Narakanth Eternal Hell, the embodiment of all sin. In this place, all truths are laid bare, and all lies are incinerated. Ram Iris, her body trembling, managed to choke out, you. You're a monster. Charybdis's smile widened. Perhaps. 
but I am a necessary monster. Now, witness the true power of creation. With a final, thunderous roar, the vortex expanded, engulfing Ram Iris and the remnants of the labyrinth in a cataclysmic explosion of energy. The very fabric of reality seemed to tear apart, and for a moment, everything was consumed by the abyss. As the dust settled, Charybdis stood alone in the midst of the devastation, her form slowly returning to its original state. As the phantasm's energy dissipated, the scene shifted to reveal Charybdis standing over the writhing body of Ram Iris. The once proud spirit queen now lay on the ground, her essence instantly corrupted by the dark truth she had witnessed. Her body convulsed, struggling against the overwhelming malevolence that now tainted her very soul. Charybdis looked down at her, a satisfied smirk playing on her lips. Look at you, Ram Iris. You wanted to defend your realm, your creations. But now, you've seen the true face of this world, and it's too much for you to bear. Ramaris's eyes, once bright with determination, were now clouded with despair. Her essence twisted and torn apart, much like Harita's had been. The corruption spread through her, seeping into every part of her being, warping her mind and soul. You will soon become something new, Charybdis continued, her voice cold and detached. Your personality, your will, everything that made you who you are, will be twisted and torn apart. You will be remade in my image, just like Harita. The mention of Harita brought a flicker of recognition to Ramaris's eyes, but it was fleeting. The corruption was too strong, and she could feel her thoughts fragmenting, her sense of self disintegrating. Charybdis turned away, leaving Ram Iris to her fate. The spirit queen's cries of anguish echoed through the desolate remains of the labyrinth, a testament to the ruthless power of Charybdis and the dark reality she had forced upon the world. As she walked away, Charybdis's mind was already focused on the next step of her plan. Chapter 67 High atop the central tower of Lanka, Akira stood, her piercing eyes scanning the horizon. The tower housed the heart of the formation that powered the shield surrounding Lanka mixture of a semi-reality membrane and Charybdis's marble phantasm. This shield had kept their enemies at bay and ensured Lanka's dominion remained unchallenged. At the moment, the shield was fluctuating, a result of Charybdis activating her marble phantasm elsewhere. It was a brief vulnerability, one that Charybdis had dismissed as inconsequential. But she was wrong. In the midst of the fluctuation, Feldway and the monstrous Velgrind teleported inside the shield. The air shimmered and distorted for a moment, heralding their arrival. Akira, with her acute senses, immediately detected the anomaly. So, Charybdis finally made a mistake, Akira murmured her voice carrying a mixture of amusement and anticipation. She turned, her expression shifting from serene to fiercely determined. Feldway, with his imposing presence, stepped forward, his eyes narrowing as he took in Akira. Beside him, Velgrind, a massive Chinese dragon with a monstrous visage, floated menacingly. The red dragon's form was terrifying, 108 angel wings sprouted from her back, and thousands of eyes adorned her scales. At her forehead, a human body protruded, naked and exposed. We're here to end this, Feldway declared, his voice deep and resonant. Lunka's reign of terror ends today. Akira's lips curled into a confident smile. You underestimate us. You may have found a way in, but this is our territory. Feldway sneered, Vermin. I can smell the cryptid stench on you. You don't belong in this world. With a wave of his hand, Velgrind unleashed a devastating attack straight at the central tower. The attack was a mixture of holy light and supreme draconic fury, a force powerful enough to obliterate anything in its path. But Akira dismissed it with a simple flick of her hand. The attack dissipated without any effect on the surroundings, as if it was an illusion. This was the effect of her intrinsic skill, one she was born with, Pashupada, the raised hand of the god of destruction. Even Charybdis didn't know the full potential this skill could lead Akira to. The air around them crackled with energy as Akira's power nullified the dragon's assault. Feldway's eyes widened in shock, unable to believe what he had just witnessed, but he controlled himself as despite this he had ways to manage this. Akira chuckled, her voice dripping with confidence. Is that all you've got? You'll need more than that to take me down. Feldway's expression darkened, but before he could issue another command. 
Akira lunged at Feldway with blinding speed, their clash sending shockwaves through the air. Feldway met her strike with raw, power, pushing her back but not overwhelming her. Loba and Mo who had just arrived flanked Velgrind, ready to exploit any opening. You can't win this, Feldway growled, his voice as cold and stern as ever. Akira smirked, confidence glinting in her eyes. Together, we are unstoppable. Velgrind roared, unleashing torrents of fiery destruction. Mo evaded the attacks, countering with bursts of energy that forced the dragon back. Loba absorbed the energy with absorb life, growing stronger with each attack. Loba grinned, her invulnerable physique allowing her to withstand Velgrind's onslaught. You really thought you could just waltz in here and win? How foolish. Mo nodded, her energy reinforcing Loba's attacks. Let's finish this quickly. Lanka needs us. Feldway's expression remained emotionless, his eyes never leaving Akira. You underestimate me. Akira's eyes narrowed. And you underestimate us. The battle raged on, with Akira, Loba, and Mo gaining the upper hand. Feldway's stern demeanor began to crack, revealing a hint of unease. Akira's attacks grew fiercer, her movements more precise. It seemed they were about to turn the tide. Akira jinned an aura of red lightning around her as she prepared TK unleash slightly more capabilities of her skill. Feldway's eyes narrowed, sensing the danger for the first. Just as Akira was about to unleash her raw destructive nature, loosening her inhibitions, Lucian struck. Squelch. The Harpy King, who had snuck in unnoticed, tore through Akira's abdomen with his bare hands, which seemed to be coated in some sort of black metallic energy. The sound echoing through the battlefield. Akira gasped, her eyes widening in shock and pain. She crumpled to the ground, her body limp. Akira. Loba shouted, her invulnerable physique allowing her to withstand Velgrind's onslaught as she moved to protect her fallen sister. Lucian stood over Akira, his expression devoid of sympathy. Vermin, he spat, his voice dripping with disdain. You think you're a match for us? Akira gasped, struggling to breathe as she lay on the ground. You. You won't win. She managed to croak out. But the man again ruthlessly stomped on her face his legs coated in the same metallic energy. Feldway smirked, the tide turning in his favor. Did you really think you could win with that cryptid by your side? Hearing this Lucian smirked nervously knowing how dangerous the battle was about to get if not for him, he was the ultimate weapon crafted by Feldway to be the splee killer of cryptids. His body produced a unique frequency of magicules that are poisonous and extremely damaging to cryptids. Feldway stood in the sky, his eyes cold and calculating. This ends now. Velgrind, now unopposed, unleashed a devastating attack towards the central tower. Loba and Mo tried to counter, the combined might of Feldway, Lucian, and Velgrind was too much. The invincible central tower shook, its structure straining under the assault. Mo summoned all her strength, her supportive abilities bolstering Loba. But even with their combined efforts, they were being pushed back. Feldway's power was overwhelming, and Lucian's surprise attack had left them vulnerable. You fought bravely, for being a spawn of that wretched woman Feldway taunted, but bravery alone is not enough. Loba gritted her teeth, refusing to give up. She absorbed as much energy as she could, launching a desperate counterattack. We won't let you win. Mo supported her with every ounce of power she had. For Lanka. In response Feldway summoned a giant arrow of light. The sky lit up with a blinding explosion of power, engulfing the central tower. When the dust settled, the defenders lay defeated. Akira lay unconscious, her body battered and broken. Loba and Mo were severely wounded, their strength depleted. Feldway and his allies stood victorious, their triumph casting a dark shadow over Lanka. The central tower, the heart of Lanka's defenses, lay in ruins. The shield around the city flickered for the final time as it failed, leaving it vulnerable. The battle had been fierce, but the overwhelming might of Feldway, Lucian, and Velgrind had secured their victory. As Feldway surveyed the battlefield, he couldn't help but feel a sense of satisfaction. This is just the beginning, he muttered. The defenders of Lanka had fallen, and the path to conquest lay open before him. Lucian looked down at the fallen Akira, 
a twisted smile on his face, before turning to Feldway. What now? We press forward, Feldway replied, his voice steady and commanding. Lanka will fall, and with it, all who dare to oppose us. Velgrind, now unopposed, charged a massive attack, targeting the city where the palace stood. The attack being a torrent of pitch-black flames. Just as the attack was about to obliterate the city, a massive explosion of energy stopped it halfway, protecting the palace. Emerging from the blast was a blonde man with brown skin, a line pattern along his eyes, and a grim expression on his face. He looked at the three invaders with intense hatred. I'm late, Veldora muttered, his presence radiating immense power and determination. As Veldora looked around on the scene, the damage was already significant. His eyes, usually filled with mirth, were now clouded with fury as he took in the sight of his injured granddaughters, Akira, Loba, and Mo. How dare you! Veldora roared, his voice reverberating with a chilling intensity. The city of Lanka lay in ruins, with half of it reduced to rubble. His granddaughters were grievously wounded. His fury was palpable, and his gaze was filled with a burning rage. Alaster, Veldora's ultimate skill, activated in response to his master's anger. The air crackled with dark energy as a towering pillar of cursed energy erupted from where he stood, casting an ominous shadow over the battlefield. The ground trembled under the sheer force of Alaster's power. Your assault on our home ends now. Veldora declared, his voice echoing with authority. The raw power he emanated was a stark contrast to the calm demeanor he had shown earlier. Feldway, unfazed, remained emotionless and stern as he assessed the new threat. Lucian, the Harpy King, stood poised after his brutal attack on Akira, prepared for whatever came next. Veldora's eyes locked onto Feldway and Lucian. You will pay for this, he growled, his tone leaving no room for negotiation. His aura pulsed with a menacing power as he readied himself for battle. The sky darkened, and the atmosphere thickened with the tension of impending conflict. The once vibrant city of Lanka now stood on the brink of total destruction, and the fate of its defenders hung in the balance. All because of the miscalculation of its creator. Chapter 68 Veldora looked at the bloodied Akira and Mo, and the unconscious Loba, his eyes burning with fury. He moved instantly, reappearing with the three girls on his shoulders, laying them down gently away from the battlefield. Their eyes struggled to follow his movements, unable to comprehend the speed at which he had acted. Rest now, he murmured, his voice uncharacteristically tender. I'll handle this. Veldora's serious expression conveyed the depth of his anger. His usual jovial demeanor was replaced by a wrathful intensity that promised retribution. Lucian, overconfident, lunged at Veldora, aiming to stab him with his black-coated hands. But Veldora caught his hands mid-air, his grip like a vice. With a savage twist, he broke Lucian's hands, eliciting a pained scream from the Harpy King. Ayak. You've hurt my dear grandchildren, Veldora growled, his crimson eyes piercing through Lucian's soul. You will pay for what you've done. Feldway, observing the scene, felt a rare tremble in his heart. He realized that Veldora had surpassed all the living true dragons in power. Desperation clawed at him as he attempted to flee with Velgrind, or more appropriately, Thugga, planning to utilize Ashoka's summoning to deal with the variable that is Veldora. But just as Feldway began his retreat, the world shattered around him like broken mirrors. Reality itself seemed to fracture, and he found himself transferred to another dimension. No. Feldway shouted in his mind, panic seeping into his voice. This cannot be. Veldora's form materialized before him, the dragon's presence overwhelming and inescapable. There's no escape, Veldora said, his voice a low, dangerous rumble. You will face justice for your crimes. Feldway's mind raced, searching for a way out, but the dimension Veldora had created using dimension craft was absolute. It was a realm where Veldora's power reigned supreme, and Feldway was trapped within its confines. The wrathful dragon's aura flared, filling the dimension with a sense of doom. Feldway and Thugga braced themselves for the onslaught, realizing too late the true extent of Veldora's power. Seeing that his escape was cut off, Feldway forcefully calmed himself down. He had a backup body far from Veldora's reach, so it didn't matter if he died here. 
However, losing Lucian would disrupt many of his plans. He had intended to develop the fallen angel harpy hybrid and then absorb him when the time was right to combat Ivaric. But what is a few more years? He'll start anew he'll just have to wait for a kid to be born. Veldora, staring them down, began to be covered by a mechanical armor forged from his own power. It was a legend-grade armor crafted by Charybdis's special scientists, and herself, from something they called the cube. Veldora didn't fully grasp their scientific mumbo-jumbo, but he knew the cube was a material that replicated the properties of Star Heart, a special material with extraordinary properties similar to high high irocane. Equipment made from it could reach god grade. The cube would eventually transform into true Star Heart and lose its original replicating properties. Since the cube had only replicated the armor for a few days, it had yet to be reforged into true Star Heart. However, this was not the case for the deep purple blade in Veldora's hands. It was a true star heart sword forged from the combined auras of Melim, Veldora, and Charybdis. Its aura was thunderous and even looking at it was painful for the weak. Thugga, agitated, launched millions of holy arrows at Veldora, using the angelic attributes present within it. But with a simple swing of his sword, Veldora unleashed a giant crescent-shaped lightning slash, dwarfing any mountain in the world. You think you can challenge me? Veldora's voice boomed, his aura flaring with intense power. You have no idea what you're up against. Feldway, maintaining his composure, created a dome of light in an attempt to protect himself. Lucian, sensing the gravity of the situation, tried to break free, but Veldora's grip was unyielding. The Harpy King's black energy was rendered useless against the dragon's might. I have plans that go beyond this battle, Feldway continued, his tone icy. You may defeat me here, but the war is far from over. Enough talk, Veldora growled. Prepare to meet your end. The battlefield trembled with raw energy as Veldora and Thugga faced off. Veldora, clad in his mechanical armor forged from the cube, was a formidable force. His ultimate skill, Lord of Vengeance Alaster, drove his every action with relentless precision. Thugga roared with a voice distorted by divine power. Divine Fury. She commanded, unleashing a torrent of holy fire. The flames surged towards Veldora, but he activated optimal path, his movements a series of calculated evasion and counterattacks. The holy fire clashed with Veldora's Starheart blade, creating an explosion that illuminated the battlefield. Despite the intense heat, Veldora's armor absorbed much of the impact, and he pressed forward with unyielding resolve. Thugga summoned heavenly wrath her wings spreading to release a rain of holy arrows. Each arrow was imbued with divine light, but Veldora's blade created a shield of lightning that deflected the onslaught. The collision of energies shook the ground, but Veldora remained steadfast. Feldway watched from a distance, his demeanor cold and calculating. He summoned dark vortexes to hinder Veldora, but Veldora, using unimpeded path, tore through them with ease. His path to victory was clear, unblocked by Feldway's attempts. As Thugga unleashed celestial judgment, a concentrated beam of holy energy, Veldora invoked persistence of rage. The beam seared through the air, its force intense, but Veldora's relentless fury allowed him to withstand the attack without much effort. He advanced with renewed strength, each step driven by his unyielding rage. The battlefield was a cacophony of divine and draconic energy as Veldora adapted to Thugga's every move he hadn't apatted to previously with Path of Vengeance. His sword cleaved through the divine onslaught, his strikes precise and powerful. Thugga, in her distorted fury, prepared a final, colossal attack. Veldora, his eyes cold with pity, anticipated her actions. He charged through the divine flames with a decisive blow, shattering Thugga's form. Her essence scattered across the battlefield, her colossal body disintegrating into fragments of holy energy. As Thugga fell, Veldora's expression remained stern, his heart hardened by the years of disengagement with his sister. He had long abandoned any notion of love for his sister, only pity for the twisted form she had become. He focused on the aftermath, his gaze fixed on the destruction left behind. Feldway and Lucian, seizing the opportunity, prepared to escape. Feldway manipulated dark energies to create a rift, while Lucian observed, his expression impassive. 
Lucian made his move, tearing through the air with his dark metallic-coated hands, but Veldora intercepted him with a fierce glare which incapacitated the young king. With a final surge of dark energy, Feldway and Lucian vanished through the rift. Chapter 69 Charybdis had just finished corrupting Ram Iris and was soaring through the sky when she sensed the troubling fluctuations. Her anger was bubbling as she detected Akira's injury the very thought of her daughter in pain drove her into a furious rage. However, amid her anger, she felt Veldora's immense power and emotional turmoil, forcing her to compose herself. She had left him there to protect them she shouldn't abandon her end of the plan recklessly. The urgency of the situation demanded clarity of mind. Navigating through the skies, she flew straight toward the Harpy Kingdom with incredible speed. The force of her flight was so immense that it cleaved the capital in half, leaving devastation in her wake. She was guided instinctively toward the basement of the palace, where her enemies were hiding. As she broke through the palace's defenses, Charybdis descended into the darkness below. Her keen eyes quickly locked onto the scene, Lucian, panting heavily, Feldway, and a pitiful, charred Ashoka. Ashoka's condition was so severe that the man was alive through sheer will. Charybdis ignored him, her focus entirely on Lucian, whose very presence was repulsive to her instincts. With a swift and determined movement, she appeared directly beside Lucian. Her fist, glowing with raw power, aimed straight for his heart. Lucian's body, cloaked in an energy that partially nullified physical attacks, tried to repel her strike. However, Charybdis was relentless. She increased the pressure with her divine hockey, her hand pressing through the barriers and reaching towards his heart. Aak. Lucian's screams echoed through the chamber, his voice hoarse and strained as the agony set in. His vocal cords were damaged from the force of his cries. Feldway, sensing the imminent threat, tried to vanish from sight. But an invisible pressure, a manifestation of Charybdis's will, held him firmly in place. Charybdis's presence was like a tempest, an unrelenting storm. Ashoka lay there, a charred shell of his former self. His kingdom, his people, his body, and even fragments of his soul had been lost. Yet, a single ember of his will remained, fueled by an unwavering desire for vengeance. He had been reduced to a mere remnant of his former glory, but his spirit burned with a fervor that defied his physical ruin. His hatred was directed toward one being, Charybdis, the wretched existence who had summoned him to this world and wreaked havoc upon it. Seeing Charybdis so close, Ashoka's will flared. He suppressed the urge to lash out immediately, instead focusing on a final, desperate act. Summoning his ultimate attack, he prepared to sacrifice everything that remained of him. This would be his final stroke, his ultimate summoning to end the great evil that stood before him. In his mind, he began to chant, calling upon the thousands of skills of his fallen soldiers and loyalists. They had entrusted him with their hopes, their dreams of freedom from Charybdis's cruel grasp. Their sacrifices, their years of existence, culminated in this moment. He called upon the gods that resided beyond the vastness of Veldnava's creations. He invoked the thirty-three qualities of the divine, beseeching them to lend him their strength in this dire hour. He did not seek power for power's sake he sought only the means to destroy Charybdis. By the names of the thirty-three divine virtues, by the spirits who have walked the ancient paths, I summon thee. I sacrifice the myriad skills of my loyal soldiers, the essence of my fallen comrades, in this final plea. O gods beyond the stars, hear my call. Grant me the power to smite this evil, to end the suffering she has wrought. Bestow upon me strength beyond measure, just for this moment. Let me be your vessel of justice, your instrument of retribution. I ask not for immortality, nor for endless power, but for the might to strike true against this wretched existence. In this ultimate hour, I offer my soul as the final sacrifice. As he chanted, he could feel the power building within him, a culmination of all the sacrifices and prayers of those who had fallen. The room seemed to vibrate with a new energy, one that was both ancient and immeasurable. He felt the divine presence answering his call, vesting him with the strength needed for this one, decisive blow. Charybdis turned, her expression hardening as she felt the divine energy radiating from Ashoka. Her instincts screamed at her to retreat, to flee from this burgeoning threat. She saw in his eyes the reflection of all the sacrifices and hopes vested in him. The air around him crackled with otherworldly power, 
and the very fabric of reality seemed to tremble. Ashoka saw it in her eyes fear, genuine and profound. He knew this was his moment. The divine energy within him reached its zenith, and he felt a final surge of power welling up. He unleashed it with all his remaining strength, a brilliant torrent of light and force that surged toward Charybdis with unerring precision. She raised her defenses, but the purity and magnitude of the attack overwhelmed her barriers, striking her with the accumulated wrath of thousands. Charybdis faced Ashoka, her body battered but unyielding. Each strike from Ashoka's divine power tore through her, but her resilience kept her standing. She began chanting the incantation for her marble phantasm, Shishvata Narakam, but the words came in pieces, between each brutal exchange. By the shadows of humanity's darkest desires, she whispered, dodging a blow that shattered the ground where she stood. Ashoka's fist connected with her side, breaking bones and tearing flesh. Charybdis gritted her teeth, enduring the pain. By the essence of all sins and liars, she continued, her voice strained. Another strike, this time to her shoulder, nearly dislocated her arm. She retaliated with a burst of divine energy, pushing Ashoka back for a brief moment. I summon forth the eternal blight, she said, her voice growing stronger. Ashoka's relentless assault resumed, but Charybdis found small openings to speak her incantation. To bring the world's truth into light, she chanted, her words a beacon of her indomitable will. Ashoka lunged again, and Charybdis barely managed to dodge. By the blood of the fallen and the cries of the damned, she said, her breath ragged. She countered with a flurry of divine strikes, her power momentarily holding Ashoka at bay. By the sins of man, both slight and grand, she continued, her voice now filled with determination. Ashoka's next attack was fiercer, but Charybdis held her ground, focusing on her chant. I call upon the abyssal flame, she uttered, as Ashoka's fist grazed her cheek, drawing blood. She summoned a shield of divine energy, absorbing the next blow. To consume all within its name, she chanted, her eyes blazing with resolve. From the depths of eternal despair, she continued, summoning her strength as Ashoka's strikes grew more relentless. I weave the threads of nightmarish air, she said, her voice unwavering despite the pain. Shishvata Narakan, rise and stand, she chanted, as Ashoka's blow shattered her shield and sent her sprawling. She struggled to her feet, refusing to give in. Embodiment of sin by my command. Ashoka's next attack was a flurry of blows that seemed impossible to dodge. Charybdis took the hits, her body nearly giving out. Unveil the truths hidden in lies, she whispered, blood dripping from her wounds. With a fierce cry, she unleashed a burst of energy, creating a brief respite. Expose the rot beneath the guise, she said, her voice echoing with power. From the darkest corners of the soul, she continued, summoning all her strength. Consume the world, make it whole. Ashoka lunged again, but Charybdis saw her opening. In this phantasm, all shall see, she chanted, her voice resonating with ancient power. The perfect world, as it should be. By my will, let the sins ignite, she roared, her energy flaring. And bring forth eternal night. In that moment, the chant completed, the marble phantasm activated. The air around her shimmered with power as the wretched domain materialized, filling the space with a blinding night. Chapter 70 The domain emerged, but unlike before, it opened in a different manner. There were no barriers, and it didn't transport them to a different place rather, it was an open domain. In the divine vision of Ashoka, the transformation unfolded like someone painting with a brush on the canvas of reality. The world twisted and writhed, turning into something beyond human senses. He quickly realized it wasn't painting on the canvas. It was removing the paint already on the canvas. The domain reverted the world to its most primordial state, stripping away the falsehoods of reality and making everything visible to the naked eye. The inevitable truth began revealing itself, causing Ashoka's brain to ache from the sheer intensity. The mechanical eye that adorned the sky stared down, exposing the deepest secrets and sins of the world. As the domain continued to expand, Ashoka struggled to comprehend the overwhelming truths it revealed. Each revelation struck him like a hammer, breaking down his divine facade. His mind reeled under the onslaught of pure, unfiltered reality. Despite his diminishing power, 
Ashoka still had the blessings of gods beyond the stars. He tried to summon his divine strength, but Charybdis's form changed again. She seemed to merge with the mechanical eye of the world, the divine mind's manifestation. By the time this happened, the expanding marble phantasm had covered half the globe, ruthlessly rewriting reality. Humans and monsters alike melted, their minds broken in the presence of their gravest sins. Their feeble presence extinguishing the giant waves of the history of the world. Charybdis, now a terrifying amalgamation of limbs extending into the infinite, spoke with countless faces adorning her body. They moved in synchronization, their voices echoing as one. By my will, she intoned, her voice reverberating through the twisted landscape. Ashoka, struggling to maintain his form, lunged at her with desperate fury. With every blow he landed, parts of Charybdis's body were destroyed, only for her to regenerate it almost instantly with different limbs. Let the sins ignite, she continued, summoning thousands of divine astras. And bring forth the eternal night. Ashoka's divine vision saw the astras as they sliced through the air, each one imbued with the power of the domain. He tried to deflect them, but their sheer number and the domain's overwhelming power made it impossible. That's what I've always said, Charybdis said, her voice a chorus of countless faces, but in reality, I've never done that. Her form shifting and roughly resembling a fusion of countless bodies and a dragon. The time of rebirth has come, they chanted, their voices a haunting symphony. Burn away, they declared, as the Astra struck Ashoka, each one tearing through his divine essence. Ashoka's form dimmed, his divine power unraveling under the relentless assault. The domain had laid bare his sins and his lies, and now, it consumed him entirely. Charybdis's domain continued to expand, covering more of the globe. The world twisted and writhed, reality bending to her phantasm. Ashoka, feeling his power weakened by the second under the relentless assault of the marble phantasm, thought that even now he couldn't win. The domain had stripped away his divine facade, exposing the raw truth of his existence. Despair began to creep in, but suddenly, he felt a surge of energy. The last blessing of the gods beyond the stars ignited within him, burning like a furnace. Power coursed through him as countless wills pushed through his being. His human form distorted, unable to contain the immense energy that surged within. His body transformed, becoming an eldritch amalgamation of divine and monstrous power. His hands moved on their own, guided by the wills of the eldritch entities that now fought through him. He was no longer merely Ashoka he was a vessel of their power, a conduit for their unfathomable strength. Charybdis, sensing the shift, prepared herself for the onslaught. Her form, now merged with the mechanical eye, watched with unblinking intensity as Ashoka's transformation completed. Ashoka's body twisted and expanded, monstrous appendages and eyes sprouting from his form. The air around him crackled with eldritch energy, a palpable aura of otherworldly power. He let out a roar, a cacophony of voices merging into a single, terrifying sound. Charybdis's voice echoed through the transformed landscape, she said, this is the true nature of the world, in the apex in this twisted and rotten world. Ashoka's newly empowered form lunged at Charybdis, his movements a blur of eldritch fury. Each attack was met with a dark, otherworldly force. Charybdis unleashed a barrage of attacks, each one a blend of twisted reality and raw energy. From her many faces came waves of distorted sound that shattered the air and sent ripples of destructive force towards Ashoka. Her limbs, now a mixture of metal and flesh, lashed out with uncanny precision, each strike aiming to tear through the eldritch energy protecting him. Ashoka's form, now brimming with the blessings of the gods, met her attacks head on. His hands, infused with a mysterious red energy, moved with a will of their own. Each strike from him sent shockwaves through the air, the red energy burning away at Charybdis's form. Charybdis retaliated with tendrils of darkness that erupted from the ground, wrapping around Ashoka and attempting to crush him. He tore through them with ease, the red energy acting as a shield and weapon in one. The eldritch entities within him roared in unison, their combined might pushing him forward. She chanted amidst the chaos, her voice a haunting melody that reverberated through the domain. From the abyss where horrors dwell, by the cursed and broken spell, I summon forth the void's embrace, to strip away this mortal place. By the sins of countless souls, by the darkness that consoles, let the world be torn asunder, in the wake of eldritch thunder. 
In response Ashoka's body convulsed, the red energy within him flaring up to defend him. With each step he took, the ground beneath him scorched and cracked. He swung his arm, and a beam of crimson light shot forth, cutting through Charybdis's defenses and searing her flesh. Charybdis's form writhed in pain from the energy. Ashoka's red energy grew more intense, his movements becoming more frenzied. He was a puppet to the eldritch wills within him, driven by an insatiable need to destroy. He lunged at Charybdis, his hands ablaze with crimson fire that existed beyond this world. Charybdis, though battered, fought back with all her might. Each of her limbs transformed into blades of pure energy, each one slashing at Ashoka with deadly precision. She summoned voids of nothingness that swallowed his attacks, only for him to break through with sheer force. The already desperate Charybdis decided to call on the rebirth spell. By the echoes of despair, by the shadows in the air, I call upon the end of days, to set the world ablaze. From the void where nightmares crawl, by the fate that binds us all, let the old world fade. But before she could finish, Ashoka's hand, now a blazing inferno of red energy, struck Theowag her enormous form. The mysterious energy annihilated her form, leaving nothing but ashes in its wake. Ashoka stood amidst the wreckage, the eldritch entities within him howling in triumph. The marble phantasm began to fade, its power dissipating as Charybdis was no more. The world, though scarred by the battle, slowly began to revert to its original state. As Charybdis faced the end, her immortal form crumbling under the relentless assault of Ashoka's power, her final moments were a whirlwind of agony and resolve. The eldritch energies that had once been her strength were now turned against her, unraveling the very fabric of her being. In the midst of this cosmic annihilation, her thoughts turned inward, reflecting on what she had built and what she was leaving behind. Though her essence was being torn apart, a fragment of her consciousness remained focused on her children Crota, Mo, Loba, and Akira. These were the beings she had nurtured and protected, and it was to them that her final gift was destined. Even as her form of chaotic blend of eldritch limbs and countless faces turned to ash, Charybdis managed to channel the last vestiges of her power. With the fragment of her soul still intact, she wove a final, desperate spell. The pieces of her soul, preserved from the consuming energies around her, began to separate from her dissipating form. Each piece was imbued with the essence of her power, a remnant of her eldritch might and knowledge. These fragments were not just tokens of her existence but potent vessels of her strength and wisdom. In her last moments, she directed these fragments toward her children. With a final burst of energy, she sent them forth, ensuring they would reach their intended recipients. Her hope was that these pieces of her soul would offer them guidance and strength, a pathway for them to ascend beyond their current limits and become powerful in their own right. To Crota, the fierce warrior on distant battlefronts, she sent a fragment to sharpen his resolve and fortify his spirit. To Mo and Loba, the guardians of her legacy, she gifted pieces to enhance their abilities and protect them from the shadows of their enemies. And to Akira, who had endured so much and seen so little of her mother's true might, she sent a fragment to guide her growth and harness her own latent potential. As her form disintegrated completely, the last whispers of her soul echoed through the cosmos. The energy that had once been her was now a distant memory, but her gift remained a beacon of her love and a testament to her enduring hope for her children. The world remained indifferent to her fall. Ashoka, now a pile of ashes, was but a fleeting aftermath of a grander cosmic struggle. The balance had shifted, and yet, within the hearts of those she had touched, Charybdis's legacy endured. Melim, feeling the remnants of Charybdis's essence, understood the weight of the queen's final act. As she cried silently standing among the fallen kingdom of Nazca the head of Michael in her hands. Crota, Mo, Loba, and Akira, each in their own way, felt the impact of their mother's last gift. Charybdis's life was like a colorless canvas that stretched endlessly, its surface dark and barren despite the immense power she wielded. Her existence, though grand and formidable, was devoid of true purpose or meaning until the rare bursts of color her family brightened her otherwise monochromatic world. These moments of connection were the only vibrant hues in an otherwise drab and empty landscape. Though often perceived as a force of evil, Charybdis's presence was not entirely devoid of merit. Her reign, while harsh and self-serving, brought stability and prosperity to countless lives. Her actions, though driven by personal gain, 
foster growth and progress in her realm, demonstrating that even the darkest figures can leave a mark on the world. Her nature was that of a true politiciana master of manipulation and power. Her decisions, motivated largely by self-interest, painted her as both a transformative force and a figure of calculated ambition. She wielded her influence with an eye on expanding her dominance, revealing the complex interplay between power and personal motives. In her final moments, Charybdis's life revealed a crucial lesson, even those who seem entirely self-interested can display profound moments of selflessness. Her act of sending pieces of her soul to her children, despite her otherwise self-serving nature, added a layer of meaning to her life. It was a testament to the idea that within even the most hardened hearts, there can be a glimmer of compassion and a potential for change. Her ultimate sacrifice, though it did not erase her past, highlighted the intricate nature of human existence. The colorless canvas of her life, once barren and stark, was illuminated by the connections she had with her family and the impact she made on the world. Thus, the chapter of Charybdis's life came to a close. Said a mature woman closing the book in her hands. In the remnants of a once mighty palace, now overtaken by overgrowth and decay, a mature woman spoke softly to a group of children huddled together. Their clothes were tattered, faces smeared with dirt, reflecting the state of their crumbling world. Behind them, the barren city sprawled out in desolation, with only the skeletal remains of a colossal beast visible on the horizon. One child, her voice trembling with hope, raised her hand. Akira, can I become strong like the ancient queen one day? Akira, now the sole survivor of Lanka and bearing the weight of its fall, looked at the horizon the floating heaven could be seen. Her expression was a mixture of sorrow and determination. With a meaningful smile, she nodded. The scene expanded, showing the devastated city of Lanka and the massive bones of the storm dragon scattered across the land. As Akira gazed out, the scene revealed her own broken smile. She was the last of Charybdis's lineage, the sole remaining child of a fallen empire. She nodded, her face breaking into a bittersweet smile. Yes, you can become strong like her, she said, her voice filled with a mix of encouragement and sorrow. Sometimes, Akira began, her inner voice trembling slightly, a story doesn't end on the note of happily ever after. Sometimes, no matter how hard you try, you cannot control how things evolve. The story of Charybdis, marked by power and sacrifice, was a testament to the complexities of life, where even the grandest of legacies can fade, leaving only the echoes of their influence in the world. As the children listened, the barren palace, the lifeless city, and the giant carcass of bones stood as silent witnesses to the end of an era. In the midst of destruction, Akira's hopeful lie became a symbol of enduring hope, a flicker of light in the shadow of a fallen queen's legacy. Chapter 71 As the children drifted off to sleep, Akira remained seated in the same spot, her gaze distant and lost in thought. The world around her shimmered as the illusion she had cloaked herself in slowly dissipated. The slim woman now revealed a different form, her belly rounded and full with the unmistakable sign of pregnancy. Akira had not only inherited fragments of her mother's skill and soul but also something far more precious, the unborn soul of her brother. For the past three thousand years, she had carried this soul within her, nurturing it with patience and care, knowing the immense power it would one day wield. She had hidden this secret so well that even the seemingly omnipotent enemies who had brought ruin upon the world had no idea another child of Charybdis was growing within her. One with a divine soul, unique for being the only offspring born after their mother had gained divinity. Akira placed a soothing hand on her belly, feeling the life within stir. She knew the time of birth was drawing near, and with it, the uncertainty of what lay ahead. But her resolve was unwavering she would protect this child with everything she had. A clanging sound interrupted her thoughts, drawing her attention to the shadows behind her. A figure emerged into the dim light, its gait uneven, as if something was wrong with its legs. Akira recognized the presence immediately but did not turn to face it. You're finally here, Blue, she said, her voice calm but tinged with a hint of resignation. So, I guess it really is time now, huh? The figure stepped forward, revealing its mechanical face, bathed in a faint blue glow. One of its eyes was missing, and a deep scar ran across its head, a brutal reminder of the sword that had once impaled it. This was Blue, the Manas created by Charybdis herself, loyal to the end despite its battered form. It's time, my liege, 
Blue responded, its voice steady despite the damage it had sustained. You must hide. There are only a few such places left, but I'll make sure that you and the baby remain safe. Akira finally turned to look at Blue, her expression unreadable. She knew the gravity of the situation, knew that what little hope she had for the future rested in the life she carried within her. She also knew that hiding might be the only way to ensure that future. With a deep breath, she nodded, her hand still resting protectively on her belly. Lead the way, Blue. We can't afford to lose this fight before it even begins. Akira gave Blue a final glance before speaking softly, put an illusion field over me for the children. They shouldn't know not yet. Blue nodded, though its mechanical face could only mimic the understanding it could fully grasp. With a faint hum, the illusion field activated, casting Akira's calm and reassuring image over where she once sat with the sleeping children. To them, she would remain there, watching over them as they dreamt of a better world. The scene shifted as Akira and Blue navigated through a narrow, congested alleyway, blending seamlessly into the crowd. The city they moved through was dystopian, a far cry from the once majestic lands of Lanka. The sky was choked by the towering buildings, casting the streets into perpetual shadow. Only the faintest slivers of light managed to pierce the oppressive darkness. Everywhere they looked, humans and monsters alike bore marks beside their faces, branding them with their status. They huddled together in cramped, decrepit spaces that could hardly be called homes, more like cages where hope had long since died. The air was thick with the stench of despair and decay, the very essence of a world that had lost its way. Blue's mechanical voice broke the silence as they walked, perhaps the queen foresaw this future. When she set out to fight all those years ago. Her voice faltered, her processing units struggling to handle the depth of such an emotional statement. Despite her vast capabilities, this wasn't something her artificial mind was designed to fully exhibit. Akira remained silent, her thoughts heavy. She knew that Blue's body, crafted nearly 2,892 years ago, was not perfect. Built by the last loyal members of Charybdis's lab after the fall of the Empire, it was an imperfect vessel. Daedalus, talented though he was, could never replicate Charybdis's genius. The body was formidable, yes, housing the last remnants of the Empire's technology, but it had its flaws, flaws that were becoming more apparent with each passing day. Blue's form was battered, her ability to heal long lost. Her legs had begun to fail her years ago, yet she pressed on, her dedication to Akira and the cause unwavering. She had been the single force that stood alongside Akira, a beacon in the darkness, even as her body withered and tattered from battles fought and wounds unhealed. As they walked, Akira suddenly stopped. Her gaze fixed on something ahead, and her expression darkened. There, at the center of the city, stood a giant statue. Akira's breath caught in her throat as she looked up at it. The statue was a grotesque mockery, depicting Charybdis, the once mighty queen, writhing under the foot of another. It was a clear attempt to humiliate, to erase the legacy of a ruler who had once dominated this realm with an iron fist. Akira's eyes narrowed as she studied the face of the figure standing over her mother, pinning her down in eternal subjugation. It was Meline Nava's face, twisted into a wicked grin. Her so-called aunt, who had murdered every single person she cared about. Akira clenched her jaw, her teeth grinding in silent fury. This mockery, this perversion of her mother's memory, was more than just an insult. It was a declaration, a reminder that Charybdis, who had once been unstoppable, had been brought low. But Akira knew the truth, the sacrifice, the battles her mother had fought, and the power she had wielded. This statue was nothing more than a lie carved in stone. None had made her kneel in battle. Blue, Sensing Akira's anger, tried to speak, but Akira raised a hand, stopping her. She didn't need words right now. She needed to remember, to hold on to the truth of who her mother was and what she had fought for. She needed to find a way to undo the twisted reality that had befallen them all. Akira and Blue silently approached the barren cave, their footsteps the only sound in the desolate landscape. The remnants of what had once been the Grand Jura Forest surrounded them, now reduced to a vast desert known as the Giant Jura Desert. The cave before them, once a hub of immense power and innovation, was now stripped bare, its stone walls cold and lifeless under the oppressive sky. 
As they stepped inside, the desolation outside gave way to a hidden stronghold within. The interior was a stark contrast, well-built and filled with remnants of the fallen empire. Machinery, weaponry, and artifacts lay scattered, remnants of a power long past but still palpable in the air. As they ventured deeper, a deep, feminine voice echoed through the cave, resonating with both authority and an ancient sadness. A figure materialized before them, kneeling in respect. It was Ram Iris, the former spirit queen, now irrevocably changed by Charybdis's power. Once the ruler of spirits, Ram Iris had been defeated and transformed, her very essence altered by the horrors of Shishvata Narakam. Now, she stood as the last true subordinate of Charybdis, her loyalty unbroken despite her fall. I've prepared the chamber for the birth of the prince, Ram Iris said, her voice steady but carrying the weight of centuries. You should rest easy, queen. Akira's hand instinctively moved to her swollen belly. She was carrying not just her unborn brother, but the last hope of a dying legacy. The title queen hung heavily in the air, a title she had inherited in the brief, tragic existence of the empire. Blue, standing beside her, remained silent. The title was one she never used for Akira, perhaps out of a recognition of the weight it carried, or the cruel irony it now represented. Akira nodded to Ram Iris, though her mind was far from at ease. Thank you, Ram Iris, she said, her voice tinged with both gratitude and apprehension. This was not just a birth it was the continuation of something far greater, something that had the potential to reshape their shattered world. Time passed in a blink, each moment folding into the next, until the fateful day arrived. Akira lay in a bed that was far more comfortable than the cold stone she had grown accustomed to over the long centuries. The plush blankets and soft mattress were a stark contrast to the harsh reality outside the cave, a small oasis of comfort in a world that had known only suffering and loss. Her breath came in shallow gasps as she stared at the ceiling of the cave, trying to prepare herself for what was to come. She had carried this life inside her for what felt like an eternity, nurturing it, protecting it, feeding it with her own energy, her very essence intertwined with the unborn soul within. Now, that connection was about to be severed, and with it, a pain beyond anything she had ever imagined. It began with a sudden, sharp pressure deep within her belly, a pain that was at once both physical and spiritual. Akira's breath hitched, and she gripped the sheets beneath her, her knuckles turning white as the first wave of agony crashed over her. It felt like something tearing inside her, ripping away the metaphysical bonds that had linked her to the child for so long. Each snap of those connections sent shockwaves of pain through her soul, wrenching cries from her lips. Ram Iris. Akira's voice was ragged, hoarse from the strain, as she called out for the spirit who had become her only source of comfort in this desolate world. Ram Iris was at her side in an instant, her form ethereal but solid, a presence that exuded calm even as Akira writhed in pain. The former spirit queen, now a loyal servant to the child of Charybdis, moved with a grace that belied the sorrow and weight she carried. She gently placed her hands on Akira's belly, her touch cool and soothing against the firestorm of agony within. Stay with me, Akira, Ram Iris whispered, her voice a balm to the young woman's shattered nerves. Breathe. Focus on the life you're bringing into this world. Akira tried to obey, gasping for breath as another wave of pain tore through her. The pressure in her belly was building, a relentless force that demanded release, and with it, the full extent of the metaphysical connection she had cultivated over thousands of years began to unravel. Each snap was a laceration to her soul, a torment that reached beyond the physical, striking at the very core of her being. Ram Iris began to chant softly, her voice weaving ancient incantations that wrapped around Akira like a protective cocoon. The magic dulled the edges of the pain, not enough to numb it entirely, but enough to help her focus on the task at hand. The spirit's presence was a steadying force, guiding her through the storm of agony as the birthing process began in earnest. Akira's water broke in a violent rush, a sharp pain radiating from her core that felt like she was being torn apart from the inside out. Ayak. She screamed, her voice echoing off the stone walls of the cave, mingling with the distant memories of her mother's own cries. The bed beneath her was soaked, and the reality of what was happening surged forward with brutal clarity. Push, Akira, Ram Iris urged, her voice a beacon in the swirling tempest of pain and fear. You need to push. Akira bit down on her lip until she tasted blood, 
bracing herself as she bore down with all her strength. The agony was unimaginable, a fire that burned through her veins and clawed at her insides, threatening to consume her entirely. She could feel the life within her moving, shifting, pushing its way out into the world, and with each movement, another piece of her soul was torn away, left raw and bleeding. Her vision blurred, spots dancing before her eyes as the pain reached a fever pitch. Her whole body trembled with the effort, sweat pouring down her face, soaking her hair, and yet she kept pushing, driven by a primal instinct to bring this life into the world, no matter the cost to herself. Ramaris's hands remained steady, her eyes glowing with a soft, reassuring light. You're doing well, Akira. Almost there. Just a little more. But Akira felt like she was at her breaking point. Her strength was fading, the relentless pain sapping her will to continue. She could feel herself slipping, the edges of her consciousness fraying as the agony took its toll. Ram Iris, she gasped, her voice barely more than a whisper. I don't know if I can. You can, Ram Iris said firmly, her tone leaving no room for doubt. You must. For this child. For the future. Another contraction hit, and Akira screamed again, a raw, primal sound that echoed through the chamber. She pushed with everything she had left, the pain ripping through her like a thousand knives, until finally, mercifully, she felt the life within her begin to emerge. That's it. Ramaris's voice was filled with urgency now, guiding Akira through the final moments. One more push, Akira. You're almost there. With a final, desperate cry, Akira bore down with all her remaining strength. The pain peaked, blinding and all-consuming, and for a moment, she thought she might lose herself to it entirely. But then, just as she felt she could endure no more, there was a sudden, overwhelming release, a sensation of something being pulled from her, and with it, the unbearable agony began to ebb. The room was filled with a new sound, tiny, weak cries, but full of life. Akira gasped for air, her body trembling as the last vestiges of pain subsided. She collapsed back against the pillows, her chest heaving, tears streaming down her face, her legs stained with her blood. Ram Iris held the newborn in her arms, a small, fragile life that had been nurtured for millennia, now finally brought into the world. She looked down at the child with a mixture of awe and sorrow, knowing all too well the weight this new life would carry. You did it, Ram Iris whispered, gently placing the newborn into Akira's trembling arms. He's here. The prince is here. Akira looked down at the tiny, wriggling form in her arms, overwhelmed by a rush of emotions, relief, exhaustion, love, and a deep, aching sadness. The child was so small, so vulnerable, yet brimming with the power she had nurtured for so long. But for now, all she could do was hold him close, feeling the warmth of his tiny body against her own, and know that despite everything, she had brought him safely into this world. The pain, the sacrifice, the centuries of waiting, it had all led to this moment. And yet, even as she held the newborn, a shadow of fear lingered in the back of her mind. The world outside was cruel, broken, and uncertain. What kind of life awaited this child? What trials would he face? Would he suffer as she had, or would he find a way to rise above the darkness that had claimed so many before him? But those thoughts would have to wait. For now, there was only the fragile life in her arms, and the bittersweet triumph of knowing that she had done what she set out to do. She had given him life, even if it had cost her a piece of her own soul to do so. In the grand, imposing throne room of heaven, where the ceiling seemed to stretch beyond sight and the walls were adorned with ancient symbols of power, Malim sat upon the throne. The air was heavy with the weight of countless eons, the silence punctuated only by the distant hum of boundless energy that coursed through the realm. Before her, the seal of Ivarich, the original cryptid, pulsed faintly, a monolithic slab of ancient power, its surface spiderwebbed with cracks that foretold its imminent shattering. Her gaze was fixed on the seal, her eyes void of emotion, yet her mind churned with thoughts that eluded clarity. The seal had been the focus of her attention for what felt like an eternity, its slow degradation a symbol of the relentless passage of time and the inevitable decay of even the most indomitable forces. Then, suddenly, she felt it a subtle shift in the atmosphere, a ripple in the otherwise still air. It was barely perceptible, a fleeting sensation that passed through her like a whisper, yet it lingered, gnawing at the edges of her awareness. 
Meline turned her head slightly, her eyes narrowing as she tried to grasp the source of this unease. It was a feeling she hadn't experienced in what felt like an eternity, a nagging sense of something unfinished, a mistake left unresolved. It was like the faint, almost forgotten memory of a fire that once raged uncontrollably, now reduced to a single, barely flickering ember. Weak and feeble, yes but undeniably present, and with it, the potential to reignite into something far more dangerous. For a brief moment, her usually emotionless expression faltered, a shadow of doubt passing over her features. There was something out there something she had overlooked, or perhaps, something she had deliberately tried to forget. A loose end in the grand tapestry of destruction and domination she had woven over millennia. But what was it? The thought slipped through her fingers like sand, refusing to be grasped fully. And yet, the sensation persisted, tugging at her consciousness, a quiet yet insistent reminder that somewhere, beyond the confines of this throne room, a spark still burned, waiting for the right moment to catch fire once again. Melim exhaled slowly, her gaze drifting back to the seal of Ivarich, though her mind remained preoccupied with the disturbance. The seal was her priority, its imminent breaking a matter of cosmic importance. And yet. That tiny, the last wisp of fire called out to her, demanding her attention, hinting at a future conflict she hadn't anticipated. As they walked down the busy street, Satoru Mikami and his junior colleague, Tamura, were engaged in light conversation. Tamura's girlfriend, Aki, walked beside him, beaming with excitement. I'm really happy for you too, Satoru said with a warm smile. You make a great couple. Thanks, Satoru-san, Tamura replied, grinning from ear to ear. I wanted you to be the first to meet Aki. You've always been like an older brother to me. Satoru chuckled, rubbing the back of his head. You're too kind, Tamura. I'm just glad you're doing well. Aki smiled shyly. Tamura talks about you all the time, Satoru-san. He says you're the best mentor anyone could ask for. Satoru felt a pang of warmth in his chest, though it was tinged with a bit of sadness. I'm just doing my job, he said, waving off the compliment. But it means a lot to hear that. As they continued walking, Tamura suddenly turned to Satoru, his expression serious. You know, Satoru-san, I've been thinking you should find someone too. You deserve to be happy. Satoru laughed, though it came out more forced than he intended. Oh, don't worry about me. I'm just an old man now. Besides, who would want someone like me? Don't say that. Tamura protested, his face earnest. You're a great guy. I'm sure there's someone out there for you. Satoru smiled, though inside, the word stung. Thanks, Tamura. But I've made peace with it. My time's probably passed by now. Before Tamura could respond, a sudden flash of movement caught their attention. Out of nowhere, a man with a wild look in his eyes came charging at them, a knife glinting in his hand. Watch out! Satoru shouted, instinctively pushing Tamura and Aki aside. The blade sunk deep into Satoru's stomach, the impact knocking the wind out of him. He stumbled back, his hand automatically clutching the wound as the pain spread through him like wildfire. Satoru-san! Tamura screamed, rushing to his side as Aki gasped in horror. Satoru fell to his knees, the world spinning around him. The pain was intense, but the cold the cold was so much worse. His vision blurred, but he forced himself to look up at Tamura, who was frantically trying to help. Tamura it's okay, Satoru gasped, his voice weak. Just just take care of Aki, alright? No. We need to get you to a hospital. Tamura cried, his eyes wide with fear. Satoru managed a weak smile, shaking his head slightly. Listen Tamura, there's something important I need you to do. What is it, Satoru-san? I'll do anything. Satoru's smile turned wry as he looked his junior in the eye. Delete my search history, okay? Don't don't let anyone see that stuff. Tamura blinked, momentarily stunned by the absurdity of the request. What? Satoru-san, this isn't the time. Promise me, Satoru interrupted, his tone more insistent, even as his voice grew fainter. Please, Tamura, it's my final request. Tamura swallowed hard, nodding as tears welled up in his eyes. I promise, Satoru-san. 
I'll take care of it. Just just hang on, okay? But Satoru's strength was fading fast. He could feel the coldness creeping through his body, the edges of his vision growing dark. He forced himself to stay conscious, even as the world around him seemed to blur and fade. Just then, a strange, mechanical voice echoed in his mind. Pain resistance acquired. Hemorrhage resistance acquired. Skill acquired, sage. Satoru blinked in confusion, the voice a bizarre intrusion into his already chaotic thoughts. What what the hell? He thought, disoriented by the surreal experience. Was he hallucinating? The mechanical voice continued, almost detached from the reality of his situation. Thermal resistance acquired. Uniqueness detected. Skill evolving. Despite the confusion and pain, Satoru found a brief moment of humor amidst it all. A sage, huh? Guess all those years as a virgin paid off in the end, he thought, a wry smile crossing his lips. But then, the pain returned in full force, and the coldness spread through him like an icy grip, pulling him toward the inevitable. Man I really don't like this cold feeling. Dying's a lot less peaceful than I thought. The world grew darker, the pain and cold intensifying. Satoru's thoughts became disjointed, fragments of regret and fleeting humor. You're a good kid, Tamura, Satoru whispered, his voice barely audible. I'm I'm proud of you. Satoru-san. But Satoru couldn't hear him anymore. The pain, the cold, the darkness it all became too much. His thoughts drifted, becoming disjointed, fragmented. Man dying really really sucks he thought vaguely, the mechanical voice still echoing in his mind. And then, silence. In the depths of the void, a consciousness stirred, fragmented and incomplete. It had no form, no shape only a vague awareness that something was amiss. The void pressed in on it, cold and silent, a vast emptiness that swallowed all thought. There was no sense of time, no past or future. Only an endless now, stretching into infinity. But amid this emptiness, a single word echoed through the fragments of its awareness, persistent and insistent, Charybdis. The name pulsed like a distant beacon in the dark, the only anchor for the consciousness drifting through the void. It had no memory, no understanding of what it was or where it had come from only that name, reverberating through the empty expanse of its being. Charybdis. The consciousness clung to it, the name a fragile lifeline in the sea of nothingness. And then, slowly, it began to take shape. Awareness coalesced, forming into something more concrete. It was as if the name itself was drawing it out of the void, giving it form and purpose. A sensation foreign and unfamiliar crept into its awareness. The void around it shimmered, and then, without warning, it was pulled from the darkness and into a world of light. The consciousness blinked or it would have, if it had eyes to blink. Vision flickered into existence, and for the first time, it perceived its surroundings. It was held in place, restrained by something firm but gentle. Its newly awakened senses registered a dim, glowing light, and it realized it was no longer alone. The beings that surrounded it were unlike anything it had ever seen or rather, unlike anything it had ever been able to see, for there was no memory to compare them to. They were tall, sleek, and inhuman, with gel-like bodies that shimmered with a greenish hue. Their forms were intricate, covered in delicate circuitry patterns that pulsed with a faint, rhythmic light. In the center of each face was a single, cyclopean eye, unblinking and piercing. These beings, these galvanic mechamorphs, held the consciousness carefully, their movements precise and deliberate. Some were tall and slender, their limbs long and elegant. Others were more robust, with shapes that hinted at strength and stability. Their forms varied, some resembling the branching curves of trees, others more streamlined and mechanical. The consciousness observed them silently, unable to speak, unable to move. It could only watch as the mechamorphs examined it with a detached curiosity, their single eyes narrowing and widening in response to unseen stimuli. One of the mechamorphs a female, the consciousness somehow knew leaned closer, her eye glowing softly as she observed the newly awakened being in her grasp. Her form was more refined, with a defined forehead and chin, her figure more aligned with something vaguely human. She emitted a series of soft pulses, her eye narrowing slightly as she studied the consciousness. 
The other mechamorphs responded in kind, their circuitry flashing in intricate patterns as they communicated in a language the consciousness could not understand. The consciousness Charybdis remained still, its awareness limited, its understanding even more so. It did not know why it was here, or what these beings intended. All it knew was that it existed, that it was being observed, and that it had a name. And in that moment, that was enough. The mechamorphs continued their work, their movements precise and synchronized, as Charybdis watched silently, its nascent awareness slowly growing, the name pulsing in the depths of its being like a distant, echoing heartbeat. Charybdis. The End.